Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you a star, Mr. Orson Welles. This will be the first of two consecutive performances by Mr. Welles, in which he will appear as the protagonist of Kurt Siodmak's novel, Donovan's Brain. The producer of Suspense and its sponsors, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, feel that this story is so unusual that it merits more than our usual time. So in somewhat of a departure from established radio formulas, we will bring you the story of Donovan's Brain in two parts. Part one you will hear tonight, and part two next Monday night at this same time. Before we take you to the scene of our drama, let's take a little journey of a different kind. We'll let a bottle of Roma wine serve as Aladdin's lamp. I touch the label, and presto, we are all transported to that capital of gaiety, Havana, Cuba. And now we find ourselves in the charming Pan American Club. At a table nearby, an American has just voiced his delight at the uncommon beauty of the scene. And then his Cuban companion responds, well, you in America also have much that is uncommon to boast of. Such is this marvelous tasting wine we are enjoying this minute. To enjoy uncommon fine quality, Cuba imports this wine from your own distant California. It is your superb Roma wine. Now just realize what it means when other countries import Roma wines from such great distances. Such international esteem must mean that Roma wines are truly magnificent in quality. And then consider this. You here in America need pay no high import duty, no expensive shipping charges. For these fine Roma wines come from Roma's own wineries in the heart of the rich California wine grape districts. Because so many Americans do realize this good fortune, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. So why deny yourself this taste delight? Try an inexpensive bottle of tangy, appetizing Roma sherry, or the hearty Roma burgundy, or any of the marvelously enjoyable Roma wines. But remember, these days your favorite dealer may be temporarily out of the type you prefer. Then please try again. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with part one of Donovan's Brain, and with the performance of Orson Welles as Dr. Patrick Corey, we again hope to keep you in suspense. As I sit now outside my laboratory door writing under the heading Experiment 87, this final entry in my casebook, I know that these are the last words I shall ever write upon this earth. I neither ask nor expect forgiveness now or hereafter, but for those who seek some explanation, I refer them simply to this casebook. Let them read it carefully from its first entry on that ill-starred day of July the 13th. <laughs> July 13th. Today I bought a small capuchin monkey from an organ grinder. The animal trembled with fear when I took it into my laboratory, and when I tried to pet it, it bit me. But I had to make it trust me completely. Fear causes an excess secretion of adrenaline, resulting in an abnormal condition of the bloodstream which would throw off my observations, so I fed it, and finally the creature voluntarily crept up into my arms, uttering little whimpers of content. When it laid its head against my shoulder, I stabbed it the surgical lancet. It died instantly. <laughs> Well, David, what do you think of it? Well, it, it's pretty amazing, all right. See what I've done, don't you? I, I think so. You think so? Good Lord, don't you know? Well, after all that, I'm only a second-year medical I student. I know, but what if I was a second-year student? Who is it? It's me, Janet. Come in, darling. Patrick, Dr. Schrott is here to see you. Oh, come on in, Doctor. You know our son, David, of course. Yes, of course. How are you, my boy? Fine, thanks, Doctor. 
Well, Patrick, hard at it as usual, I see. <laughs> Patrick, you didn't eat the lunch I sent in to you. Well, what is it this time, Patrick? A brain. What? A brain, a brain, a monkey's brain. Oh. What about the brain, Patrick? I've been trying to see how long I can keep the tissue alive. Oh, is that it in that jar? Oh, there's considerably more to it than just a jar, though. Want to see how it works? Is it still alive? In a way, yes. It's a fairly simple device, actually, Doctor. Variation on Corell's mechanical heart. The brain lies in a bath of blood serum. These... Rubber arteries are fixed to the vertebral and internal carotid arteries of the brain. The blood substance is forced through the cycle of Willis to feed the tissue. Over here, I've installed a small rotary pump that forces the blood circulation, you see. But how do you know it's alive? It's very easy to determine. The brain, when functioning, gives off infinitesimal electrical impulses. They can be measured. As a matter of fact, I've hooked the encephalograph up to a small amplifying system. The brain impulses can actually be heard. Here, I'll turn it on. You see? Quite effective, isn't it? Yes, it's effective. And it's it's wrong, Patrick. Terribly wrong. Oh, I've tried wrong. to tell him, Dr. Schratt. In it's heaven's only... name, what's wrong with it? Oh, Patrick, you and your mechanistic philosophy, trying to reduce life to a mere matter of chemicals and test tubes. The origin of life is from a higher domain than that, Patrick. And you're profaning. Nonsense. You can't stop the progress of science. Every discovery of whatever kind is a step forward. If I can prove that the brain can perform certain functions outside the body, who knows where we may be able to go from there. Oh, Patrick, how, how do you know that thing in there doesn't feel pain? How do you know it isn't writhing in agony? The brain tissue itself is insensitive, you know that. Just a feeling look. I'll switch on the encephalograph. See? There. Notice the faintness of the amplified alpha rays. Notice the comparatively slow rate of pulsation now. Notice what happens when I tap on the glass jar. See? Huh. It feels. It thinks. I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but it certainly shows marked reaction to an external stimulus. I wouldn't have believed it possible. <laughs> the trouble with you, Schrott, is that you don't really believe in science. Uh, have it your own way, Patrick. That's when you can manufacture love and sympathy and kindness in a test tube. I'll be back. You leaving, old boy? Yes. Patrick. Hmm? Do me a favor, Patrick. Shut off the pump and let that poor thing in there die. Let it die? Huh. If it were within my power to grant that little brain would live forever. July 18th. I'm utterly exhausted from lack of sleep at the events of the past five days have been of such tremendous importance that I must set them down while every last detail is still fresh in my mind. I've had no time to make an entry in this record since that day last week. It seems a month ago now and I had my first partial success with the brain of the Capuchin monkey. At that time, however, it seemed that I was doomed to disappointment. In spite of all my efforts, the brain of the monkey ceased to live at 12.14 that night. Tired and disheartened, I lay down to sleep on the cot in my laboratory, but at that very moment, fate was contriving an occurrence which now seems destined to have the most profound effect not only upon my own existence, but perhaps upon that of all mankind. <laughs> Dad. Oh, David. Come in, come in. What's the matter? It's Dr. Schrott. There's been an accident or something. He's oh. pretty upset. All right, I'll come. Oh, Patrick. Oh, Patrick, Patrick thank heavens, my boy. What's the matter, boy? There's, there's been a plane crash on the mountain. Only one of them was left alive, and I've, I've brought him this far, but he, he needs an immediate oh, operation. Sorry, that's your job, your county physician. Mm. Patrick, it's, it's multiple fractures of both legs. Oh, the no. arteries are severed, and the legs will have to be amputated. Huh? You are not in any shape to do the job. Well, I... Well, that's not my fault. Take him to the Phoenix Hospital. I'm not going to take responsibility. Oh, it's too far. Really we'd never it. get there in time. Patrick, please, it, it may mean a man's life and... And, and I... your job as county physician. No, no, I'm not mm, thinking of right. that, but it's it's an important man. William H. Donovan. Donovan? Don... The Wall Street Donovan? Yes. You've got to help me, Patrick. Donovan. Hmm. What are his chances? About even, if we hurry. Well, bring him in. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you. You'd better get some things on, David. You may have to help. Yes, uh, and you will use the laboratory table. Before you go, put the instruments the sterilizer. And don't forget the Geely saw. Right. Oh, but... But, uh, but what? Why, as 
thought the gel you saw was only used for... For, for brain surgery. Hmm. Not always. Hurry, they, they bring him in now from the car. Okay, Dad. Yeah. In here. Careful now. That's right, easy, does. Around the Back. table, please. Yes, Doctor, easy, easy. You better get yourself a gown and gloves, Doctor, right over there. You won't have time to scrub. Yes, thanks, mm-hmm. Doctor. Too bad, isn't he? Pulse rapid. Heart very faint. I wasn't sure. Uh, David, uh, yes, half cc of adrenaline, David, one to one thousand into Venus. Right. You men can go now. Is there anything else we no, can do? No, thank you. Patrick, don't you think... I'd rather we were alone if you don't mind, gentlemen. Yes. yes. Good night, then, Dr. Schreier. Doctor. Good, Good night. Good night. Now, David, David, if you remove the blanket from his legs, that's it. Right. Hmm. You see, fortunately, a forest ranger got to him right after the crash and had sense enough to put a tourniquet on each leg. Even so, yeah. <sighs> Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. We'll get it. Sure, sure, sure. What's he saying? Uh, Something like, sure, sure, sure. He said it over and over. Huh. I hadn't realized he was deformed. It doesn't show as much in his pictures. Patrick, don't you think we ought to begin? Oh, there's no use amputating those legs. No use? he would be dead anyway by morning. Well, won't it? Well... Suppose you're right, Patrick. You know I'm right. But still, we ought to try. We can't refuse to operate just We are because... going to operate. Syringe, please, David, the large one. Here you are, Dad. Spinal anesthetic. Will you give it, Dr. Schrock? Right. Scalpel, please, David. Scalpel and the Geely saw. Geely saw? Patrick. Well? No, 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 Patrick. I won't let you. After your performance tonight? Well, I have... But, Patrick, he's still alive. Precisely. My mistake with the monkey was that he was dead. I don't intend to make that mistake again. Come on, David, Patrick, the scalpel. Patrick, are you out of your mind? You're, you're, you're taking a man's life. I'm giving him life. Donovan would die anyway. But for a while, at least, Donovan's brain will live. <laughs> Better hurry, they'll be coming for the body pretty soon. Yeah, you can go now, David. I David, think I will, uh, then. You understand, of course? Yes, I understand. Not a word, not a word to your mother or to anyone. I understand. Yeah, did you put something in the skull cavity oh, so yeah. the eyes won't fall? I, I filled it with cotton, bandaged the whole cranium. It looked like any head injury. I hope nobody gets any ideas about an autopsy. You're the coroner. You can stop there. Look, Schwartz. This is a chance that comes once in a lifetime. William Donovan had one of the greatest minds, has one of the greatest brains in the world today. And now you have it. Uh, it's Turn madness, on the Patrick. encephalograph. Uh, simple alpha, simple alpha, alpha waves, waves of course, no different from the monkeys. You can't take a human brain out of its body and expect it to function. I suppose not, but... Trot! Did it ever occur to you that the brain might simply be asleep? Asleep? Certainly. An operation like that is a severe shock. Tap on the glass. Good Lord, Patrick. Delta waves. It was asleep you woke it up. It's actually conscious. You see, you see, the three of us. Three of us conducting this experiment now. You and me and William Horace Donovan. July 25th, I moved my bed into the laboratory, but I've scarcely slept in six days. I no longer any doubt that the brain responds like a sensitive seismograph to vibrations near it, including the sound of my voice. Yet I've found no method of communication with it. I've devised a simplified Morse code consisting of taps on the glass container, together with voice vibrations. Perhaps, perhaps I can teach the brain. July 30th, Schrott has come to stay with me, half out of a feeling that he shares with me a common guilt, half out of scientific curiosity. So I've scarcely seen him, and both David and Janice have been avoiding me, not that I really care. They've been tapping out my code on the side of the brain's container endlessly, day and night, over and over, a thousand times, so that a baby could learn it, if the brain can learn. I sleep only when the brain itself falls into exhausted slumber. When it wakes again, I resume my tapping. Come on, get up! 
Corey! Come on, I want to show something you something. Something the matter? Yes, old boy, I want to show you something. Patrick, you look like a ghost. Where are we going? Back to the laboratory. I can't believe it myself. I, I may have been dreaming delirious. What's happened? Come on. You hear that? Delta waves. Seems disturbed. You've got to check my observations for me. If my reasoning is wrong, tell me. I can't be sure of anything anymore. Yes, sir. Now listen carefully. You know that I've been trying to communicate with the brain in code now. If I were able to cause a distinctive pattern of the brain's delta waves by a specific command in code, if the brain responded with the same pattern of sound each time I issued the command, it would prove that I'd succeeded in communicating with the brain, wouldn't it? Yes, Frederick, I think it would. Now, listen... Donovan! Donovan! If you understand, think three times of the word talk. Three times. Talk. 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 It answered. It spoke. Then I'm right. It's true. This thing has learned to talk. To talk. July 31st. Shot is romanticizing, of course. The Delta pattern is so infinitely complex that it would be utterly impossible ever to break it down into specific words, yet that it understands me, that it's trying to communicate with me, is certain. Shot suggests mental telepathy, that I try to make my mind a blank, as the mediums call it, while at the same time increasing the energy content of the plasma that feeds the brain in the hope of stepping up the brain's electrical potential as one would step up the power of a radio station. Naturally, telepathy is nonsense, but... The feeding theory intrigues me. I shall try it. August 12th. Notice today for the first time two distinct nodules of new brain cells on the frontal lobe X. The electrical potential has increased to 510 microvolts. I, I, I've become smoking cigars. Although I've always hated cigars before... Nerves, I expect. August 22nd, nodule still growing, electrical potential 1450, but no observable results. I've lately felt a compelling urge to know more of Donovan's life and have collected every available scrap of information about him. A strange man he was. Strange, ruthless, actually evil in many ways but nonetheless an extraordinarily brilliant mind. wake you up, Patrick. You were moaning asleep. in your sleep, talking. Uh, talking? What did I say? I'm not sure, but your voice was so strange that... Janice, Janice, what's the matter? Oh, it's nothing, nothing. I was dreaming, that's all. Janice woke me up. Patrick, let me see your hand. My hand? What you no, the hand other one. For? What about it? You're not left-handed, are you? No. Then why have you got ink on the fingers of your left hand? Well, I don't know. Were you writing anything tonight? Oh. You must have been, Patrick. Here it is, right here on your desk. Nonsense. Wait, let me see it. Well, you've been writing his name, William H. William Donovan. H. Donovan Schrott, that's not my handwriting. It's... What? Don't you see what it means? The brain has communicated with me. Patrick, you don't... Look here. Look at this magazine article. Here's a reproduction of his signature... And he was left-handed, too. It says so here. Why, it is. It, it oh, is exactly the what same. What a fool I've been. Look at this picture smoking a cigar. With his left hand, I wondered why it suddenly started smoking cigars. The same brand, too. Janice, try to remember what you heard me saying just before you woke me up. 
Come on, Janice. Think. Patrick, I, I can't believe... Think, Janice. All I heard was something like... Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Of course. Don't you remember, Schrott? He said it that night. It was the only thing we ever heard him say. It, it, it was an expression of his. It tells about that in one of the articles. Two years. There it is. It right wasn't there. your voice, Patrick. It wasn't Patrick. my voice. You see, the brain has grown. And it's strong enough to influence not only the higher functions, the frontal lobe, but the speech centers, the motor centers of another brain. Patrick, if this is true, then your experiment has been successful. It's ended. Ended? Oh, it's only begun. Patrick. Don't you see what this means? Patrick, listen to me. Oh, what, Janice? What? You've got to stop. Stop? I can't stand it any longer. Can't you see where it's led you? When you cut yourself off from your family, when you neglected your health, began having fits of temper and were like... like someone I hardly recognize as the man I married. All that I tried to understand... But don't you see what you've done? You are a murderer, Patrick, a murderer. Oh, Janice, darling. David told me the whole thing. That poor boy's half insane himself from worry. Insane? What do you mean by that? What I say. You killed Donovan. Janice, Maybe darling. he wouldn't have lived anyway. But you killed him. And now this, this thing has gained such power over your mind that it can make you do things you don't even know about. For all you know, it could make you do anything. Anything. You've got to choose, Patrick. Oh, Janice, please. I suppose you're right, but I'm utterly exhausted. I can't even think anymore. You've got to think. Give me until tomorrow. Let me sleep, and then tomorrow I'll do something. I promise you. All right, Patrick. Tomorrow. But if you don't do something, if you don't destroy that this thing, I will. The brain. It's almost as though it heard you and were raging. Raging at you. <laughs> This way, please, Dr. Come Corey. Come along, darling. But, Patrick, why well, are we going in here? A psychiatric clinic? I told you I'd do something, Janice. I've, I've got an idea. You I... mean you're you're having yourself psychoanalyzed? Well... Something like that? Something like that. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. First, I want, I want you to talk to this man alone. Dr. Zanger, this is Dr. Corey. Oh, how do you do, Dr. Corey? How I've do you heard do, something Dr. Zanger? of your work. Oh, yes. And this is Mrs. Corey. Of course, excuse me. I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Corey. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, won't you come in tomorrow? Uh, I, I will certainly. Janice, would you mind, darling, waiting in the reception room? We'll be out in just a moment. Thank you. Why, certainly, do. In here, please, Doctor. Very well. Uh, doctor, she seems quite normal. I'd expected from what you told me on the telephone. That I... I know, I... I know, I, I... I can assure you, I... I... I hate to tell you this, but... Uh, doctor... She's quite insane. I see. Yes. Uh, uh, paranoia. She, she's always been, you know... Jealous of my work. And... Well, last little while she started, she's got a, a, a delusion that she thinks I've made some kind of a monster in, up in, in my laboratory that controls my mind and, and controls my actions. Huh. So I, I'm, I'm putting her completely in your hands. Oh, well, it's... It's, of course, a little unusual, but since you are yourself a medical man... That's right. Uh, you definitely wish to commit her, then, huh? Yes. Yes. You have the papers. Oh, yes. Here you are. Uh, just your signature will be enough, though. Uh, there you are. Uh, you, you let me know about everything, won't oh, you? Oh, naturally, Doctor. We keep yeah. you informed. Thank you. Well, goodbye then, Dr. Corey. We, we'll do what we can. Oh, right. Uh, Patrick? Uh, Mrs. Corey is staying with us, Miss Wilcox. Yes, Dr. Zanger. Patrick? Come back! Patrick! Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Corey. Just come with me, please. Patrick! No. Where are you going? Let me go! Let me go! Oh, Dr. Corey? Yes? 
Uh, about the bill, how do you wish it to be handled? Uh, the bill? The... The bill? <sighs> sure, sure, sure. I, I'll take care of it by the week. The checks will be signed uh, William H. Donovan. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> August 20th. It's nearly three weeks now since Janice went away. I can't understand how she could have left me just when I needed her most. When I try to question Shrott or David about it, they only look at me strangely and change the subject. Clearly, they too now are in on the conspiracy. Sometimes it seems the only person I can trust is Donovan. The brain communicates with me more freely now each day. I know it has some great plan in mind for me, for both of us. I'm waiting, patiently waiting. <laughs> Donovan? Donovan, I I'm listening, Donovan. Don't be angry, Donovan. I'm trying to understand. I I'm listening, Donovan. I'm listening. I... I I'm... Li <laughs> sure. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <laughs> And so closes Donovan's Brain, part one, the first of two half-hour presentations of Kurtz Jodmak's story, presenting Orson Welles as star of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. We sincerely hope you enjoyed the performance of Orson Welles and that of the whole cast tonight in our Roma Suspense play, and that you'll make a note to be sure not to miss the completion of this story next week. The Roma Wine Company would like to express its thanks for the many letters of appreciation from listeners which we are constantly receiving saying how much you enjoy these broadcasts. And here's a thought. To discover the enjoyment these suspense programs offer, you first had to sample one. And so you must first sample one of the many delicious Roma wines to discover for yourself their wonderful taste and quality, the excellence that makes Roma America's largest selling wines. You'll discover, as of other millions before you, that Roma wines are super quality, are super tasting, and are super easy on your pocketbook, too, costing only pennies a glass. Be sure you get R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The greatest and most profitable investment you can make in your country's future is to buy war bonds. Don't forget, then... Next Monday, you will hear part two of Donovan's Brain, starring Orson Welles, in the completion of this remarkable tale of suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents... Suspense! Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. 
Tonight from Hollywood, we again bring you Mr. Orson Welles in the second of two consecutive performances starring Mr. Welles as the protagonist of Kurt Siodmak's novel, Donovan's Brain. The producer of Suspense and its sponsors, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, felt this story so unusual that it merited more than our usual time. So in somewhat of a departure from established radio formulas, we are bringing you the story of Donovan's brain in two parts. Part one you heard last Thursday, and tonight you will hear part two, the completion of Donovan's brain. But before we raise the curtain on our suspense play, let's for a moment wish ourselves away to Havana, Cuba, seated at a table in the fashionable Hotel de Nacional de Cuba. Near us, a, gr a group of Cubans are entertaining an American visitor. Our American has just remarked that in point of great enjoyment, the Cuban rumba is one of America's most delightful imported dances. And then, raising his wine glass, the Cuban host responds, then we have perhaps discharged some part of our debt to you Americans for this wonderful tasting wine that gives us such great enjoyment. It is wine that Cuba imports from your faraway California. It is Roma wine. Americans didn't have to wait for wine connoisseurs of other lands to discover the greatness of California's wine districts, the superb quality of Roma, California wines. So many millions made this discovery for themselves that Roma wines have long been America's largest selling wines. But these millions discovered something more. In Roma wines, they discovered an easy and expensive way to increase the delights of daily living. Yes, millions have discovered that Roma wines as a beverage on the table, and when used in entertaining, add a charm of a special and wholesome kind. I told you Roma wines cost little. That's because here in America you pay no high import duty, no expensive shipping charges. And two, Roma wines come from Roma's own wineries in the heart of choice California vineyard districts. So cost to you is only pennies a glass for R-O-M-A Roma wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with part two of Donovan's Brain, and with the performance of Orson Welles as Dr. Patrick Corey, we again hope to keep you in suspense. As I sit now outside my laboratory door writing... Under the heading Experiment 87, this final entry in my casebook, I know that these are the last words I shall ever write upon this earth. For those who seek some explanation, I refer them simply to this casebook. Let them read it carefully. Perhaps they may then in some measure understand, if not condone, the awful circumstances under which I have been driven to the most appalling crime against God and nature that it has ever been the fate of mortal man to perpetrate. August 24th, it's now six weeks, exactly 42 days since I began the experiment. For six weeks, by artificial means alone, I have kept alive a human brain, completely detached from the body, floating in a bath of serum nourished by a synthetic blood plasma fed through its arteries by an electric pump. It has remained alive, not only alive, but I have succeeded in communicating with it. For I've even induced new growth of brain cells and so tremendously increased its mental faculties that by sheer brain power alone it has actually been able to communicate its thoughts to me. And each day my communion with that living, pulsing mass of grey matter that was the brain of William Donovan becomes stronger and stronger. Even now I sense it striving to reveal some plan to me, something so truly world-shaking in its implications that only such an organism developed to a point thousands of years ahead of its time, could ever have conceived it. So far I sense this only, but soon I shall know, indeed I shall be partner in its execution. What a fool I was ever to have considered for a moment my wife's demand that I end the experiment. It's because I refused, of course, that Janice left me a week ago without so much as a word of explanation or farewell. Even my son David and my assistant Shrat are privy to this conspiracy to thwart me, for when I ask about Janice, they propose and know nothing. Uh, they seek to avoid my questions. But the brain will live. Yes. I can hear it now. Its delta waves quite audible over the amplifying system I've arranged for it. Almost as though it were calling to me. 
trying to speak to me. The brain will live. Donovan? What is it? What are you trying to tell me? Go on, Donovan. I'm listening. Go on. Go on. Go. Who is it? It's me, Patrick and David. Well, what do you want? You want to talk to you, David? I have no time to talk. I'm busy. I'm Open sorry. Door, Go away, I tell you. I'm busy. Please, Pat. Can't you two leave me alone? All right, all right. What is it? What is it? Patrick, won't you come into the study with us for a few minutes? What have you got to say? You say right here. You know I can't leave the laboratory. Well, Dad, it's only that well, we wanted to talk to you in, in private. Well, don't tell me that you're afraid of this poor mass of brain cells here. It's not that, Dad, but we... Well, never mind, David. <laughs> At least turn that thing off then, will you, Patrick? <laughs> what difference would it make? It could still hear, couldn't it? Well, what is it then? Well, it's... It's about Mother. So, she put you up to this, did she? I thought the truth would come out sometime. Dad, listen. She's tried to stop this experiment from the beginning. She thought she could blackmail me into quitting by leaving me, and she still does. And now Patrick. she's using you as a go-between. Now, Patrick, true, listen it? a I've minute, won't enough. you? We haven't heard a word from Janice. We don't even know where she is. That's what we've come to talk to you about. Oh, have you? Well, how could I know where she is? Well, because you were the last person seen with her, Dad. I was. Don't you remember, Patrick? You took her into town with you. You you wouldn't tell any of us why. Yes, of course, the moment I'd forgotten, but what of it? Well, don't you remember what happened then? Of course I remember. She left me, that's all. Where, Dad? Where did she leave you? What were you doing? I don't know. We were in some big public building, city hall, courthouse, taxis or something. Next thing I knew, she'd simply disappeared. I... Is that all? Didn't yeah. she say anything? Didn't she at least tell you why she was going? No, no, I remember what she said. It's been a week or more. I've hardly slept. You know, I've been working night and day. Yes, that's just it, Patrick. What do you mean by that? Patrick, you say this. The, the brain communicates well, with you. Tells yes. you things about his past life. Suggests thoughts. Yes, Well, yes. if the brain can make you think of things, mightn't it also be able to make you forget things? You're out of your mind. Dad, are you sure... Are you sure you don't know what's happened to Mother? No, I tell you, no, I but don't Patrick, know. Patrick, don't you see what you might have done? What? In heaven's name, stop now while there's still time. Get out of here. While there's still time to help Janice, if there is. While there's still time to help yourself. Shut off the current. Get Let the brain out. die. Kill it, Patrick. Kill it. Get out, both of you. Get out. Get out. <laughs> August 26th, the brain continues to communicate thought fragments more and more easily, but nothing further on what I've come to think of as the plan. I'm now sleeping a great deal, but my dreams are becoming increasingly troublesome, although I'm at a loss to analyze them. Most frequent is a sort of vast cosmic ballet presided over by the colossal figure of a young man whom I seem to recognize, yet I never, never see his face. It's as though the entire population of the Earth were moving past him in review at his command. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. Now. Do it now. Now. Sure, sure, now. Help me, someone! Help! Shrant! Shrant! Let go, Dad! David! Head to Dad. Never mind, I hear. Help me with Shrant. He's fainted. No, no, David. Don't let him. It's yeah. all right now. Here's a glass of water. Yeah. What's the matter? You're trembling all over. I... You looking I at can't... me that way for you. Look, look how I'm frightened after death. Dad, you... What happened here? Anyway, I came and found you on the floor with your hands around your own throat. Dad went for me. Why is your luggage all packed? I was going to leave. Leave? In the middle of the night? Why? Because The I... fuse box has been opened. It was you, Shrot. You were going to shut off the current. You were going to kill the brain. Patrick, you tried to strangle me. What? It's true, Dad. That's why I had to slap you. But that's absurd. I came in here and found Shrot with his hands around his own throat. He was strangling himself. Dad, please, think a minute. Nobody can strangle himself. Look at these marks on my throat. 
No. You think I could have done that? Well, it's, it's not possible, and yet... It's true, Patrick, that I tried to shut off the current. I was afraid for you. But as I opened the fuse box, I heard the delta waves in the laboratory suddenly become stronger and louder than they'd ever been before. And then... Then... Then I... Yes. Then the brain knew... You even spoke in Donovan's voice, Donovan's Patrick. Voice, his that voice. recurring phrase of his, sure, 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 in his very tones, sure, his very sure, accent. Sure. You've created a monster, Patrick. It has the power to make me commit murder. The brain, the brain must die. Pull the switch in the fuse box, Patrick. It will only be a matter of seconds, yes. and then. Yes, I, I. But I. But I... You've got to, Patrick. Shrot, David. Help me, I can't move. Come yes, to me. You... Pull the switch, hurry. Shrot, David, go on. You? You too? It's paralyzed, this huh? The brain won't let itself be killed. Then... Then it has the power to live on. And on. To command us as long as we live. To make us do anything it wants. To kill. Murder. Dead. What are we going to do? Listen. Uh, it's a brain. It's... It's... Laughing. Laughing. September 7th, Schrott has left. He had to, of course, for his own protection, if nothing else. Before he left, he swore to eternal secrecy and was going to try to find Janice. The very thought that any harm might come to her through me is enough to drive me almost mad. As for David, although he's strong enough to prevent any untoward accidents, I don't know, he's, he's volunteered to stay with me. I, he'll sleep at night behind locked doors. We must devote every faculty we possess together and independently to finding a way of destroying the brain. Perhaps while it sleeps, although it seems to have developed tremendous powers in the subconscious which operate even in sleep. The recurring dream, the now oppressive sense of some further task to be performed continues. If Janice were only here, even her presence, I know, would help immeasurably to combat this fearful thing terrible thought crosses my mind. Could Trot have left if the brain had not, for some reasons of its own, actually wanted him to leave? September 10th. My thoughts are less and less my own. The dream of the young giant bestriding the earth, the figure without a face, pursues me now, even in my waking hours. Increasingly, I seem to live in a world of evil fantasy, peopled and controlled by the mind of William Donovan. It's not much time, but time enough. Time enough. Sure, sure, sure. Time enough. Sure, sure. Uh, hello? Who is it? Patrick. Oh, Janice. Janice, my darling. Janice. Hello, Patrick. My sweetheart. How... Are you, Patrick? Oh, I'm well enough. I'm well enough. But, Dennis, where have you been? Janice, why did you leave me that day? Why didn't you at least tell me? Where did you go down here? I was with friends. Well, did Trot tell you anything? No, nothing special. Well, Janice, I know I haven't been a very good husband these last months. I haven't been very kind or very considerate or even civilized. I, I haven't been myself, Janice. I know, Patrick. My poor darling. If you'd only known how I missed you after you left, how I needed you... I need your help, Jess. I Terrible. know, Patrick. Terrible. I, I came back to help you. But... But what? Where is David? Well, he's asleep in the next room. That is, lately he's tried to make it a point to sleep only when I didn't. Uh, trying to 
keep an eye on things. Patrick, I'm going to help you. Oh, no, no. All I can, any way I can. But first, I uh, want to take David away. David, why? Because I don't think it's good for him to be here. No? I don't think that you... Patrick, I don't want to torment you. It's only that perhaps we can find a way, if we know all the facts. What, Janice? I... Don't you know, really, where I was? No, how could I? Don't you remember where you took me? Where? I took you? I don't... You took me to a psychiatric, psychiatric clinic. clinic. You had me committed. To a madhouse. Yeah, Janice. No, that, not you, Donovan. Donovan. It was because I tried to make you stop the experiment. Yes. Kill the brain. As you left me there, you even spoke in Donovan's voice. Sure, 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 you said. Sure, sure. I thought they were the last words I would ever hear you speak. Oh, Janice, forgive me. Forgive me, baby. I couldn't persuade anyone. I was sane. Oh, sweet. After what you told them, everything I said only made them think I was mad. Hmm. I'm not mad. Am I, Patrick? I'm not mad. Am I? Am I? <laughs> Janice will be gone for some three hours. I've sent her into town for Dr. Zanger, the psychiatrist. Maybe he can help, but now, suddenly, I'm... I, I, I'm... I'm overcome with the thought of the humiliation I shall have to suffer when other, other medical men become aware of the position I'm in. It'll be the end of my career, my reputation, all my hopes. But folly to think that Zanger would keep it to himself, indeed, I... He'd have no right to. I, I, I can bear it if I must, but another way, a possibility, occurs to me, and I've, I've been thinking it over. There's no harm in trying it in any event. I, I must try. I, I have three hours. <laughs> What's your blood type? Do you know your blood type? As a matter of fact, I, well, I don't think I do. Why? Uh, no matter. We can easily find out. David, I, I think at last I know a way. To kill the brain? It's simple. It's perfectly natural. And yet nine chances out of ten is something Donovan has never known about. I, I'll do it myself. Unfortunately, my blood type and his are... Uh, they're the same. A transfusion? Uh, of course. I have to replenish the blood substance periodically. Anyway, it's about time to do it again. I, I've always used my own because it was the same type as his. But if you, yours is a different type. Yeah, the right type, David. You mean the wrong type? You, you, yes, you've given the wrong... The brain the, the brain will die given the wrong type. Yeah, it's possible. I, I, I'm sure of that. I know it. But uh, suppose the brain yes. knows it, it knows other things. I, I, I've thought of that. It's a chance we'll have to take if you're willing, David, my boy. Of course I am, Then Dad. we'll take the blood sample now. Come into the laboratory. We only have the right blood type. Sure. Rather the wrong type. Now, if you haven't, we'll find someone who has, maybe... Maybe shot. Now lie down there on the table, David. We, we want a tourniquet on your arm here. A I'll small put it on. syringe will do it. Go ahead. I'm ready. David, don't watch me. It'll be easier if you easier if you don't. For me. That's a funny one, coming from you. Well, the doctors are never quite as steady with members of their own family, you know. Ready? Sure. Ready. <clears throat> here we are. You you all right? Yeah, yeah. You'll be through in just a second. You, you're getting it all yes, right? Yes, sure, sure. Just a second now. Dad, I, I'm i sleepy. You'll be over it in a minute. But what's the matter? Why am, why am I so sleepy? You'll be all right. Sleepy. So sleepy. <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure, sure. That's what an anesthetic is for. Make you sleep. Ah, 
I was somewhat surprised to find the instrument sterilized, already laid out, but I worked more rapidly and skillfully than ever before in my life, I think. I made an incision just below the hairline, laying back the scalp as far as the base of the skull. I trepanned the cranium at two centimeter intervals, working back and downwards to the upper edge of the occipital bone. With the Geely saw, I cut through the connecting bone structure and removed the entire top of the cranium, placing it in saline solution to preserve it. I made a semicircular incision in the dura mater, laying it to one side, exposing the brain. As I dissected out the facial, auditory, and pneumogastric nerves to free the medulla oblongata, I, I, I became conscious of an insistent clamoring, something like a mounting hysteria in the distant reaches of my mind. I, almost as strong as the irresistible compulsion that drove me on. But my hand did not falter. With a sure stroke, I severed the spinal cord just below the first cervical nerve. As I make this last entry with that awful guilt upon my soul, even now I cannot fully comprehend how it has been possible for any man by mortal or immortal means to be driven to such a crime. Even the divinity himself did not demand of Abraham that final sacrifice of expiation. When he with his only begotten son ascended the Mount of Olives. Hmm. Perhaps Schrott is right. Perhaps there is indeed in man some spark of the divine that will elude our test tubes and our laboratories until the end of time. Perhaps that is the one thing that even Donovan did not foresee. I only know that at the instant my son died under my own hand, I was set free. At that instant, I saw and understood for the first time that monstrous plan born in the brain of William Donovan of which I was to be the instrument. It was the plan I had glimpsed but never grasped in the recurring dream. Donovan did aspire to the domination of the world. And with those tremendous mental faculties that I myself had given him, it was literally within his power to become the absolute ruler of all mankind. Only one thing was lacking, a body, a body, a young, strong body into which those ever-growing brain cells could graft and affix themselves to live on and on, perhaps for centuries. He chose the body of my son, and now, my son, at last too late, I am free to destroy this foul thing of my creation. I know it as surely as I know that my own life must be forfeit, and the brain also knows. I can hear the disturbed, erratic oscillations of the delta waves coming through the laboratory door. But there's no room left in me now for fear. I shall take the six steps from the desk where I'm writing this across to the laboratory door. Huh? How often I've taken them in happier times. I shall open the door, close it behind me for the last time, and write finis to the mortal life of Patrick Arthur Corey and the brain of William Horace Donovan. May others learn from the record I leave here the lessons I have learned so bitterly and profit by them. And for the things that I have done, may God have mercy on my soul.
Phoenix, Arizona, September the 15th. The bodies of Dr. Patrick Arthur Corey and his son David were found in Dr. Corey's own laboratory early today. Young Corey had apparently died on the operating table as a result of a delicate brain operation performed by his father. In the case of Dr. Corey, medical authorities gave us their opinion that he might have died of shock as a result of the unsuccessful operation on his son. A curious feature of the case was the fact that numerous pieces of tissue identified as being from a human brain were found scattered about the laboratory floor, while a larger section of brain was found in the midst of an elaborate apparatus, evidently part of a scientific experiment. Medical authorities stated, however, that they were unable to explain the nature of the apparatus and that the brain itself was in such a state of decomposition as to indicate that it had been dead and slowly decaying for at least three months. Dr. Corey is survived by his wife, Janice. She was committed to the county asylum for the insane late this afternoon. Burial of Dr. Corey will be at the Mount of Olives Cemetery. And so closes Donovan's Brain, Part 2. The completion of two half-hour presentations of Kutz Yodmak's story presenting Orson Welles as star of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Did you know that these Roma Wine suspense dramas are setting a record for the millions of delighted listeners they are attracting? We want you to feel that by tuning in the suspense program every week, you can count on real radio enjoyment. Well, in even more dramatic style, the popularity of Roma Wines is also record-breaking because Roma Wines are by far... America's largest selling wines. Millions make sure of great wine enjoyment simply by asking for Roma wines. Here's something else these millions have discovered. You don't need fancy glassware or a special occasion to enjoy these zestful, taste-delighting Roma California wines. Roma wines possess lip-smacking flavor and zest because they come from Roma Wines' own wineries right in the heart of the magnificent California wine grape districts. And you can enjoy them as a daily delight, because the cost is only pennies a glass. Ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Orson Welles. Next week, Mr. William Spear tells me, and he'd like me to pass the information on to you, that suspense will bring two exceptionally fine artists, Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, in a play by one of radio's outstanding authors, Lucille Fletcher. I want to hear that, and I know you will too. Money invested in war bonds now helps ensure a healthy, prosperous post-war America, the kind of America we will want for our children as well as ourselves. Don't forget, then, next Thursday you will hear Ida Lupino and Vincent Price in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines present Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the Man in Black, here to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, we bring you Mr. Orson Welles. Mr. Welles will appear as star of the suspense drama called The Dark Tower, from the play by George S. Kaufman and the late Alexander Wolcott. But before we raise the curtain on this evening's tale of suspense, here is a message from your host, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. 
Let us picture a scene in the fashionable restaurant El Patio in Havana, Cuba. From the next table, we hear a Cuban judge of fine wines describe in glowing terms the wonderful climate and soil of our own California. When his American guest points out that his Cuban host has never been to the United States, the Cuban answers, well, it's true I've never visited your California, but from only such perfect wine country could come sherry of such superb quality as that we have enjoyed, Roma California sherry. Yes, by their example, wine connoisseurs of many other lands tell you that in Roma wines are all the great qualities that must be present in a wine for great enjoyment. It's for this reason these wine experts of other lands import Roma wines from great distances to be enjoyed as a rare luxury. But for you, this luxury of other lands becomes a daily pleasure because you can enjoy any of Roma wine's many different taste-appealing wine types without additional charge for import duties and expensive shipment from great distance. These two great Roma wine features, superb quality and small cost, have made Roma Wines America's largest selling wine. I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A. Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now with the Dark Tower and with the performance of our star Orson Welles as that noted actor Damon Wellington, scion of the celebrated royal family of stage and screen, we again hope to keep you in suspense. You dare, you dare call me a ham. Violet, I will prove to the world there are no brains within that thick Teutonic skull. I'll cleave it open like an overripe melon. Who thus profanes the rehearsal of my lines? Enter, if thou art man of woman born. I fear thee not. Hello, Damon. Van Weston, you old son of a gun. I heard you were back from the coast. What news on the Rialto from that cesspool of the arts known as Hollywood? Have they turned my picture to the wall at the Brown Derby yet? No, it's still there. I despise myself for wanting to know, of course. It's marvelous to have you back, Ben, old boy. Seen Jessica yet? Yes, I've seen her. Isn't she looking fine? Feeling better than she has for years, I think. You got a great thing in this play, Ben. Changed quite a bit from the original, of course. Sort of a satire on the family. Perhaps it might be more dignified to say that the family is a satire on the play. Yes, I heard about it. For instance, those lines you heard me declaiming as you entered actually happened to me once. You know, that German, what's his name, who directed Macbeth, he called me a ham. And I chased him out of the theater and for four city blocks in full costume with a two-edged sword. (laughs) Damon. There's a little thing I like in the second act, too. Jessica asked me why I don't stop drinking, and I say, what? Would you have me subsist entirely on food and reach the gargantuan proportions of an Orson Welles? That ought to needle a boy wonder. (laughs) Amen. Damon. Can't you stop clowning for a minute? Of course I can. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave. Damon, please. Please be serious. What's the matter, old man? You know as well as I do what's the matter. No, frankly, I can't say that I do. To me, the world looks rather well. Does it? And Jessica, feeling better than she has for years. Is she? Well, isn't she? Of course not. How could she be? And why shouldn't she be? Damon, don't you realize there's been a murder? Oh, to be sure. So there has. And a good thing, too, if you ask me. What of it? What of it? Can't you see the thing is hanging over this house like a... Like a curse? I hadn't noticed anything hanging over this house profane or otherwise. And what about Jessica? Oh, I suppose it's bound to upset her a little, but she's really in fine shape, Ben. It's going to be marvelous in this play. There's more at stake in this than a play, Damon. The thing has never been solved. Perhaps it never will be. Perhaps that's just as well. But Jessica can't remember, don't you understand, Damon? She can't remember. Well, well, then, Jessica can't remember. Listen to me, Damon. I wouldn't mind it if it was just that other people thought she might have done it. But they would do that anyway. But, but she does. Ah, come on, Ben. I don't believe it. I've talked to her, Damon. I know. Oh, Damon, I love Jessica more than anything else in the world. You know that. Yes, Ben, I do. But this way, I, I couldn't. You couldn't marry a murderess. (laughs) I just think it would be rather exciting. Now that you mention it, I rather wish I had. 
instead of some of those I did bury. Damon. I'm sorry. Pretty serious to you, isn't it, old man? Did you think it wouldn't be? Well, to tell you the truth, Ben, I hadn't thought about it at all. That's the trouble with being an actor. As long as your heart's good, you don't give a hang about the rest of the play. Uh, you told Jessica? Yes, we had a long talk. How did she take it? You know Jessica. She carried it off, of course. But... Uh, ben, you know, in spite of all our histrionic bickering, I'm rather nuts about Jessica myself. I know you are, Damon. I have no very fundamental objections to you, either. I would describe you, my dear Benjamin, as adequate. Thanks. So I think perhaps you and I'd better have a nice, long, heart-to-heart -heart talk. What good will talking do? I think if you'll do the listening and let me do the talking, you'll see. Lend me your ears. I will a tale unfold. <laughs> Jessica, as you know, had been in a sanitarium for nearly a year. She hadn't been on the stage in more than two years. The dark tower was to be her first attempt to work again. All that time. I know it isn't the greatest play in the world, but it has a surefire box office appeal. Jessica needed that to get her confidence back. Well, we were just polishing up a few last-minute changes here at the house. David Torrance, the producer, you know, he was there with us. And, of course, there are the usual little... And another thing, Damon. When you kick me in the middle of the second act... Where? You know perfectly well where. Is it absolutely essential that you boot me halfway across the stage? What do you want me to do? Pull my punches? That's one of the high spots in the show. It may be a high spot to you, darling, but it's just a black and blue spot to me. Very well. Henceforth, I shall appear for the second act on crutches. You know, Uncle David, that's not a bad idea. Oh, now, Damon, let's be serious. There's a lot of work to I'm do. I'm quite serious. I could throw them at her. You might try throwing me a cue once in a while. It's the use of having a play if you just make up the lines as you go along. The critics thought my ad-libbing very witty, remember, dear? Oh, Damon, you're such an insufferable ham. A ham? A ham? Me? A now, ham? Now, now, children, please. I uh, fail to see why I should permit that little minx to insult me with impunity, David. How dare you speak to me that way? You started it. I did not. You started You called me a ham. You are ham, ham, ham! Minx, minx, minx! Stop that brawling. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east. And Martha is the son. I quite agree. What? That you're a ham. Gad, I'm beset by harpies. David, haven't you any control over these hirelings of yours? Oh, I'm only the producer, my dear Martha. You at least are a member of the family. And you at least can quit. <laughs> We're terribly sorry, Aunt Martha. We've been a nuisance, I know, and I apologize. Damon, eh? I even apologize to you. Don't be silly, Jim. I've been much the worst, I know, but... I've really been terribly keyed up working again, and, you know, Ben is coming east for the opening. Love rears its ugly head. Don't be hurried, Damon. It's all right. I couldn't even be angry if he was. Anyway, I'll have a husband to protect me by this time next week. I can lick him with one hand tied behind me. Damon, seriously, I know I owe you an awful lot. Me? I hadn't actually realized how far I'd gone. These last six months have been like coming alive again. The play and Ben. Thanks, Damon. Good Lord. Now I think I'll dress for dinner. Let's all go out to the... I'll get it. Aunt Martha, where would you like to go? To a rest home. Hello? Who? No. No, he's not here. He's not here, I tell you. Dead. <laughs> oh, darling, what is it? It was for Stanley. For Stanley? Yes. Yeah. Never mind, darling, it's all right. Just some fool who didn't know. Of course. Uh, Damon, you take David and Martha out to dinner, will you? I think I'll lie down for a little while. Oh, come on, Jess, you mustn't let a little thing like that upset you. I know, but I'm awfully tired. Please. 
Jessica. You'd uh, better leave her alone for a while, Martha. Oh, I suppose so. It was for Stanley Vance, the husband, huh? Yes. He's dead, you say? Might as well tell him about it, Martha. I was always for telling about it. Well, you don't have to. I'd rather. He was the cause of her breakdown, of course. Should have been an actor. That's why Jessica married him. She married him because he forced her to marry him. Ah. He controlled that girl's mind like some sort of fiendish hypnotist. My dear Martha, I've always said that if Jessica was fool enough to marry a psychoanalyst... Damon, stop playing the heartless brother. You saw what Stanley did to her. I was in Hollywood. Perhaps that's why Damon went to Hollywood, huh? Well... What could one do? She was legally married to the man. She'd listen to no one but him. Here's what happened, David. She went to this fellow to be psychoanalyzed, and in the process, something happened. I don't know what it was, but Vance acquired a power over Jessica's mind that was utterly inhuman. He married her quite frankly to have her support him. Then he found he'd overplayed his hand and sent her into a complete mental collapse. When he found he couldn't snap her out of it, and she was no longer a source of revenue to him, he simply decamped. Hmm. You say Vance is now dead? We heard the happy news about six months ago. Some public benefactor had shot him. I've always meant to look that fellow up. From that very day, she began to get better. From the moment she heard the news, it was as though a spell had been lifted. Hmm. Now she's practically all well. You know, it's odd at that, someone phoning for him after all these months. Probably the sheriff just catching up. Oh, I wonder who that could be. Damon. You don't suppose... I'll go. It may be a peasant with a petition. Good evening. My dear Martha, you are positively psychic. The Honorable Stanley Vance. Thank you. I trust the shock will not be too great. One knoweth not the place nor the hour when the bridegroom cometh, does one? My luggage will be here shortly. Listen to me, Stanley Vance. Good evening, Martha. I regret to arrive so unceremoniously. I have been ill. So we have been told. We have been assured, however, that your illness was fatal. Damon, I thought I... Stanley. Jessica. My poor, poor darling. Stanley. Oh, but you're ill, my dear, aren't you? You're ill. You should be resting. You're tired and exhausted, aren't you? Terribly. Terribly tired. Yes. I am tired. Oh, great. Terribly tired. I'll take you up to your room, darling. I take it we still have the same room, Martha. Listen to me, Stanley Vance. The poor girl, you can see how weak she... If you think you're going to stay under this roof for a single minute, get out! Very well. Get out! Very well, if you insist on being inhospitable, Martha... You'll pack your things, Jessica. We'll go to an hotel. Yes. Yes, Stanley. Jessica. But I'm so tired. Will you help me, Stanley? Of course I will, my dear. Come along. Stanley. Yes, Martha? All right, Stanley. You win. Ah. You're asking us to avail ourselves of your hospitality, Martha? Yes, You can stay. That's very sweet of you, Martha. Isn't it, darling? Yes. Yes, Stanley. But somehow, someday, there'll be a time of reckoning for you, Stanley Vance. And until it comes, keep out of my sight. The pleasure will be all mine. Come, darling. We'll go to our room now. Yes, Stanley. Damon. Yes, my aged auntie. Damon, what are we going to do? I don't know what you're going to do, Ducky. But I'm going down to the Lambs Club and have a quadruple scotch and soda. You may think it heartless of me, but during the next few days I simply stayed away. I think you'll understand my reasons later. As for Jessica, she was, of course, completely in his power again. And about a week later, there appeared upon the scene... A gentleman who was destined to play a very substantial role in our little drama. I think you've already met him, at least on one occasion. I'll get it, Jessica, darling. Hello? No, Mr. Damon Wellington isn't here. Can I take a message, please? Mr. Max Hartsfeld. Hartsfeld. 
Uh, I'll tell him you called, Mr. Hartsfeld. I really couldn't say. Well, you can come up and wait if you like, of course, but I can't promise he'll see you. Very well, goodbye. Jessica? Yes, Stanley? Do you know any friend of Damon's named Max Hartsfeld? No, Stanley. He seemed extremely eager to see him. He said he'd come up here and wait. Oh, I see. That's no matter. Tell me, darling, have you been feeling a little stronger these last few days? Yes. I think perhaps I am, Stanley. But of course you're not ready to go back on the stage again, are you, darling? No. Of course not, Stanley. Poor darling. No more love, no more... Well, my little lovebirds, how are you two? How are you, Jessica? A little stronger, I think. Am I a little stronger, Stanley? Of course you are, my dear. Uh, Jessica, I think you'd better leave us now. There's something I want to talk over with Damon. Yes, Stanley. I'll see you again very shortly, darling. Yes, Stanley. Well, Damon, I've been wanting to talk to you for some time. Really? I wish I could say the same. I suppose you realize, Damon, that... It's out of the question for Jessica to go on in the play in her present condition. Uh, kind of the point where you Vance have a pressing engagement with a pin-up girl, and I have got to change into my zoot suit. <sighs> now, seriously, Damon, I know that you somehow connect me with Jessica's condition. By an odd coincidence, I do. What of it? I know it would make you and everyone very happy if Jessica could go on in the play. Aha, uh -huh, the light at last illuminates maddled wits, so it's a shakedown. A shakedown, is it, Stanley? My dear Damon, I really don't know what you're talking about. Look here, about. my larcenous in-law. I've been shaken down by experts on every conceivable count, including the Man Act in my time, and I can smell them a mile away. What you propose is that for certain financial considerations, you will leave this happy home, Jessica will recover, and she can go on in the play. The answer is No. There won't be any play without her, Damon. Are you suggesting that my name is not sufficient to draw the suckers? I can get a dozen people to play Jessica's part. Margaret O'Brien, Marjorie Maine, Daisy, Agnes Moorhead. Makes no difference to me, anybody at all. Don't try to bluff me, Damon. After all this build-up, you won't dare go on without Jessica. You little know me, stinky. You may consider your little farce as having closed on opening night. As for Jessica, I'm very much afraid that she's made her bed, and now she'll have to lie in it. There's no cure for her short of murder with yourself as a victim. And I do not propose to put my neck in the hangman's noose. Good night. I think you'll see things my way a little God later, Damon. Did. By the way, did I have any calls? Oh, yes. Uh, Max Hartsfeld called. Max Said he was Hartsfeld. coming up here to wait for you. Good heavens, when? He's on his way now, I imagine. Look. Tell him I'm out, will you? Going to Hollywood or something. A fellow's been pestering me all week. Wants to buy into the show, and I simply don't want to see him. Oh, he wants to buy into the show. Yes, he does not share your lamentable lack of faith in my talent, Stanley, and he's dying to buy into the show. But does he know Jessica won't be able to uh, appear? Of course he does, you idiot. Everybody does. Don't you read the trade papers? And now, good night, repulsive. I have other fish to fry. Toodaloo, flat top. Jessica. Oh, Jessica, my dear. I'm coming, Stanley. Tell me, Jessica, The Dark Tower, the play you are going to appear in with Damon, you have an interest in it, don't you? Yes. Yes, I think I do. An equal interest with Damon? With Damon, yes. Uh, how much do you suppose that interest is worth, Jessica? A hundred thousand dollars, I think. A hundred thousand dollars, huh? Yes, that was it. Have you thought about what you're going to do with it now that you can't appear in the play yourself? No, Stanley. I haven't. You see, I'm not at all sure the play will be a success without you, Jessica. I don't know, Stanley. And so it might be wise to sell your share of it before it opens. Don't you agree, Jessica? Yes. Yes, I do agree. And Jessica... If I could find a buyer, and I think perhaps I can, it might be best if I were to handle the details for you. 
don't you think? Yes, Stanley. You handle it. The fact of the matter is, there's a man coming up here this evening, a friend of Damon's, Max Hartsfeld. Do you remember I asked you about him? Yes. It won't be any trouble to you, darling. All you'll have to do is sign the necessary papers. Oh. Excuse me. Is this the residence of Mr. Damon Wellington? Mr. Hartsfeld? Yes. Oh, come in, please. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Wellington is at home? No, and we don't expect him, but he's discussed with me the reason for your visit, and I think perhaps you and I can reach a satisfactory agreement. And you are... Uh, Stanley Vance. I'm Miss Wellington's husband. This is my wife. How do you do? How do you do? I'm very glad to know. Uh, sit down, please, Mr. Hartsfield. May I have your hat and coat? Thank you. And your gloves, please. Uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, eccentricity, perhaps. I always keep them on. Oh. <laughs> uh, now, Mr. Hartsfeld, <laughs> Damon tells me that you wish to buy an interest in the new Wellington play, The Dark Tower. Yes, I, I've been seeking an interview with Mr. Wellington. Yes, so he's told me. However, <laughs> Damon has very definitely made up his mind not to sell any part of his interest in the play. You are sure of this, Mr. Vance? Oh, yes, quite sure. I had a long talk with him about it only this evening. I <laughs> see. I will not conceal from you that this is a source of great disappointment to me, Mr. Vance. I have such a deep admiration for the talents of Mr. Wellington. I ventured in a few previous theatrical enterprises. Now, at last, I hope... I uh... quite understand your feelings, Mr. Hartsfeld. And I think that I may be able to help you. Yes? Yes. You see... Damon owns only half of the Wellington interest in the play. <laughs> My wife, Miss Jessica Wellington, owns the other half. And she, we, if the offer were sufficiently attractive... <laughs> and indeed. Uh, you, you are willing to sell then, Miss Wellington? Yes, whatever Stanley says. Good. Then perhaps we should get down to detail, huh? <laughs> yes, Mr. Vance. And Miss Wellington, I'm afraid you will think me very rude. Not but, at all. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, since the talents of Miss Wellington's brother uh, must be considered the very essence of our bargaining, and since you are acting as her agent in any event, I wonder if she would forgive me if I asked that you and I conclude this part of our business <laughs> alone, Mr. Vance. Oh, of course. <laughs> Jessica will understand perfectly. Won't you, my dear? Yes, Stanley. Run along then, darling. I'll call you when we need you. Yes, Stanley. <sighs> Now, Mr. Vance, I imagine you will wish to know a little more about the man with whom you are dealing. Here's my card. I'm staying at the Waldorf. I've written the room number on the card for you. Oh, there's no need, really. <laughs> yes. But before we discuss terms, there is one other thing. Yeah? I wonder... You do not know me, do you, Mr. Vance? Know you? I, I... You do not know why I've been looking forward with such pleasure to an interview with you? Alone. I know, I... I... Well, it's very simple. It's very simple, really, Mr. Vance. It's, uh, it's just that I'm... <laughs> I'm going to kill you. To kill me? Really, Mr. Hartsfeld? With these two hands. And before you die... Huh? Before you die... I want you to know the reason. Uh... Jessica... No. No, no. <laughs> so you see, Ben, there is your murderer, Mr. Max Hartsfeld. And I hope you're duly grateful to him. An elusive fellow, Hartsfield. The police have been trying to find him for two weeks. They never will. He... Uh, left no fingerprints, you see. Uh, he always kept his gloves on. It's uh, an eccentricity. Damon. <laughs> Wait a minute. Do you mean you? Uh, my dear Mutton. My dear Muttonhead. Listen, darling, the whole thing's perfectly clear. It's as plain as the putty nose on Max Hartsfield's face. I still can't get it into my head. Benjamin, if you don't know who Max Hartsfield is by now, you are the only person within the sound of my voice who does not. You mean you impersonated... Then it wasn't Jessica. Jessica? <laughs> she never could have done it. The girl has talent, but no genius. But Damon, murder. Murder, he says. Dear friend, 
You share with me a guilty secret. Your lips are sealed. Come. In the words of Hamlet, never so help you mercy. Note that you know aught of me. Swear by my sword. What? Swear! I swear. Well said, old mole. Well, I think that winds up the case, Watson. Uh, Jessica will receive by registered post a signed confession by Max Hartsfield, bound in vellum. That should end her worries. You may consider it as my wedding present. It will be a work not without literary merit, although written lefty. I should prefer it to be published posthumously. I look forward to a long and brilliant career in the theater. I should not care to terminate it abruptly upon so paltry a characterization as the late Max Hartsfeld. Music, curtain. And so closes The Dark Tower by Alexander Woolcott and George S. Kaufman. And starring Orson Welles, tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. If we could bring to this microphone a man typical of all Roma wine dealers, this is what he might tell you. I sell a lot of the good Roma wines. They are, you know, America's largest selling wines. My Roma wine customers, I've noticed, are sociable people who enjoy entertaining friends. Talking with me... They give a lot of credit for the success of their entertaining to the enjoyable Roma wines they serve. They're thrifty people, too, these buyers of Roma wines. What else could offer so much enjoyment for so little cost? Only pennies a glass by actual check. Now, that doesn't leave much for me to add, except this, perhaps. If you are not already one of the millions enjoying Roma wines regularly... Make your own taste test of any of Roma Wine's many different taste-delighting California wine types, such as the delicious tangy Roma Sherry, or the hearty Roma Burgundy, or the sweeter, heavier Roma Port, and discover for yourself why Roma Wines are winning international praise voiced in this phrase. Roma Wines are truly magnificent. Let me repeat the name, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen. Next week's suspense will, as is its policy from time to time, do the unexpected in the way of casting. Because you're going to hear the country's leading comic juvenile, Mr. Eddie Bracken, as a dramatic actor. I look forward to hearing that. I know you do, too. Ensure your baby's future by ensuring your country's future. Buy war bonds for your baby today. Don't forget then, next Thursday, same time, you will hear Eddie Bracken in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Tonight, our stars from Hollywood are Miss Virginia Bruce and Mr. John Loder. Miss Bruce appears as a beautiful and adventurous young lady who went in search of the bright face of danger and risked her life while finding it. Loader's role is that of the smooth and charming gentleman who granted her employment in a perilous enterprise. The story called The Cross-Eyed Bear by Dorothy B. Hughes is tonight's tale of suspense.
If you've been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the performances of Virginia Bruce as Lizanne Stephan and John Loder as Bill Folker. We again hope to keep you in suspense. The Cross-Eyed Bear. The subway train, Midtown, New York. A tall blonde girl reading an item in her newspaper. Reading it over and over. An advertisement. A personal advertisement. Wanted. A beautiful girl. No special training required, but must not be afraid to look upon the bright face of danger. Full wardrobe and liberal expenses, good salary. Apply in person, room 1000, the Lorenzo Hotel, East 51st Street. 51st, 51st Street! How do you do? I, uh, came to answer an ad. Oh. Is this the place? Uh, yes, uh, this is the place, I should think. Well, am I the only one? Well, not quite, but uh, just now you're the only one. I see. I thought, listen, Miss, uh, whatever your name is. Lizanne. Lizanne Stephenson. Take my advice, Lizanne, before it's too... Uh, Lydia, about that... Oh, someone to see me? <laughs> this young lady came in answer to the end, Mr. Foker. Miss Lizanne Stephenson. I see. Well, won't you come in, Miss Stephenson? Thank you. In here, please, my office. Please sit down, won't you? Thank you. Mm. Uh-huh. Not bad. Not bad. Oh, excuse me, Miss Stephenson. This is my uh, my associate, Mr. Hugh King. A bodyguard. She might as well know these little things, Bill. Hugh's not really rude, Miss Stephenson. It's just a mannerism. Well, Bill did advertise for a beautiful girl. I've always considered myself sort of an authority on that subject. I see. Perhaps, Mr. Falker, you'd be good enough to explain why... Perhaps I might tell you something about the job, eh? Well... Why did you apply for this position, Miss Stephenson? I, uh, I needed the work. And you're quite sure you're not afraid of danger? As a matter of fact, I suppose I am, but I told you I need the work. Well, that uh, makes two of us. Miss Stephenson, have you ever heard of the uh, cross-eyed bear? Yes. Where? Why, uh, in the papers. Wasn't that what they called Newt Villiers, the Swedish nickel king? Did you know he was dead? Yes, that's how I happened to hear about him when they had it all in the papers about a year ago. And did you know he had three sons? No, I I didn't read much beyond the headlines. He did. One of them's dead. His name was Dean, the youngest. The oldest, Stefan, is still in Sweden. The third, Lance Villiers, is where your job comes in. I see. Which she obviously doesn't. I want you to meet Lance Villiers, to get acquainted with him, win his confidence. Do you understand? I think so. We know where he is, who he is, but he won't admit it. He pretends he's a piano player named Lance Vaught at Jim and Jack's nightclub. We're pretty sure that Lance Vaught is actually Lars Villiers, the second son of the cross-eyed bear. Am I supposed to know why you want this done? You might as well tell her, Bill. She's in for it now, anyway. In for it? Oh, you mean it seems you're hired. You are. Oh, thank you. You accept? Yes, oh, yes, I accept. Well, then, the background, Miss Stephenson, is this. When the cross-eyed bear, that is, old Knut Villiers, died, he left a will. The will was consciously designed to bring about the murder of at least two people. Murder? Yes. He left his estate, which included several important mines, divided equally among his three sons. He left a check for three million dollars. One check torn in three pieces. One piece for each of his sons. And all three pieces must be presented together before the check is valid. A check torn in three pieces? Oh, sure. It's an old gag, but it's effective if you want a house divided. You see, the old bear knew that one son would eventually kill the others for their shares. And he knew which one. Stefan. The one in Sweden? Yes. But why do such a thing if he knew... Survival of the fittest, chum. The fittest to run his empire. The old boy is what is known as a rugged individualist. And because he hated all of his sons and wanted them to hate each other... They weren't even brought up together. Why, they've never even seen each other. But it seems so 
Can't someone bring them together? Isn't there some way? Sure. Stefan's way. First he killed Dean, and... Of course, there's no proof. It happened somewhere up in Vermont. I thought you said Stefan was in Sweden. We think he is. But there are ways of doing these things. No, he's on the trail of Lance, the second brother. And that's where you come in. We want to get to him before Stefan does. But if you think you know where he is and who he is, why don't one of you talk to him? Because he's scared. He doesn't trust anyone. He won't talk to anyone. Now, maybe he'll trust you. But, Mr. King, may now, I ask just why you... you see, is neutral, and so they're scared to do anything about it officially. Now, Bill here is like one of those spies in the movies. If he gets caught, his own government is the one to throw the first stone. Besides that, my government is afraid that if Stefan gets control of the mines, he'll turn them over completely to the Germans. Yes, yeah, Stefan's pro-Nazi, among his other virtues. Well, Miss Stefferson, will you be ready to go to work tonight? Yes, I'll be ready. I'll reserve a table at Jim and Jack's. Two, in fact. For, say, uh, ten o'clock. We'll meet you around the corner from the bar. I don't want Lance to see us together. I'll be there. Very well, then, Miss Stefferson... Oh, by the way, here's a little cash. You may want to buy yourself an evening dress or two. Thank you, but... Oh, not at all. Part of the bargain. Goodbye. See you later. Heavens. It's a thousand dollars. Well, so you got the job. Yes. Uh, you were trying to warn me about something before I went in, weren't you? It's no use now. I only hope you have better luck with it than I had. Were you... Oh, I'm so sorry. Don't be... Look, Lizanne, I don't know who you are, but you must be somebody. You must be mixed up in this thing somehow. I must be somebody? If you're not, get out of it while you can. You are, of course, but get out of it anyway. Why? Didn't it ever occur to you that the ad you answered maybe may have been in the papers for weeks and that there are thousands of beautiful girls in New York and that hundreds of them must have come up here and been turned away? I, I wondered, yes. And why do you think, out of all those, you were chosen? That's it. I don't know. Diary, October 12th. Yes, why was I chosen? Who are they, really? And more important, what do they know about me? There's no answer except to work with them and wait. At least I know that at last I've found the trail of the cross-eyed bear true, then, about the torn check divided among the three sons. And one is already dead, Dean. The second, the man I'm supposed to meet tonight, to trap. But I'm sure now that I was right to come to New York, and I'm sure I was right to answer the strange ad. As for danger, I always knew it would be there. Sure, Lance hasn't come in yet, Miss Stefferson. Positive. I've asked the head waiter twice. I don't think it'd be wise to ask again. Perhaps not. But does he do this often, uh, stay away like this? No, that's the funny part. They say he's been at that piano every night for a year. This is the first oh, look, time... Oh, look, Lizanne. Do you mind if I call you Lizanne? No. Well, you didn't by any chance tip our friend off that people were looking for him, did you? I? Why should I when I'm working for you? Oh, I'm sorry. Skip it. Just a habit. Nobody trusts anybody in this thing anymore. But if you don't trust me... Of course we trust you, Lizanne. He was a little nervous, that's all. Me? <laughs> I'm not nervous. I like sitting around nightclubs with beautiful girls. You do look very charming tonight, Lizanne. <laughs> it would be hard not to on a thousand dollars. Hey, don't look around now, but our boy's just come in. Did he see us? No. I just happened to be looking around the corner and saw his back. He's heading for the orchestra. All right, Lizanne, here you go. Don't be nervous. Just talk with him, chat along, you know. Yeah, what should I not say? Be as frank as you like. There's nothing to conceal. All right. Oh, waiter. See you later. Waiter, I have a table reserved for tonight. My escort will be along shortly. Uh, yes, madam. Uh, what is the name, please? Stefferson. It's table number 24, I think, over by the orchestra. Oh, well, this way, please, madam. And here we are, madame. Uh, do you wish to order now or later? I'll wait, thank you. Oh, thank you, madame. Excuse me. Yes? May I ask you a question? Why not? Won't you sit down for a minute? All right. Well? I, uh, I wanted to ask your name. My name is Vaught. V-A-U-G-H-T, Vaught. And your first name? Lance. Why? It's only because you look like someone I 
Someone whose picture I saw in the paper once. Yeah? Don't you believe me? Why should I? You're just another one of these people who've been going around here lately with a bad case of mistaken identity. Well, you're wrong, too. You know about it, then? About the cross-eyed bear? Of course I do. It's been following me long enough. They think I'm Lance Villiers, that I'm heir to a lot of Swedish dough. Well, I'm not. You still look like the picture I saw in the paper. Who are you working for, Stefan? No. No, that's just it. Don't you see? Your life's in danger. Not as long as I keep my face shut, it isn't. Look, you must trust me. I can help you. I don't need any help. Are you sure you don't? Say, who are you working for? I noticed you ducked that one. No, I didn't. I don't have to lie. Well, who is it? His name is Bill Folker. I never heard of him. He's working for the Swedish government. He wants to help you, too. A lot of people seem to want to help me. Won't you talk to him? I might. Tonight? They're here at another table. They? Bill and his bodyguard, Hugh King. Oh, since when do representatives of neutral governments need bodyguards? Apparently when they become involved with the cross-eyed bear. Please come. All right. For a couple of minutes. I'll admit I'm, uh, I'm rather curious. Over here. Oh, I uh, didn't tell you my name, did I? It's Lausanne. Lausanne Stephenson. Oh, nice. Here we are. Mr. Volker, Mr. King, this is Mr. Lance Vaught. Oh, How do you do, sir? Mr. Vaught. Won't you sit down, Mr. Vaught, please? Thanks. Uh-huh. I thought perhaps I'd recognize you. Oh, yes, I've been in here several times. Pleasure or business? A little of both. Look, Mr. Vaught, I'll speak frankly with you. You can save it. Your Miss Stephenson has told me all about it. My name is Bort. You're barking up the wrong tree. Got a birth certificate? Why should I show it to you? It might, uh... Uh Uh-oh. Here comes something. Well, hello, Hugh. Hi, Toby. Oh, don't let me disturb you. But, uh, you better make some introductions, Hugh. Well, this is Inspector uh, Tobin of the uh, Homicide Squad. Miss Stephenson, Mr. Vaught. How do you do? Mr. Falker. How do you do? What's up, Toby? Oh, I just thought I'd like to ask a few questions. Well, I... I'm sure you don't want me. I've got to get back. You better stick around, son. Oh. I don't I suppose see. any of you can give a satisfactory account of your movements between, say, 8 and 10 this evening with witnesses. <laughs> I thought so. How about you, Miss Stephenson? You're a new one. I thought you might at least. Well, uh, it took me quite a long time to dress. <laughs> it looks as though it might have. Well, it's better to have too many suspects than none, I guess. Come on, Toby, give. There's been a murder. A murder? That's right. A certain Lydia Vinton, your secretary, Mr. Volker. Lydia? Uh, Surprised? Why? Of course. Where do I come in on this? Well, now, Mr. Vaught, the New York police know a lot more about what's going on in the world than you think. All sorts of things. Like the cross-eyed bear, for instance. I've got nothing to do with the cross-eyed bear. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But there are a lot of people who think you have, including me. But Lydia, poor Lydia, she was only my secretary. She had nothing to do with it. Had nothing to do with the cross-eyed bear? (laughs) Whether you knew it or not, Mr. Fulker, Lydia Vinton was in the cross-eyed bear thing up to her neck. She knew the Villiers setup. She knew the Villiers family. In fact, she was one of the heirs to the Villiers fortune. Lydia was? Lydia, Mr. Fulker, was the wife of Stefan Villiers. And that's why she was killed. October 14th. Lydia. Poor Lydia. Who tried to warn me. And no wonder. Lydia was an heir to the cross-eyed bear's estate. And she is dead. Dean was the youngest son and heir, and he is dead. And the next, Lance. Of course he is Lance Burgess. His disappearing is as good as signing a confession that he is Lance Burgess. He disappeared not because he was a murderer of Lydia or anyone else. But he is afraid of being murdered. Because he is the second son of the cross-eyed bear. And that means I've got to find him before they do. Oh, 
Lost Lands Fort? No, I don't know anybody by that name. Well, he might be using some other name, but he's a piano player. Well, that isn't him over there, is it? No. You don't have any other piano player, one who's just recently come with you? No, no ma'am. Sure, he belonged to the Musicians' Union. They all do, but he hasn't worked for over a week, and, well, if he didn't leave any forwarding address at his hotel, I'm sorry. Some of these piano players are funny guys. Oh, yes, yes, I know who you mean, all right. I used to go by this corner every evening. Oh, but that fellow's wanted. You don't think you're going to find it before us cops do, do you? <laughs> I know you feel mighty bad about not finding that man. I, I can see that. Uh, do you want a little advice? Oh, yes, yes, I do. You ever hear the 48 Club up in Harlem? No. Uh, you go up there. Now, I'll tell you how to get there. And you just hang around. You'll show up there one of these nights. But why? Because nobody that's a real musician, and I know that boy is a real musician, nobody could stay away from there very long. They got a piano team up there. Mm -hmm. You just got to hear him ever so often. Now, you just go on up there like I can. <laughs> Are you sure? I think I know who you mean. I've uh, been keeping my eye out ever since you told me. I see. Well, thank you. Uh, the man you want uh, wouldn't have a beard, would he? Beard? I don't know. He... There's the gentleman right over there. Where? Oh. Is that him? Well, I'm not sure, but I think I'll take a table for a while anyway. Lance! Lance! Quiet, you little fool. Come here. Sit down. Oh, Lance, I'm so glad I found you. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. And the beard. Well, I had to do something. Not very good. I recognized you. All right. What are you here for? Put the finger on me? Oh, Lance. No, that isn't true. Why not? Because you trust me, don't you? Well, yes, for some reason. I know why. Because I trust you when you know it. You trust me. Oh, don't you see? We're all in this together. We're all in danger. Well, how does that apply to you? Well, I'll tell you. First, listen. Don't you see what you've done? By running away, you've all but made an open confession that you are Lance Davis. The police may think you ran away because you killed Lydia. But whoever did kill her knows why you ran away. Don't you see? Yeah, I know. I thought of that after a couple of days, but it was too late then. You are Lance Davis, aren't you? Why should I tell you? Because we can help each other. Because if we don't, we're both helpless. How do I know you're not with them? I'm not with anybody. I'm trying to find out just as much as you are. Look, sister. I don't know if you are or not. But I'm gambling with my life. Listen. If you're Lance Villiers, you have a torn piece of a check made out by your father, Canute Villiers, the cross-eyed bear, for one-third of his estate. There are two others exactly alike. And all three must be presented together before any are valid. If I show you another of those pieces of that check, then will you believe me? Yes. I will. But first, we've got to find a place for you to hide. Where did you get part of that check? Never mind that now. Where have you been staying? Oh, here and there. One broken down hotel after another. I know. My place. It's got two rooms, and you can have one of them. Isn't that risky? No, don't you see? It's like the story of the man who left the valuable letter in plain sight on his desk. The simplest place to find you is the last place they'll look. Come on. Here we are. How do you like it? Well, it's a lot better than I've been used to lately. And there are bolts on the doors. I had that done the second day I got mixed up in this thing. Oh, which room do you want me to take? Oh, you might as well have this one, I guess. The phone's in the next room. You won't want to be answering that anyway. Well, this is all right. We can work and plan here. It'll be our headquarters. We can... Well, there's the phone now. Make it 
yourself comfortable. Why don't you try the piano? Okay. Hello? Hello? Hello, who is it? Hello, hello. That's funny. There was no... Trent! Trent! Phil, how'd you get here? What happened? You can see for yourself. You killed him. Phil! Tony followed me. He's right behind me. I can't help that. Come on, open up. Come in, come in. The door's open. Where? What happened here? I don't know. I walked in and found them like that. Lover's quarrel, I guess. Bill, what are you saying? So this is where he's been hiding out. No, no! You better take her in, Inspector. Come along, Miss Stefferson. <laughs> Here we are, miss. Don't fret now. It's no use. Try to get a good night's sleep. Can I call a lawyer? Sure you can. You want me to get in touch with someone for you? Who do you want me to call? I I don't know. I don't know who to call her. Oh, who to talk October 28th. At least they will let me write. But what? I've been such a fool. They are Stefan's agents, Bill Falker and Hugh King. And I walked into the trap. They must have followed me. Seen me locate Lance. Perhaps even heard what we said. Now Lance is dead. The police believe I killed him. And they will swear to it with all the power of money, even foreign governments behind them. But worst of all, they must know who I am. You must know where the third piece of the cross-eyed bear's check is. And that is why I am to be next. Dean, Lydia, Lance, and now Lizanne. Here she is, Mr. Foker. Bill! Lizanne, I'm so sorry. I couldn't come to you sooner. It was a matter of your life and mine, too. Your life? Didn't you see through it? Oh, you poor child, I've been so blind. But it's all right now. We're safe. Are we? Come along, and I'll tell you about it on the way. Everything's in order, isn't it, Matron? Certainly, Mr. Foker. You didn't really think I'd done such a thing to you, did you? Didn't you see him standing there? Who? King. Hugh King. Don't you see it now? Is he? Of course. He's been Stefan's man all the time. Watching me, protecting me, waiting for me, for us to lead him to the answer, and then strike him. This way, please, and then you can get out right through the courtyard. Thank you. You see now why I had to do it? I didn't actually see him kill Lance. I got there a second later. If I'd accused him, he'd have denied it. They wouldn't have arrested him for a few hours at least. And in those few hours, with the power of Stefan behind him... It would have been you and I next, Lizanne. But why did you let me be sent to jail? To make him think I believed him. But chiefly because I knew you'd be safe here. And only if I knew you were safe could I do what I had to do. What? You won't trouble us again, Lizanne. It's finished. At last. Oh, I can still hardly believe that you came. Oh, it's been so horrible. I know, my poor child. Come along. I'm going to take you home. Taxi. Lizanne, you should have told me who you were. Go on in. Just relax for a while. Like a drink? No, thanks. You don't mind if I do? Of course not. As a matter of fact, there are still a few things I haven't told you about this little business of the cross-eyed bear. (laughs) There must be quite a lot of things. For instance, you never knew I had a wall safe behind this bar, did you? No. And of course, you didn't know what I kept in it. Perhaps you'd be interested to see. The cross-eyed bear's check. All three pieces. Yes. Lance's... Who had his part in his pocket, the fool? Yours and my own. You are Stefan. 
You know, I rather marvel that my poor brother Dean managed to marry such a naive girl. You believed in me all the way, haven't you, Lizanne? Even this afternoon. When did you know? Really, my dear, you don't think you were that beautiful, do you? I knew my younger brother had a wife somewhere, and I knew she'd turn up eventually if I used the right bait. The ad. The ad. But you weren't quite as innocent about that ad as you pretended, were you? The beautiful girl went looking for danger. You were trying to find the man who killed Dean, weren't you? Yes. Didn't you realize that he'd only married you for protection, so there'd be one more heir to the Villiers' fortune, so they couldn't all be killed, or so he thought? Yes, I, I realized that after I'd married him. Lizanne, I have a private plane waiting for me, and I have the check. By the way, I got your part out of your safe deposit vault, copies of your keys. Oh. So there's no use prolonging the agony. You understand. You're going to kill me. I'm afraid I must. Dean, Lance, my poor, silly wife, Lydia, who became a little too panic-stricken, and now, since as Dean's wife, you're the last heir to the Villiers' fortune, I... You can't! You'll never get away with it! I will. Oh, it'll look like suicide, naturally. I've even forged a little note in which you confess to the other murders. Remorse. Uh, do I make myself clear? No! My poor child, you mustn't think you can deceive me by that ancient trick of staring over my shoulder at a non-existent intruder. Drop it, Bill. You! I said drop it. You! You, are you all right? Sure, I'm all right. It was a close one for you, though, baby. I told Tobin to keep you there till I got back. I'll call the doctor. Oh, that can wait. But this can. Oh, you... <laughs> November 17th. This is the end of you, darling. I'm a married woman now. And the most appropriate end I can think of is this clipping from today's time, pasted on the last page. Stephenson King. Villiers heiress weds FBI agent Hugh King, who shattered notorious Stephen Villiers for six months to break international murder mystery. By special dispensation of justice and war departments, couple will honeymoon in Sweden. closes The Cross-Eyed Bear, starring Virginia Bruce and John Loder. Tonight's tale of Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour with us again next week, when Orson Welles will begin a four-week engagement as our very welcome guest on Suspense. During the next weeks, Mr. Wells will star in three unusual and spectacular suspense plays. The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, The Lost Special by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and Donovan's Brain by Kurt Siodmak, the last of which will be done in two parts on successive weeks. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who, with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and Robert L. Richards, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California 
introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars Dame May Whitty and Miss Maureen O'Sullivan. And so with the performances of these two distinguished leading ladies in the play called The Black Shawl. We again hope to keep you in suspense. Listen to me, please. Listen carefully and tell me if I'm right. I say I'm about to be murdered. I'm not certain. No one's even threatened me. But I say I am going to be murdered. This is just a plain, ordinary-looking kitchen that I'm sitting in. But for me, I know it is a death house. If it were only three days ago and I could live them all over again. Or if it only were. The fair was being held in town and everyone was gay. And Robert was late as usual, but I didn't care. waiting for Rob again, are you? Have you ever seen me when I haven't been? <laughs> and him a lawyer for the watch factory. Somebody ought to teach him how to tell time. <laughs> hey, how about a dance, Sue? One short one before that boyfriend of yours comes around to steal you away. Oh, thanks, George, but I'd rather wait. If he's not quick about it, he'll find nothing left to steal except the bench. Uh, <laughs> all right, but let me know if you're interested in a change of habit. <laughs> Hello there. Oh, hello. I've been watching you sitting there, and I wondered whom you were waiting for. Oh, just a friend. I see. I don't wish to seem inquisitive. Please don't misunderstand. It's only that your face struck me as being unusually bright and alive, as well as being uncommonly pretty. Thank you. Now, you see, I have a, an eye for faces. My son was a sculptor. He worked almost entirely with heads, and my job was choosing them. It's all very foolish. I'll admit, more so since he departed some time ago. Oh, I am sorry. Thank you. That's precisely why I was watching you. Of course, I know nothing about you any more than you do of me. But, by the way, what's your name? Susan Appleby. Mine is Elizabeth Masters. How do you do? I live just the other side of town. Oh. Let me come to the point, Susan. I admire your looks and I like the way you act and speak. <laughs> I'm not a young woman and I'm lonely. I have been ever since I lost my son. I need a companion, someone who can stay with me and help me too. And you resemble closely my very first companion, my best remembered one. Oh, but I... I'll pay you well, 30 pounds a month. <laughs> Your chief occupation will be to brew me some tea and talk to me. Are you interested? Well, I have been seeking that sort of a position, but I... Splendid. You need look no longer. But you know nothing about me. I know that I like you and that I want you to accept my offer. I'll return here at the same time tomorrow evening. If you do want the position, please be here. And believe me, I hope you are here. Good night, Susan. Good night. See you tomorrow at eight. All right. I'll be here. Dada. <laughs> what do you mean you'll be here? Oh, Rob, you <laughs> frightened me. Well, you were whistling our tune, so I thought you were expecting me. What do you think you're doing making dates with strange women? Well, believe me, she is a strange woman. Mrs. Masters? Oh, no, she's nice. And, Rob, she offered me a position. I'm doing what? As a companion. Just what I wanted in a 30 pounds a month, darling. No small sum, that. Too bad you can't manage it. But I'm thinking seriously of it, Bob. Well, stop that. I don't want you ever to have one serious thought about anything. Now, Rob, I'm going to take it. What do you know about the old hen? Nothing yet. Sue, did you look at the way she dressed? Hmm? Black from shoes to shawl. Why, the shawl's so large and black, you'd hardly know she had a face. She seemed charming. Oh, she might well be, but <laughs> I'm not so bad myself. Oh. And I want you for a companion, too. <laughs> Let's push the wedding date ahead, darling. Make it any time you will. Oh, now, we've gone through this so many times, and you know it can't be done. But with the way you're coming along, and with 30 pounds a month additional, why, Rob, in no time at all, we'll have all we need. You're an awfully stubborn fellow, darling. Oh, you know I'm right. How many evenings off will she allow you? We didn't get that far. Well, where's the place at, then? Well, that's strange. 
She left so quickly, I never had a chance to ask. Call it off, Sue. I... Well, why, Rob? Well, I don't like it. You know nothing about her, not even where she lives. Well, I told you I hardly spoke to her. Tomorrow I'll know everything. All right, my darling, you win. Oh. But let me hear from you as soon as you sit there. Well, of course I will. Why, everything's going to be fine. Ah, I'm silly. Sure it will. <laughs> Hello, darling. Hello, Rob. <laughs> everything will be fine for us. Tonight for Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Dame Whitty and Maureen O'Sullivan, whom you have heard in the prologue to The Black Shawl by R.R. R. Lewis. Tonight's study in Suspense. Far from the scene we have just left, far to the south across the equator, is another scene I ask you to visit with me. It is just before the dinner hour on the beautiful Ruth Terrace Cafe of the Hotel Metropolitano of Guayaquil, Ecuador. We are finishing our appetizers, an excellent sherry. And lifting your glass, you remark to our host that you envy him such wine. He laughs. You are very kind, he says, but it is your own California you must praise for this splendid wine. For you see, it is Roma, California sherry. Yes, in many far countries where discerning tastes have found Roma wines, it is a luxury imported and treasured. For Roma wines are in every sense fine wines from the rich vineyard country of California. Products of age-old winemaking skill aided by modern quality controls and tests. And here in the United States, Roma wines cost mere pennies a glassful because here there is no import duty, no overseas shipping costs. Such enjoyable flavor and constant quality, such low cost, such high wine values, have made Roma by far America's largest selling wines, enjoyed by millions with meals when entertaining any time. To enjoy these delights yourself, ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage Maureen O'Sullivan as Susan and Dame May Whitty as Mrs. Masters in The Black Shawl. A tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I was there waiting, as Mrs. Masters had instructed me, the following night. We got into her car, and she drove us off. It only seemed a mile or two from town, but we twisted and turned so many times that in the dark I became completely confused as to my whereabouts. Then finally, we stopped. There it is, straight ahead, down the path. Miss Appleby, welcome to Masters Hall. I'm in the parlor, Miss Appleby. Won't you join me in a cup of tea? Oh, thank you, Mrs. Masters. I'd be very grateful if I might. I love my room. Good. Mm. Sit down over there opposite me, won't you? I certainly will. The fire's as inviting as the tea. I've always had one burning whenever I'm home. I get cold so easily. That's why I always wear this shawl around me. Sugar? Thank you. No lemon or milk, thank you. Now, Susan, tell me about yourself. Everything, all you've done, all you see in the future for you. Oh, there's very little to tell. I've always lived here in town. I expect I always shall remain here. After you're married, you mean? I presume you've such intentions. I expect so. It is the only thing that matters, isn't it? Having someone to care for. Yes. I know. Before my son left me, I desired nothing. The scope of his talent was the world we lived in, and beautiful it was. I suppose love is like talent in that respect. It, too, creates a smaller world within the large one we inhabit and makes you want it never to disappear. Did his talents receive recognition? To a limited degree. Everyone saw in his work the promise of a truly great sculptor. 
The promise never bore fruit because he hadn't enough time. Winter came far too early in his life. How old was he? I lost him before he was 21. Oh, Mrs. Masters. That's terrible. So great a waste. That's it. You realize it too. The waste. To lose a useless thing, that can be forgiven. Or if the loss can't be helped, there's nothing we can say but... But to cast away genius. To kill it before it's reached its full expression. That no one can forgive. No one can forget. Oh, now, now, please, Mrs. Masters. We have no control over such matters. They're God's will. Of course. Thank you, dear. You're very sweet. I wish you more success in the world of your love. I'm sure you'll have more. Oh, that's kind of you. <laughs> Another good man ruined. <laughs> I should be insulted. Ruined by a woman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that's it. Smile, laugh. Life can be so short. Remember, my boy. Enjoy life while you may. I slept well that first night and did not awaken until almost nine. When I realized how late it was, I dressed quickly and ran downstairs. Mrs. Masters had left a note on the kitchen table telling me she'd gone shopping, that I was to take my breakfast and then wait for her. I looked around to see if I might do something, but everything was in perfect order. I looked for a phone, thinking I'd call Rob. But I could find none in the kitchen or the center hall. Finally, I thought I'd take a look at the outside, get a bit of fresh air. I went to the front door and tried it. It was locked. I turned the bolt and pulled. The door was still locked. I couldn't understand. Then suddenly I realized the door was locked from the outside. I ran to the kitchen, not afraid, but surprised. Then something struck me that I hadn't noticed before. All the kitchen windows were barred. I made a quick dash for the kitchen door. <gasps> Why, Susan. <sighs> good morning. Did you have a good night's rest? Oh, yes, I did, thank you. Fine. But you're trembling. Is there a chill in the house? You really should stay away from the doors. Oh, I know, but I wanted a breath of air. The front door was locked. Was it? Yes. Oh, I must have done it automatically. You see, I've lived alone for so long, and it's natural for a person who lives alone to lock all doors behind them when they go out. Uh -oh. Why are the windows barred? Oh, that goes back to the time my son did his work here. We had so much of it lying carelessly about all over the house. So much of value. Anyone might easily have climbed to the windows. Oh, of course. Oh, it's silly of me. For a moment, though, I felt so much like a... like a prisoner behind those bars. <laughs> An unusual experience for you, I take it. <laughs> a very unusual one. Now you're smiling again. That's fine. My boy always liked to see a smile on a woman's face. Without one, he always said they reminded him of... death. Yes. Death. <laughs> Next day, I wrote to Rob. Please come to see me now, Rob, if you can. Everything's all right. Don't worry about me, but come to me. It's unbelievable, but I must tell you that I still don't know the address here. I cannot tell you how to find it. But someone must know Mrs. Masters and can tell you where she lives. I want to send this off to you now, so I'll close. I can't tell you, darling, how great is my need to see you and my love for you, Sue. Mrs. Masters? Why, yes, Susan, what is it? Uh, where can I post a letter? Let me have whatever you want sent, and I'll drop it in the box when I go shopping tomorrow. Oh, I don't want to bother you. I'll take it down myself. No bother at all. There's nowhere else to post a letter, and I pass the box every day. Oh, but I, I'd much it's rather... It's settled. Let me have it. It'll be sent early tomorrow. Oh, of course. Here you are. Thank you. And, Susan, I dropped my shawl. Would you mind? Oh, not at all. Exquisite, isn't it? Will you join me in a cup of tea? No, thank you. Mrs. Masters, this morning I said I was silly for feeling like a prisoner in your home, but the feeling is still there. What have I done or said that might create any such impression? That's not the question I'm trying to answer. I just feel it. 
The answer I don't know is, what do you want with me? What was that? Wait right here. I'll be down shortly. Where are you going? Upstairs. But you wait down here, do you understand? Oh. No. No, I won't stay down here. I'm frightened. I'm coming up, too. No, dear. Don't worry about the bus. It hasn't broken at all. Oh, no. There's not a scratch on it. Dear, dear, please don't cry. Oh. Susan, I told you to stay downstairs. What'd you come up for? All right. You know now. Miss Appleby, this is John Masters, my son. Uh... Oh. Oh. That night at dinner, there were three of us. I couldn't bear to look at him. The twisted face, the dull, glazed eyes. Whimpering, grunting, unable even to speak a single intelligible word. And when I saw the two together, she with the horrible black shawl draped around her... I knew for certain that in her own way she was as mad as her son. And I knew more surely than ever how great was my own danger. Late that night, I packed my bag silently and swiftly. And I waited. It was well past midnight before I dared open my door and look out. The house was completely dark, upstairs and down. I felt my way along and started down the stairs. I reached the bottom... And went right to the front door first. Susan. <gasps> oh. Susan, where were you going? You couldn't possibly know your way about once outside the house. You'd surely have lost your way. Wouldn't she, John? Uh, uh, oh, stop it, stop it. Uh, All right. John, leave us now. Uh, John, dear, did you hear me? Uh, 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 uh. I must master. You have no right to keep me here if I don't wish to stay. Well, when I accepted this position, I was of the opinion that you lived alone. Conditions have changed, and now I wish to leave. Please, Susan. Believe me, I I don't blame you a bit. But think of me. Just for a single moment. Why do you think I asked you here? Do you believe it's so easy for me, chained to this lost thing? No one to talk to, day or night. I needed someone... I need you now. You told me he was dead. I never told you that. Only that he'd left me. And so he has. No. No, I won't stay. I go mad if I do. Very well, dear. It's no use trying to argue with you. But stay at least until tomorrow. You could never find your way tonight, and if you stay over, it'll give me a chance to find someone in town. I'd rather go now, if you you don't mind. Tomorrow night. Just until then. Even if I've no one... Well, you can leave after dinner tomorrow. I'll pay you two weeks' wages if you do. Please, you... You can't refuse me that. Well, I... I... Thank you. Thank you, dear Susan. I shouldn't have stayed. I knew that from the moment I agreed. I slept badly, waking from time to time certain that I heard odd noises from the next room. Low chuckles, whispered, voiceless muttering. But the night passed finally, and today was uneventful. When Mrs. Masters returned from shopping in the village, she informed me that my successor would arrive tomorrow morning, and I was therefore free to meet, leave immediately after dinner. She spent the rest of today preparing the evening meal. It was as though it were a special holiday, so great were the pain she took. The dinner turned out to be wonderful. And Mrs. Masters was extremely gracious. <laughs> dear Susan, we drink to you, my dear, dear Susan, to your future, to your man, <laughs> to your future with your man. <laughs> oh, thank you. And may you remember this evening all the rest of your days. You're very All fine. the rest of your days. Thank you. Not at all, not at all, my dear. Let me pour you out some more wine. And some for you, John. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm really sorry that I must hurt you by... Leaving you this way? You? Hurt me? Why, my dear, if anyone has been hurt, surely it's you. We frightened you so. Made you so miserable. You're the hurt one, Susan, dear. Not I. Anything I've felt or said is forgotten now. Always when I think of you, I shall remember this evening. I'm certain of it. 
And so you may remember better, my dear. Let me imprint the occasion still more clearly upon your mind. Do you know what happening it is we celebrate? Oh, I expected it was my leaving. So it is. But did it seem likely that you alone would cause so much excitement in our home? Well, I... I... Miss Appleby, this is the third anniversary of the most important event in the history of Master's Hall. We honor you by asking you to partake of our joy. Uh, uh, and I thank you for it. No need of that. You need only listen and be silent. Three years ago, my son was a genius. Today, he is my son. Three years ago, the world's door stood wide before us. Today, all the shoulders on earth couldn't break it down. It was shut upon us three years ago tonight. She slammed it as she left. My son loved her dearly. My first sweet companion. Uh, 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 I warned him. I told him that no woman would put up with his temperament. He wouldn't listen. He loved her madly. <laughs> madly. <laughs> the perfect word for it. And for that, she slammed the door on him. Slammed it in his face, his heart, his head. That night he lost the power of his mind. Ever since we waited in vain for its return... But we've honoured the occasion. <laughs> Don't think we've forgotten, eh, John? Uh, Two years ago this evening, on the first anniversary, Sally Thwaite left us. Uh, we told her the story. She was overwhelmed. She couldn't bear to stay and left quite suddenly. Last year, Catherine it was, Kitty, can't recall her last name at the moment. She wanted to leave us too. How could we refuse? And now, tonight, Susan Appleby. Tonight, Susan, you are leaving us. <laughs> Where are you going, Susan? To the kitchen. Excuse me, please. That is why I say I'm going to be murdered. <laughs> I can't know for sure. But the way they laugh. Uh -huh, the way they look, the way she sits there fingering that ugly, torn black shawl. The shawl that looks like death. What can I think? What can I do? Susan, there's one thing more. This shawl, so beautiful, so exquisitely wrought. You must surely have noticed that I wear it all the time. It belonged to her, a gift from my son. Uh, uh, in her haste, it slipped from her shoulders as she left. So this is all that remains of that lovely, wonderful creature. I should like you to wear it, if only for a moment. You're so much like her. And her memory is John's greatest comfort. Oh, no. No, don't come near me. Don't touch me. Please, just around oh, your shoulders. I won't wear it. Stay away from me. Please don't. Oh, oh. Our daughter. Who would be coming here now? John, watch her closely. I look through the window. Uh, uh, uh. I don't know who he is, but he must surely have seen the light in the kitchen. I'll just send him away. I'll only be a moment. Watch her, John. If she shouts for him. Well, you... You mustn't allow that, must you, John? Uh, 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 so you'd better be still, Susan. Yes? What is it you want? Uh, I beg your pardon. I'm looking for a Miss Susan Appleby. You won't find her here. I'm sorry. Well, are you certain of that? It seems to me I recognize that shawl. It was worn by the woman Miss Appleby went to work for night before last. Surely this is not the only black shawl in the world. Nor am I the only woman who wears one. And I've been inquiring in the village, and all the shopkeepers remembered you as the woman who always does. So I followed you here this morning. Then I returned to the village, and now I'm back again. Well, you can return right to the village. If you must know, Miss Susan Appleby was here. But she was entirely unsatisfied uh, as I could uh, have. Uh, you probably uh, at home now. Uh, well, all right. If she's gone home, I'll, I'll see her there. I'm so sorry for your trouble. Not at all. Thank you. Good day. Good day. Susan. Susan, was that you whistling a moment ago? I thought I told you to be still. Oh, I, I was nervous. It's a habit of mine. A very bad one, of which you've many. 
Among them, no doubt, is that of driving men mad. That one just now. The love in his eyes for you. I've seen that before. In other eyes. Mm. I'm so terribly sorry he's gone away. Perhaps he'll return another time. Stay away from me. Here now. The shawl's around oh. Draw it tighter, oh. down. Tighter. Oh. No, please. Oh. Let me go. Let me go. You heard her. Let her go. Oh. Adams, get him. Yes, sir. Draw it quickly, John. Quickly. Oh. Quickly. Oh. 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 No. No. You killed him. John. 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 Susan, darling. Oh, Rob. Rob, you heard me then? Of course. This morning I went down to the local constabulary and persuaded Adams here to join me. I was interested, ma'am, because there had been two disappearances in as many years. And just about this time, this sounded like a third. It almost ended like the others, too. Almost, but... After... He's locked the door. Let's have a hand here. We'll break it down. All right, oh. Watch out. Once we're in, she's mad and may try anything. Right. Let's go now. One, two, two three. three. All right, now. Well, look at that. The chandelier. Let's cut her down quickly. It's too late. Her neck's gone. Rob. The shawl. The black shawl. Oh. And so closes The Black Shawl, starring Dame May Whitty and Maureen O'Sullivan. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. To every woman listening tonight, I want to say a special word about making every dinner or supper you serve taste better. I want to urge you to start serving Roma wine with your meals. It's simple, the cost is very, very little, and it works magic in making food more enjoyable. You can serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you enjoy most of all. Try hearty red Roma California Burgundy or the delicately delicious Roma California Sauterne. The cost is mere pennies a glass, but you'll find even a pickup supper tastes like a banquet. Get Roma wines today. If your dealer is temporarily out of them, please try again soon. Just ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Dame May Whitty appeared through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and is currently being seen in the White Cliffs of Dover. Next Thursday, same time, Donald Crisp and John Loder will be our stars in another unusual study. Stars in another unusual study in mystery, suspicion, and dangerous adventure. At that time, you will hear the only ghost story ever to have been staged by... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California... For enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. The Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, welcomes you again to this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you as stars Miss Ida Lupino, currently being seen in Warner Brothers' In Our Time, and Mr. Vincent Price of 20th Century Fox, soon to be seen in the Daryl F. Zanuck production, Wilson. For the appearance of these two distinguished screen personalities, Lucille Fletcher has written a suspense play that deals with brooding anxiety and sharpening suspicion, played against the severe and forbidding background of the late Victorian era. And so with Fugue in C minor 
And with the performances of Ida Lupino and Vincent Price, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! First, 1900. Dear Bessie, this is just to let you know that I arrived in Pilotsville. Lizzie met me at the station. She's heartbroken about Papa's bankruptcy and for some reason feels that it's up to me to remedy the family situation. I told her I'd been offered a job, but she swept away that idea in horror. A girl with your looks, Amanda Peabody, doesn't have to get a job. There are too many rich husbands floating around for that. Furthermore, she says she has a rich husband already picked out for me right here in Pilotsville. Don't you remember? I told you about him at Christmas time. He's a Mr. Evans, rich as Croesus, charming, cultured, a lonely widower with two dear little children. And besides that, he's just your type, a real intellectual. You should hear him play the pipe organ. And you know, Bessie, I've met so few interesting men lately. And all you'd have to do is lift your little finger. Mr. Evans. Oh, good evening, Mrs. Chumley. How delightful to see you here. I'd like you to meet my sister. Mr. Evans, my sister, Amanda Peabody. Delighted, I'm sure. It's a lovely party, Mr. Evans. Thank you, Miss Peabody. Have you just come to Pilotsville? Yes. She's down from New York visiting me after the whirl of the hectic social season. Oh, indeed. <laughs> well, I'm afraid our Pilotsville society must seem a bit dull to you, Miss Peabody. Oh, no, not at all. It's charming. I've enjoyed everything so much tonight. Your beautiful house, the music. I hear you're going to play for us, Mr. Evans. Oh, a bit. Do you care for organ music, Miss Peabody? Oh, very much. I never miss a church recital. But what a luxury it must be to have your own pipe organ right here in the house. I'm afraid I couldn't do without it. It's my hobby, you know. Bach, Buxtehude, César Frank. Don't you adore their work? Oh, Amanda's very musical. You should hear her render the burning of Rome. <laughs> yes. And the delightful thing, of course, about having a pipe organ in the house is that it's everywhere. To sit at a keyboard and hear the walls, the ceilings, the floors vibrate. You see, Miss Peabody, I've had the pipes installed all over the house. Under this floor, for example, are all the choir stops. Up in the bedroom walls are the stops for the swell manual. In the great uh, 32-foot pedal stops, the giant diapasons are underneath the staircase. My children sleep next door to the echo chamber. <laughs> so, you see, we live like angels here in a paradise of music. How thrilling. Now, ladies, come upstairs to the second floor landing, won't you? And I'll show you the console. It was made for me in Vienna. And Bessie, dear, to tell you the truth, I really find him fascinating. I wish you could hear him play. It sweeps you off your feet. There is such wildness to it, and at the same time, such dignity. And to hear the sound all through that marvelous house, rolling through those gorgeous rooms with their beautiful tapestries and potted palms. I could sit and listen to him all night. You have the most amazing eyes, Miss Peabody. What are you thinking about? The music. Oh, please don't stop. It's so beautiful. Well, you seem to be as mad about music as I am. Your sister says you play too. <laughs> oh, no, only a little. My appreciation of it is all inside, I'm afraid. That's plenty. If one can't play, it's better just to enjoy the music of others. I can't bear this sentimental drumming. Can you? I shouldn't think you would enjoy it. The idiotic tunes people play nowadays. Give me the old stern classics. They have strength and power. Give me something with life to it. Something that will flood the whole house with sound. Marvelous. Uh, you're a very unusual girl, Miss Peabody. Quite unlike the run of girls here down here at Pilotsville. Yes, in what way? Oh, it's rather hard to explain. Uh, some more tea, Amanda. No, thank you. A muffin? No, thank you. 
You have an excellent cook, Mr. Evans. Please, please call me Theodore. You know, you promised. Theodore. Amanda. And your house is beautifully run, too. You must have an excellent housekeeper. Everything always looks so charming and quiet. I haven't even heard a peep out of your children. My children? Oh, yes, the children have been away at school. You have two, haven't you? Yes, Daphne and David. What sweet names. Ordinarily, I don't approve of schools for young children, but you see, they were rather overwrought. After Mrs. Evans passed on... Oh, I can well understand. They were almost morbidly devoted to their mother, and then, of course, the unfortunate circumstances of her death, but <laughs> I suppose your sister, Mrs. Chumley, has told you all about that. No, not very much, except your wife was killed in a street accident, wasn't she? Yes, in Philadelphia, a brewery wagon and four horses ran her down. Oh, how terrible. It's something I don't like to think about very often. Poor, beautiful Margaret... Well, it's like a nightmare, Amanda, and I still can't feel reconciled, but... Well, what I was driving at was the children. They were in school when she died, and by some malicious stroke of fate, there was an epidemic of scarlet fever raging up there. The authorities wouldn't lift the quarantine and let them out for her funeral. Oh, poor little things. Yes, it upset them dreadfully. In fact, I sometimes fear it's left a mark on them which may endure all their lives. Why, what do you mean? They suffer from delusions. Delusions about her... They think that in some way she is linked. Her soul is imprisoned in the organ pipes. How horrible. I wish I could do something about it. It's a frightful notion, but they won't... They don't let me play when they're at home. That echo chamber in particular next door to their bedroom. Yes. You know, it's nothing but an empty sealed room with a few wires. Of course, it's all because they never saw her dead. But they have a notion that she's, well, somehow hidden there. How ghastly. They really think that, do they? Children can think up such very strange things in their little minds. Can't they? Tonight for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as stars Miss Ida Lupino and Mr. Vincent Price, whom you have heard in the prologue to Fugue in C Minor. Tonight's tale of suspense. Let us look in on another scene for a moment. A smart dinner party at the internationally famous Hotel de Nacional de Cuba in Havana. One of the guests, a world-traveled American, sets down his wine glass and remarks that a truly fine wine always carries the unmistakable flavor of the particular vineyards from which it comes. Then, laughs his Cuban host, you must be homesick for California right now. For the wine you are enjoying so much is from America, from California. It is Roma wine. Yes, it's true. Our own wonderful vineyard country in California produces in Roma... Wines that discriminating people in other lands esteem as an imported delicacy. Yet you here at home can enjoy these distinguished Roma wines for mere pennies a glassful. You pay none of the expensive overseas shipping charges and duties. Daily with your meals or when entertaining or any time, you can delight yourself with the wonderful flavor that comes from age-old winemaking traditions perfected by modern quality controls and tests. Yes, only pennies a glass full for a treat you are certain to enjoy. For remember, Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. Roma, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Ida Lupino as Amanda Peabody and Vincent Price as Theodore Evans in Fugue in C Minor. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense! April 18th. I met the children today, Bessie, for the first time. It was a shock. They're strange little creatures, utterly unlike their father... The girl is about 11 and the boy 8. They were both dressed in deep mourning. Their large grey eyes seemed strained with terror. They listened and trembled at every sound. This is Miss Peabody, children. She's a very good friend of mine. Now I want you both to shake hands with her. Oh, come now, Daphne. 
You can at least tell Miss Peabody how old you are. Oh, no. Please don't press her. I know when I was a little girl, I hated people to talk about my age. I'd much rather hear about, well, about school. We're not going back there, no matter what anybody says. David. That's all right. Then you didn't like school. No. And Mommy didn't like it either. She cried when we went away. Oh. But your mama wanted you to be educated, didn't she? She wanted you to grow up and be intelligent people, didn't she? Well, didn't she, Daphne? Who are you? You may call me Aunt Amanda. I'm a friend of your papa's. Do you know where my mama is? Your mama? Well, your mama's in heaven, dear. No, she's not. Then where is she, dear? Please, please don't start them off, Amanda. It's too upsetting. Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music, like old times. You remember when your mother was alive? We all used to play together. David, you with your cornet and Daphne at the violin, and Mama at the piano. Well, Miss Peabody plays the piano, too. And she's promised to play Narcissus, Mama's favorite piece. Well? Well, perhaps some other time, Theodore, when they don't feel so strange. I tell you, I've humored them to death. Now, come, David. There's your cornet on the mantelpiece. And Daphne? No. I insist. Look, now, I'll start the melody on the organ. David, you come in with your cornet obligato in the third measure. Daphne, you can follow me. Funny noise. What note? Oh, oh, you mean that? Oh, that's just a cipher. A wire must have stuck somewhere. One of the pipe valves. It's Mama. That's where Mama is. She's calling for us. Oh, don't be silly. I'll just hit the key a few times and it'll stop. You've heard these ciphers before, haven't you, Miss Peabody? Well, I don't know much about pipe organs. It's organ. a common technical occurrence, but very annoying, of course. What is she doing in there? Why doesn't it stop? That's where she is. She's in the pipe and she can't get out. Daphne, stop that nonsense. Oh, hush, dear. Your papa will fix it. No, he won't. He can't. She won't let him because he killed her. Daphne. Daphne, what did you say? Oh, she didn't mean it, I'm sure. The poor little thing's hysterical. We should never have tried to persuade them. Oh, man. Just because they never looked upon her face, because they never saw her lying there in the coffin. Hush, hush. My own children believe that I am a murderer. Theodore, you're making them both sick. As though I, I who loved their mother so much, who was so devoted for 12 years, do I look like a murderer, Amanda? Do I? No. There it is again. It's Mama. It's Mama. Shh, dear. I'll take them upstairs for you, Theodore, while you try and fix it. April 24th. Oh, Bessie. Those poor little children. We took them out to the cemetery today to show them her grave. A marble angel guarded it. It was planted with pure white tulips. How final it was and peaceful. And yet they began to tremble again the moment we set foot inside the house. Poor Theodore. The man is nearly out of his mind. What can he do? I keep asking myself that question. She died in Philadelphia, you say? Yes, on May 15th, just a little less than a year ago. You weren't with her? No, she went there to take a piano lesson. There was a new teacher she'd heard about. She was always so self-conscious about her technique. But she never reached his studio. They notified me at midnight from the city morgue. And no one in Philadelphia saw her? No one except the attendants at the morgue, of course, and the people who picked her up after the collision. It was such a brutal accident. There'd be no one from among them who could speak to the children, explain to them. Oh, no. Oh, it's so horrible, so sordid. Oh, I know, my dear. I hate to make you suffer. But if we could find some way, if they could just believe. When you brought her back here to Pilotsville, there was a funeral. Yes. And was there anybody then who saw her? Oh, no, I couldn't bear it, Amanda. I... I didn't think at the time she'd been so beautiful. Her lovely, sweet, gentle face and her eyes. The horses had completely trembled. Oh. Even if the children had been able to come home, I wouldn't have let them look. The coffin was sealed when I left Philadelphia. I didn't want to see her again myself. But there was a funeral. People came. There were flowers, an undertaker. Yes. Well, if they could believe that, if there was one witness... Perhaps my 
my own sister Lizzie. Funeral, Amanda? Of course there was a funeral. The finest funeral in town. A snow white hearse and 25 coaches. Everybody sent flowers. The casket wasn't open, but I've been to lots of funerals where they don't open the casket. And from what I understand, she was pretty badly mangled. But it was a beautiful funeral. Mr. Evans played the organ himself, the finest selections, all the sweet old pieces his wife liked. There was Narcissus and Mighty Lack Rose and Goodbye Forever. That's the way it was. So you see, David, my sister, Mrs. Chomley, was fair. Yes, but how did she know it was Mama? Oh, David. Uh... She didn't see Mama, did she? Well, nobody saw your poor Mama, dear. She wouldn't have wanted anyone to see her. Mommy wasn't there. She talks to us every night. She tells us to look for her. Where, dear? In the pipes. But, David, your mama's dead. She's been dead for nearly a year. Now, you she... saw her grave out in the cemetery. She's happy and at rest. Why doesn't Papa give us the key? If he'd only let us have it, we could look for her. What key, dear? The keys to the pipes. There's a little door. Just underneath the stairs. That's where they... That's where the big pipes are. And inside it's all dark. But where are the... But there are... There are tunnels. There's a little room. A little on, room. Dear. That's Please. where she's hiding. That's where Mommy is. Oh. That's where Mommy is. Oh, David, darling, now look, come here. No... I hate you. But why do you hate me? Why don't you let me help you? Because... Because what? Because you... you like him. Him? Papa, you're going to marry him, aren't you? Yeah. Yes, you are. Safina says you are. You're going to marry him. Then he'll send us back to school. There'll be no one left to help Mama. Poor Mama will never be left out. Oh, I hate you, I hate you. David... What are you doing here? David, did you strike Miss Peabody? He's sick, Theodore. I'm sure he's very sick. Now go to your room at once. Oh, those dreadful children. I tell you, Amanda, they'll ruin whatever happiness we might have. Theodore, I love you very much. But I couldn't marry you. Not with that child's cry ringing in my head. We've got to help them. Give them that key. Let them go and look in the room where the pipes are. Then they'll see for themselves that there's no ghost. Key? Who told you about a key to that room? The children. The children? Amanda, I'm going to tell you something. Something I've tempered, never told to a living soul. It, it may frighten you. Yes. Margaret was going mad when she died. Oh. No one knew it but me. It ran in her family. I discovered it long after we were married, after the children were born. Otherwise, I'd never... And now you think the children? I'm afraid so. It was peopling of sound she had, just like them. A fear of the dead's returning. She used to play... What's that? Sounds like the organ. But the motor isn't on. The console was locked when I left. Someone's trying to play. No one but me can touch that instrument. It's forbidden in this house and the servants are out. Unless those children... Come upstairs, Amanda. Theodore. Why, there's no one here. No one at the keyboard. The organ's playing itself. That's impossible. The motor's not going. The motor? Yes, it sets the bellows going. There's no air in the pipes unless it's on. No air to make the pipes speak. It's impossible, I tell you. Perhaps the children found the key and got in. Key? No, no, no. The key's here in my pocket. There's no other way in. No. Theodore, open that door. Go in there and see what's happening, please. No. Theodore. I won't give in. I I won't be a prey to it. Do you hear? I, I won't. I, I won't. I won't. It stopped now. Yes. It was probably really nothing but the wind. Theodore, give me the key. I'm not afraid. Are you saying that I am? I don't know. But I'll be fair with you, Theodore. I couldn't marry you and live here with that any more than your children can. What do you mean? Rip out those pipes. Rip out the whole pipe organ. Give it to a church, but don't keep it here. Get rid of it's the pipe worth... organ? Yes. But I couldn't. The whole house was built around it. It's been the very soul and spirit of this home. It's been the curse, you mean. Theodore, I know I'd go mad, too, if I had to listen to it night and day. It's so hollow. To think of those pipes so huge down there in the darkness. I'd begin to hear things, too. 
Oh, I can't. Be quiet. Be quiet. Come outside. We'll take a walk. No. No, give me the key. Give me the key. You're hysterical, Amanda. I'm sorry I've overburdened you. Why don't you want to go in there? Is it because you know something? You did something. What do you mean? Did you kill her? Amanda. <laughs> Very well, Amanda. Here's the key. If that's the way you trust me, we'll go down and look around together. Come now, Amanda. I'm sorry, Theodore. It slipped out. It was a dreadful thing to say. It's all right, I understand. Yet it hurts a little. I've trusted you so completely, Amanda. Theodore. Yes, Amanda. Let's not go in there. I do trust you, darling. I, I believe everything you've told me. No. <laughs> this little key... To think it should mean so much. Oh, how black it is. Yes, pitch black. And cold. Where are the pipes? I can't see them. Come in further, Amanda. You'll see them as soon as your eyes grow accustomed to the darkness. The biggest pipes pack this well under the great staircase like giants. Oh, yes, I, I'm beginning to see them now. Shouldn't we go and get a candle? Oh, no, no. Go in a little further. Be careful. The floor is a maze of wires. Now stand there for a second. Theodore, don't leave me. I won't be long. I thought you said you weren't afraid. No, I'm not only... Where are you going? Just upstairs to play for you. Theodore! I'd like you to hear how the music sounds in the darkness. It's quite an experience being so close to the pipes... You know, narrow, suffocating, especially when I pay the great Passacaglia and fugue of Bach. Oh, Theodore, please. I don't want to stay Perhaps here. Perhaps one of the Rheinberger symphonies or the great chorales of Cesar Frank. <laughs> Margaret, of course, preferred Narcissus. Margaret? Now, you're very gullible, Amanda. Then you did kill her. You killed her in this room. And you're going to kill me. Yes, simple, isn't it? But why? I don't why? know. One gets tired every now and then of mere music. Sometimes the classics demand competition. A scream, for example. There's something so exciting about pulling out all the stops and drowning out all human sound. Have you ever tried to match your voice, Miss Peabody, against the thunderous voice of Bach? It's most effective. And then when the struggle gets weaker, when the air is almost gone and you choke and gasp for breath... To bring the music down, softer, softer. Theodore, you're mad, you're mad. Come, Amanda, would you deny me that pleasure? No, I Help. promise you the concert Help. will be too long. It takes about eight hours before the air gives out. But you know, I could play for days. And don't worry about the children. I think you've convinced them about the ghost. What's that? Theodore! Someone shut the door. It's locked and the key's outside. Who's there? Let me out! Let me out! Theodore. Get away from me. Let me out to you here. Let me out. Let me out. I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. It's so dark. I can't breathe. Let me out. Please. Please. I can't breathe. I can't. No. No, no. I can't. I can't. Let, let me out. I can't breathe. <laughs> I shall be coming home in a few days, Bessie. I still can't sleep at night. I still hear that laughter. Still hear that cornet playing its unearthly music. And Theodore Evans once more lies dead at my feet. It was his heart, Bessie. He died of fright. In those few moments, he anticipated the hideous fate he had meted out to so many. And I might have died there if he had not gone so quickly. But the children hated me. They wanted to kill us both. Those terrible, pathetic children. What horrors they must have sensed in that charnel house. There were other women beside his wife. The police found them all buried and stuffed away into unused parts of the pipe organ. 
You see, I was in that pipe room alone with him for four hours before that door creaked open. There they stood. And I shall never forget their faces or the things they said. All right, Miss Peabody. You can come out now if you're really sorry. I'm sorry. Are you sure he's quite dead? Yes, he's dead. We were right all the time, weren't we, Miss Peabody? Yes, you were right. Now, will you come and help us find Mama? And so closes Fugue in C Minor, starring Miss Ida Lupino and Vincent Price. Tonight's tale of... Suspense! Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Of all the rich treasures man gets from the earth and mother nature, none has been more highly esteemed than wine. Good, delicious wine. And if you are one who does not yet know how much and how delightfully Roma wines add to your meals... Well, let me urge you not to miss out any longer on such a treat as this. There's nothing complicated about it. Just get and serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try the many different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you like best of all. Try Roma California Sherry with its wonderful nut-like flavor as an appetizer or ruby red Roma Burgundy or the deliciously delicate flavored Roma Sauterne. These superb wines cost you only pennies a glassful. And yet, they make even the simplest meal taste like a million dollars. Get some today. And if your dealer is temporarily out of Roma, please try again soon. You owe it to yourself to have and regularly enjoy R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Ida Lupino. Mr. Spear has just been telling me a little about next week's suspense show. The star will be Thomas Mitchell in a story about a man who had headaches, tried everything to cure them, finally went to a psychiatrist and found out that he was a murderer. That certainly sounds like a broadcast we listeners won't want to miss. One more word. Don't forget to buy that war bond this week. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Thomas Mitchell and Donald Crisp in... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our stars tonight are Miss Agnes Moorhead and Mr. Ray Collins. You have seen these two expert and resourceful players in Citizen Kane, The Magnificent Amberson, in which Miss Moorhead's performance won her the 1942 Film Critics Award. Mr. Collins will soon be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mayer Technicolor film, Salute to the Marines. Miss Moorhead and Mr. Collins return this evening to their first love, the CBS microphone, to appear in a study in terror by Lucille Fletcher called The Diary of Sophronia Winters. The story told by this diary is tonight's tale of suspense. If you've been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold a solution until the last possible moment. 
and so it is with the diary of Sophronia Winters and the performances of Agnes Moorhead and Ray Collins, we again hope to keep you in suspense. February 1st, St. Petersburg, Florida. I, Sophronia Winters, have hereby begun this diary because on this date I feel for the first time that I've begun to live. Diaries are no good unless one has thrilling experiences. For 40 years I've never had what could really be called a thrilling experience. But Papa's death has changed everything. Here I am in beautiful St. Petersburg with everything to start life anew. Money in my purse, two suitcases full of new clothes, and a gorgeous new permanent wave. And Florida is really the land of romance. It doesn't matter whether you're 17 or 70. There are parties and dances and bingo games and flirtations for all. My landlady, in fact, tells me that people often become engaged and even married to perfect strangers overnight. I'm still shy, of course, but just the same. It's such fun and so thrilling to think one's fate may be just around the corner. February 3rd. Oh, diary, it is beginning. This morning when I came out of my lodging house to go down to the beach, I noticed a man, a thrilling-looking man, sitting across the street on a bench. It was just as though he were waiting for me, because when I came out, he sort of started up as though he knew me. Of course, I didn't speak first, but I knew the minute I started down the street that he was following me. Well, I got to the beach and sat down with my magazines, and suddenly there he was, strolling toward me with a broad smile. Well... Sitting out here all by your lonesome? Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Didn't I see you last night over at the Starfish Tea Room? The Starfish Tea Room? Mm hmm. Oh, yes, yes, I was there yesterday. But it was so crowded, I'm afraid I don't recall. Quite a nice cuisine they've got over there. Uh, mind if I sit down beside you? Oh, not at all. Oh, oh just a minute. Uh, sit on this magazine. The beach is so sandy. Oh, sand doesn't bother me. I'm from <laughs> Maine, you know. We get plenty of sand up there. Do you? You've been down here at St. Pete long? Oh, just three days. Three days? That's a long time. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder I didn't spot you before. Oh, Mr. Uh, Johnson's the name, Hiram Johnson. Oh. I come from Green Harbor, Maine. Run a big hotel up there, Summers. Oh. Well, that's my whole history in a nutshell. My name's Sophronia. Sophronia Winters. Sophronia? Uh huh. Well, you know, that's quite a coincidence. My sister-in-law's name was Sophronia. Oh? Sophronia Johnson. You ever heard of her? She looked quite a bit like you, too. Sophronia Johnson? No, I'm afraid I haven't. Who was she? Someone very famous? <laughs> I'm so ignorant about these things. Oh, that's all right. Say, look at that sun, will you? I'd say it was pretty nearly time for lunch. And diary, darling, he is wonderful. Strong and kind, warm-hearted. So generous. I don't want to be like the other silly women in this town, but Hiram is different. There's, there's something almost poetic about him, something sad and, and deep. You know, Sophronia, it's kind of mysterious us finding that nine-point starfish on the beach together. My sister-in-law, Sophronia, used to collect nine-point starfishes. And to think your name, Sophronia, and you find a nine-point starfish with me. Well, it kind of draws us together, eh? Huh? What do you think? Completely. As though I'd known him all my life. My landlady says it's foolish. But look at Romeo and Juliet. Weren't they foolish? What's the good of waiting, Sophronia? I've got to be back at the hotel in a week. We we may never see each other again. Oh, Hiram, don't say that. I I couldn't bear it. Then let's do it right away. Tomorrow? There's a parson out on Coral Avenue who'll do the job for us. We can take a nice moonlight drive out to the alligator farm afterward, have a nice shore dinner, then climb on board the Orange Blossom tomorrow night for Maine. Oh. Just think of Maine. The big dark pine woods, the sand, the bay. The two of us alone together. The two of us alone together. February 7th, on board the Orange Blossom. I was married in a wedding dress of Alice Blue Moiré with a frill of white organdy at the collar and wrist and a rhinestone belt buckle. Hiram sent me talisman roses. I'm pressing one precious flower between the pages of this diary for luck. You see it beyond 
understand in a couple of minutes. Uh, bags heavy? No, not particularly, dearest. Oh, I can't get over that taxi manifestation. Imagine his insolence, saying he couldn't drive us over. <laughs> Maybe he didn't have any gas. It's happened sometimes around here. Well, anyway, I'm glad the weather's so mild. Can you imagine what it would be like in a blizzard? There's the place. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to look until I put down these bags. <sighs> now, where? There. Through those big pine trees. Oh. Oh, it is big, isn't it? 125 rooms. So many fire escapes and balconies and porches and towers. <laughs> I, uh, I stayed in a hotel like that once years ago with Papa. It was very fashionable there. My grandfather built that place 50 years ago. Hasn't been changed much since. No? <laughs> well, of course, you've put in modern plumbing. Not yet. Here we are. Walk in. Oh, what's that? Just a foghorn out in the bay. Fog? We get it almost every night in this kind of weather. What are you locking the gate for? Why not? There's nobody coming in after us. Or going out again for a while. But I, I thought you said the hotel. The hotel is empty. Hiram. What is it now? Hiram, darling, I know it sounds silly, but but let's not go in there tonight. Let's let's wait until morning. Why? Oh, just because it's so dark and empty, there's not a light in the whole place, and no one's expecting us. What do we eat? Where will we sleep? Let's stay in the village just for tonight. I've got things to eat, a place to sleep. Come on. Oh, my arm. Hiram. Hiram. Do you remember my telling you down in Florida about my sister-in-law, Sophronia? Well, that's her over there on the wall. Take a look at her. Hiram, you hurt me. Oh, well, this glass is very dusty. She must have died many years ago. But her face is sweet, very sweet. And her eyes, it, there's something very sad and wistful about her eyes. She was a murderess. She was hanged in Portland 25 years ago for the murder of my brother Ephraim here in the lobby of this hotel. She murdered him in cold blood with an axe. That fire axe hanging over there on the wall. Hiram. It was a summer day. There were guests sitting out on the front porch in the rockers. It was just after lunch. My brother Ephraim was sitting at the desk counting his loose change. My mother was crocheting in that old wicker rocking chair. Sphronia came downstairs humming a hymn. Oh, don't, Hiram. Please, please don't tell me any more. Why not? Well, it makes me nervous to hear it like this in this big shadowy lobby. And, and your eyes, Hiram, your eyes. Hiram, you're acting so strange. Hiram, what's the matter with you, dear? I, I know it was a terrible tragedy, but it happened 25 years ago. Don't touch me, Sophronia. Don't touch you. Do you remember what I said to you in Florida? What did you say? Well, you, you said a million sweet and wonderful things to me, Hiram. I said you resembled my dead sister-in-law. Look at her again. Look at her closely. The Fronia. But why? Oh, no, no, I can't. It's too horrible. I can't look at her face with any pleasure now, knowing she was a murderess. You're afraid to look at that, it? No, no, I'm not afraid. Hiram! Hiram, please, my arm! Oh, very well. I'll look. Now, stand there quietly. Like that. Take off your glasses. Uh, that's all I wanted to see. That's all I wanted to see. February 13th, Green Harbor Hotel, Maine. I can't understand it. I try to fathom it, but my head aches and my heart is heavy. The hotel is deserted has been for 25 years. Everything is covered with spiders and cobwebs. The great dining room with its oak woodwork is alive with rats. And the row of broken rocking chairs on the front porch faces emptily out to sea. Does he mean this to be my home? He's downstairs in the shabby parlor, off the lobby playing the harmonium. Mm. 
earlier. Yes? Yes, Hiram? Sleeping? Uh, no, dear. Why is your door locked? Come out. I want to show you around the place. It's all right, dear. I, I've seen it. I, I've seen just about everything. No, you haven't. You haven't seen the grounds at all. The grounds? But, Hiram, it's after midnight. I want to show you where my sister-in-law, Sophronia, is buried. Well, no, not tonight, dear. Please, it's so late and I, I have a headache. Open the door, Sophronia. I want you to come now. No, no, I shan't. Oh, go away. Let me alone. I won't. I... I won't, I won't. No use carrying on like that. You oh. see, I, I have pass keys to all the doors. Beyond, where those four birches are standing, it's where my sister-in-law, Sophronia, was laid away 25 years ago. It was the biggest funeral in the neighborhood. Folks crowded outside the gate with the dozens trying to get a look, but we wouldn't let them. Buried her ourselves without a service out here by herself on the grounds. Ephraim is buried in town, but not Sophronia. I had a feeling I'd have to keep an eye on her even then. Keep an eye on her? I knew she was one of those restless sleepers who wouldn't stay quiet in her own grave. I knew before the year was out she'd find some way to start roaming around, hunting for mischief again. She was a young she-devil to the core, Sophronia. And they could hang her till doomsday. Wouldn't do any good. You mean... You mean the... You think she haunts this hotel? No, no, not this hotel. She never had any use for it, alive or dead. No. She makes for the warmer climates. She was always a cold-blooded little fish, freezing and shivering all the time. It's places like California and Texas. And Florida, she makes for. Florida? Yes, that's one of her favorite haunts, particularly around St. Pete. She likes the flowers and the sun and the romance. Hiram, I feel cold. Do you mind if I go inside just now? Just a minute, just a minute. I, I haven't explained everything. You think I'm crazy, I guess. Crazy. But I'm a lot smarter than some people give me credit for. Because, you see, I have found her now. Three times. Do you see that grove of birches over there? Under every one of them's a grave. I found her wandering the earth in disguise three times. And I've killed her three times. Mm. It still doesn't do any good. She's still restless. You... You mean you... You killed three different women? So now I keep another open grave to remind her. It's waiting now. Would you like to see it? Sophronia? No, Hiram. No, no, please, I... Are you afraid to see it, Sophronia? No, I... Hiram, you don't mean to say that you think... Just because my name happens to be Sophronia and that, that I look a little like... Think I... what, Sophronia? Nothing. February 14th. My mind is made up. I've made a terrible mistake and I must get away from this place. I must get away from Hiram as quickly as I can. <coughs> it should be easy. There's no fog today. If I can only escape from the hotel, I can run and hide in the pine woods. No. No. I shall wait for dusk when he generally sits down in the parlor and plays the harmonium. <coughs> I can hide a little earlier in one of the deserted rooms, and, and, and then, when his back is toward the lobby, slip out the front door. <coughs> Sophronia? Sophronia? Sophronia! Oh, there you are. What's the matter? Anything wrong? No, Hiram. You didn't want anything outside, did you? Because if you do, you'll have to ask me to get it for you. You see, I always keep the front door locked. Yes, Hiram. Yes, the back door, too. And all the doors leading out into the porches and fire escapes. 
and a good many of the windows would make one feel safe from thieves <coughs> and peeping toms. <coughs> oh, you've got a cold. That's too bad. Yes. I must have caught it last night. Outdoors. The damp. You ought to be in bed. A good bed. The only good bed in the house is in my sister-in-law, Sophronia's old room. No, no, Hiram. I, I, I'm all right. Is, is this a little head cold? Oh, little head colds <laughs> often develop into pneumonia. Why, it's too bad I didn't think of that before. You might have slept in it from the beginning. Here, up these stairs. What? What's the matter? Are you so weak? No. No, I'm all right. This room is the cleanest in the hotel, too. I've always had a sort of suspicion about it. You see, I've kept everything as it was. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. It's just... It seems kind of familiar. No, no, no. It, it, it's just that seeing it so clean, seeing it as though someone were living here, as, as, as though they it only just stepped out for a moment. It's as she left it that afternoon when she walked down to murder my brother. You see her needlework on the table with the needle sticking in it? And her hymn book still open? Mm. She was very fond of singing hymns, Sophronia was. Had a nice voice, too. I used to accompany her. Uh. I'll turn down the bed for you. Then you can get undressed while I go and make you some hot tea. No, I don't want any. Here's the closet. You can put on one of Sophronia's dressing gowns. diary. I'm beside myself. I shall go mad. I shall go mad. Two hours of pack and see locked the door upon me. Night's fallen and I'm alone. Alone in this horrible room with its hideous little mementos of death. I, I'm sitting here at her little wicker table trying to be calm, trying to write this. Somehow when one writes about a thing, it, it doesn't appear so real. My hand is just Rushed against her needlework. Her hymn book. Where they still lie. Waiting. I can bear having them near me no longer. I must get them out of sight. Anywhere. In that closet. A bureau door. Ready for your tea? No. Uh, yes, Hiram. Why aren't you in bed? You'll take worse cold, you know. I'll get in bed in a minute. Uh, first, I... Oh! Brushing up on your needlework again? My needlework? You've got it in your hand. Have I? Oh, oh yes. Yes, so I... Uh, but I, I wasn't working on it, Hiram. I swear I wasn't. I, I, I've never done a stitch of needlework in my whole life. I don't know one embroidery stitch from another. Let me show you. Look, I don't even know how to hold a needle. Get into bed, Sophronia. You're feverish. Before we go on, Hiram, before you go on thinking, I, I, we've got to have an understanding. You've got to let me explain. I... I I was born in 1892 in Kalamazoo, Michigan. My name is Sophronia, that's true, but they name lots of people Sophronia. I, I, I was named for my grandmother. She had just died. No, 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 you've got to listen to me. I've lived in Kalamazoo all my life. If you'd only just write a letter or send a wire. Well, I've never heard of Green Harbor in my whole life. I, I never went anywhere. For almost ten years, I stayed home day in and day out nursing Papa. He, he had a stroke. I wasn't out of the house. It was a red brick house in the green shot. February 15th. Now I live only from moment to moment, listening to each creak upon the stairs. <coughs> I've been in bed all day. It's night now. A foghorn has begun to blow again. February 19th. I, I woke up early this morning after a wretched night and... And the date was burning in letters of fire in my brain. If he's planning to kill me, it'll be today. But the hours have been crawling on. It's almost midnight. Oh, why, if he's going to kill me, doesn't he do it at once? Why does he torture me like this? I'd rather be dead than sit here in this room one moment longer. I can't bear it. If he doesn't come in five minutes, I shall force him to come. I shall beat on the door. I know. No. Rather let me sit quiet praying that he doesn't come. 
Oh, I want to live. I want to live. Sophronia! She's come. Sophronia, come downstairs. I want you to sing me a hymn. He, he never asked me to sing for him before. But she sang. I, I can't sing, dear. I, I told you that long ago. Did you? Well, I'd forgotten. And besides, how can I come downstairs when my door is locked? It's unlocked. Try it. Unlocked? Oh, no. How could it be? It is, and I never know it. I never know it. <clears throat> Coming? He unlocked it. Sometime while I was just sitting, oh, why didn't I try a few more times? Why did I just sit there assuming? No. No, he'd have caught me anyway. He'd have known me. But I might Oh, now it's too late. He's going to kill me. Sophronia. Yes, Hiram. I'm coming. Hiram, where are you? In here. In the parlor. What are you doing there, Hiram? Waiting to hear you sing. You're at the harmonium? Yes. All right. I'll sing. I haven't sung in years, but I might as well. I'll sing for you out here in the hall. My voice will carry better. It always did carry better in the hall, didn't it, Sophronia? So you remember that, too. Of course, you know both the front and back doors are locked. Play a few bars, Hiram, dear, to warm me up. Shall I sing, too, Sophronia? Would you like me to sing along with you? If it pleases you, Hiram. Work for the night is coming. Work in the morning sun. Work for the night is coming. When man's work is done. Shall I read it to you? Yes. Yes, go ahead. March 22nd. I've been sick, I think, for a very long time. The pages of my diary are blank, but I shall take you out again, poor diary, today and start you over again. No. No, I shall never look back at the other pages. I shall only write on and on about this beautiful place so that no one reading this diary will ever know that I did it. <laughs> but I did do it, diary. I was smarter than he. When I opened that door at the head of the stairs and heard the music, when I saw the fire axe still hanging on the wall. <laughs> Oh, I was so cautious. 
so terribly cautious. I tiptoed like a little mouse, even as I sang the hymn into that room where he was playing. But I was clever, so much cleverer than he. I kept on singing, and now I'm free, free as a bird. I'm free, and he shall never catch me now, not this time or ever again, because, because he's dead. Isn't he, nurse? Nurse, isn't my dear brother-in-law, Hiram, really dead? Yes, miss, he's dead. And now I'll thank you to hand me that diary. The doctor doesn't approve of the patient's writing anything. <laughs> And so closes the diary of Sophronia Winter, starring Agnes Moorhead and Ray Collins. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when Richard Dix, Gail Page, and Montague Love star in Death Flies Blind. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Mahowick, the composer, and Lucille Fletcher, the author collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, Roma Wines present. Suspense. Tonight, You'll Never See Me Again, starring Joseph Cotton. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now, a glass full would be very pleasant as Roma Wines bring you Suspense. This is the Man in Black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, who tonight from Hollywood bring you a star, Mr. Joseph Cotton. And so with Cornell Woolrich's story of marriage and murder, called You'll Never See Me Again, and with the performance of Mr. Cotton as an American husband named Ed Bliss, we again hope to keep you in suspense. So... You're walking out on me. What does it look like to you? Like you're walking out on me? Got everything you need? Well, at least I'm glad you're showing your true colors. I'd rather have found it out now than later. Didn't take you long, did it, baby? If you're looking for your coat, it's in here. Thanks. Need any money? I don't need anything from you, including your wedding ring. There! And you know what you can do with it. Sure, a hock it. Well, pick a nice, quiet hotel. I don't have to pick a hotel. I'm no orphan. And when you get good and sick of it, come on back and maybe I'll still be here. You'll still be here. You'll never see me again as long as you live. <laughs> You'll never see me again as long as you live. You'll never see me again as long as you live, she said. If I'd known then what I know now, I guess that, that wouldn't have sounded so funny. All right. Maybe I'm not the easiest guy in the world to get along with, but it's perfectly natural for a couple to have at least one good fight after they've been married nearly three months. And I just wasn't going to be the first one to say uncle, that's all. Still, you don't wait around forever when your wife walks out on you, even if you are playing hard to get. So the third evening, I put in a call. I knew all along she'd head for a mother's place, and anyway, she'd practically told me where she was going when she left. Hello? 
Oh, uh, hello. Is this uh, Mrs. Alden? Yes. Oh, this is Ed, uh, Janet's husband. Oh, oh, yes. How, how is Janet? Isn't she there with you? With me? Why, no. Isn't she with you? No. That was all I needed to hear. Grabbed my hat and headed for the bus station. That was the only way she could have possibly gone to her mother's place at that time of night, by bus. At first, I wanted to find out if there was anybody who could positively identify her as having left. The guy at the ticket office wasn't very bright. To West Hampton? Yeah. Well, seems like I remember somebody like that. It would have been Monday night, just about this time. West Hampton, Monday night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, maybe... Couldn't be sure, though. Never mind. Give me a ticket. Uh, where to? Where do you think? West Hampton. She was blonde, blue eyes, good looking. Uh, sure, sure. I remember her. Where'd you get off? I, uh, think it was West Hampton. Come for all lock. I, I just wanted some information. Huh? Can you tell me where the Aldens live? Alden? Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're those new people. Yeah. Well, you, you go up the crossroad there and then turn to your left, go on down the hill. It's the one, two, three, let me see. No, fourth driveway on your right. Did uh, anyone ask you how to get there last Monday night? Oh, we're closed Monday. Thanks. It's the fourth driveway on your right. <laughs> Somebody lost their way. Yes? I'm uh, Ed Bliss, Janet's husband. Oh, 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 yes. Uh, uh, come in, Ed. I've been looking forward so much to meeting you. I wish it could have been under different circumstances, though. Yeah. Hey, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, oh, haven't you heard anything yet, Ed? No, me. I no, can't understand it. Yet. It's not like her to do a thing like that. Oh, Ed, I... Pardon me. I, I want you to meet... Mr. and Mrs. Farley. We were just playing a little bridge. How do you do? Yes. How do you do? And this is my husband, Joe Alden. <laughs> Guess that makes him your stepfather-in-law, doesn't it? Uh, Joe, this is Ed Bliss. How do you do? Nice to meet you, Ed. Well, I guess we'd better be going. Yes, I guess we had. I do hope that your wife... I mean... Well, uh, I wouldn't worry about oh, that. Oh, uh, you heard about it, did you? Well, Ed, you see, they dropped in a little while after you phoned, and we thought... Oh, that's all right. Well, uh, thanks for asking us over. Uh, come again real soon. Yeah, we'll do that. We now, will. I hope you well, uh, Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, good night. Well, Ed, I hope you didn't mind about them. I... It's all right. Okay. Well, uh, come on into the living room, then, and tell us about it. Not much to tell you that you don't know, is there? No. No, I suppose not. Sit down. Thanks. Uh, can't I get you something to eat? No, 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 thanks. Oh, oh some coffee or I something. I think I'll pass up the refreshments this time. Well, I know how you must feel. Yeah, I guess you do. But I, I still can't. I, I just can't. You've uh, painted this room lately, haven't you? Yeah. What about it? Nothing. Just looks a little funny, that's all. You think so? Yeah, that brick wall in front of the house is kind of new, too, isn't it? You know I'm a bricklayer by trade, don't you? Well, now that you've mentioned it, I... Oh, Joe, how can you talk about... <laughs> uh, <clears throat> you better go on upstairs, Laura. <laughs> She's taking it pretty hard. Yeah. You seem to be bearing up all right, though. You haven't lost any sleep over it yet yourself, have you? I'm not her husband. This isn't getting us anywhere. What was that? Laura, I guess she's going to bed. Oh. Well, I guess I better be... Getting down to get that last bus. How about staying overnight? No, thanks. Suit yourself. Wait a minute, I'll put the porch light I'd on. I'd see, all right. Ah, that's better. By the way, what happened? What do you mean, what happened? I suppose you and Janet had a row. What's that got to do with anything? 
I hear you got kind of a temper. Were you a little too quick with the flat of your hand? That's all this for the benefit of the neighbors? Might be. Have you notified the police yet? No, and I don't like the way you ask questions. Okay, okay. Want me to walk down to the bus with you? It's pretty dark. Maybe that's why I'd rather walk down alone. Now, wait a minute, Ed. I think maybe you got me All right, all right. Maybe I have. Say goodnight to Mrs. Alden for me. Yeah. Let us hear from you. Don't worry. You'll hear from me, all right. Still plenty dark when I got back to town, but I took the shortcut at the corner just the same, a path across a vacant lot. Between the lot and my house, there's a hedge. I was just going through it when I stopped cold. There was a light on in my house. Only it wasn't a regular light. It was the beam of a flashlight moving past the living room window. That could only mean one thing, cops. Of course, it was Joe Alden that tipped them off. I just waited, and then I heard the front door open and close. I saw two men standing outside, and one of them went up the street. Pretty soon, I heard a car drive off. The other man was just a shadow now, standing by a tree in front of the house. You could see he was expecting me to come from the other direction. I stepped through the hedge and went over to him. Would you be looking for anybody in particular? I might be. Who are you? Ed Bliss. Who are you? Detective Stillman, Bureau of Missing Persons. How did you know anyone was looking for you? Oh, I'm just bright that way. Yeah? Well, they like bright boys down at headquarters. Come on, let's go. Tonight, for suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Joseph Cotton, whom you've heard in the first act of tonight's tale of suspense. In many foreign countries where discerning tastes have found Roma wines, they are an expensive luxury imported and treasured. For Roma wines are in every sense fine wines from the choicest vineyard country of California. They are products of age-old winemaking skill aided by modern quality controls and tests that assure unvarying excellence of taste and character. Yet Roma wines cost you mere pennies a glassful. Such enjoyable flavor and constant quality, such low cost, such high wine value, have made Roma by far America's largest selling wines, enjoyed by millions with meals when entertaining anytime. Try Roma wine yourself. Tomorrow at dinner, no matter what you're serving, place on the table a cool bottle of ruby red hearty Roma California Burgundy. See how much new zest it adds to food how it makes a real occasion of even the simplest meal. To enjoy this extra mealtime pleasure, just ask your dealer for R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California, for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Mr. Joseph Cotton, who, in the person of Ed Bliss, resumes the story called You'll Never See Me Again. Tonight's study in suspense. She stood there in the shadows watching my face. Detective Stillman of the Bureau of Missing Persons. I'd been expecting this to happen sooner or later, but now that it had, I was stunned for a moment. He said it again. Come on, bright boy. They're expecting us at headquarters. Now, wait a minute. I want to talk to you. I'm in a jam. Oh, you're telling me. Not the way you think. Would you come inside with me? I've been inside. What kind of a furnace do you have in your cellar, Bliss? An oil burner. The kind that turns on automatic with an electric cut-in? That's right. Why? Is there a fuse blown? How did you know there was a fuse blown? (laughs) Was that why you were searching my house with a flashlight, or was it because you didn't have a warrant? Oh, Oh, you really are a bright boy, aren't you? Well, come on, come on. Now, 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 listen, listen. I I don't want to have any arguments. I want help, and I want it bad. Will you give me a break? What kind of a break? This is no place to talk. Will you come inside? Okay, okay, but you'd better talk fast and good. Don't worry. Excuse 
box is right down here. A flash your light up here. I always keep a couple of fuses on top of it. Yeah. There we are. Let's go in the front room. Uh, after you. <laughs> okay. Uh, now. Now, what do you want to talk about? Don't you understand? She's my wife. I'm scared. Then why did you run out? Why didn't you tell the police? Because at first I thought it was just, you know, one of those things. And anyway, I... I knew where she'd gone, back to her mother's. How did you know that? Because I went down there after her, because all kinds of people saw her go. Bus drivers, ticket sellers. Only when I I got there, she wasn't there. How much uh, life insurance did you carry on her, Bliss? 25000 Well, that's quite a lot for a $75 a week architect, oh, isn't it? Oh, her mother paid for it, a wedding present. For heaven's sake, what do you think I did? Burn it in the cellar or something? No. No, we know you didn't do that. Oh, we looked. Oh, cut it out, cut it out, will you? I I love her. We've only been married three months. Well, what do you want me to do? Give me a break. You take me down to headquarters now. It may be hours. Oh, it'll be hours, all right. In the meantime, if there's still a chance, there's got to be. She's somewhere, and she's in danger. I know it. Yeah, how? I tell you, I followed her down to her mother's place in West Hampton. There's a guy at the station who remembers selling her a ticket. The bus driver remembers her getting off there, and then she just disappeared. Then what? Well, I went down to her mother's house. They hadn't seen her. But there's something funny about it. There's something funny about her mother and that stepfather. There's something funny about that house and about that room. What room? That living room of theirs. Listen, you've got to let me help you find her. You've got to go down there to West Hampton with me because I've got a hunch somehow that that I'm the only one who can find her. Uh. All right, Bliss. All right. I don't know why, but I believe you. You do? You'll go? Yeah. And I... I shouldn't believe you either, because... Because what? What was your wife wearing when she ran out on you Monday night? What was she wearing? Yes, yes. You must remember what she was wearing. Well, she was wearing a gray flannel suit, a skirt and jacket, you know, a pink silk shirt waist, patent leather high heel shoes, and all those crazy little hats. Any baggage? Yeah, a little tan suitcase. You're sure of that? Sure. Well, that's why I shouldn't believe you. Why not? Because when you find somebody's clothes around, you usually start looking for the body right nearby. Well, what do you mean? They weren't burnt up because that fuse had blown. But we found every one of those things in the furnace down in your cellar about 20 minutes ago. And he said that I knew there wasn't much time. But he was going up to West Hampton with me anyway. That was the main thing. Of course, first he had to route out the bus driver, the ticket seller, and check my story with them just to be sure I wasn't trying to pull a fast one. But that was all right. I'd expected that. And we climbed into, into the police car and headed out to West Hampton. He believed me now, all right. That car couldn't have been pushed any harder if I'd been driving it myself. Still, it was getting daylight when we got there. Parked the car a little ways down the road and walked toward the house. See what I mean, Bert? Take that brick wall, for instance. Oh, what about it? Well, it's new. What did he build that for? It's not tall enough to hide the road. It's not even tall enough to keep a dog out. Why did he build it? Well, maybe he built it to keep it in practice. Come on, come on, let's go in. Awfully uh, quiet. Well, why not? They're probably in bed. Where I'd be if I hadn't let you talk me into this. Listen, Bert, you don't think... I'm here, ain't I? Go on, ring the bell. No answer. Keep trying. Shades are all down. I, I don't think they're Come in. Come on, let's try the back door. Shades are down on this side of the house, too. Look, look, the garage is empty. Yeah. Well, I guess our birds have flew the coop, all right. Bird, I don't like this. Come on, we'll try this back door anyway. Uh oh. Locked. Here, 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 here's an axe. Uh, I'd like to try my keys first. There, that's got it. Is this the way to the front of the house? I guess so. I've uh, never been back here. Yeah, this is it. Here's the front hall. There. There it is. What? That room. The living room I was telling you about. Well, what about it? Snap on the lights. All right, I still say, what about it? I don't know, but... But don't you get something, something funny about it? 
Oh, what? Well, the, the lights or something about that fresh paint, the, the rug. The, there's something, though. I know there's something. Oh, come on, come on. We're wasting time. There's something screwy about the whole joint. We went over the place from top to bottom. I wanted to get back to that room, and time was awful important. But Bert Stillman wanted to look into everything, which was only right and natural, and... Then we ran into something that was just about the last thing I expected. What's, uh... What's this door here? I don't know. I thought we'd covered everything on the ground floor before. Mm, it's locked. Yeah, it must be some sort of back bedroom. Oh, doggone it. The keys won't fit this one. Funny. Only room in the house that was locked. Well, maybe we've got what we're looking for. Give me that axe. Uh, Bert, you see, if, if she was here and they've gone, they must have taken her. Mrs. Alden. Your wife's mother? Yeah. Where's your daughter? Oh, please, please. Come on, come on. Where is she? I don't know. Was she here? Yes, yes, but... Where is she now? I don't know. Did she leave with your husband? I don't know. Why didn't you tell me she was here the other night? Joe told me not to. She was here, but the next morning, Joe told me she'd left. And this morning, he left. <coughs> Look, look, wh uh, what did you lock yourself up in here for? I, I knew when Joe left that something, something terrible. And when you came, I was frightened. I just... Come on, Ed, where to? Don't you get it? For some reason, the stepfather's put the snatch on her. We've got to put a call through to headquarters, get the highway patrols to watch for him. What about her? Oh, she comes along. Oh, please. Come on, Bert. Come on. Yes. Well, there's something wrong about you. You bet your life there is. Oh, no, I mean, why would he Why would he do it? And what motive would he have? You let me worry about the motive. You worry about your wife. Got some connection with what's wrong about that room, whatever it is. Will you forget about this room? We've got to get... I want to look just once more. I know there's something. Listen, listen. You, do you want your wife back or don't you? There's no... Bert, Bert. I've got it. You've got what? It's lopsided. Don't you see? It's, it's, it's not on the square. Are you crazy? Oh, no, I'm an architect. Look, the light's on in the middle of the ceiling. The window's on in the middle of the wall. So what? The design on the rug is wrong. It's, it's cut, cut off too close to that wall. It's... Bert. What? That wall. That's why the room has just been repainted. That's why he built that brick wall in front of the house. I don't get it. One wall of this room is a dummy. Built out in front of the real one. That's why the room looks lopsided. That's why he built a brick fence, to get bricks without arousing suspicion. Which wall? That one. And Bert. It must be hollow. Give me that act. You don't think that, that, that Janet... Uh, Bert, Bert, give it to me. Let me. Get back, you hear me? Bert. <laughs> Mrs. Alden. It's, it's Janet. Answer me. Answer me, Mrs. Alden. She can't even talk. Ed, you'd know if... if she was the mother. Of course you? I'd. No. I wouldn't. I never saw Janet's mother until I came here to the house Monday night. Mrs. Alden. Mrs. Alden, answer me! I'm... not Mrs. Alden. That's Mrs. Alden! Just a question of time now, whether we'd get back there in time to stop it. It all fit together now, and what Brett didn't know, he got other woman on the way back. Did you know Joe Alden before? No. Not before I came to their house in Eastport to take care of her. I'm a nurse. Then Joe and I... Uh-huh. Well, we... Who got the idea to kill her? You or Joe? He did. When he saw me giving her a sedative once. She was pretty sick. Oh, premeditated, huh? 
Why did he do it? Money, of course. She kept a lot of bonds around the house. That's what Joe wanted. Is that why you moved from Eastport to West Hampton? Yes. Nobody knew us in West Hampton. We moved in at night. They thought there was only two of us. They thought I was the real Mrs. Alden. When did he do it? About a week after we got there. One night. By morning, she was where you found her. We were doing better than 80 most of the way, but I still didn't think we'd make it. Naturally, Bert was afraid to put the local cops around the house for fear Alden would spot them first and take Janet away and do it somewhere else, if he hadn't done it already. Because Bert Stillman had to picture Cole now. Janet had come to the West Hampton house and found her mother was missing before Alden had been able to make his getaway. So Alden had been made to kill Janet, too. Bert knew where he was taking her because of the clothes and the furnace in my house. That was a tip-off that Alden was going to try to plant it on me. It was the only break I had. At least I knew where to look if I could get there in time. In the outskirts of town, we picked up a police escort. But Bert made them lay off when they got near the house. We drove up the side street and parked a little ways off. We walked up to the house. There was a car in front of it. Is that Alden's car? Yes. All right. You're coming in with this lady, but the first sound out of you, and I'll shoot. And I mean that. I know. Got your keys, Ed? Yeah. Quiet now. Yeah. Look. There's a light. That's the door to the cellar. Come on. Listen, listen. Digging. The light's gone out. He must have heard us. Put on your flashlight. Let's go. There he is. Ed, why you? Hey, Ed. what'd you do that for? Killed my wife, didn't he? Switch on the light. Maybe it isn't too late yet. There she is. She's dead. Yes, yeah. Chloroform. You smell it? Get that cloth off her face. Too late, can't you see? Yeah, yeah, I'm afraid. What are you doing carrying a gun, Ed? I got a permit. Anyway, what's the use of asking questions like this now when... Look! Look, she's moving. What? Yes, what? she's alive. Here, here, give me a hand. Ed. Ed, help me. Ed. Where are you going, Ed? Put up your hands, Ed. Okay, okay, they're up. Come on back down here. All right. Take it easy. I'm coming. Ed, you could at least have done it yourself. Instead of hiring murderers. <laughs> What did you do it for? The money? What do you think? For fun? Go ahead. Talk. Anything to make you happy. Would have been perfect if Alden had killed her when he first got her in the cellar like I told him to. Maybe he had a sneaking idea I was going to double-cross him. He was stalling until the last minute. I don't know. Anyway, won't do him much good where he is. What did you have on him, Ed? The mother, his wife. I'd been up there before alone. I knew he'd killed his wife because I'd seen a picture Janet had of a real mother. And I spotted the room right away. I told all him I'd split the money with him if he did it. And if he didn't... Mm -hmm. Go on. Well, I knew I could pick a fight with Janet. I knew she'd run up to her mother's. Then I went up there to make, make it look good. After I left, Alden was to call the cops like he did. You'd take me down here to headquarters, and while you were giving me the old third degree, Alden was supposed to plant the body in the cellar. That way... I was in the clear because uh, you'd know I couldn't have done it while I was down here talking to you. And you'd know she hadn't been there before because you'd looked. That's why I planted the clothes in the furnace, remember? So you would look. Uh, smart. Uh, I had an alibi and nobody had a thing on Alden unless I squawked. And he had to take that chance. Looked pretty good there for a while, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, your wife's outside. Do you... Want to say anything to her? Hmm? Yeah. Uh, just tell her I said, uh, you'll never see me again. And 
so close as you'll never see me again. Starring Joseph Cotton. Tonight's study in... Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. To every woman listening tonight, I want to say a special word about making every dinner or supper you serve taste better. I want to urge you to start serving Roma wine with your meals. It's simple. The cost is very, very little. And it works magic in making food more enjoyable. You can serve Roma wine with any meal or any time in any kind of glass you wish. Serve it chilled. Try different kinds of Roma wine until you find those you enjoy most of all. Try hearty red Roma California Burgundy or the delicately delicious Roma California Sautern. The cost is only pennies a glass, but you'll find even a pickup supper tastes like a banquet. Get Roma wines today. If your dealer is temporarily out of them, please try again soon. Just ask for R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Joseph Cotton appeared through the courtesy of David O. Selznick and is currently being seen in the Selznick production Since You Went Away. Next Thursday, same time, you will hear Miss Merle Oberon as star of The Pen. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wine presents The Sense. Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud! Your health, senor. Roma Wine host the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black. Here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you two of Hollywood's favorite screen stars, Miss Virginia Bruce and Mr. Alan Jocelyn, with the noted character actor George Zuko. Our suspense play, which is produced and directed by William Spear, presents a rather neat problem, that of a crime committed while no criminal was present. And so with a locked room, and with the performance of Virginia Bruce as an exceedingly bright young lady named Iris Lane, of Alan Jocelyn as an exceedingly shy young man named Harold Mills, and of George Zuko as the exceedingly polished Dr. Woodhall, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! No, Mr. Seaton is not in. No, there will not be any statements for the papers. Carol, will you get that? Hello, no, I can't tell you oh, anything Mr. about Seaton's it. President. No. No, there will be absolutely no statements. Here we go again. If you wish, Hello, only you're Mr. wasting Seaton's your President. time. Look, I told Very you this well. morning there wouldn't be any statements for the newspapers. No, not tomorrow oh, either. Oh, dear. I'm sorry, I'm awfully busy right now. I said I was busy. Busy. <laughs> What a death. It's rather disturbing how quickly the reporters got wind of it. I do hope no harm's been done. Well, we did our best. It's too big a deal to keep secret anyway. There are always rumors, and it's the business of newspapers to pick up rumors. Dear me, I wonder how he's going to take it. The old man? He probably won't be tickled pink. You know how he is. I know I'll be relieved when he has it under lock and key, my word. Oh, good evening, Mr. Seaton. Good evening, Harold. 
Wayne, you two still working? No, we thought we'd stick around until you got here. Oh, I'm sorry I was so late. The newspapers have been calling, Mr. Seaton. The newspapers? How in blazes We told they... them there wouldn't be any statement. Oh, I should hope not. Now, how do you suppose... Then it... it's not finished? Oh, no, the deal's closed. Have it with me, as a matter of fact. With you, sir? You've been carrying it around in your pocket? Well, you see why I don't feel so good about the newspapers. But at least I got it home all right. Like to see it? Oh, yes. Doesn't look like much wrapped up like this. Well, there it is. Oh. Like it? The Lavella diamond. What a beauty. It's enormous. Yes. But tomorrow we start to cut it. And within a year, it'll be just so many engagement rings. You know, I hate to see it change. It's so beautiful the way it is. Oh, there's no money in it for me this way. Oh, uh, Dr. Woodhall called. He wants to give you a checkup if he can catch it before dinner. No, Dr. Woodhall. It's an old woman. Treats me like an invalid. Oh, well. Anything else? Nothing important. Oh, Harold, will you answer? Yes, certainly. Mr. Seaton's resident. Who's calling, please? Uh, just a moment. Mr. Seaton, Mr. Van Houten. Van Houten? Yes, he wants to speak to me. Oh, um, uh, tell him I'm out of town. Mr. Van Houten, Mr. Seaton's out of town. Well, dear me, you can think what you like, but Mr. Seaton is not here. Goodbye. Well, well, odd. What did he say? He said he has information that you are here, and he insists on coming up here now. It sounds most disagreeable. Well, I don't think he's likely to show up. If he does, don't let him in. All right, Mr. Seaton. I'll be in my study until Woodhall gets here. But don't forget your medicine, Mr. Seaton. I put it right beside the seltzer bottle. Oh, I won't be there. I hope Dr. Woodhall hurries on. Dead. I'm sure you must be. Mr. Seaton seemed awfully proud of his new stone, didn't he? I thought he was cool as a cucumber. How would you feel if you just bought the biggest diamond in the world? Oh, the second biggest, I believe, Iris. Not that that's anything to belittle. What do you suppose he paid for it? I understand the price was something under a million, but he expects to get back over a million and a half once it's cut and polished. Harold, putting that kind of money into a piece of stone, I know if I had a million, I'd never buy diamonds. <laughs> Dear me, for that matter, neither would I. But for some people, diamonds take the place of other things. Power, love. What would you do if you had a million dollars? Mm, I don't know. There are a lot of swell people I'd like to help out. Then I'd like to travel. Oh, there are lots of things. What would you do? Do you really want to know? Of course I do. I, I don't think I should say this, but if I had a million dollars or even much less, I'd, I'd ask you to marry me. Why, oh, Harold? No, please, I don't want you to say anything. You don't have to. I know I'm, I'm not the sort for you, really. I'm not like Dr. Woodhall, you know. Sure of myself. Well, it's not that, Harold. Honestly, it's just that you never said anything before. You never even. <laughs> What was that? It sounded as if it came from the study. Mr. Seaton? Mr. Seaton, is anything wrong? He doesn't answer. Mr. Seaton! The door's locked. Yes, have you your key, Iris? Right here. Mr. Seaton! Mr. Seaton? Why, where is he? There he is on the floor. What happened to him? Is it? Wait, I'll see. Oh, goodness. Put him on the no, couch. No, just a minute, Iris. I don't think you'd better look. He's badly injured. Injured? But how? It's his head. Get a doctor, will you? A doctor? Someone's tried to kill him. Hurry. To kill him? All right. Try Dr. Woodall. Maybe he hasn't left. I will. Operator, get me granite. Six. Nine, seven hundred. Well, good evening, Iris. Oh, Dr. Woodall. Never mind, Operator. Come on, Doctor. I was just calling you. Is something wrong? Mr. Seaton, he's hurt. Someone tried to... Harold, Dr. Woodhall was just coming in. Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad you're here, Doctor. What's the matter with Seaton? I I think someone tried to kill him. It's his head. You can see the blood. I found this under him. What's that? That seems to be a piece of broom handle filled with lead. Evidently, he was struck with it. Hmm. Concussion. Nasty. Still some pulse. I just had him in my bag. Here you are. And you'd better call the police. The police? Certainly, this is attempted murder. Oh, dear. Good evening. Did I hear somebody say murder? Who are you? My name is Van Houten. I telephoned a little while ago. How did you get in? Well, I rang, no one answered, so I walked in. I wish to speak with Mr. Satan, but I see that perhaps I'm a little too late. Eh? Perhaps you knew you'd be a little too late, Mr. Van Houten. Harold, I think we'd better leave that for the police. Will you call them? I can't figure out how it happened. Harold, you and I have been outside that door all day. I know there wasn't anyone in this room. Iris, it must have been the windows. What do you mean the windows? No one could climb. You see, look, there's a ladder still there. And it took us some time to open the door. There is a ladder. Oh, yes, yeah, a very convenient ladder. Oh, don't you see? It still couldn't have happened. What do you mean? Someone came through the window, hit Mr. Seaton, and escaped the same way. But it couldn't have happened that way. Look, the windows are locked. Both of them on the inside. And Harold and I were outside the only door. The windows are locked? 
Dear me. That means Mr. Seaton was alone. Alone in a locked room. <laughs> Before we return to the scene of our suspense play, let me describe another scene that might even now be taking place in the handsome cafe of the Hotel Nacional de Cuba in Havana. An American visitor has remarked to his Cuban host what great enjoyment the gay Cuban music and the dancing gives him. Gracefully, the Cuban host returns the compliment, saying, But your United States makes us a gift that brings great pleasure on many occasions. This superb wine from the choice wine districts of your California... This fine Roma wine. Yes, for a wine to give great enjoyment, it must have greatness of character. And it's this that has spread the fame of Roma wines to other lands. Why otherwise would these countries import Roma wines to be enjoyed as a rare luxury? How fortunate then are you who can enjoy any of the Roma wines, many different delicious wine types, whenever you choose, without additional charge for import duty? with no high shipping costs added to your small cost for Roma wine. Yet here is a quality so high, it has won international recognition. Quality coupled with costs so modest that Roma wines are America's largest selling wine. Why not make your own taste test of these good Roma wines and discover for yourself the fine wine qualities acclaimed by wine experts of many lands? I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A, Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our soundstage Virginia Bruce and Alan Jocelyn with George Zuko in the locked room, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> folks, are you all here? There's Miss Iris Lane. Yes. Dr. Charles Woodhull. Yes. Harold Mills. <laughs> and Mr. Alex Van Houten. No. Yeah. Ah, now let's get down to business. We know some of the facts, but not enough of them. We know that you four were the only people in the house when Mr. Seaton was robbed outside of the cook, and she was in the kitchen. We know Seaton had the diamond on him when he went into the study, and that someone lifted it before we got here. We haven't located the diamond yet, but we will. Now, uh, this business of the windows being locked, somebody here knows who locked them. One of you hasn't come clean, or all of you. It's easy to see what you're thinking, Captain Hadley. As we tell it, it looks as though Harold and I did the job. But we didn't, that's all. That's all. The only door locked and washed before and after. Windows locked before and after. No one hidden in the room before or after. And I don't believe in ghosts. So the thing's impossible. Now, which one of you locked those windows? Mr. Mills? Well, really, dear me, officer, why would I do the one thing to make it look as if Iris and I had committed this crime? Yes, you know, Harold got something there. If the windows hadn't been locked, you'd know someone from outside did it. Look, I'm trying to be patient with you people. But if Mr. Seaton doesn't die, which he hasn't yet, he'll tell us who did it. So I advise you to come clean now. Dr. Woodhall? Yes, officer? You and our friend, Mr. Van Houten, here were, as the young lady puts it, outside when it happened. Maybe you managed to lock the windows afterwards. Captain. How could he? He was too busy helping Mr. Seaton to get anywhere near the windows. And neither did Mr. Van Houten. I'd swear to that. Well, thank you, dear lady. I did not expect such a kindness. Uh, pardon, Captain. Well, Barton? Nurse has to tell you that Seaton's come, too. He's talking. Talking? Mm -hmm. Is he out of his head, or does he make sense? Uh, she says you can ask him some questions if you don't tax him too much. Well, now we'll get some, please. I think uh, all of you had better come with me. Here's the captain, miss. We'll try not to upset him too much, nurse. Captain, maybe being a suspect, I shouldn't say anything, if you don't mind. I don't think it's safe to question him. Safe for who, Doctor? Nonsense, Woodall. I want to tell what I can. Mr. Seaton, I know your condition. I don't think you should... Shut, shut up, Woodall. I was in the study. I sat down the desk. Waiting for Dr. Woodall. The chair faced the door into the office. I heard Harold and I was talking outside. Both of them? Yes. Sound carries pretty well through the door. 
They were talking some nonsense about what they do if they had a million dollars. You heard what we said? Then I think Harold was proposing or something. Oh, dear me, Mr. Seaton, I never realized that you... Well, I could. I was taking my medicine, and then I heard... I heard, I think, a footstep behind me. I set my glass down and started to get up. Did you turn around? I didn't have time. Something smashed down on my head, and... Oh, then uh, you didn't know who it was? No. And I don't know how. What do you mean, how? Because I've locked the windows, both of them. You locked the windows? Yeah. I, I saw some of the ladder up. I suppose it was the gardener or somebody. But I didn't want to be climbing around, so I locked both windows. You're, you're sure no one was hidden in the room? Positive. Captain, I think you've had enough. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, I guess you're right, Doctor. Uh, will you people step outside? I, I'll be there in a minute. Come on, Doctor. Harold. Uh, now, Mr. Seaton, what I want to know is... Criminal, make him keep talking. Poor Mr. Seaton, he does look awfully bad. Yeah, I suppose it's proper to feel pity for even Francis Seaton. Look, Mr. Van Houten, you've made several remarks like that. Maybe you've got your reasons, but I don't think it would sound so good to the police. Well... Huh. Believe me, dear lady, my distaste for Mr. Seaton is purely objective. It's terribly perplexing, isn't it? Now that Mr. Seaton's confirmed us on the locked windows, I can't see how the police are going to prove anything. Look, let's not kid ourselves. We're all supposed to be nice, civilized people. But one of the four of us is a thug. A thug who beat a defenseless man over the head and took that diamond. Dear me, as I see it, that's just the point. It proves that none of us could have done it. Well, if Mr. Seaton's story proves that we couldn't, it proves a hundred times more that no one else could. Well, Captain, is there anything more we can do? Yes. You'll all be searched again for the diamond. And none of you are to leave this house until further notice. Not leave well, the house. Well, what about my practice? I don't know. Well, surely it requires more evidence than you have to hold us over the uh, supposed disappearance of a diamond. I'm not holding you because of the diamond. I'm holding you on suspicion of murder. Mr. Seaton is dead. <laughs> Can I come in, Iris? Oh, Dr. Woodhall, what do you want? I'll only be a minute. Well, all right. I hate to disturb you, but I'm... I'm really worried. You are? Iris, why don't you try to get out of here? Out of here? Why on earth should I? Don't you realize you're suspected of murder? You could hide somewhere until this is all being cleaned up. Are you crazy? Sure, I'm suspected, Doctor, but no more than you... How's it going to look if I suddenly disappear? Yes, I suppose you're right. If I could only keep you out of this. I'm so worried I don't think straight. You have a cigarette, Iris? Yes, look in that box on the table. Oh, watch out, there's a lamp cord. Oh, oh I'm sorry, that was clumsy of me. Oh, don't let it worry you. It's no heirloom. What's that? What? What? Look. Where did you get that? The diamond. Where did you get it? Well, it was on the floor. On the floor? I just didn't the police search in here. How did it get on the floor? I suppose it must have been in the lamp. Yes. See? This part lifts out. It must have been an oil lamp. Apparently. May I have it, please? A diamond? It was found here. What do you want to do with it? I want it. Iris, it's not safe. Sure, I know. Give it to me. Well. Thanks. Are you going to give it to Captain Hadley? Why? I don't think it would be wise. Not yet. You're not afraid of something, are you? Iris, suppose they didn't believe you. Suppose they think that you... Oh, I'll think about it. Dr. Woodhall, will you do me a favor? Certainly, if I can. Well, will you meet me here in exactly ten minutes? Uh, you are coming downstairs. Oh, sure, but I've got a couple of things to do. I won't be long. Well, perhaps I'd... I should wait. No, oh, please, you don't have to do that. Well, all right, but be careful. Yes. I mean, don't let anyone know you have the diamond, because... No, I know. Yes, because whoever killed Seaton for it would kill me, too. I know it will be soon tonight. It has to be. What? Yes, I'll do it as loud as I can, but... 
Don't slip because I'm counting on you and... Iris, are you ready? Oh, uh, yes, Anne, darling. I'm sorry. I'm really stuck for a couple of days, but we'll make it soon. Sure, dinner and a show. All right, darling. Goodbye. I didn't mean to barge in. Oh, that's okay. Let's go downstairs. Where are the others? You mean Harold and Ben Houghton? I think I, I heard them when I came up. Yes, they're in the office. Listen. Come on, let's go in. It'll be for a few days. Oh, we wondered if you were coming down, Iris. My, you startled me. We are not intruding. Intruding? It sounded like you were having a little argument. Oh, no, it wasn't that exactly. You see, we were talking about... Well, dear me, I don't know why I shouldn't tell you. About an engagement ring. An engagement ring? The hell? Mm -hmm. I didn't want you to know I'm buying one from Mr. Van Houten. I don't have quite enough money, and I won't have for a few days. Mr. Van Houten sells rings. Well, I thought that was understood. It, it, it's my profession. I, I deal in diamonds in a small way. Diamonds? To the police? Is the word diamond so surprising, sir? Naturally, the police would have to know my business with oh, Mr. Yes. Seaton. Yes, I'm sure they would. It's only You're bad. hinting at my apparent dislike for the late Mr. Seaton, Doctor. Well, I hated him. He was a cheat and a fraud. I cheated me. It doesn't sound like Mr. Seaton. My dear young lady, there are a hundred men in Amsterdam who would be glad to know that he suffered. But as you know, such dislike was not the motive for his murder. Well, really, now, there's no need to be huffy, Mr. Van Houten. Well, dear me, we all know what the motive was. I guess it was motive enough for any one of us. Yes. Look, let's face it. One of us killed Seaton, that's true. But three of us didn't. And yet we're all suspected. I think if the four of us let down our hair, maybe we can figure this thing out. Iris, don't... I think that sounds very reasonable. If Iris needs advice or help... Maybe I do with that. I've found the diamond. You mean you found it? You found, found it? it where? In my room. Dr. Woodhall accidentally knocked over a lamp. It was inside. And uh, where is it now? I brought it with me. It's here in my purse. Then the Iris, police do not know, huh? So here I am, stuck with this thing, and uh, I don't know what to do about it. Oh, dear. Iris, I'm... I'm really ashamed... Uh, I don't know how to tell you. Ashamed of what? Well, I couldn't tell the police. At least I thought I shouldn't. You see, Mr. Seaton told me in confidence. But now that we've agreed to be frank and honest... What are you driving at? I don't know why Mr. Seaton was killed. Maybe none of us will ever know that. But it wasn't because of the diamond. I knew that all along. You see, that isn't the real diamond at all. Well, preposterous. You, you expect us to believe that... Uh, Miss Lane, let me see that diamond, please. Sure, you're the expert in the crowd. Take a look. I'll hold on to it, though. I don't care what Mr. Van Houten says. Mr. Seaton told me it was a replica he brought home. I don't know why. This is ridiculous. Why would anyone want to plant a false diamond in Iris's room? What about it, Mr. Van Houten? It's incredible. What? Well, even without my glass, I can see that this is false. There are no planes of cleavage. A very shoddy piece of work. Phony? I don't get it. Why was he killed, then? Well, you see how I've been racking my brains. Here... Mr. Van Houten, maybe we'd better put it in the safe. Right? I might as well keep it. You'll have to give it to the captain anyway. Yes, I suppose we'd better tell him. Dear me, he'll be terribly distressed, I'm afraid. No, I hate to admit it, but this is beginning to get me down, Harold. I feel jumpy and sort of sick. Oh, it's probably my fault. I should have told you. I'm not just about the diamond. Everything. The locked windows. The way he looked before he died. I, Iris. I, you feel bad? You look as if you might... I'm sorry. I hate to be so silly. I, I do feel sort of shaky. Maybe if I lie down. Would you help me into the study? Here, Iris, let me open the door, please, Doctor. On the couch, Iris? Yes, please. I'll lie down right here. Oh, Dr. Woodhall, do you have something that I could take for this headache? I feel really... Why, yes, if you think you need it. Is there a glass? I have something here. Well... Here's a glass, Doctor. This is a mild sedative, Iris. Now to water. Here, Doctor. Here's the seltzer bottle. Oh, that'll do it. Now drink this down, Iris. Set it right there. I'll drink it. I just want to close my eyes for a minute. And will you switch out the lights when you go out? And maybe you should lock the door. Yes, of course. We'll call you for dinner. Uh, try to sleep. Poor girl. Who is it? 
Oh, so you are awake, eh? And how... Where's the diamond? Done. Give it to me. Well? But you said it was false. We are not so easily fooled. We know what goes on. We? Who do you mean? Never mind. Give me the diamond. And if I don't? You know what will happen if you don't. Who's there? What are you doing? Stand off! What is it? What's happened? Who is it? Turn on the lights. Harold. Well, I seem to have arrived just in time. Harold, you... You hit him. No, he's only knocked out. How... How are you feeling? Well, much better. Oh, you didn't take your medicine. I'm, no, I, I didn't. Oh, dear me. I was afraid you were too smart for that. Iris, I think you and I should have a serious talk. You don't mind if I lock the door? Oh, would it make any difference Very if I did? Very little, I admit. Now, Iris, just how much do you know? About... What? Oh, come, come. There's no need for you to be reticent. I shall have to kill you in any case. Oh, but you can't do that. And who will stop me? Dr. Woodhall? No, no, Iris. He, he'll be very busy for a little while. The cook has become quite ill. You poisoned No, no, it's nothing much. She'll recover. Tell me just how much do you know? I, I know about the seltzer bottle. That's how you knocked out Seaton. Oh, that's very good. You're so clever. Dear me, if I had more time, I'd be inclined not to kill you, but it's late and I sailed with the diamond at midnight. I'm signed on as a steward, on a freighter bound for Argentina. So you see, it's really time that makes this unpleasantness necessary. You know, Harold, they'll find me before midnight. Ah, but they will find with you Mr. Van Houten. Poor Van Houten, he'll be very confused. You know, I actually persuaded him that you and Dr. Woodhall were the culprits. That's why he came here, to get the diamonds. And now you're going to frame him with my murder. You're a pretty smart boy, aren't you? Oh, thank you, my dear. They'll probably suspect me, too, after they find out I've gone. Tell me, how did you guess about the seltzer bottle? The condemned woman ate a hearty breakfast. Okay, I'll talk. Well, I knew it must have been the seltzer bottle when I realized it was one of those kinds you filled yourself with a capsule to make the bubbles. But what did you put in it? <laughs> a concoction known as a Mickey Finn. But it felt so much like a blow on the head that even Seaton confirmed my little story. Well, I knew whoever did it would try the same thing on me to get the diamond. You were the one who got me the seltzer for my medicine tonight. But I suppose you saw it coming. Your little trap? Yes, I'm afraid I did. <laughs> Dear me, we're just too smart for each other, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And you hit Seaton over the head when I was phoning for a doctor just to make it look good, right? Yes, of course. Oh, I wish Seaton hadn't locked those windows. Maybe you think I don't. Well... Iris. Well? I really hate to do this, Iris. Look, Iris, I'll give you a choice. Choice of what? I have here a fairly efficient gun, but it's noisy and it's messy, too. I don't like to use it. But if I have to... What else? Or you could drink what I put for you in the glass from the seltzer bottle. It would be much easier for you. Practically tasteless. After you drink it, you'll, you won't mind what else is necessary. What? I suppose... I... Yes, that's right. Pick it up. Pick it up. Now, drink it. Quickly. All right. Here goes. Why are you... <laughs> nice timing, Captain Hadley. The glass wasn't a bad signal. It was nice timing on your part, Miss Lane. Throwing yourself on the floor. You hadn't figured on the gun. No, I hadn't. Is Van Houten coming around, Doctor? Yes, he'll be all right. Okay. Come along, Harold. Oh, this is such a shame. Iris, before I go, I'd like to tell you how sorry I am. Sorry? Yes, about that proposal. Even if it was an alibi, I, I almost meant it. Dear me, it looks now as though I shall never marry. Yes, dear me, it certainly does. And so closes The Locked Room, starring Virginia Bruce and Alan Jocelyn with George Zuko. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Mr. Jocelyn appeared by courtesy of 20th Century Fox. Before we tell you about next week's stars and story, Roma Wine, sponsor of these weekly suspense dramas, brings you one of tonight's stars, Miss Virginia Bruce, with a message of real importance. Miss Bruce. 
Somewhere the other day, I came across a small news item. It mentioned that the men and women of our armed forces, most of whose pay averages very little more than $50 a month, have subscribed the huge total of a quarter of a billion dollars worth of United States war bonds. Ladies and gentlemen, if you need a testimonial to the worth of subscribing to the fourth war loan, which is now on, I think this news item supplies it. If the men and women who are fighting this war have that kind of faith in the future of our country, how can we have less? This is the time when our armed forces are making ready for the final extra effort, which will bring us victory. They need your extra support from extra purchases of war bonds. For the fourth war loan, one extra $100 war bond, please. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you two distinguished actresses, Miss Ida Lupino and Miss Agnes Moorhead. Don't forget, then, next Thursday, for Ida Lupino and Agnes Moorhead in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines. R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Broadcasting System. Suspense. Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Miss Agnes Moorhead in The Chain, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Say, Harlow, whom do you go to when you have a baby? I, a baby? Why, to a doctor. I mean... Uh, 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 when you go to jail, I mean... Or I rather, I should say, when you have a lawsuit, whom do you go to? A lawyer. Baby, lawsuit. What are you driving at, Hap? The best spark plugs for your car, my good man. Oh, well, now you're on my ground. Who knows more about the best spark plugs for your car than Autolite's ignition engineers? The men who design and build complete ignition systems for many of America's finest cars. Why, it's the skill and know-how of these Autolite ignition engineers that have made Autolite the world's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment and made Autolite spark plugs world famous. That means they know how to build into spark plugs the best in quick-starting, smooth performance and gas mileage, eh, Harlow? Right you are, and say, it's the skill of these same Autolite engineers that made possible the development of the Autolite resistor spark plug, one of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. So, friends, go to your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer and have him replace worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. Whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now, with the chain and the performance of Agnes Moorhead, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. All I did was write a letter, that's all. You can't blame me for what happened. I didn't start it. It came to me and I followed the instructions because I was afraid. Hundreds of people do it every day, so how can you blame me? Everybody in town knows me. They respect me. I've always been a good wife. By the morning it started, I was fixing George's breakfast. Not just toast like some women fix, but bacon and eggs and hot biscuits. Coffee ready? I asked you not to wander off. Your bacon is burned to a crisp. I told you I only wanted fruit juice and coffee. I'm down to the road to pick up the mail. Why do you always run for the mail? Are you expecting something you don't want me to see, George? 
If there was anything I didn't want you to see, I could have it sent to the office. Oh, could you? I didn't know you were important enough to be permitted to receive personal mail there. Leonora, that's enough. Bert Reynolds was appointed district manager. I should have gotten the job, but I didn't. Now, let's forget about well, it. Well, maybe you can forget about it, but Abby Reynolds won't let me forget. She has a high man to do her work now. She can spend half her day in town, but not Leonora Copperman. No, poor Leonora is bottled up here without a car, without anything. Here's your coffee. After all the trouble I've gone to, I guess I can throw the rest of the breakfast out. What was in the mail? Just this letter for you. For me? Who was it from? I don't know, Leonora. I've never opened your mail. Well, you made me so sarcastic. Oh, dear. From my cousin Emily. One of those ridiculous chain letters. This letter was started by a holy man in Tibet to end all evil. You must make two copies and mail them to others within 24 hours or the chain will be broken. Whoever breaks the chain will meet with evil. A Navy pilot broke the chain and was killed in a crash two days later. <laughs> Such a ridiculous thing. Now, who can I send it to? You can burn it and not send it to anybody. Well, maybe you don't think so, but I think our luck is bad enough as it is. I could send one to Abby Reynolds, of course, but I'd have to sign my name to it. And since you... You're peeved with Abby. She's fortunately spared. Besides, she'd tear it up. Yes, she would. That'd be just like Abby. What's the name of the man they hired? I don't know. Kerch, something or other. Kerchevsky, Peter Kerchevsky. Peter Kerchevsky? You're not thinking of sending a copy to him. Why not, George? Why not? Well, it's absurd. You don't even know the man. I send one to him and he sends one to Abby. He probably won't send it to anybody. But he will, George. He's a foreigner, isn't he? And they're all so superstitious. He'd have to send it to her. He may not even know anybody else. Suit yourself. Need anything from town? No. Time for him to be getting back to the office. It's very early, George. You never used to leave so early. You used to eat a big breakfast. I'm just not hungry. Well, maybe you'll be hungry by the time you get to town. Then you'll have time for a second breakfast at the drugstore. Maybe. You might even meet Miss Holden. She has her breakfast there. Leonora. She's very pretty, George. Not at all like your former secretary. Betty Holden's a very efficient girl. If she's pretty, I've never noticed Well, her. notice it, George. Notice it while you're having your second breakfast. I'll see you at dinner, George didn't fool me a bit. He never did. Some wives can't see the signs, but I could. I cleaned up the house spotless. That's where I kept it. Then I sat down with the letter. I made a copy and addressed it to Mr. Peter Kachevsky, care of Mrs. Abby Remmer. Then I made the second copy. Whoever breaks the chain will meet with evil. <sighs> I hadn't spoken to George about this copy. I sealed it in an envelope and addressed it to... Miss Betty Holden. I mailed the letters, then I waited patiently. I watched George's face the next night when he came home. I had all his favorite things for dinner. I even had my hair put up the way he liked it best. Not that he was ever pleased with the things I did for him. I wasn't the one he had on his mind. You're not very good company tonight, George. I find very little to say. I passed your office today. You seem quite animated in there. But perhaps you find Miss Holden's conversation more stimulating than mine. We were discussing something that was very embarrassing to me, Leonora. Oh? Why did you send her that letter? Well, it said send two copies, and that's what I did. Well, why Miss Holden? Why not? Because it was a stupid and childish thing. Is that what she said? She's too much of a lady. That's what she thought, and so did I. Oh, you and Miss Holden seem to think very much alike. It's a pity you're not married to her. Yes, Leonora. It is a pity. So it's true, then. You agree that I'm stupid and childish. What other agreements do you have, George? Why do you twist things so? I said... I know what you said. You think I'm deaf, George? I'm not. I'm not blind, either. She's my secretary. That's all. If that's all, then why don't you fire her? For what cause? Because I don't want her there. That's cause enough, isn't it? I'm your wife. Isn't what I want important? Not when it can cost somebody a job without reason. Oh, you're so noble, aren't you, George? But that isn't like you. I know because I live with you. You're a liar, George, and I could get her fired without your help. I'll go to Burt Reynolds and tell him... Leonora, 
If you do that, I'll... Go ahead, go ahead and hit me, George, because the secretary means nothing to you. No. That wouldn't do any good with you, Leonora. You're not worth it. You stay here and talk to me. Where do you think you're going? I'm going out to the guest room over the garage. Where I go from there, I'll decide later. You mean you're going to stay out there? That's exactly what I mean. You want to make a fool of me. You want people around town whispering that you left me. You want them to laugh at me. They'll never know unless you tell them, Leonora. You'll make sure that Betty Holden knows it, though, won't you? George! George, come back here. Do you hear me? George! They were talking about me. I could see it in their faces every time I went into town. The woman is always to blame when something goes wrong. But they didn't know what George was like. I went to town every day whether I had to or not to show them I had nothing to be ashamed of. Thursday was the day Abby Reynolds did her shopping at the Bon Ton. I planned to meet her accidentally. Leonora! Oh, Leonora! I'm so glad to see you. Hello, Abby. I tried to phone you this morning. Oh, well, I've been in town all day. Bert told me to call you. I'm glad I ran into you instead. It's... Well, there's something I have to tell you. We know you meant no so harm. So George has been criticizing me to Bert. Why, no, dear. I meant about the letter. The chain letter you sent to Peter Kachetsky. What harm could that do, Abby? None. That's what Bert tried to tell him, but he's a, a very quiet, strange man, and... Well, you see, Leonora, his wife died yesterday. Oh, no. No, Abby. He got the letter a few days ago. No. He can't read English, so he usually brings his mail to Bert. But his wife got sick that morning, and he took her to the hospital. He didn't bring the letter to Bert until this morning. And without thinking, of course... He read it to him? Bert tried to reason with him, but he didn't seem to hear. He just kept staring... Then he turned and walked out of the house. He blames me. He thinks it's my fault. Why did you ever send it to him, Leonora? Why did you pick well, him? Well, I meant no harm, Abby. I swear. I swear on my heart. I just mean... You it. better tell George about it. In case there's any trouble. Yes. Yes, I, I'll tell George. You see, if I'd sent the letter to Abby, it never would have happened. That's what I would have done if she wasn't always trying to make herself better than I was. I wouldn't have been in this if it wasn't for her. I left the Bon Ton and went to the square. The Country Hill bus wasn't due for half an hour. I couldn't stand there, so I walked out of town and I crossed the wooden bridge over the river. The side road was pitted with ruts left by the rain and I, I stumbled and the heel of my shoe broke off. I sat down on a patch of grass and tried to fix it and then and I heard a branch snap in the trees behind me. Hello, Mrs. Carpenter. It was a voice I'd never heard before. But when I turned, I knew the face. It was Peter Krzyzewski. He was all dirty and unshaven, and he had a half-empty bottle in his hand. You afraid, huh, Mrs. Carpenter? You stay away from me. Stay away, do you hear? No. He started for me. I threw the shoe. It caught him in the face, and a nail tore a gash in his forehead. I turned and started to run up the hill. I got you. I could hear him behind me. He was getting closer and closer, and the house was still a quarter of a mile away. A quarter of a mile away. Autolite is bringing you Miss Agnes Moorhead in The Chain. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Say, Harlow, what ignites the ignition system? I, uh, I'll ask the Autolite ignition engineers. And what sparks a spark plug? Uh, that's another for Autolite ignition engineers. If anyone knows spark plugs, it's these same Autolite engineers who design coils, distributors, and all the other vital parts that make up the complete ignition systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. They really know, eh, Harlow? Yes, sir. And look at the Autolite resistor spark plug they developed. It's one of the greatest advances in spark plug design for automotive use in the past 20 years. Can they talk about spark plugs like you, Harlow? <laughs> sure they can. And your friendly Autolite spark plug dealer can tell everyone listening to this program as much about world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs as I can. No. Sure. So go to him. 
and have him replace your worn-out spark plugs with world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. And whether you choose the resistor type or the regular type, for smooth performance and the best in gas mileage, you can't buy a better spark plug for your car because you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Agnes Moorhead, in The Chain, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. My lungs were ready to burst. I wanted to scream, but no sound had come. And there was nobody to hear me, nobody but Peter Kachevsky. He was coming along after me. I heard the ball drop and break. I could see the house now in the clearing through the trees, and I started to cry. I couldn't run any fast. I just couldn't. He was almost up to me. He reached out, and I, I felt his hand tearing at the back of my coat, and then he fell. He fell. I heard him go down, but I didn't turn to look. I crossed the clearing, up the steps of the house. I tore at the clasp on my handbag to get the key. Well, it was stuck. Kachevsky staggered into the clearing. I remembered the stamp key under the doormat, got it, and opened the door. He had reached the fourth steps. I slammed the door and locked it in his face. Go away, do you hear me? Leave me alone, leave me alone. Nobody run to help you. You don't get away. I go and wait for you. I lean against the door trying to get my breath. I could feel Kuchewski on the other side of it like a big crazy ape. What did he want to hurt me for? I took a chair and raced it under the doorknob. Then I heard him move. He padded down the porch steps, but he wasn't going away. He was moving around to the back door. I raced through the house. The door was locked. So were the storm windows on the lower floor. I ran upstairs to the bedroom. George's service revolver was in the bureau. I got it and opened the window. Come down, Mrs. Cashman. Get off this property. No, come down. Look, I've got a gun and I know how to use it, you understand? Will you go? You killed my wife, Mrs. Cashman. Oh, I did it, I did it. You go away, I warn you, I shoot, I shoot. Shoot, shoot. Shoot. I didn't hit him. He started to back away across the clearing. I fired again, and again. He kept backing away, looking at me with that mean, horrible face. I tried holding the gun with both hands and squeezing the trigger as George had talked to me, but I couldn't hit him. He backed into the trees at the edge of the property. I'm going to pay for what you do, Mrs. Carpenter. I'm going to come back. I'll see you again. You're going to pay. I held the gun in my lap and waited until I could see him going down the road towards town. Then I unlocked the bedroom door and slipped down the stairs to the telephone. Town 3417. The minute. Castle Insurance Company, Reynolds speaking. Bert, this is Leonora. Oh, yes, Leonora? Is George there? I must speak to him. He's out for the afternoon making some calls. Is, is, is Miss Holden there? No, I think George gave her the afternoon off. Oh, I see. Is anything wrong, Leonora? No. Uh, uh, no, Bert. Uh, did you tell George about Kotetsky? And the letter? Yes, Leonora, I told him. And he told me why you sent it. Is there anything else I can do for you? Well, if George comes I'll in... I'll tell him to call you. Goodbye, Leonora. Uh, Bert, I'm at the... George knew. He knew and Betty Holden knew. She was keeping him in town. This was what they wanted. They wanted something to happen to me. It'll be getting dark soon. Kachevsky would come back and I'd be alone. I'd be all alone. Number, please. This is Mrs. George Carpenter of Country Hill. Will you call the police and ask them to send a car out? Somebody's trying to kill me. He didn't try to break the door down or get in through any of the windows? No, but that's... Well, Mrs. Carpenter, he wasn't carrying a weapon and he never actually touched you. I can't arrest him for attempted murder. There isn't even enough evidence for a simple assault. I want that man arrested, do you hear me? Well, what you want has nothing to do with the law, Mrs. Carpenter. You're supposed to protect people. That's what we pay taxes for. Kachevsky pays taxes too, Mrs. Carpenter. 
You fired a gun at him. If you're smart, you'll drop this. Haven't I the right to protect myself in my own house? In the house, yes. But you were behind locked doors firing at a man out in the open. If you'd killed him, you'd have been charged with murder. Now, take my advice and don't use that gun again unless somebody breaks in. But that man is crazy. He's just crazy. If I had a simple mind like his and the same thing happened to me, I might be crazy too. But I can't locate my husband. I'm alone here. You've got to find that man and arrest him. I demand it. All right, all right. But all I can charge him with is trespassing. We can hold him until his fine is paid, and that's all. Well, I don't care what you charge him with. Arrest him. Just arrest him. He may bring counter charges against you. What charges could he bring against me? I've never hurt anybody. I've never done anything to anyone. Well, I'm glad to hear that, Mrs. Carpenter. I uh, like nice people. Goodbye. If you see my husband, tell him to come home. Tell him I'm alone here. I, I don't know what I'll do alone. When we find Kachevsky, I'll call you. <laughs> It started to get dark, and I sat there listening to every sound. And then it started to rain. I heard it pounding on the roof. It frightened me. If somebody came up to the house, I wouldn't be able to hear them. Seven o'clock came, and then eight, nine, ten. I didn't dare light a light. And I thought I heard a car. George. It had to be George. The headlights flashed through the windows as the car turned into the drive, and, and a moment later, I heard his key in the lock. Leonora. What's the matter, George? Are you surprised to see me? All the lights were out. I thought you were in bed. Oh, is that what you thought? Is that why you waited so long to come home? Where were you? Where I go is no longer any concern of yours. You were with her. All right, Leonora, I was. For the first peaceful evening in ten years, but not the last. What are you saying, George? I'm going to divorce you, Leonora. I'm moving into town tonight. I'll be at the hotel. I'll stop you. There isn't anything I won't do to stop you. I know. I can depend on you for that. The wife doesn't mean anything to you, George. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what happened today. I know you tried to kill a man with a gun. How do you know that? Everybody knows it. The police are looking for Kachevsky. You have no feeling about what you've done to that poor, confused devil, have you? I haven't done anything to him, the superstitious idiot. All I did was send a silly letter. That didn't kill his wife. I'm sorry she's dead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm no sorry. you're not. You're only sorry because you're afraid for yourself. How can you say that to me? Because I know you, Leonora. After ten years, I really know you. You didn't send those letters the way other people send them. I... You sent them with a curse out of the evil of your heart. You can't kill people with a curse. Which is fortunate for me. I'm not talking about the act, Leonora. I'm talking about the intent. I want to get my clothes. You can't. You can't. I won't let you. All right, I can get others. Goodbye, Leonora. I forbid you to leave this house. Get out of my way. No, George, no, I'm your wife. Remember how things used to be with us? They can be that way again, George. Let go of You me. know I can make you happy. Kiss me. Just kiss me once. Get out of my way. No, George. <laughs> oh, don't leave me. <laughs> don't leave me. I tried to sleep, but I couldn't. The rain got heavier. Each time the lightning flashed, I could see the river below. It was beginning to wash over the bridge. A shutter tore loose and started to bang. <gasps> Hello. 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 Who is it? Lieutenant Marsh at police headquarters, Mrs. Carpenter. Have you found Kuchewski? Yes, the boys brought him in about a half hour ago. I uh, did all I could. Well, what do you mean? Trespassing is a minor charge, Mr. Carpenter. Bail was set at $25. Mr. Reynolds just came in and bailed him out. You mean he's free? You let him get away? You've got to send somebody up here. You can't leave me alone if he's loose. I'm sorry, Mrs. Carpenter, but there's a storm emergency besides the bridge is washed out, and I'm I... tying up the line talking to you. Good night. I... Lieutenant! 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 Operator! Operator! Uh, get me, uh, Mr. George Carpenter at the, uh, at the Clearview Hotel. I'm sorry, but the lines are open for emergency service. But only. I must speak to him, I must. I'm sorry, but the storm has washed out most of the lines. We only have three circuits open for emergency. But this is an emergency, I tell you. It's a matter of life and death. Just a moment. I have a clear line. Oh. Please make your call brief. All right. All right. Hello? 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 
Where's your party? Hello. George. Oh, George, it's Leonora. You've got to help me, please. They arrested Kocheski, but Bert Reynolds bailed him out. I know it. Bert told me. You, you know it. You let him do it. You want me to be killed. He took Kocheski home and put him to bed. But he won't stay there. He's crazy. Oh, come out here, George. I need you. The bridge is out. There's no road well, over. Well, he'll find a way to get here. Oh, do you want me to go mad, George? I- I'll give you a divorce. I-, I won't fight it. I promise you, George, only don't let me die. Leonora, you know, you're please. hysterical. It's after midnight. <laughs> I'll be... Go on, George. Go on. George, please, George. George. <laughs> I was dead. Dead like I was going to be dead. Kachevsky would come. They didn't know it, but I did. The rain stopped, and I sat there listening to the ticking of the clock. It struck one, then two. That was all. It was so peaceful, and I almost dozed off. So, something was moving outside. I went to the window and saw the figure of a man turning into the shadows behind the house. I found the gun where I'd left it under the sofa pillars. I couldn't shoot him until he broke into the house. I moved to the kitchen and waited. He was fumbling with the door. There was a metallic sound. He was forcing something into the lock. And then it clicked. The door swung open. He was framed in the center of it and I fired. (laughs) He fell. I backed through the house. Opened the front door. And started to run. The road was a sea of mud. I knew he was dead, but I could feel him behind me, chasing me. I got to the river. It was starting to flood, but there was a boat coming across. Oh, I just cried with relief. When it landed, I I ran to it. A man jumped out. Hello, Mrs. Carpenter. Oh, no! No, no, you're dead. You can't hurt me. You're dead. My wife, she's dead, Mrs. Carpenter. Look at me, lady. Look at my face. I'll give you money. I'll give you money. I won't say anything about this. You can get away. Why you do this thing to me, Mrs. Carpenter? Why? What did I ever do to you? My husband. My husband was the one. He told me to do it. I didn't want to. He made me. You lie, lady. Your husband is good, man. You're choking me. Don't you like to die, Mrs. Carpenter? You like to write letters? You like other people should die. You must have killed me. You must have just run. You've been punished for it. You know that, don't you? Who's going to punish I... me later? You? I didn't mean to shoot you up there tonight. I, I, I thought you were hurt. I was coming down to get a doctor for you. I, I... You you just came across the river. You, 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 you couldn't have gotten down here before me. George! It was George. I killed George. You kill your husband? I thought it was you. I I mean, oh, I don't know. You want to kill me, but you kill him. I don't know. Ah. (laughs) You kill your husband, Mrs. Carpenter. You kill him. Now they're going to make you pay. It was an accident. An accident, I tell you, an accident. It was an accident. It was an accident. Ah. It was an accident. Ah. Ah. Because he's dangerous, I tell you. I came back here to the house and I found George. I left him just as it was, so you could see it was an accident, Lieutenant. I, I, I called you as soon as I got the phone light working. Yes, I see, Mrs. Carpenter. Uh, well, did you get all that on the wire recorder, Chuck? Yeah. Good, shut it off. <laughs> well, you better get your coat, Mrs. Carpenter. I'm being arrested. On suspicion of murder, Mrs. Carpenter. Oh, but you're making a mistake. All I did was write a letter. And kill your husband. But that was an accident. Why should I kill George? I had no reason. But you did have a motive for killing him. A very strong motive. He left you. He was divorcing you. He was going to marry another woman. And you knew all that before you shot him. But I didn't. It's on the recorder. Oh, you don't believe me. Don't worry about me, Mrs. Carpenter. It's the jury you've got to convince. All I did was write a chain letter. So 
Suspense, presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Agnes Moorhead. Doctor, lawyer, merchant, chief. Half your test, stating my belief that every car owner can be happy if his car is equipped with a set of the world-famous ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs. So be sure to have your dealer give your spark plugs a spring checkup. Autolite makes over 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete electrical systems used as original equipment on many makes of America's finest cars. Spark plugs, batteries, generators, coils, distributors, electric windshield wipers, starting motors, bullseye sealed beam headlights. All engineered to fit together perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite original factory parts at your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Miss Joan Bennett. The play is called The Statement of Mary Blake. And it is, as we say... A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. The Chain is an original play written for radio by Joel Murcott. Agnes Moorhead may soon be seen in the Warner Brothers production, Caged. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Claire Trevor and John Lund. And don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Joan Bennett. You can buy world-famous Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite stay-full batteries, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest star, Hollywood's genial character actor, Stuart Irwin. The story is by the author of The Thin Man and the Maltese Falcon, Dashiell Hammett, one of America's acknowledged masters of the art of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Stuart Irwin plays for us a pleasant, easygoing assistant chief of police in a small town who, to everyone's surprise, was instrumental in solving a murder. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense tonight, CBS presents Stuart Irwin in Two Sharp Knives by Dashiell Hammett. Shortly after 2 a.m., a poker game had just broken up at Ben Camdeley's, the doctor coroner of Deerwood City. Scott Anderson, Deerwood's chief of police, and Wally Shane, his assistant, were standing... Where are we heading for, Scott? Let's walk across the street, Wally. Railroad station. Gee, aren't you afraid of the excitement, Chief? Don't you think that watching the 211 come in is apt to be too much for your blood pressure? Well, if it is, Wally, you can always carry on. You've been a pretty good imitation of an assistant to me for some time now. Yeah? Yeah. If anything happens to me, you'd be the chief. Don't worry. It won't be any harder for you to fool the public as chief. Hi, Elmer. Uh, howdy, Scott. Uh, hi, hello, Wally. Kind of late for you boys to be around, ain't it? No, I don't know. We sort of figured we'd put the town to bed tonight. How's the 211? On time? Right on the nose. She ought to be blowing for the bend in just about three seconds now. Yep. What'd I tell you? It's her now. 
You expecting anyone on her, Scott? No, I'm, I'm not expecting anyone. Wally and I just thought we'd come over and watch you come in, that's all. You know, Elmer, you never can tell who might get off, though. Dick Turpin, Henry Morgan, Jesse James, Jake, Jack the Ripper, or six officers of Murder Incorporated, or even your Aunt Gussie. I guess you're right, Wally. Well, here she be. Pardon me, Jinx, but I gotta be rolling the wagon out to the baggage car. Well, can't complain. Can't complain, Cap. Well, maybe you can, Elmer, but I sure can if you hold us up with that freight there. You got much more? Nope. This is the last piece now. There you are, Cap. All done. Okay. See you tomorrow, Elmer. Hey, Scott. Do you see what I see? I mean, do I see the man who just got off that train? The answer is yes. Well, he's a ringer for the guy we got a picture of. That is the guy. Well, then, what do we do now? We take him, Wally. My car's at the corner of the alley. But Scott... We'll tail him up the street. Okay, Scott. There he goes now, over toward the taxi stand. Come on. Let's follow him. Hello, Furman. Huh? Oh, I... I don't believe You're I... Mr. Furman, aren't you? Yes, I am. Philadelphia? Yes. I'm Scott Anderson, Chief of Police. What? Chief of... What's happened to her? Happened to who? Oh, oh no, you don't. No. Let me go. Oh, no. You think you can pull that sort of stuff okay. with me? You're very much a crack at that mug. Oh, no, no, no. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute, Hold gentlemen. It, well, Furman? Well, I... I am sorry. For a moment there, I thought you weren't really a policeman. Thanks. Nice to know I look almost human. Yes, it... It was silly of me. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, let's get going now before anything else happens. Okay, Furman, get in the car. I'll drive, Scott. Anyhow. I'll, uh, are you taking me to police headquarters? That's right. What for? Philadelphia. I, uh, I don't think I understand. You understand that you're wanted in Philadelphia for murder, don't you? Murder? Why, that's ridiculous. That's... Who told you that? Well, it's a cinch he didn't make it up. But wait, there, there must be... Take it easy thing. now. Just wait till we get down to headquarters. And I'll show you what I mean. Now then, here's the circular on Lester Furman. It was sent out by the Transamerica Detective Agency in Philadelphia. Take a look at it. Oh, uh, $1,500 reward for the arrest and conviction of Lester Furman, alias Lloyd Fields, alias J.D. Carpenter, for the... for the murder of Paul Frank Dunlap in Philadelphia on December 8th, 1942. Well... Uh, it's a lie. You're firming, aren't you? Oh, yes, but... That's your picture on the circular, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but I... Well, I... Scott, I see you and Wally got firming, huh? Oh, hello, George. Uh, you lucky stiffs. Now you two split a grand and a half reward. i uh, never seen nothing like it. You know, if it ain't vacations in New York at the city's expense, it's reward, though. Judge, someday, if you don't remember you're the jailer around here, not the D.A., Hmm? You're going to be wearing your teeth on the outside of your lips, and I'll be the guys who arrange them that way. Savvy? Uh, just because you caught a guy who's hot in Philadelphia. It's a lie. It's a frame-up. You can't prove anything. There's nothing to prove. I never killed anybody. I won't be framed. Take it I easy, won't be framed. Furman. Take it easy. You're wasting your breath on us. Save it for the Philadelphia police. We're just holding you for them. But it's not the police. It's the Trans-America Please detective. turn you over to the Philadelphia police. Mr. Anderson, I... I... Well... Then, then there's nothing I can do now? There's nothing any of us can do till morning. We'll have to search you now, then we won't bother you anymore till they come for you. But I... Wally, you look through his bag. I'll see what he's got in his pockets. Okay, Scott. Well, all he's got on him are some business cards, a few letters, a hundred and... dollars, a book of checks in the Philadelphia bank, and a few odds and ends. What's with the bag, Wally? Not much. A couple of changes of clothes, some toilet articles, and... Oh, here's a 38. Loaded. Pretty little thing, isn't it? Okay, put those things in what I got in the vault. All right, George. 
You can take Furman now and lock him up. This is the most ridiculous come thing Come on, I... darling, come on. We ain't had nobody in our little hoosco for three days running. Hey, yeah? Uh, you'll have it all to yourself. Just like a sweet of the rich. But I... Go on, in you go. I tell you, 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 you're making a mistake. I demand to be allowed to get in touch with my lawyer. I... Hey, how about you boys cutting me in on a little of that blood money, huh? No, oh, sure, George, sure. I'll forget all about that two and a half you've been owing me for three months. Mm. Make Furman as comfortable as you can, George. Take good care of him. He's valuable, huh? Yeah, now, if it was some bum that didn't mean a nickel to you... George, any day now, I'm going to forget that your uncle is county chairman and throw you back in the gutter just to see how high he'll bounce. Remember that. Oh, Scott, I, I didn't mean nothing. That's I... all, George. Never mind the rest. I'm going home now. If anything's urgent, I can reach there. But get this. I don't want to be disturbed. Unless it is urgent. What time is it? It's five after six in the morning, and you'd better come right down, Scott. That fellow Furman's hung himself. What? Furman hung himself? Yep, by his belt, from a window bar. Dead in a mackerel. I'll be right in, Wally. Phone Doc Camsley and tell him I'll pick him up on my way down. No doctor's going to do Furman any good, Scott. Well, it won't hurt to have him looked at. You'd better phone the chronic court at Douglasville, too, and file a routine report. Already did that. And what's more, hold on to your seat. The DA's on his way over, in person. The DA? Yeah. I'll be there before you hang up, Wally. <laughs> Chief, Ted Carroll, the DA, is here, and he's plenty hot under the collar. What's he burning about? Oh, he's just mad, running up quite a phone bill on us, too. Been calling Philadelphia every couple of minutes since he got here. What kept you so long? Ah, I couldn't get my car started. Well, right, let's go in and see the old buzzard. Oh, Ted? Listen, Scott, what is all this? Oh, well, what? There's some funny business going on here. What's funny about it? Man hangs himself. Just another case of suicide. Sure, it was suicide. But I just telephoned Transamerica. Dug a guy out of bed there. And he said they'd never sent out circulars on Furman. Didn't know about any murder he was wanted for. All they could tell me about him was he used to be a client of theirs. You know what to say, Ted. I don't either. Oh, a fine chief of police you are. What on earth kept you so long? Castor. Came as quick as I could. Ain't you so crabby, Ted? Nothing. I guess it's just the district attorney and... Oh, now, come, come, gentlemen. Nobody'd know you two are staunch admirers of each other. <laughs> okay, Wally. Tell me, what do you make of it? Well, there's plenty wrong, Scott. First, that Trans-America thing. They never send out circulars about Furman. And now, get this. I talked to the Philly police just before you came in. There wasn't even any Paul Frank Dunlap murdered. There wasn't? no. What did you get out of Furman before you let him hang himself? That he was innocent. Didn't you grill him? Didn't you find out what he was doing in town? Wally, didn't what you? What for? He admitted he was Furman. The description fitted him. The photograph was him. The Trans-America Detective Agency is supposed to be on the level, ain't it? Philadelphia wanted Furman. We didn't, but Scott... I sure, Ted. If I'd have known he was going to hang himself. Yeah, but then if your aunt wore pants, you'd be your uncle. You said Furman had been a client of Trans-America. They tell you what the job they did for him was? His wife left him a couple of years ago, and he had them hunting for her for five or six months. But they never found her. They're sending a man up here tonight to look things over. Yeah, huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going out and grab a quick bite. But I might as well tell you, Scott, there's going to be trouble over this. I know that, Ted. There usually is when somebody dies in a jail cell. <laughs> Become of that 1,500 fish now, eh, huh, Scott? What happened there last night, George? Nothing. Furman hung himself. Did you find him? Uh-huh. Wally took a look in here to see how things was before he went off duty, and he found him. You're asleep, I suppose. Well, uh, I was catching a nap, I guess, but 
Everybody does that sometimes, Scott. Even Wally sometimes when he comes in off his beat between rounds. Yeah, but I always wake up when the phone rings or anything. Oh, sure. Well, suppose I had been awake. Can't hear a guy hanging himself, can you? Did Doc Cantley say how long Furman had been dead? Yeah, he done it about five o'clock, he said he guessed. Oh, you want to look at the remains, Scott? They're over at Fritz's undertaking parlor. Not now. Hey, and speaking of Furman, what are you going to tell the guys from Transamerica when they show up here tonight? <laughs> Come in, come in. Oh, uh, they, they told me I'd find you here. You're Chief Anderson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. I'm Carl Reising, assistant manager of the Trans-America Detective Agency in Philadelphia. This is Mr. Wheelock, who is Lester Furman's personal attorney. Glad to know you, Mr. Reising. How do you do, Mr. Wheelock? How do you do? I know you gentlemen are already in possession of most of the details concerning Mr. Furman from the time he arrived in Deerwood until the time of his death. But perhaps you don't know that the police of most towns in our corner of the state have also received copies of this same reward circular. Take a look at it. Oh. Oh. I must say this circular is an excellent forgery. You're sure it's a forgery, Mr. Reesing? Oh, yes. There's no doubt about it. But it's an excellent forgery. Tell me, Mr. Wheelock, was Mr. Furman a native Philadelphian? Oh, my, yes. He was a well-known, respectable, and prosperous citizen of Philadelphia. Married, I believe. In 1934, he married a 22-year-old girl named Ethel Bryan, daughter of a Philadelphia family. And the Furman's had a child. Isn't that right, Mr. Wheeler? Yes, born in 1936, but the child lived only a few months. Mr. Furman's wife disappeared after the child's death. Well, what year was it that she disappeared? Mr. Reesing should remember that. His agency worked on the matter. Oh, I remember it well. Uh, Mrs. Furman disappeared in 1937. We never heard anything of her again, although Furman spent a lot of money trying to locate her. What did she look like, Mr. Tracy? Oh, in just a moment, uh, I have a picture of her right here in my briefcase. Uh, uh, here it is. Quite pretty, isn't she? If you care for that type. Oh, you see what you mean, Mr. Wheeler. Well, she's attractive as that. Judging by this photo, I'd say that she was a small-featured, pretty blonde, with a weak mouth and large, somewhat staring eyes. Oh, that's an accurate enough description, all right. If you don't mind, I'd like to have a copy made of that photograph, Mr. Reesing. Oh, you can keep that one if you like. It's one that we had made up at Transamerica. Uh, her description's on the back. Thanks. Did uh, Furman ever divorce her? No, sir. He was a lot in love with her, and he seemed to think that the child's dying made her a little screwy so that she didn't know what she was doing. Uh, that's right, isn't it, Mr. Wheelock? That is my belief, Mr. Reesing. Uh, you said Furman had money, Mr. Wheelock. Uh, about how much did he have? And who gets it? I should say his estate will amount to perhaps a half a million dollars left in its entirety to his wife. Mm -hmm. It's quite a handy sum for anyone to have, I'd say. Mr. Wheeler, everything shows that somebody framed Furman into the Daywood jail. And that frame-up drove him to suicide. But there has to be something else. A lot else. Well, then, what are you going to do? I'm going across the street to the undertaking parlor and have a look at Furman. I'll see you later. Oh, Doc. Hi, Scott. I figured you'd come over here to the undertakers pretty soon. What's in your mind, Doc? Uh, let's uh, get out of this crowd. I, I want to tell you something. I just got rid of two guys in my office. Let's go back there. Suits me. Two of those uh, bruises uh, showed, Scott. What bruises? Furman. Well, up under the hair, there were there were two bruises. Well, why didn't you tell me? I'm telling you now, Scott. You weren't here when I made my examination. This is the first time I've seen you since then. Why didn't you spill the stuff about Furman's bruises when you were testifying at the inquest, then? Uh, I'm a friend of yours. Do I want to put you in a spot where people can say you drove this champ to suicide by third degreeing him too rough? Ah, you're nuts. How bad was Furman's head? Well, Scott, uh, that didn't kill him, if that's what you mean. Yeah, there's nothing the matter with his skull. Just a couple of bruises nobody had noticed, and unless they parted the hair. I thought you ought to know, though. Well, yeah. thanks, Ben. 
Yes, who is it? This is Fritz, the undertaker. Listen, Scott, there's a couple of ladies over here that want to take a look at Furman. Is it all right? Who are they? I don't know them. Strangers. What do they want to see him for? I don't know. Wait a minute. Can I please see him? Why do you want to see him? Well, I... I'm... his wife. Furman's wife? Yes. Oh, 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 certainly. I'll be right over. So long, Ben. I've got to go back to the undertakers. So long, Scott. Hey, Scott. What do you want, Wally? I want to talk to you a minute. Over here where we won't be seen. Okay, what is it? A couple of dames came into Fritz's undertaking place just as I was leaving. One of them's Hotshaw Randall, a babe with a record as long as your arm. She's one of that mob you had me working on in New York last summer. Does she know you? Sure, but not by my right name. She thinks I'm a Detroit rum runner. I mean, did she recognize you just now? I don't think she saw me. Anyway, she didn't give me a tumble. You don't know the other one? No, she's a blonde, kind of pretty. Okay, Wally, stick around a while, but stay out of sight. Maybe I'll be bringing these dolls back with me. Whatever you say, Chief. Oh, there you are, Scott. I wondered when you were coming. Uh, this is Mrs. Furman, and this is Mrs. Crowder. How do you do? Hiya, Chief. They just saw the body. Mrs. Crowder? I thought your name was Randall. What do you care, Chief? I'm not hurting your town any. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call me Chief. You city slickers, I'm the town whittler. Thank you for letting me see him. It's all right, Mrs. Furman. But I'll have to ask you and your friends some questions. So if you'll just come across the street to headquarters, we'll get on with the routine. <laughs> any questions, I want to tell you something. Mrs. Furman, your husband didn't commit suicide. He was murdered. Murdered? Ah, oh, Chief, we got alibis. We were in New York, and we can prove it. And you're likely to get a chance, Tim. What brought you down here, anyway? Murdered? Well, who's got a better right to come down here? She was still his wife, wasn't she? She's got a right to look out for her own interests, hasn't she? Mm-hmm. Uh, it reminds me of something. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, I've got to make a phone call in the next room. Officer Hamill speaking. This is Scott. Yes? Is Wally around? No, he's not here. He said you told him to keep out of sight. I'll find him for you, though. Right. Uh, tell Wally I want him to go to New York tonight. Send Mason home to get some sleep. He'll have to take over Wally's night trick. Oh, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Anderson, do you think I had, had anything to do with Lester's, with his death? I don't know, Mrs. Furman. I know he was killed. I also know he left you something like half a million. Wow. Dollars? Dollars. All right, Chief. Let's stop clowning. The kid here didn't have a thing to do with whatever you think happened. No? No. We read about Lester Furman committing suicide in yesterday morning's paper. And about there being something funny about it. And I persuaded her she ought to come down to Mr. Dear Anderson. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt Lester. I left him because I wanted to leave him. I wouldn't have done anything to hurt him for, for money or anything else. Had I wanted money from him, I would only have had to ask him for it. That's the truth, Chief. For years I've been telling Ethel she was a chump not to tap him. But she never would. I wouldn't have hurt him. Why'd you leave him then? Oh, I don't know how to say it. The way we lived wasn't the way I wanted to live. I wanted... Oh, I don't know what. Anyway, after the baby died, I couldn't stand it anymore. Excuse me. Hello? Oh, yeah, Hammer? Hmm? You gave Wally the message? Yes, yes, I want him to go to New York tonight. Okay, where is he? Home? He is home, huh? Okay, thanks. This is, uh, Furman. Uh, this circular that's got your husband in the jail. Did you ever see that picture before? No. Well, that's... It can't be. It, it's a snapshot I have. It's an enlargement of it. Who else has one? Nobody that I know of. I don't think anyone else could have one. Have you still got yours? Yes. I don't remember whether I've seen it recently. It's with some old papers and things. But I must have it. Well, Mrs. Furman, it's stuff like that that's got to be checked up. Neither of us can dodge it. There's two ways we can play it. 
Yes. Miss Berman, I can hold you here on suspicion until I've had time to investigate things. Or I can send one of my men with you to check up in New York. Yes. I'm willing to do that if you'll speed things up by helping them all you can. If you'll promise you won't try any tricks. I promise. I'm as anxious as you are. All right. Water. All right. How'd you come down? We drove down. We got a great big car. That's my car, see? That big green job across the street. Yeah. yeah. And my man can ride back with you, but no funny business. Oh, I don't worry, Chief. Come on. We're going to see Wally Shane. The man is going to drive to New York with you. Wally? Who is it? Scott, Wally. Come in. Ladies first. Harry. Harry. Ethel. No, you don't. No, you don't. No use reaching with that gun, Wally. Already got you covered. I guess you win, Scott. Yeah, I guess I do. Come along back to headquarters with me like a good little boy. Wally, you're under arrest for murder. Well, and that's how I knew it was all up, Scott, the minute I saw those two dames going into Fritz's. Then when I was dug and out of sight, I ran into you, and I was afraid you'd take me over there with you, so I had to tell you one of them knew me, figuring you'd want to keep me undercover for a little while anyhow, long enough for me to get out of town. Why didn't you get out, Wally? Well, I dropped in home to pick up a couple of things before I scram, and that phone call of Hamels catches me, and, and I fall for it. You see, Scott, I figured you're not on to me yet, and are going to send me back to New York to see what dope I can get out of the dames. Well, you fooled me, brother. And I thought you'd fall for that. Then you didn't just stumble into all this accidentally, did you? No, I didn't, Wally. I figured Perman had to be murdered by a copper. To know reward circulars well enough to make a good job of forging one. Incidentally, who printed that Perman circular for you, Wally? Now, I'm not dragging anyone in with me. It was only a poor mug that needed dough. Okay, Wally. You see, I knew only a copper would be sure enough of the routine to know how things would be handled. Only one of my coppers would be able to walk in a firm and sell, bang him across the head and string him up on the... Those bruises showed, you know, Wally. They did? I guess I should have wrapped two towels around that blackjack. Well, oh, gee, Scott, I seem to have slipped up on a lot of things. So that narrows it down to my coppers and... Well, you told me you knew the Randall woman. There it was. Only I figured you were working with him. What got you like this, Wally? Same thing that gets most saps into jams, a yen for easy dough. And I was in New York, see, Scott, working that Dutton job for you, palling around with big shot racketeers, passing for one of them, and... Yes? Well, I got to figuring that my work takes more brains than theirs, and they're taking in big money, and I'm working for coffee and cakes. That kind of stuff gets you, Scott. Anyway, it got me. Mm-hmm. Then I ran into this Ethel Furman, and she goes for me like a house of fire. I liked her, too, see? So that's dandy. But one night, she tells me about how much dough her husband's got and how he feels about her, and I get to thinking... Thinking what? I think she's nuts enough about me to marry me. So I get to thinking, suppose he died and left her his role. Mm-hmm. I see. So I run down to Philly a couple of afternoons and look Furman up, and everything looks fine. I took my time working out the details, meanwhile writing to her through a fellow in Detroit. Go on. Finish one. Well, I decided to do it. I sent those circulars out to a lot of places, not wanting to point too much to this one. And then when I was ready, I phoned Furman, telling him to come to Deerwood Hotel that night. And sometime before the next night, he'd hear from his wife, Ethel. I knew he'd fall for any trap that was baited with her. Only I guess I'm not as sharp as I thought I was, Scott. Maybe I, yeah, Wally. Maybe I. Yeah. That doesn't always help. Old man Camsley, Ben's father, used to have a saying. To a sharp knife comes a tough steak. Well, it's how you did it, Wally. I always liked you. I know you did, Scott. 
I was counting on that. Dashiell Hammett's Two Sharp Knives, starring Stuart Irwin. Tonight's story of... Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next week, suspense will not be heard because of a special holiday broadcast. Columbia's review of the events of the year. Twelve crowded months, which has been scheduled. On the following Tuesday, January 5th, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and Bernard Herman, the composer-conductor, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. Take a deep breath and let it out slowly. And once more. No, this is not a caprice. It is a thoughtful precaution. Fill your lungs well now, for you will be holding your breath for the next 30 minutes as you live through the long night with Frank Lovejoy. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. This is United 404, 10,000 over outer range. Request lower altitude over. United 404, this is Rockford Tower. Maintain present altitude until further advised. Over. United 404, roger, Rockford. Over and out. Rockford Radio, this is Delta 318, over. Delta 318, this is Rockford Radio. Go ahead. Delta 318, request permission to trade in approach. I'm over Milford Hills at 4,000, over. Delta 318, straight you stand in the airport granted. control tower, 90 feet up in the sky over Rockford Field, waiting to go on the night watch. And you'll listen to the babble of voices that fill the crowded room in an endless series of requests. Request for altitude change, request for landing Rockford permission, tower, request aircraft. for the weather. Here is the 9 o'clock weather. Low stratus clouds over the entire Mississippi Valley, spreading out over the central states. Visibility 2 miles, ceiling 2,200 feet and lowering steadily. Smoke clouds, and haze, smoke, haze, clouds, haze and fog, and a ceiling getting lower every minute. You look out through the tinted glass windows into the misty night, and you think of the strangers overhead, in and above the clouds. And you wonder if they, too, feel the hush as the long night begins. You wonder if the strangers with the throb of engines and the harsh rasp of many voices in their ears can feel the stillness. You look around the tower room, you look and you listen to the voices, and you're glad every time a ship touches down safely on the long, light-lined runways. Okay, Brother Ken, you can have it. For me, it's been a long day. Traffic been heavy? It started sort of slow, but it's building up. I got three converging on the outer marker and two inbound on the range. It's all here on the board for you. Yeah, okay. They're beginning to stack up over Chicago, but uh, that's their worry. Yeah, and they can have it. Yeah. Well, happy landing, man. Yeah, so long, Charlie. Good night, John. Rockford Tower, this is TWA Flight 70 requesting weather your field. Over. Hello, TWA 70. This is Rockford. We have straightest clouds, ceiling of 2,000, visibility under two miles. Smoke, haze, and fog on the ground. Over. What is your traffic there, Rockford? Five inbound inside the 20-mile range, one Convair and two DC-7s outbound on the red, over. 
Okay, Rockford, uh, this is DWA 70 requesting change of flight plan to land your field instead of Chicago. Roger, TWA. I'll notify Chicago and clear you in. Give us a call when you pass the Milburn Hills. Rockford out. Roger. Thanks very much. Give Chicago a call, Mike. Tell them their Flight 70 is terminating here. Okay, Ken. We'll do. Rockford, Rockford, Rockford Tower. This is Beechcraft Bonanza N91457. Hello, Beechcraft N91457. This is Rockford Tower. I've been homing on your range, and apparently my automatic direction finder isn't working right. I think I'm lost. Stand by, 457. Check the flight file, will you, Mike? See if he's on it. All right. Hello, Rockford. Are you hearing me, Rockford? If you are, please give me a call. This is Rockford. We're reading you fine, Beach. Hold on a second. Find anything on it, Mike? Nope, there's nothing here, Ken. No flight plan. Okay. Hello, Beechcraft N91457. This is Rockford Tower. What seems to be the trouble with your ADF? I don't know exactly, Rockford. I'm not too familiar with this equipment. But I don't think it's working right because I've been changing from one range to another just like I was told to. And I ought to have been somewhere over Minneapolis long ago. And I'm not. All right, Beechcraft. We'll work something out for you. Where are you flying from? Indianapolis. Headed on a direct flight to Minneapolis? That's right, Rockford. I set my automatic direction finder just exactly the way I was told to when they installed it. Did you make any visual checks against what your ADF showed? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Did you check your course when you passed over the airways range stations by looking at visual ground objects like signs on the top of oil tanks telling you what city you were over, anything like that? No, I'm afraid I didn't. I thought my ADF was working, so I didn't think about anything else. Okay. Now, what was your last known position? Last known? Well, uh, I'm trying to think. I guess the last time I positively knew where I was was when I departed Indianapolis. At what time was that? About 5.30, uh, maybe 5.45. 5.30? Uh, verify that time. That would be more than three hours en route. You should be well out of my range. Yeah, I know. But I've been circling for more than an hour, trying to make the ADF work and looking for Rockford. What is your remaining fuel supply? Well, uh, I guess there's no use kidding myself. I think I've got about 45 minutes, maybe at the very best, an hour. Well, here is the situation. The weather here is solid overcast at 600, visibility one mile in smoke and haze. Do you see any towns, rivers, highways that you can identify? No, I can't see anything but clouds. I'm on top. Holy smoke, did I hear that right? Yes, you did. Beechcraft, did you say you were on top? That's right, on top of a solid layer. Have been for a long time. At what altitude? I'm, uh, I'm at 5,000 indicated, about 1,000 above the clouds. Uh, 457, take a good look around you. Are there any breaks in the overcast? Can you see any holes, any thin spots in the area at all? No. No, it's solid. It's a completely solid layer. Are you an instrument pilot? What do you mean? I mean, are you checked out on instruments? Do, do you have instrument training? No. No, I've never been on instruments in my life. I'm just lost. You look at the clock, 9.04. You look at the clock and mentally give yourself 45 minutes. 45 minutes to find him, bring him in, and get him on the ground. You check the latest weather chart and you don't like what you see. Your mouth feels dry. You reach for a cigarette as you punch the mic button and do the next thing that must be done. Rockford Tower to all planes working this frequency. We have an emergency. Repeat, we have an emergency. Please maintain radio silence on this frequency until further notice. Out. A Rockford Tower to Beechcraft, N91457. Come in, 457. Okay, Rockford. Tell me, how did you get on top? Well, it was almost clear when I left Indianapolis. I climbed straight out to 5,000, and later, while I was trying to get the ADF working, I 
found myself on top. It, it just happened. Yes, are you familiar with range orientation? No, I don't know anything about that either. I'm just a businessman with a new airplane. I know only enough about the radio to tune in the stations. I know I'm lost, though, and need help. These gas tanks aren't getting any fuller. Yes, I know, 457. I understand. Sure, you understand, but he doesn't. He knows he's lost and he needs help. He understands that. But he doesn't know what the odds are on getting him straightened out and over the field and then getting him down through that solid layer of clouds. You fight down a sudden urge to push the microphone button and scream at him. To tell him that nobody forced him into an airplane he hardly knew how to fly. Nobody forced him to take off on a long night cross-country in weather suitable only for experienced professionals. But you know there's no time for hindsight. There's hardly any time for hopes. So you push the black button and you try to sound calm. Hello, 457. This is Rockford Tower. Now, listen to me carefully. Are you reading me okay? Yeah. Hello, Rockford. I'm hearing you fine. Loud and clear. All right. Now I'm going to try to get a fix on you. But before I do, I want you to know what the situation is. I'm sure I can find you. I'm reasonably sure I can get you over the airport before you're out of fuel. I am not sure, though, that we can get you on the ground. Do you understand? No, no, I don't understand. I'm lost, and I'm about out of gas, and I don't understand why we're wasting time talking about it. You get me over an airport, and then we'll worry about getting on the ground. All right, but you understand this. It's my job to help find you. It's my job to help you find the airport, and I'll do everything I can to get you on the ground. But flying that airplane through those clouds will be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. Do you understand that? Okay, I understand. Now, what are we going to do? Now, we're going to orient you by radio and bring you in over the Rockford Airport. I will tell you what must be done, but you have got to do it. I can't fly your airplane for you. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay, Rockford. I understand. You know the standard procedures for range orientation. You run over every step of them a million times for just this kind of emergency. That's one of the reasons you're up here in this modern Tower of Babel on these long nights. But you've got two strikes against you on this one. Time, you read the clock at 9.07, and a fool in an airplane. Uh, Mike. Yeah, Ken. Get your cargo control center on the horn. Ask them to set up an alert of all facilities within 100 miles. Roger. Uh, you better get them to clear all altitudes in the area below 6,000 feet. Okay, we'll do. You know, I don't know whether to try to get him down through the clouds now and then try to bring him in or whether to get him over us on top and then let him down where we won't lose radio contact if he gets too low. Well, it's souped up all across the valley, Ken. You might get him down through it, but if he's too far out, he'd have no chance of getting here under the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, and if I don't get him started, it's something he'll be out of fuel anyway, and it won't matter. Uh, I'm going to bring him in on top. Okay, I'll check weather very closely, Ken. If I hear of any breaks, I'll give it to you. Good, thank you. Hello, 457, this is Rockford Tower. Yeah, okay, Rockford. I'm going to speak very distinctly. And if you don't understand any part of what I tell you, come in and break me off. It's vital that you understand me. Is that clear? Yeah, I understand. Okay. Now, I want you to listen very closely to my range signal. Put everything else out of your mind. Listen and describe exactly what you hear. Okay. Hello, Rockford. I hear a code sound. Is that the range? That's right. What does it sound like? Well, it, it's, uh, it goes... Da, dit, da, dit. Okay, 457. Now, is it loud or soft? It's pretty loud. Okay, that's the N quadrant. Now, I want you to tune to the Madison, Wisconsin range and tell me what you hear. Okay, wait a minute. Yeah, uh, hello, Rockford. Uh, I've got the Madison range. What does it say? It's just like the other, only backwards. Uh, da-da. Da-da. That's right. I can hardly hear it, but it's there all right. Yeah, okay, 457. That's the A quadrant. 
Now I want you to try Peoria and then Chicago. Rockford, Madison, Peoria, Chicago. Four corners to check from. Four radio sounds that you hope he's reading correctly. You finish the check and he comes through without a bobble, and you know you have him fixed. You know at least his direction from you. You take a deep breath and for the first time you feel a tiny flicker of hope that you're going to find your stranger and get him in all right. But you're a long way from home and you light another cigarette and push the black microphone button hard. Now listen carefully, 457. I'm going to run a check procedure on you. I want you to take up a northeast heading, turn your volume down as low as you can and still receive my range signal. At the very moment you detect a change in signal strength, either higher or lower, advise me. All right, Rockford. I'll do my best. I'm not sure that I... I'm not at all sure. Hello, 457. Can you hear me? Do you hear me, Beechcraft 457? Rockford. Yes, I read you now. I lost you for a second, but I hear your range signal now. Did you get all of my last transmission? Yeah, I think so. I think I can do it. Hello, Oxford. My gauges indicate empty tanks. There's some gas left, I know, but I have no idea how much. Do you know where I am? I'm quite sure of your direction from me, and I believe I know how far out you are within, say, 20 miles. If what you've told me is correct, I estimate you have 30 minutes fuel remaining. I believe your gauges are indicating normally. Now, try to concentrate on doing just what I've told you to do. Yeah, okay, Rockford. I don't want you to think I'm ungrateful. I realize you can't afford mistakes. But I can't last much longer. I'm not trying to hurry you, but the gauges say empty, and my son is getting sick. You didn't say anything about having any passengers aboard. How many are there of you? Just my son and me. Is the air rough? Is there turbulence? No, no turb... Uh, the air is smooth. But you said your son is getting sick. Yes. You see, he's only nine, and he's getting scared. That's what's making him sick. You don't say anything for a long minute. You just stare out into the miserable night, and your thoughts are not nice. You think of your own kid and you thank God he's home safely in bed. And you know now, if you didn't know it before, that you've got to bring these strangers home. You reach for the microphone button, but before you push it, the voice is back What's on your screen. What's happened, Rockford? I, I can't hear you anymore. Did you hear me? I, I was talking to you. You didn't answer. Hello, Rockford. Come in, please. I'm reading you. Four, five, seven. I heard everything you said. Now listen to me carefully. You should be approaching my west course close into the station. I want you to listen closely and describe any change in your signal. I won't call you. You call me when you hear anything change. Okay, Rockford. Hello, Rockford. The signal is much louder now, and I'm getting more of a continuous tone in my earphones, although I can still hear that other signal. All right, 457, that's fine, that's good. Now, listen carefully. Turn your volume down a little more, and when you no longer hear that other signal, and when the continuous tone is loud and clear, and when you hear nothing but the continuous tone, at that time, I want you to turn right to a heading of 93 degrees magnetic. Is that clear? I, uh, yeah, I think so. You think so? You've got to know so. When you hear nothing but a tone, when there's nothing but a loud buzz in your ears, I want you to turn right to nine three degrees on your compass. Do you understand me? Yes, I understand. Turn right to ninety uh, to nine three degrees on the compass when I hear a loud tone. That's correct. The tone is strong now. I don't hear the other signal. Nothing but the tone. Shall I... Yes, turn right, turn to 93 degrees, and advise. Advise? Advise when on course, when on 93 degrees, advise. Uh, Roger. Advise when on... I'm on course now. 
on 93. All right, good. Chicago Control Center has everything cleared on the 6,000. They're monitoring the calls, too. Okay, Mike, thanks a lot. What's the time? Um, 940, straight up. 940? That's 12 minutes to make it in. Hello, 457. You're approaching the range now. You're almost over the station. The range is about two miles from where I'm sitting. The signal you hear will continue to increase in volume until you cross the range. At that time, it will fade out quickly. For a moment, you may hear nothing. Then it will increase again rapidly. Now, at the very instant your signal fades, I want you to make an immediate left turn to a heading of four or five degrees magnetic. Take that heading and advise. Understand? I understand. Mike, get on the phone and alert the local police and fire departments. Tell them what we've got and to be on the lookout for a fast move. Roger. Get all the lights on in the field, the runway markers. When we get him down through this, he won't have any time to spend looking for the field. Okay, we will do. That is, if we get him down through it. You light another cigarette. You watch the clock on the desk. You try to keep your mind clear, to think ahead, to think of everything that can possibly happen, and the waiting is worse than anything yet. You keep reaching for that microphone, wanting to call him to ask him why he doesn't tell you he's over the range. And you know he hasn't called you because he isn't over the range yet. And you wait, and you wait, and then it comes loud and clear. Rockford! Rockford! I'm over the range and starting a turn. It's just like you said. It's exactly the way you said it would be. Roger, 457. You're doing fine. Now come left to 45, straight and level. Hold it until I tell you different. I'll call you back. I think you got him, Ken. Well, if he's where he ought to be, we should hear him in about 20 seconds. I'm going out the platform and listen. Call me if he calls in. Okay. You stand on the steel grating of that tower platform and you try to hear over the sounds from the field below. You strain your ears for a sound that should come to you out of the southwest. And you've never wanted to hear anything so much in your life. And then you hold your breath. You stop breathing to hear better. And it's there. A single engine singing a quiet, sweet sound and approaching directly on course. You flick your burning cigarette out into the black space and stumble back into the tower room. You grab the mic and you almost shout into it. Four, five, seven, four, five, seven. This is Rockford. You're over the field. I hear you clearly. Start a 360 turn immediately and orbit in your present area. Beginning of 360. For God's sake, tell me what to do. This engine is ready to quit. You snap a look at the clock. 9.46. Five, maybe six minutes more if you're lucky. Six minutes at the outside to get him lined up properly for a straight-in approach to talk him down through 4,000 feet of solid clouds. Six minutes to bring off a miracle. You waste 15 precious seconds debating the best way to do it. All along up to now, you've planned it this way. A good, steady, full-scale power approach, nose up a little, flaps down just enough, power on exactly right. Your mind has told you that this was the ticket, the only answer. With a good steady airplane, no turbulence to speak of, well-trimmed and hands-off, he might just make it. He might. But suddenly you're not sure. Maybe if he could pull his power, slow her down, trim her slow and steady, a touch of flaps, that might be the answer. That might do it. It would save precious gas if he missed his approach or he goofed up in the clouds, he could get back on top for another try. Maybe. You push the microphone button hard and try to sound calm. 457, I hear you plainly. You're circling the airport. There isn't time to talk this out. You'll have to do exactly what I tell you the first time and do it right. There simply isn't time enough. Oh, wait a minute. Do you have chutes? Do you have parachutes aboard? No. No parachutes. (laughs) All right, uh, 457. We'll have to do it this way. Now listen to what I have to say. You don't have to talk. Just listen. Come around to a due west heading. Due west. As you do, start slowing her down. Slow her down and trim her up for a power approach. A normal power approach, do you understand? I understand, Rockford. Don't talk to me. Bring her around, head west, with the power on. Slow her down, flaps down to approach position. Trim her up, make her steady. Advise when you're headed west and slow down. 
10, 15, 20. Where is he? Where is 25? 457, are you there? 457? I'm trying to get her steady. I'm trying to do what you told me. All right, 457. Don't talk. Advise when on course. Rockford, I, I'm on 270 now. Slowing down. I don't know. I just don't know. I know you don't know. All we can do is try. I understand. I'm down to 80 now. Flaps down and power on. Roger. Continue trimming her. Trim her down good. Adjust your power and trim her until she's descending at a steady 500 feet per minute. That's 500 per minute. Trim her good, do you understand? Trim her so good that she will let down at 500 feet per minute with your hands off. Do you get that? With your hands off. I understand. Now, 457, you're going to bring her around very slowly and precisely to an east heading. You're going to handle her very gently so she won't fall off on you flying so slow. You hear me? Yes, I hear you. Let her continue to settle at 500 feet a minute. Just bring her around slowly to the east, recover, and then take your hands off the controls. She won't fly with my hands off. She will fly. She'll fly better than you can. Now listen to me. When you are eastbound, hands off. She will descend slowly into the clouds. After you're in the clouds, do not touch the controls. I don't think I... Then don't think. Do as I tell you. Now, when you get in the clouds, everything will change for you. You will think the airplane is all wrong, that it's doing everything that it shouldn't do. If you leave it alone, it will start a slow spiral to the left, but I don't think it'll be enough to do any harm until you've broken out under the ceiling. Now, whatever it does, you will think it's going to the right or up or down or even spinning, but it won't be doing any of those things unless you make it do them. Now, don't touch it. Now, are you eastbound? I'm eastbound, yes. Take your hands off the controls. But I... Take your hands off now. Okay. Hands are off. Now let her have it. Let her fly herself. Ken, the ceiling's under 600 feet. That doesn't give him much time to recover and get his bearings when he breaks out. Oh, but... It... But it's all we can do. It's all anybody can do. You sit there waiting, only too aware of what can be happening in the cabin of Beechcraft 457... Sweating out each second of time with a terrified pilot and his deathly scared kid. You wonder if this man, this stranger, and yet no longer a stranger, can keep his fantasies under control for that long letdown. The lonely, long letdown through total darkness with nothing but a great fear for a companion. A minute goes by, and another, and then... Rockford! Rockford! It's turning, Rockford! Turning! Airspeed's high! It's going higher! Get off those controls! Cut the throttle! I've got the throttle closed! She's slowing down fast! I can't see! I can't! Well, she's going to stall. Give her the throttle slowly. Keep your hands off except the throttle. She'll climb back out on top if you keep your hands off her. Two minutes wasted, more than two minutes because he couldn't believe what you told him. You had him and then you lost him. And now, if the teacup of gas still in his tanks holds out, if he gets back on top, you still have it to do all over again. You begin to feel the long night closing in on you. He's almost calm when he calls you back this time. You can almost hear his sigh of relief. Hello, Rockford. I'm back on top now. Good. Maybe we have time for one more try. Now, let's try it with the power off this time. You may lose your engine before you can it's get... It's no use, Rockford. It's just no use. I can't do it. I was fine until I got into those clouds. I just couldn't sit there and do nothing. I just couldn't. 
I know I can't do it again. Listen, there's time. There's time for another try. Forget it. The engine just quit. That's it, Rockford. Well, you can still do Forget it. Forget it. You're wasting your time. I just want to say thanks for trying. Hello, 457. Hello. Hello, Beach. Hello, 457. He can't hear you. His hands froze to the mic. Yeah. You better hit the crash button. Roger. A Rockford Tower to all planes awaiting landing instructions. The emergency is over. Normal radio procedure is now in effect. Rockford, over and out. Rockford Radio, Delta 216, rest. WA-70, request permission. Suspense. In which Frank Lovejoy starred in The Long Night, adapted by Sam Pierce from the Atlantic Monthly Story by Lowell D. Blanton. Listen. Listen again next week when radio's outstanding theater of thrills brings you another tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Suspense is produced and directed in Hollywood by William N. Robeson. Included in tonight's cast were Stacey Harris, Byron Kane, Court Falkenberg, Sam Pierce, and Jack Crucian. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Paul Barron. Sound patterns by Ray Kemper and Bill James. With Jack Benny and his gang back on the air each Sunday, there's just no excuse for a frown. Later on today and every Sunday, get in on the fun on the lighthearted Jack Benny Show. It's always a joy to hear. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by indictment. Just about the gayest couple in detective fiction are Nora and Nick Charles. Nick Charles is really the detective, but Nora makes a beautiful and able assistant. You'll hear all about the Charles family when you listen to The Adventures of the Thin Man every Friday beginning January 8th over this station at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime and for the Pacific Time Zone at 9.30 p.m. Pacific Wartime. Tonight, Columbia brings you as guest stars two deaf players from the movie lots of Hollywood and the stages of Broadway, Miss Celessa Landy and Mr. George Coloris. They are here to spend with us a half hour of suspense. Suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are stories calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. Tonight, for instance, Miss Landy plays for us an agreeable young lady who is on the trail of some hot money. And Mr. Coloris plays for us a disagreeable young man who may or may not know more about the money than he says. We trust that with this tale we shall keep you in... Suspense. For Suspense tonight, CBS presents Alyssa Landy and George Coloris in Nothing Up My Sleeve by John Dixon Carr. Hey, 
X-ray, X-ray, read all about it. Shock, fog, and caught. X-ray, X-ray, read all about it. Shock, fog, and caught. It's New Year's Eve, remember? Times Square is celebrating. The fiery lights flash no longer, but the crowds are still the same. Thronging, jostling, singing, drowning out a voice at the street corner when it says, Fatal gunfire, let you make it. Read all about it. Fatal gunfire, let you make it. Read all about it. But would that cry perhaps reach as far as a large and sedate country house some 20 miles from New York? Out there, the earth is sealed up with snow. The white pillars of the house rise up high and ghostly against it, showing no outward light. A lonely house, this mansion in Fir Wood. Just the place for a murder, I've always said. Wouldn't surprise me either. These Ralphs are a funny lot. And alone in that house tonight, apparently alone, is a man practicing shots in a billiard room, a long and paneled room at the back of the house. Now, look at Mr. Derek Ralph, as tall and lean and well-tailored as ever. Many people don't like him. He's a little too supercilious, a little too short of himself, too suggestive of the lifted lip and the glazed eye. There he stands in the billiard room, under the snow-covered skylight, leaning over the green cloth under brilliant lights when... Huh. Just a moment, please. Ah, good shot. Yes, come in. Excuse me, Mr. Ralph. Oh, not at all. Hey, but aren't you Miss... Uh, I'm Dorothy Dale, your aunt's social secretary. Surely you remember that. Oh, of course, of course. Forgive me for forgetting your name. Uh, you surprised me, Dorothy. Yes, I thought I surprised you a little. No, I mean you surprised me by being in the house at all. Why? Why? Well, this is New Year's Eve. Shouldn't you be out getting drunk and blowing cardboard horns and doing the other fantastic things that people do? I haven't much heart for that tonight. Please, don't become emotional, Dorothy. I detest emotion. If you're shivering, go over by the radiator. Mr. Roth. May I ask you a question? Of course. Did you ever feel sick at heart? Huh? Physically sick, I mean, so that your insides turned over and you couldn't get your breath and... Did you? <laughs> no. No, I can't say I did. Uh, may I move you aside for just a moment? <laughs> Thank you. Ah, not bad. Can't you guess why I came here to see you tonight? No. Because I'm in terrible trouble, Mr. Rolf. Desperate trouble. And I think you can help me. I can help you. How? For one thing, you're making quite a name for yourself as a lawyer. Yes, that's what others have told me. For another thing... Do you know a man named Shark Morgan? Shark Morgan. Shark, did you say? Mm-hmm. Shark Morgan. No, I'm sure I've never heard that name before. You ought to know him. He's a little dark-faced man with most of his upper lip cut away in a knife fight so that you can see all his teeth. That's why they call him Shark. Oh, he sounds like an unpleasant-looking person. He is, or was, a ghastly-looking person. You don't know him? He's not a client of yours? No. I don't believe you. Uh, just a moment, Miss Dorothy Dale. I must put down this cue and say a few words myself. Please do. I don't want to be offensive to you, but it seems to me that for a paid employee of my aunt, practically a servant, you're taking a great deal on yourself. If you're trying to hurt me that way, you're succeeding. But go ahead. You come to me at 11 o'clock at night. You come rushing into this billiard room. Oh, observe, I call it a billiard room, though this is actually a pool table. <laughs> Just as everything in life gets its wrong name. I entirely agree. Yes, but you agree about what? That everything gets its wrong name. Honest men are called thieves, and thieves are called honest men. Uh, would you mind explaining that remark to I me? I can explain it very easily. I'm engaged to be married to Jerry Winton. Well? But don't say you don't know who Jerry Winton is. He was in college with you. I played on our extremely second-rate baseball team with him, yes. You never liked him, did you? Liked him? I'm afraid I never noticed him. Jerry Winton works at City and Provincial Bank on 51st Street. He's a teller there. Does that mean anything to you? No. You see, it's not my bank. I was at the City and Provincial Bank yesterday afternoon. Yesterday afternoon, Mr. Ralph, just before closing time. It was a dark day and the lights were on. There weren't many people in that big marble hall. I went up to Jerry's window, if that's what you call it. <laughs> A 
check for a million dollars? Hello, Dolly. <laughs> Hello, Jerry. You glad to see me? I am not pleased to see you here, Dolly. Huh? I'm never pleased to see you here. And why not? Because I can't make love to you. Can <laughs> you imagine anybody making love in a bank? Oh, we might sneak into the president's office. As a matter of fact, I've dreamed of holding a party in there. But it'll never happen, unless I'm fired, which is very likely. Jerry, sometimes I wish you weren't so easygoing. I'm not easygoing with the bank's money, Dolly. Otherwise, I'd be shoving it out to you through the window in double handfuls like this. Jerry, for heaven's sake, no. <laughs> they didn't state your business, madam. The convict in the next cage is watching us already. I want to cash a check. Here it is. Twenty dollars. That is, if my account can stand it. <laughs> yes, I think we can manage that. How will you have it? Oh, it doesn't matter anyway. Jerry. What's wrong? Look over there. Where? Over there by that marble table with the pens and ink on it. The little man with no upper lip to his mouth and all his teeth showing. Ugly looking devil, I admit. He's carrying something like a violin case. Hold on. I've seen that fellow someplace before. Of course you have. Don't you remember where? It was... It was out at Mr. Rolfe's house in the country when you came to visit me last Sunday. The man with the teeth and five other men were coming out on the porch as we were going in. Wait a minute, Dolly. That's not all. What is it? There's some very funny-looking customers in this bank right now. Where? At Mr. Wallace's window. At Mr. Robinson's window. And up by the guard at the front door. They, they, they don't seem to make any sound. As though they all wore rubber soled shoes. Jerry, something's going to happen. I know it is. Unless I can get off this stool and... Oh. Warn... That was just to call your attention, folks. Just to call your attention. Now, just stand where you are, all of you. And nobody I can hide. Darling, I, I'm scared. Well, what should oh, I do? You stay Steady, there, dear. Just stand still. Stay I right don't there. dare turn around. Was that the man with the teeth? Yes, he's got, he's got the machine. We don't want any funny business about alarm bells, see? One of the boys is already gone behind to take up the collection. Now just stay where you are, that's all you gotta do. You can't get away with this. Oh, look, boys, here's a guy at the front with a nice mahogany desk and a plate with his name on it who says we can't get away with it. Let's show him. Huh? Don't do it, Sean. That wasn't in our orders, so we can't get away with it. Oh, he's crazy. Now, hear somebody else talking? Jerry! Thought I heard somebody over it. Oh, it's you, kid. Move to one side of the window, Dolly. Move to one side of the window. Don't worry, kid. I ain't gonna hate you. No? Not a bit of it. Thanks for helping us. You'll get your cut later. What do you mean, my cut? That's what I said. You'll get your share when we divvy up. Well, I don't know anything about this don't robbery. Don't worry, kid. We'll take care of you. I tell you, I don't know anything about this robbery. Jerry! Are you listening, Mr. Rolfe? Well, this shark Morgan must be quite a fool. I grant you that. He was a fool. He must have been crazy. But they've held Jerry at police headquarters just the same. Well, that's very unfortunate if he's innocent. You know he's innocent. I'm afraid I don't know anything about it. Don't you even know what happened today? Haven't you read the newspaper? No. The police trapped that whole gang in a Long Island farmhouse. There was a gunfight. Oh, is that so? Oh, no casualties, I hope. You hope? I must tell you again, Dorothy, don't, don't be emotional. I detest emotion. The whole gang were killed, every last one of them, including Shark Morgan. So there's nobody to talk, nobody to tell, but... But, oh. uh, as you were saying? They didn't find the money. What money? The stolen money. $88,000 taken from that bank, and yet the police can't find a cent of it. Shall I tell you why, Mr. Rolfe? Because it was passed on to somebody else for safekeeping. Oh, passed on to somebody else. That's eh? what I said. <laughs> Well, perhaps your friend Jerry Winton could tell us where it is. That's what the police think. Oh, can you imagine what he's going through tonight? Oh, it's not a pleasant way to spend New Year's Eve, I admit. Uh, excuse me. But, you know, after all, the late Shark Morgan did accuse Winton. Now, if he isn't guilty, why should Morgan accuse him? Meanness. <laughs> I, I don't think I understand. Meanness? The sort of meanness that some people call a sense of humor... Morgan saw Jerry in this house. Oh, be careful, young lady. That's an actionable statement. I've already made it to the police, thanks. Oh, and did they believe you? No. They're a very intelligent crowd down at Center Street. And after all, your story isn't very credible. Why huh? not? Well, Shark Morgan sees your friend Winton. 
sees him for perhaps 10 seconds coming out of this house and then accuses him of compl complicity in a bank robbery. Now, is that very likely? Yes, very likely. If somebody put him up to it. <laughs> Again, I don't understand you. Somebody deliberately told Morgan to accuse Jerry and get him into as much trouble as possible. Tell me, Mr. Rolfe, why do you dislike Jerry so much? You know, now that you mention that fellow, I can recall who he is. Thanks for condescending to. Yes, yes, indeed. Why, he was the man in our class voted most likely to succeed. <laughs> now, let's see. Where did you say he is tonight? He's just where you put him. You know, you're trying my patience to the very limit, young woman. And out in a Long Island farmhouse, there are five bodies full of bullet holes. Five men who'll never speak again. And somewhere else, maybe not very far from here, is the man who engineered the whole robbery. Planned it and staged it and got his accomplices killed. My goodness, he must have supernatural powers. No he? witnesses, nobody to testify. Oh, if I could only find the money. $88,000, I think you said. If I could only find the money and prove who had done it and prove Jerry innocent and just for one second get past that devilish smug mask of yours that's driving me. Anything wrong, Dorothy? No. No, nothing at all. You've been following me round and round this table. Have you been looking at something? Only ad admiring your billiard room, that's all. Oh, you haven't been looking at, at the suitcase, for instance. Oh, well, a suitcase? Look, over on the bench under the cue rack. The suitcase that contains legal papers. I hadn't even noticed it. Uh, Mr. Rolfe? Yes, Dorothy? I'm afraid I've taken up a lot of your time and not done my myself any good and made something of a spectacle of myself. <laughs> Frankly, young woman, you have. Well, if you won't help me, you won't. That's that. If you don't mind, I'd like to go now. I suppose, my dear, I didn't choose to let you go. But why... Why, why shouldn't you? What harm can I do? I... Now, who was it? Who was it? Was, it? was it Meredith who remarked that the last thing to be civilized by man will be woman? I think it was, yes. And, you know, and a slanderous woman can do a great deal of harm. But I, I haven't done you any harm so far. We're all I... alone in this house. There's not even a servant here. Now, if I chose to get between you and the door like this... I... Keep away from me. Oh, I'm not coming near you, Dorothy. No. I'm merely standing between you and the door. Now, I suppose you realize that I could turn very nasty if I like. What are you going to do? Do? Well, what? I'm going to open the door for you, like this. I'm going to say, God bless you, my child, as befits a New Year's greeting. I'm going to show you out and wish you good night. You... You... You, 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 you don't mind? Mind? <laughs> Certainly not. You've got something to hide, haven't you, Mr. Rolfe? No, no. Nothing, young woman, that I can't hide. Good night. Operator. What number are you calling, please? Operator, I, I want to get to police headquarters in New York City. No, 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 that, that, that'll take too long. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, uh, get me the local police station. This is Mallingford 8891. Eight, the local police station? Yes, yes, that's right. The number you want is Mallingford 326. I will ring them. Thank you. Hurry. Oh, why is he so confident? What has he got up his sleeve? Mallingford Police Station. Oh, uh, let me speak to the chief of police, please. You're speaking to him, ma'am. Nobody else to stay up here on New Year's Eve. Well, my, my name is Dale, Miss Dorothy Dale. I, I, I'm speaking from Greenacres, Mr. Derek Rolfe's house, about two miles up the post road. Um, do you know it? Yes, I know it, but can't you talk louder? I can hardly hear you. I, I don't dare talk loud. I, I'm speaking from a phone just outside the billiard room door. Well, what about it? Listen... You want to recover the city and provincial bank money, don't you? We sure do, miss. That money's hot, but... But it's here. It's in this house, in this billiard room now. Oh, who's got it? Derek Rolfe himself. Look, miss, is this on the level? I swear it's true. I've seen the money. The Rolfe's are prominent people, you know. I can't help that. 
There's a big suitcase completely full of money in packages fastened with the paper label of the city and provincial lamp bank. And that's not his own bank. Take it easy now. The lid of the suitcase wasn't quite closed. He thought he'd be alone here tonight, and that's why he was careless. Does he know you saw the money? Did I see the money? I, 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 I'm not quite sure. You're not sure? No, I could almost have sworn he knew I saw the money, but, but he, he didn't seem to care. He... Be careful. The billiard room door's opening. I thought I heard someone using the telephone out here. Excuse me, Mr. Roth. I, I, I only... What's uh... this about the door opening? Oh, these doors are rather thick, Dorothy, but I was under the impression that I heard somebody say police. Yes. <laughs> well, uh... Yes, you did. I... <laughs> you weren't phoning the police by any chance, were you? Yes, I I was. <laughs> Why? I, uh... Go well, on, go on, go on. Why? Well, I, as a matter of fact, I was trying to get in touch with Jerry. That's it. He, he's at police headquarters in New York, and I, I was trying to get in touch with him to see if they'd let me talk to him on New Year's Eve. You know, I, oh. I, I thought it would cheer him up. Look, Miss, this is the Mallingford chief of police. Are you still there? What's that? What's Mal- Mallingford? Well, it's a New York call relayed through the local station. You, you, you don't mind... Not at all. Please go right ahead. Oh, by the way. What? I don't think you'll find that money, young woman. Good night. Listen, miss. Are you still on the end of the wire, or aren't you? Yes, but I couldn't talk to you. He was here. Who was there? Derek Rolf. He said I'd never find the money. You mean he admits he's got it? Well, no. He just smiles and smiles. He's got some trick up his sleeve. I know it. Oh, have to be a good one. Please never mind that. Can you come over now? Oh. oh all right, miss. I'll, I'll take a chance. Who else is in the house with you? Nobody. I'm all alone with him. What are you going to do if he tries to light out with the money? I don't see what I can do. That's all the more reason for you to get here quickly. I swear you'll find the money in that billiard room. Only hurry. <laughs> Five minutes, ten minutes, fifteen minutes. It can seem a very long time to a waiting girl crouching in a cold and dim-lit hallway outside a closed door, hearing only the clicking of billiard balls and watching, wondering, and praying until... Miss Dale, Miss Dale, this way, shh. Miss Dale, I'm Joe Hollister, chief of police. Yes, I recognized your voice. The front door wasn't locked, so I just walked in. I hoped you would. I didn't want to leave here. Has Mr. Ralph come out of that room since you talked to me? No. And according to what you claim, he's still in there with a suitcase full of money. That's right, Mr. Hollister. Now, look, Miss B, before we go any further, there's something I ought to tell you. Well? Well, I I checked with New York about you. Uh, and, and what did they say? Yes, Miss Hollister? And what did they say about her? Mr. Roth! I'm rather interested in knowing that myself. So you could hear everything through that door? Of course I could hear everything through the door, including your conversation with our friend, the chief of police. Good evening, Mr. Hollister. Good evening, Mr. Roth. This young lady says that... I know, uh... I know what she says. Will you come into the billiard room, please? Both of you? Oh. Thank you. Just what trick are you up to now? Trick? You talk of tricks? Now, just a minute now. Take it easy. What I want to know is, where's this suitcase Miss Dale was talking about? There it is. What, you mean that empty suitcase on the bench beside you? Empty suitcase? Yes, that's what I said. It wasn't empty when I left this room. Chief, do you mind seeing for yourself? Well, it isn't empty. It's empty now, miss. Hollister, it would gratify me to clear this matter up here and now. It would gratify me, too. I'm tired of this slanderous nonsense, and I mean to end it. This young woman told you that I had... What was it? Some $88,000 in this room only a few minutes ago. I still say you had. Curb your temper, please, while I ask you some straight questions. Can you do that? You better answer them, miss. All right, I'll try. Did I or did I not leave the billiard room at any time? No, you didn't. Good. Well, there's only one door and no window. Only a skylight covered with snow. So I didn't leave that way, did I? No, I suppose you didn't. Therefore, unless you're lying, the money must still be in this room. Yes. Then where is it? I don't know. You must have hidden it someplace. Oh. Where? I'm afraid Mr. Rouse right, miss. Take a look around you. One pool table. Comes apart so you can examine it. One radio. Go on, examine that too. One overhead light, one standing lamp, one bare bench, one rack of cues, one 
rack of pool balls. Now, that's everything. Now, can you tell me where I could hide enough money to fill a suitcase? No, I can't. It's impossible, miss. The stuff's not here. It must be here. It's either here or else... Or else what? Or else it vanished. Oh, Mr. Hollister, haven't we had quite enough of this? Yes, I guess we have. Now, look here, Miss Dale. I like the way you talked, and I thought you were talking straight. Will you just tell me why you try to string me along like that? You know, I think I can tell you, Chief Hollister. I wasn't exactly asking you, Mr. Ralph, but... Well, go ahead. You know, perhaps, that she's engaged to a man who's mixed up in the city and provincial robbery? He was not. It was neither a very clever nor a very far-sighted attempt. I'm inclined to think that uh, she'll not have a job when my aunt returns. But as I say, it was a case of any old attempt to shield Jerry Winton. Did somebody mention my name? Jerry! Oh, Jerry! Jerry! Steady, I'm alive. I'm not a ghost. You needn't dive at me like but that. But how did you get here? How did you get away? I was trying to tell you, miss, when our host put it in. The DA is convinced your young man had nothing to do with this. That's right, Dolly. And I thought I'd better come out and take you back to New York with me. I was, was never so glad to see anybody in my life. Put your arms around oh, me. Darling. I don't suppose you'd mind if I picked up this cue and went on practicing? <laughs> Let's try the eight ball all the way down the table. Come on, Dolly. It'll be New Year's in a few minutes. There's nothing to worry about. There is something to worry about. He's got the money, the whole 88,000. I know it. I'm sure of it. Only we can't find it. It's hidden somewhere in this room. As I said before, haven't we had just about enough of this? The chief of police there won't believe me, but it's true. I've heard a lot about that money myself. <laughs> I'll bet you have, son, for nothing but hot money, hot money, hot money. And where is it, where is it, where is it, until I thought I was going off my nut. If I could prove Derek Rolfe had anything to do with this, I'd... Dolly, what's the matter? Mr. Hollister. Yes, miss? I think I know now where he's hidden the money. Well, that was a bad shot, Mr. Rolfe. You've made the white ball jump clear off the table. <laughs> well, there are plenty of others on the table. I tell you, I know where he's hidden it. Is it in this room? Yes. But where? In the pool table? In the radio? In some secret panel? No. You'd better speak up, Dolly. Has it ever struck you, any of you, that there is such a thing as an invisible piece of furniture? An invisible piece of furniture? You mean we can't see it? No, it's in plain sight. It's smack in front of your eyes. But nobody ever sees it. You can't see it now. We may not understand you, Dolly, but by George Derrick Rolfe does. Look at his face. Yes. I'm looking at it. What's the matter with all of you? Please don't become emotional, Mr. Roth. I detest emotion. Miss, there's a reward of 10000 for the recovery of that money. If you know where it is, tell us. There's nothing easier. It's... Before that young woman says something she may regret, please listen to me. You've got him, Dolly. I don't know how or why, but you've got him. Go on, Mr. Roth. Tell me, Winton. You and I used to play on the same baseball team, didn't we? That's right. What about it? What did I play on that team? You were the pitcher. Why? Was I good? You had the best control and the best fast one I ever... Wait a minute. Why are you picking up that pool ball? What are you going to do? Take it easy, Mr. Ralph. You three are across the room from me. I have a number of rather dangerous objects on the table here. And I'll split that girl's skull if she says another word. Don't be a blasted fool. Think I can't do it? Oh! Uh, oh. Well, does that convince you I haven't lost my pitching arm? You didn't even get a chance to raise that gun. Oh! No, you don't. Don't try to pick it up. Just let it lie there on the floor. Get behind me, darling. You stay where you are. Move a step off first base and... Maybe you'd better listen to him, Miss Dale. Well, what are you going to do, Ralph? You can't keep us here forever. I don't propose to keep you there forever. I'm not so enamored of your company. Now, what's the game? Well, I'll make a bargain with you. Well? My car's outside with a little more gas than the state allows. Give me one clear hour to get away. Well, what do you say? I'm a cop, Mr. Ralph. I can't make any bargains with you. No? No, and I'm coming over there after you. And you'll compel me to start throwing... Down, Dolly, down under the table. Oh, you missed that one, Mr. Ralph. Not missed with this one. It's a shame to bust that tube rack, Mr. Ralph, but I'm still coming for you. You've lost your control, old son. You're done for. I might try this. Yeah, that was the wildest pitch yet. Don't look. Don't get up, but look. What is it? The radiator. The steam radiator. It's knocked the whole thing sideways. Did you ever see that happen to a radiator before? Of course not, because it's a dummy radiator. Dummy radiator? Yeah, I got you, Ralph. I'm not too old to handle a bird like you. You haven't even got a search warrant. I'll take a chance. Well, what? What was that about? A dummy radiator? Yes. Look. Look here. It's got a little oil burner inside to make it give out heat. Yeah? And it, 
There are hinges at the back to form a lot of compartments where you can hide as much money as you like. I saw the hinges when he told me to go over to the radiator, but I didn't guess what they meant. It's really a safe that never attracts attention because nobody ever notices it. Uh, and the stuff's here all right. Oh, there, Mr. Hollister. That's what I saw in the suitcase. <laughs> I told you there was a $10,000 reward for that, miss. Oh, did you hear that? Turn on the radio, Jerry. Go on, turn it on. Welcome in the new year. Didn't you tell me, all of you, that, that the money was hot? Sleeve, starring Alyssa Lundy and George Coloris. Tonight's story of Suspense. Columbia presents these tales of mystery and intrigue and dangerous adventure for your relaxation and enjoyment. Next Tuesday, there'll be another in this series. Same hour, 9.30 Eastern Wartime. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, Bernard Herman, the composer, conductor, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Miss Mary Astor, one of Hollywood's most charming and resourceful actresses, and a lady who is no stranger to the art of keeping audiences in suspense. Ask anyone who saw her in the Maltese Falcon or across the Pacific. The story called In Fear and Trembling by J. Donald Wilson is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with In Fear and Trembling and Miss Mary Astor's performance we again hope to keep you in suspense. At the edge of the cliff, overlooking the sea, sits a greystone mansion, weather beaten by the storms of several decades. To this mansion, Gilbert Durant brought his bride, Lucia. Uh, that was four years ago. Gilbert and Lucia were quite happy until a year ago when Lucia's half-sister, Beverly, came to live with them. Gradually, something began to happen. Lucia felt it, felt that some insidious horror was beginning to gnaw at her happiness. She began to know that Gilbert's ardor was beginning to cool. 
he became more absorbed in his writing. Then she felt the cold clamminess of the great stone structure creeping about her, clutching at her heart. Anyone who saw her could tell that fear was growing in her mind, a fear of something which she could not or would not explain. One evening, Lucia, having excused herself at dinner, tossed on her bed in a fretful sleep. No. Don't. Don't. Get away from me. Ah! Oh, Mrs. Durant. Mrs. Durant, what's wrong? Oh, Benson, come in. Oh. What on earth is wrong? Why were you screaming? Oh, Benson, I, I must have been dreaming. It was horrible. You're white as a ghost and shaking like a leaf. Yes, I know. Oh, Mrs. Benson, I can't stand it. It's driving me mad. That makes the fourth or fifth time I've dreamed the same thing, the same in every detail. I've never heard you scream before. No. Oh, that's probably because... What? Oh, it always comes a little closer to me. Tonight it almost reached me. It? What do you mean? I don't know what it is. It's a figure, a human figure, but I can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. It comes through that door and walks slowly across the room with its arms outstretched, reaching for me. Are you sure you were dreaming? Now that I think of it, it isn't like a dream, an ordinary dream. Its reality seems to carry over even... After I'm awake. That's what's made you so ill. This dream, if it is a dream, means something? Is that what you think? It's a, a premonition? Perhaps. What time is it? Nine o'clock. Where's Gilbert? Your husband went horseback riding over an hour ago. Did he go alone? Your sister went with him. Beverly? Why didn't he ask me to go? Well, you've not been yourself lately. Not been feeling well. Yes, yes, of course. Well, if you're feeling better, I'll go back to my room. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I'll be all right. Thank you, Miss Benson. Good night. Good night, Benson. Beverly. Gilbert. <laughs> Lucia lay there for a while, staring wild-eyed at the patch of moonlight on the bedroom door, listening, waiting. Then, as the clock struck half-past ten, the door opened, and a figure stepped into the room and moved noiselessly through the moonlight to Lucia's bed. Suddenly, Lucia opened her eyes. Gilbert, don't, don't! Lucia, what's wrong with you? What are you doing in my room? I just wanted to know how you felt. How long have you been standing there? Oh, just a few seconds. I, I was dreaming, I guess. I, when I woke up, you startled me. Why were you yelling, don't, don't? I don't know. I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> I talked with Dr. Handy about you today. I told him how run down you were, and he suggested that I get a tonic for you. I'll drop in at the drugstore on my way home tomorrow evening. Uh, a tonic? Yes. Well, what is it? Oh, I don't remember. Something, something in strychnine. Strychnine? Yes, he said it would give you an appetite. Where have you been, Gil? Oh, I've been riding. Nice moonlight night. Very pleasant. Did Beverly enjoy it? Yes, yeah, she's an excellent rider. I've decided to buy that filly from Thompson. Going over there tomorrow afternoon. Is Beverly going with you? Yes. She's a good judge of horseflesh. Why? Nothing. I just asked. Well, good night, Lucia. See you at breakfast? Uh, yes. Good night. Something, something, and strychnine. Something, something, and strychnine. Lucia jumps from her bed, rushes down to the library, snaps on the light and steps to the shelf holding the encyclopedia. She runs her fingers down the long line of books, L-M-N-O-P-R, and then she stops. And stares. The S to T is missing. Then she sees it on the desk, the missing volume. She rushes to the desk and stares down at the open page. Yes. Yes, that's it. Strychnine. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Beverly. I'll leave the deal entirely up to you. Up to me? Oh, Gil, that's not fair. Why not? <laughs> well, suppose she turns out to be a lemon. I don't think she will. Because you're going to have the job of training her. Oh, you certainly flatter me. <laughs> Not in the least. Oh, good morning, Lucia. I just realized what time it was. You'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, it's nine this very minute. 
Uh, step on it. Uh, more coffee, Beverly? No, thanks. How do you feel, Lucia? Uh, better. Much better. Well, you better eat something. No, no, I can't. At least some coffee. Yes, I'll have some coffee. I've got to run. See you later, Lucia. Yes, Gil. And I'll see you this afternoon at 2, Beverly. Yes, I'll meet you in town at 2. Oh, Gil, don't forget Lucia's medicine. No, I won't. Goodbye, Lucia. Are you meeting Gil in town, Beverly? <laughs> yes, he wants me to decide on that filly he's interested in. Where did you learn so much about horses? Ooh, seems to be natural. Why don't you get interested in horses, Lucia? Why should I? What are you interested in? Well, I am interested in a few things. My husband, in particular. <laughs> you don't act interested in anything. Really? Well, if you'll take my advice, you'll snap out of this coma and get some pep. Does Gil like women with pep? No man cares about a woman who sits around and mopes. I think you're a hypochondriac. Do you? You should do something about it. I intend to. I intend to do something about it. <laughs> I'm glad to hear it. Get out and do things. Play games, golf, tennis, swim, and ride. Maybe this medicine will fix you up. You know all about it, do you? What is it? Oh, I don't know. It's a, a tonic, a, a builder-upper. I wish I could believe that. But at least you can try it. Won't hurt you. No? <laughs> I wonder. Oh, come in, Dr. Handy. Well, Lucia, why did you call me out here? What's wrong? I just couldn't make it into town. Oh, it can't be as bad as all that. Did Gilbert talk to you about me yesterday? Mm, I saw Gil for a few moments at the club during lunch. Said you were run down. Did you give him a prescription for me? Oh, never do that until I've examined the patient. You didn't give him a prescription? Well, no. What did you suggest for me? Oh, I don't know. Mentioned a few tonics he might get for you. Spoke of beef iron and wine and... Carry an egg and... Uh, oh, I don't remember what else. Then you mentioned nothing specifically. I don't think so. I see. Now, what seems to be wrong with you, Lucia? I don't know exactly, but something has been happening to me that... Well, frankly, I'm afraid I'm losing my mind. <laughs> we all feel that way at times. I'm serious. Things happen to me in the night. What sort of thing? At first I thought they were just nightmares, but... When you have a nightmare, you wake up and the fear is gone. You realize the truth. But this vision that comes to me haunts me through the waking hours as well. Vision? Something, I think it's a person, comes through my bedroom door, comes toward my bed with outstretched arms as though it intends to strangle me. Each time it comes a little closer. And my fear is that eventually it will get to me before I wake up. See, you always dream the same dream? If it is a dream, yes. And who is the person? I don't know. You don't think it's really a dream? No. I think it's a premonition. Hmm. Have you any basis for such a fear in real life? Is there someone or something that you're afraid of? Doctor, I'm convinced they're not dreams, that I'm not asleep. Oh, nonsense. I'm positive they're not mere dreams. Well, I think it's all due to your rundown condition. You probably don't sleep as soundly as you should. So you transfer sounds in the night to dreams and nightmares. That's exactly what I mean. If I'm only half asleep, I may be transferring actual movements and sounds into dreams. In other words, if someone slams a door in the night, I may half hear it and attribute it to a dream. Yeah. All right. All right. But then perhaps I'm not dreaming. Don't you see? Hmm. I think you'd better come into town and have a thorough physical... You mean a checkup by a psychiatrist? Oh, I may have someone help me. It's the usual thing, you know. Oh, oh Dr. Andy, I'm so proud. No, 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 no. <laughs> Everything's going to be all right. I'm afraid. Afraid that, that I'm going to die. That someone is trying to kill oh, me. Oh, you're not going to die. That's ridiculous. I'll call you and make an appointment. <laughs> That's better. Very well. In the meantime, try not to think about it. Keep your mind on the brighter side. Yes. I'll try. All afternoon and on into the evening, that awful gnawing of jealousy and fear occupy every moment. Gil and Beverly. How could they do such a thing? And how far will they go to get you out of the way, Lucia? Will they stop even at murder? <laughs> Sleep, 
Lucia? No, I'm not. How are you feeling? I seem to have developed a headache. Have you eaten anything today? No, I didn't care for anything. Well, this will help you. Better take a dose now. I'll measure it for you. What is it? Well, it's the tonic. Did Dr. Hanby prescribe it? Yes. Yes, he did. Where's Beverly? Down in the library. Did you buy the horse? Yes, Beverly thought she was a fine animal. I didn't know Beverly knew so much about horses. She's a horsewoman after my own heart. Is she? Rides like the wind, too. She had intended to go home tomorrow. Is she staying on? She's got to. I wouldn't think of her leaving now. Why not? Well, for one thing, she's going to train the horse. And what else? Why, nothing else. Here, take this. A little bitter, but you'll get used to it. Gil! Go ahead, it won't hurt you. I don't want it. And why not? It has poison in it. I suppose it does have a little, yes. But only enough to act as a tonic. I don't want it. I won't take it. Are you going to act like a child? Take it and quit arguing. I won't, I won't. Take it, swallow it down. I can't take it. You're impossible, Lucia. I'm afraid. You need this medicine, but you're so confoundedly stubborn, you'd rather sit around and mope all day. Very well, there it is. You can take it or not. I'm disgusted trying to help you pull out of this. Good night. No, 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 no. Wait, Gil. I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't care whether you do or not. There. I've taken it. <coughs> Terribly bitter. Well, that's more like it. Now take another dose around 11. Gil, where's Mrs. Benson? Why, I told her she could have the night off. That she might like to spend the evening in town. You, you let her off? Yes, she's been sticking pretty close lately. Yes. Yes, she has. Good night. Good night, Lucia. What's wrong, Gil? You look upset. I am. Lucia didn't want to take it. No? Why not? She's afraid of medicine. What are you going to do? She finally took a dose of it. But if I know her, she'll never take another drop. She's got to take it, Gil. You've got to figure out a way to make her take it. Can't be disguised. It's too bitter. Try something else. I'll try and coax her into it again. Isn't there something that tastes more pleasant, or something you could put in milk or orange juice? Mm, I don't know. But I'll find something. Of course you will. You've got to. She's. Wait a minute. There's someone listening outside the door. Oh. Oh, sir. Well, Benson, what are you doing standing here in the dark? Why. I was just going upstairs to see if Mr. Durant wanted anything before I went out. I see. Now, by the way, I'm staying home for a couple of days, and I thought that since you've been staying so close to the job, you'd welcome a few days' leave. Leave? Why, yes. But Mrs. Durant may prefer that I stay. I think you'd better take a little rest yourself. You needn't come back till Friday. But I... I don't need to rest. You come back Friday. Yes. Very well. But that night, for once, the good Mrs. Benson disobeys orders. A few minutes before 12, she returns to the mansion. No lights are burning. So she makes her way quietly through the back entrance, slips up the stairs, and taps lightly on Lucia's bedroom door. Mrs. Durant? Mrs. Durant? Then she turns the knob, opens the door, and snaps on the light. Mrs. Durant? Are you here? Then Benson steps quickly toward the bed. The bed is empty, but a horrible sight meets her eyes. Oh, blood. Blood all over the bed. Oh. Oh. Get me the police department. All right, Mrs. Benson. Now, just calm down and tell us what happened this evening. Well, earlier in the evening, Mr. Durant told me that I could have the night off since I'd been staying close to Mrs. Durant for some time. And then later, he said, he decided to let me off until Friday. I didn't want to go, but he insisted. Was there anyone else in the house? Yes, Mrs. Durant's half-sister, Beverly. Did you leave the house? Yes, but I sneaked up the back stairs and told Mrs. Durant I'd be back about midnight. Hmm. If you had till Friday, why did you come back at midnight? Because... We were both frightened. Of what? Well, 
Mrs. Durant had been having premonitions that someone was trying to kill her. Who was trying to kill her? She didn't know, but she was terribly frightened. Is that all? No. Her husband tried to get her to take some medicine he had brought home. She refused, and he got angry. How do you know he was angry? I... I heard him talking about it to Beverly. They were in the library. And he told Beverly that Lucia was stubborn. Beverly said that he'd have to think of some other way. Did Mrs. Durant suspect her husband and Beverly of trying to do away with her? Yes. Yes, she did. She was convinced that Mr. Durant and Beverly were in love and wanted her out of the way. I see. Mm -hmm. Well, so you came back tonight because you anticipated that something was going to happen. Yes. The house was dark, so I came up the back stairs, knocked on her door. When I got no answer, I came in, turned on the light, saw she was gone, and then I saw the bed all covered with blood. <laughs> she wouldn't take the poison, so they did it another way. That's what they planned in the library. Where are they now? Any idea? Well, they didn't expect me back tonight, so they're probably gone to dispose of the body, intending to come back here and clean the place up later. I see. Anybody else know about Mrs. Durant's fears? Yes. She talked to Dr. Hanby. I called him right after phoning the police and told him about it. He knows. Dr. Hanby, Captain Drake, what in the world is the meaning of this? From all indications, Mrs. Durant has been murdered and the body disposed of. Doctor, I understand Mrs. Durant told you that she was afraid that something was going to happen to her, that she was going to die. Who told you that? Mrs. Benson here. I see. Well, she did call me in this morning. She'd been having strange dreams. Premonitions, she called them. I called them hallucinations. Who'd she think it was? Well, she couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman, but someone was always approaching her bed with outstretched arms, trying to choke her. Do you think it was more than a dream? She was a sort of hypochondriac. I, I asked her to come into town where I could give her a thorough examination. I didn't take her story too seriously, but this certainly puts a different slant on the entire picture. Yes. We haven't found the body, but I have men out looking now. We'll find it. Here's Mr. Durant and his sister-in-law. They found them about half a mile down the beach. Oh, how are you, Durant? What in the world goes on here? What's wrong, Doctor? Take a look at that bed. What happened? Lucia. What? Where is she? We thought you might enlighten us on that point. What do you mean? Where is she? It's... Is Lucia dead? Oh, Gil, what, what... What happened? We think your wife has been murdered. Murdered? But I, what are you doing here, Mrs. Benson? I thought you were gone till Friday. Why did you tell her to go until Friday? Why, I, I thought she needed to rest. She'd been having long hours. Wh where is Lucia? Where have you and your sister-in-law been? Why, I slipped upstairs and saw Lucia was asleep, so we decided to take a little ride down the beach. It was still early. Mm-hmm. Didn't take... Anything with you? Certainly not. What do you mean by that? What would we take? I don't know. I just ask. Would you two try to get Lucia to take some medicine? No. Wait a minute, Beverly. That won't do any good. Yes, we did. Lucia was run down and needed a tonic. But she refused to take medicine. Why did she refuse? I don't know. Maybe she was afraid of being poisoned. Poisoned? Why should I want to poison her? Lucia was my wife. How long has your sister-in-law, Beverly, been here with you? Well, I don't know. Quite some time. Just a minute. Uh, are you inferring that, that Gil and I... I'm not inferring anything. I merely asked you a question. Oh, Gil, tell him that... Just a moment, Beverly. Mrs. Benson, what have you been saying? What did you tell them? I told them the truth. You think I planned to kill Lucia, is that it? Yes, you and this woman. You're out of your mind. You tried to get her to take some medicine. She knew you were in love with her sister and that you were trying to poison her. And how did she come to that conclusion? She had premonition. That means nothing. And besides, I heard you talking, you and Beverly, planning the whole thing. What? She's lying. I heard you. And when you realized Lucia wouldn't take the medicine, Beverly said you'd have to think of some other way. Some other way to what? To get rid of her. To kill her. There must be some... Dr. Handy, you know better than this. Do you think I had a reason back of wanting to know about various medicines? Well, no, no, I didn't, not at the time, but now... Now what? Well, I'm sorry to say it all adds up to something suspicious. It seems more than just coincidental. Do you... Do you think I killed Lucia? Look about you. Look at the room. What else am I to think? What was the tonic you tried to give your wife? It had strychnine in it. Is that right, Durant? Yes. It was one of the things Dr. Handy mentioned. It was uh, uh, iron, quinine, and strychnine. Did you mention that, Doctor? Well, 
suppose I did. It's commonly known tonic. Did you add anything else to it, Durant? Certainly not. How about it, Sergeant? What's the report? The bottle contained iron, quinine, and strychnine, and a heavy content of arsenic. Arsenic? But that isn't possible. I put nothing in it. Where would I get arsenic? It was in there just the same. Good heavens. Do- Doctor, this isn't true. You know it isn't. I hate to say it, Gil. But the evidence looks bad for you. Benson knows what this is all about. She's lying. She knows Gil wouldn't do such a thing. She's back of it all. Why? I don't know. But believe me, I'll find out if I have... That'll do, that'll do. Under the circumstances, I think you'd all better come down to headquarters so we can keep you separated. Come on. And no more talking. After 48 hours, hours of relentless grilling, endless questioning, Gil and Beverly are released on a writ of habeas corpus. Weeks go by, and Lucia's body has not been discovered. So the district attorney makes a public announcement that no murder charges can be preferred against them due to lack of corpus delicti, the failure to produce the body, Lucia's body. Then one evening, Beverly and Gill talk in the library. Beverly, I, I want you to know how wonderful I think you've been. You stuck right beside me, never lost your nerve, and, well, you're one girl in a million. Oh, thanks, Gil, but it isn't over yet. They won't stop their search for Lucia's body, and... And if they find it, we haven't a chance. I know, but what can we do about it? Well, why couldn't we leave the country? Together? Not necessarily. They'd be sure to follow us. But we could go separately in, in different ways and... And meet someplace later on? Is that what you mean? Yes. That's what I mean. It seems a bit mad. It would be equal to an out-and-out confession. Oh, but Gil, if they find Lucia's body, we haven't a chance. It's too strong against us. We could never come back, Beverly. What of it? I don't want to die, Gil. And I don't want anything to happen to you. Beverly, I... Oh, I don't know what to say. I'm frightened, Gil. I can't stay here with such horrible fear hanging over me. I'll go mad. If you don't go, then I will. I'll leave tonight. Please, Beverly, I need you more than ever now. Please don't go. Don't worry, Gilbert. She won't leave you. Lucia. Good heavens, Lucia. I won't let her leave you. I'll see that you both go together. And stay together for a long, long time. Lucia, what? Lucia. We thought you were dead. Disappointed, aren't you? Where have you been? What are you going to do with that gun? You thought I was dead. Well, I'm not. I'm live enough to pull this trigger. I've been hiding for weeks. And I've been behind those curtains for the last 20 minutes. I heard every word. Now I know you're in love with each other. Now I know you wanted to do away with me. In love? Beverly and I... From the day she came here... She took you away from me. I did not. We never thought of such a thing. Never. Never read it, Alma. Why lie about it? You've let your imagination run away with you, Lucia. You're insane. You think so? Well, if I am, it's your fault. Yours and Beverly's. You've driven me insane, both of you. I had a plan to get even with you to make you pay for what you've done, but it failed. What plan? You see, I didn't know about the law of corpus delicti, but I do now. And this time there will be a body. Two bodies. Yours and Beverly's. You're a suspicious-minded devil, Lucia. I, I plan to trap you on a murder charge, my murder. But it's going to be your murder now. You were convinced that Beverly and I were in love? Of course. I never needed a dream nor a premonition. I cut myself and smeared blood on the bed and disappeared. When I found they couldn't touch you without the corpus delicti, I came back to kill you. Lucia, you fool, you vicious-minded fool. I'm going to tell you something. Then go ahead and shoot me if you will. Lucia, not until now, this very moment, has the thought of loving Beverly ever occurred to me. You never loved Beverly? No. But I can tell you this, Lucia. Now that I've seen you as you really are, I could never love you again. Never. Gail! Wait, Beverly. But I... I I was sure. I I was convinced that you and Beverly... You were sure only because your warped, jealous mind convinced you that there was something between us. (laughs) You mean I... You've certainly made a sorry mess of your life, Lucia. Then I... All I've done is kill your love. Oh, Gil. Yes, Lucia. And you've no one to blame. No one but your own miserable self. (laughs) Gil! Lucia, don't, Lucia! Oh, Gil. Gil! Yes. But it's, it's probably the best thing for her and for us. 
So closes In Fear and Trembling, starring Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's Mary Astor, tonight's tale of suspense. The broadcast originated in Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when another of the screen's lovelier leading ladies, Geraldine Fitzgerald, will star in the uneasy drama called Will You Walk Into My Parlor? William Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, the director, Bud Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Morrowick, the composer, and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. In just a moment, CBS will present its weekly program of the world's outstanding thrillers, Suspense. Before we begin, the producer of feels it incumbent upon him to reply herewith to the many inquiries concerning the solution of last week's story of the woman on the telephone called Sorry, Wrong Number. Due to a momentary confusion in the studio, an important line cue was delivered at the wrong time, and some of our listeners were uncertain as to the outcome of the story. For them, be it known that the woman, so remarkably played by Miss Agnes Moorhead, was murdered by a man whom her husband had hired to do the job. We should also like to announce that in response to many hundreds of requests, this suspense play will be repeated within a few weeks. And now, this is the man in black, here again to introduce our performance tonight of Suspense. This evening are two distinguished gentlemen from the Hollywood sound stages, Mr. Donald Crisp and Mr. John Loder. Mr. Crisp and Mr. Loder are here to enact for us a strange and startling drama in which they, in the interest of justice, made use of an unusual method to wring a confession of guilt from a criminal. The story is by Rupert Croft Cook and is called Banquo's Chair. And so with Banquo's Chair, and the performances of Donald Crisp as Sir William Brent and John Loder as Arthur Grange, Sir William's friend who relates the story to us, we again hope to keep you in... Suspense! I would like you to look at this photograph. It's the picture of Sir William Brent ex-head of the English Criminal Investigation. I knew Sir William well, and he always terrified me. Not in the sense that he was brutal or evil. He was none of that. But look at that cold face, particularly his eyes. When he looked at you, you flushed with guilt. Every misdeed you ever committed in your life floated over your face. A glance from him made you feel as if you were stark naked. He saw you with all your defenses down. Sir William was the scourge of criminals, coldly unemotional, utterly without fear or passion. He tracked them down mercilessly and never lost a case. There was no feeling in him, no pity, no hate, nothing but terrifying, cold intelligence. And he was deadly to everyone he went after. I'm going to tell you about his last case, a case that 
Well, even recalling it sends real shudders through me. I swear it's true. I saw it with my own eyes. I wish I never had. I witnessed it in all its dreadful details. One night at the club, about 11 o'clock, a boy came up to me. Telegram for you, sir. I ripped open the envelope and read the telegram. Dear Arthur, will you come and dine with me at Turret House, Sydenham on Thursday? There will be several guests, and I think I can promise you an unforgettable evening. It was signed by Sir William Brent. I was annoyed. I don't like to receive telegrams so late in the evening, and Sir William could easily have phoned, unless he didn't want to go into details with me. I decided to phone him. This is Arthur Grange calling. Yes, I know. Did you receive my telegram? Yes, Sir William. What's all the mystery about? Well, I'll tell you about it on Thursday. Are you coming? Yes, I'll be there. Very good. I particularly want you to be there. You sound so mysterious, I'm thinking of coming armed or bringing several bodyguards. No, it won't be necessary to bring any bodyguards. But you'd better come armed, well armed. Yes, bring a revolver. Good night. Early Thursday evening, I made my way to Turret House. A windy November rain slashed at the streets. Turret House is a huge, red-brick, unpleasantly somber mansion, an ugly product of Queen Victoria's time. There it squatted, back of the road, almost hidden to view by several dripping pine trees. The neighborhood had known better days. I walked up along the unkept path, until I reached the great oaken door. I let the knocker fall once or twice, and the door opened. Good evening, Mr. Grange. I was waiting for you. Hello, Lane. Nasty night, sir, isn't it? There's not much warmer in here. There's a fire in the dining room, sir. Whatever made Sir William move into this drafty dungeon? Oh, we haven't moved in, sir. It's only temporary. Sir William just rented it. We still live in the West End. Oh, I see. Have any of the other guests arrived? Yes, Mr. Grange. Miss Stone is here. Miss Stone? Yes, the mystery writer. This way, Mr. Grange. I'll show you to the dining room. Sir William will be down shortly. Oh, hello. I'm Roberta Stone. How do you do? I'm Arthur Grange, an old friend of Sir William. Yes, I know. I've read some of your mystery stories and enjoyed them very much. Oh, thank you, Mr. Grange. Just what is going on here tonight? I don't know. Sir William sounded awfully mysterious. But then, I've known Sir William for a long time. He never lets anyone down. If anything, he understates. I know. He told me to come armed. He told me the same thing. Here's my gun. (laughs) I must admit, I've never fired it in my life. This house is certainly a proper background for anything unpleasant. It's already been the scene of a crime. Oh? What crime? Murder. A particularly unpleasant one. Really? Really? I must say the murderer couldn't have picked a more ideal spot. Isn't it a fact? You know, I once wrote a story. Good evening, Roberta. Uh, Arthur, I'm glad you're both on time. Hello, Sir William. Hello. A nice apartment you have here. A sort of uh, mausoleum and dining room combined. Mm. You're a bit afraid, aren't you? Of course not. Why should I be? Your eyes give you away. What's all this about? You invite us to this godforsaken dungeon and tell us to come armed? Don't be upset, Arthur. I'm sure you'll come out of this all right. You mean we may be in some danger? Naturally, I wouldn't tell you to come armed otherwise. Who is this other guest, Sir William? There are two more guests. But first we'll have a drink and then I'll tell you both all about it. Uh, Lane. Yes, Sir William? Will you serve the drinks? Yes, sir. Now, I'll tell you what's going to happen tonight. This house, Turret House, was the scene of the Sydenham murder. A very famous case. Yes, I know about it. That's right. Uh, No offense, old man, but wasn't it the only case you never solved? You're wrong, Arthur. I solved the Sydenham case, but I couldn't bring the criminal to justice because of insufficient evidence. You mean you knew who the murderer was? Oh, yes, of course. It was the nephew. The police knew it, too. Then why in the world didn't you bring the case to a conclusion? Because the nephew had an absolute and unimpeachable alibi. To have arrested him would have meant a waste of time and money and a release in the end. Besides, according to English law... A man discharged can never be arrested again on the same murder charge. Well, this is all very fascinating. 
Uh, has it anything to do with our being here tonight? Yes, Roberta, it has. In a short while, the nephew, John Bedford, will be here to dine with us. And, oh yes, the victim, Miss Ferguson. What? Well, wait. You mean Miss Ferguson wasn't actually murdered? Miss Ferguson is quite dead. Has been dead these two years. You mean you're going to have the body of Miss Ferguson here at dinner? Oh, this is a little too much. If you'll excuse me, I'll dine elsewhere tonight. Not so fast, Roberta. Perhaps you'd better wait until you hear the rest of the story. This promises to be a very gay dinner. Oh, yes. Now, as you both know, I've never lost a case, except the Sydney murder, which will be finished tonight. Now, I'm an egotist. I don't believe there's a criminal in all England that can outwit me. As a matter of fact, I've resigned from the criminal investigation for the sole reason of trapping Mr. John Bedford. It's hard to believe. Well, I told you I was an egotist. No criminal has beaten me yet, and no one ever will. You have an awful lot of patience. Mm, infinite patience. I devoted two years to this case, and now that my moment of triumph has arrived, I wanted to have some witnesses. A writer who will record the event, and an admirer who will applaud with awe the trickiness of my scheme. Well, if it's as gruesome as I think it is, I won't be here to watch it. Oh, yes, you will. Horror has a way of fascinating and hypnotizing people. Besides, Arthur, you'd be ashamed to run out now. No, I'll stay, of course. So will I. Good. Now, before I tell you my scheme, let me first acquaint you with the details of the murder. Exactly two years ago tonight, old Miss Ferguson... <laughs> Ferguson. Why don't you answer when I call? I was in the kitchen, ma'am. It's after ten o'clock. You should be on your way home. I was just about to leave. Has my nephew called? No, ma'am. Mr. Bedford hasn't called since yesterday. I told him he couldn't come in. Just like you said. I don't ever want to see him again. He's no good. He's an evil man who will come to an evil end. You're never to let him in here, Hilda. He won't ever come in this house if I can help it. No, ma'am. Now you'd better run along. And make sure all the doors are bolted. Yes, ma'am. Good night, Miss Ferguson. Good night, Hilda. A pity about that nephew of mine. I'll change my will. Won't leave him a penny, I won't. In the morning, I'll change the will. That's... <gasps> Who's there? Who is it? It's I, Aunt Martha, your own affectionate nephew. What are you doing in my house? Oh, you're not at all pleased to see me. Your only living relative, too. I'd like you to leave at once or call the police, I <laughs> I'd rather not, Auntie. I want to have a talk with you. You don't want to talk to me. All you want is money. Yes, Auntie, I do want money. And lots of it. You've got all the money you'll ever get out of me. You won't even get a penny after I die. I'll see to that. Perhaps you'll appreciate the value of money after you've worked for it. You know, Auntie... You're... You're wearing gloves. What are you up to? I've made up my mind. Uh, what are you doing? Keep away. You're an old woman. All that money is no good for you. You can never use it. I'm young and money means life to me. A rich and gay life. You're old and you're going to die soon anyway. No. No, it can't be. You're not going to do that. Yes, Auntie, I am. You don't want to live anywhere. You're lonely, you're sick and you're old. I'm going to do you a favor. Help! Help! Nobody can hear you now. Oh. I'm your heir. Your only heir, auntie. Your next of kin. The estate is going to be mine. All of it. <laughs> now, don't you worry, auntie. We'll have a fine funeral for you. Pretty much the way old Miss Ferguson was murdered. Oh, how ghastly. Hilda found the body the next morning. I immediately went to work on the case. All the evidence pointed to John Bedford. Everyone believed he committed the crime. He almost admitted it himself. I had him brought to my office for questions. Oh, hello, Bedford. Come in. Thank you, sir. How'd you do, sir, William? Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Well... How does it feel to kill your own aunt? May I have a light, please? Yes, of course. 
thank you. I wouldn't know, Sir William. You see, I never killed anyone. Have you? I have, Mr. Bedford. And I've sent quite a few to the gallows. Yes, so I understand. What was your relationship to Miss Ferguson? She was my aunt. Don't be flippant. <laughs> Flippancy only proves your guilt. Well, to tell you the truth, sir, my aunt didn't like me. She thought I was a spendthrift and a useless parasite, and she was quite right. Would you mind telling me where you were the night your aunt was murdered? Oh, not at all. In jail. I had drunk a little too much and gotten into a bit of a tiff with someone, that's all. Have you ever been arrested for drunkenness before? Never, Sir William. This was my first offence. It's quite an alibi. Quite a fact. <laughs> it would hardly be possible for me to be in jail and kill my aunt at the same time, you know. Uh, unless, of course, my aunt came into my cell and allowed me to murder her, after which she walked back to Turret House as a ghost, dragging her body behind her. <laughs> According to my reports, Mr. Bedford, you drink very little. No one who knows you has ever seen you drunk before. You probably got drunk in joyful anticipation of murdering your aunt. <laughs> As a thoroughgoing criminal investigator, don't you think you ought to check my story? I already have. Oh. You've done a very skillful job. Too bad you couldn't use your talents for something constructive. Well, why don't you arrest me, Sir William? No, Mr. Bedford, I have time. Plenty of time. Well, you'd better work fast. By the time you get around to me, I'll have spent all of my aunt's beautiful money. It's not the money we're after. It's you. Your beautiful life. Good day, Mr. Bedford. How matters stood. I refused to let any of my men arrest him. But how in the world could he have murdered his aunt while he was in jail? Perhaps he bribed the prison guard to let him out for an hour. Yes, Roberto, I believe he did. Unfortunately, the guard died of pneumonia soon afterwards, which left us no further source of evidence. As far as I can see at the moment, Sir William, you haven't a leg to stand on. You're quite right, Arthur, I haven't. Except that every man, particularly a criminal, has an Achilles heel. I discovered John Bedford's weakness. What is it? He's superstitious. Hmm. And it annoyed me tremendously that John Bedford was my first failure. Here was a clever, calloused criminal who laughed at me. No one had ever done that before. Bedford knew I could do him no harm, and he made the most of it. Carefully and patiently, I thought it over. I looked upon Bedford as you would look on a Chinese puzzle... There is no such thing as an impregnable defense. A few months later, I went to visit Bed. Well, Sir William Brent. What a surprise. Won't you come in, please? Thank you, Mr. Bedford. Oh. Well, I'm honored to have the great Sir William Brent pay me a visit. You're not after any more clues, I hope. It gets rather tedious, you know. <laughs> no, not at all. I know when I'm licked. Well, I don't want to appear smug, sir, but everyone has his Waterloo. Would you have a drink? No, thanks. I suppose you're curious about why I came here. Well, I I'd hardly imagine it was a friendly visit. <laughs> On the contrary, it is. You see, I admire brilliant people, no matter what they're calling. Oh, you're very flattering, Sir William. I've resigned from the criminal investigation. I'm a private citizen now. Yes, I've heard about that. Most people misunderstand me. It wasn't my love for justice that made me pursue my profession with such tenacity and... Uh, Success? With the sole exception of your case, of course. <laughs> it was a game of skill to me. My wits against all comers. I lost in your case. But then we've all got to lose some time, haven't we? I don't believe you, Sir William. You're still out to get me. Well, there isn't much of a chance, is there? I'm afraid not, Sir William. I've kept out of trouble so far. Knock wood. Hmm. That's an odd habit for a man like you, knocking on wood. You're not superstitious, are you? Huh? Of course not. Just a habit since I was a child. <laughs> I see. Well, now to the reason for my visit. I noticed in the papers that you're looking for a tenant for Turret House. Oh, yes, I am. I'd like to rent it. Well, the scene of the crime, huh? <laughs> Well, of course, why not? There's no harm in it. As a matter of fact, I'll let you have it very cheaply. I rented this house. The house where the murder was committed. Well, what's your plan? It had better be a good one. Mr. Bedford sounds like a hard customer. Yes, it's a strange plan, but an effective one. I saw Bedford frequently. Our acquaintance blossomed into a kind of friendship, an armed friendship, of course. He knew I was out to get him. 
And I wanted him to know that. He's vain, very vain. And this game intrigued him. I also learned that he was very superstitious, although he denied it vigorously. Tonight is the anniversary of the murder, and tonight Mr. Bedford dines with us at eight o'clock. It's nearly eight now. Now, this is the plan. You know May Wakefield? Of course. She's the famous Shakespearean actress. That's right. During dinner, she will enter the room in the precise likeness of Miss Ferguson, the murdered woman. We, of course, will pretend not to see her. We remain outwardly unconscious of her. Only Bedford will be aware of her presence. I believe Bedford will confess. I'd imagine he'd keep away on this night, especially if it's the anniversary. He's giddy with success. And also, the fact that Roberta Stone, the famous writer, is here with us. Tweaks his vanity. <laughs> He'll be here promptly. Oh, I don't like this. Well, this is just like one of your stories. It doesn't become you to be frightened. Oh, I won't run away. Well, there's one more thing. During dinner, the electric lights will be switched off at the main, and candles will be lit. Oh. We must have the correct atmosphere. Mm -hmm. You understand now? You're not to see May Wakefield. She doesn't exist for us. Is that clear? I'll look right through her. Oh, it gives me the creeps. That, I am sure, is our Mr. Bedford. The appearance of John Bedford suddenly made the whole scene grimly real. He was a tall, well-built man in his late thirties, immaculately dressed and perfectly groomed. At first sight, his face seemed pleasant enough, but on closer scrutiny, his grey eyes were hard and cold. He looked us over, all of us, with arrogance and superiority. I heartily wished I was elsewhere. This was one scene I had no desire to witness. After the introductions were over, we sat down to dinner. Is it still nasty outside, Mr. Bedford? Yes, and getting worse. Looks like we're in for a few days, are they? Mm, too bad. I was going to do some riding tomorrow. The soup is uh, excellent. Yes, your cook should be congratulated, son. The soup's a masterpiece. Poor Alice. She's been my cook for 20 years. But she's given me notice, absolutely refuses to stay here, says this house is haunted. So? Roberta, this might make an interesting story for you. Yes, Sir William. You should speak to her. Alice swears that she has seen the figure of an elderly lady with finger marks on her throat walking about this house. <laughs> oh, come now, Sir William. This is too good. Such an obvious attempt to frighten me. Sir William is convinced that I murdered my aunt. <laughs> Please, Sir William, a little more subtlety. Surely I deserve it. Perhaps the cook did see the figure. As you very well know, Mr. Bedford, I don't believe in ghosts, and I'm sure my cook never saw this elderly figure. It's all in her mind. Well, I'm afraid your little attempt didn't work, sir, but I, I must admire your graceful admittance of its failure. Mm, so I suppose I'd better give up, shouldn't I? Oh, no, 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 never give up. If at first you don't succeed, you know. Uh, do you live very far from here, Mr. Bedford? Uh, thank you, Miss Stone, but there's no need to change the topic. I hope you find this game as amusing as I do. I'm sorry, Mr. Bedford, but this isn't my idea of pleasant dinner conversation. Oh, we'll talk of pleasant things, then. I saw a very exciting play last night. Excuse me a moment. It's really fearfully hot in here. Uh, do you mind if we get a little air, please? Oh, I'm sorry. It is rather warm. Lane, open one of the windows, please. Yes, sir. Awful weather, isn't it? Yes. I don't know how we're going to get home, really. It's a bad month of the year. I'd intended to go to the Riviera for... What's the matter? Honest. Lane, what on earth is wrong with the lights? I don't know, sir. Well, don't stand there. Light the candles. We can't sit here in the darkness. And get the chauffeur. He knows something about electric lights. I'll call the chauffeur right away, sir. I'm terribly sorry about this. We've had trouble with the wiring before. The chauffeur will have it fixed in a few moments. Now, let's get on with our dinner. If this is one of your tricks, Sir William, I... I... Oh, have some more wine, Mr. Bedford. It was a tense and terrible moment. I looked at Roberta. She was pale and frightened. Bedford, for all his poise, was uneasy. He didn't know whether Sir William was planning anything or whether this was really an accident. My heart was pounding away, and my palms were moist with perspiration. Only Sir William appeared cool. There was not a trace of emotion in his face. Oh, Mr. Bedford, you were saying about visiting the Riviera. Yes? It's quite a change from England at this time of year. Well, I, I suppose I'll make the trip next month when I... What's the matter, Mr. Bedford? Nothing. Nothing at all. I... I wish we could have some light. Rather difficult to see. Yes, I'm terribly sorry this had to happen just at dinner. Have a little more wine, Mr. Bedford. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. The figure of a woman had entered the room. She had come in silently, like a ghost. We all saw her. 
but not one of us moved or made a sign of recognition. In the dim candlelight, she looked ghostly and unreal. Bedford looked at all of us to see if we also had seen the figure, but we ate our dinner grimly. He looked again, then shook his head and gulped more wine. Don't let you see anything. See what, Mr. Bedford? This is another one of your tricks. Can't any of you see her? What's got into you, Bedford? It's my aunt. My aunt. Perhaps you've had too much to drink. Huh? Your aunt's dead, Mr. Bedford. You're not seeing ghosts, I hope. Perhaps I drank too much. Yes, of course. She's coming toward me. Now, calm yourself. I've never seen you like this. Well, There's no one else here. Do you see anyone, Roberta? No. No, Sir William. I don't either. I'm leaving. <laughs> I can't make you out, Bedford. You don't seem to be drunk. You're not wearing your gloves today, John. She's real. Can't any of you see her? Can't you hear her? What's come over you, Bedford? I'm leaving here. She's at the door. She won't let me out now. I'm an old woman. Money is no good for me. I'm lonely, John. I'm lonely. Let me fly on mouth out of my way. There's no one in your way, Bedford. Come, sit down. Get away from that door. I'll murder you again. Give me a mother. I'll murder you again. You always shall murder you again. All right. Switch on the lights. Huh? Now, Officer Graham, come along. What? Arrest him. You've heard the confession. Put the handcuffs on him. I've got oh, him, sir. Heaven. <laughs> oh, I have never seen anything so horrible. Well, Bedford, it seems that I've finally caught up with you. I'll kill her again. I'll kill her again. That wasn't your aunt. It was May Wakefield, the actress. I'll kill her again. I'll kill her again. Take him away, Graham. He's in a state of shock. Well, shall we continue with our dinner? I hope you're fully satisfied, Sir William. Quite. It's been a long job, but it has ended as I knew it would. I'm most grateful to you both for your help. I thought it was a pretty grim affair. Oh, your methods repel me. But I suppose you know your job. May Wakefield certainly knew hers. That was the finest piece of acting I've ever seen. Her makeup was incredibly good. We must congratulate her. She's probably gone to her room. Uh, Lane! Yes, sir. Uh, please call Miss Wakefield. Miss Wakefield, sir? Yes, the lady who's been assisting us this evening. Well, uh, uh, I look for her, sir. Yes, tell her to come down and join us. We have a fine dinner waiting for her. Excuse me, sir, but this telegram came a little while ago. I didn't want to disturb you during dinner. Oh, yes, let me have it. Good heavens. Sir William, what's wrong? I'll read it to you. Severe influenza makes it impossible for me to leave my bed tonight. Will tomorrow night do? Signed, May Wakefield. Lord, help us. If it wasn't May Wakefield, then who was that figure here tonight? There was no answer. I looked at Sir William, staring at the telegram. His face was grey and stony. On his left temple, a crooked blue vein stood out. It twitched once or twice, and then was motionless. He looked... He looked as though he'd seen a ghost. And so closes Banquo's Chair, starring Donald Crisp and John Loder. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. Now you may want to make a note of a change of time in these programs. Beginning next Tuesday, suspense will be heard a half hour later, or 10 to 10.30 Eastern War Time. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us at our new time next Tuesday, when Vincent Price, Ona Munson, and Osa Masson will star in the suspense play, Five Canaries in the Room. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, with Ted Bliss, the director, 
Nud Gluskin, and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and Sigmund Miller, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the Man in Black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. So with five canaries in the room and the performances of Ona Munson as Anita, Osa Masson as Fifi, and with Lee Bowman as Ronald Denham, who tells the story, we again hope to keep you in suspense. The trouble was, you see, that a whole apartment vanished. It's true. A flat disappeared straight out of that apartment house. And the dead man disappeared with it. No, I'm not crazy. And in spite of what they said, I hadn't taken too many drinks. You see, I was getting married to Anita in another two weeks. And Jimmy Westlake gave a bachelor party for me. Oh, hang it, it's a situation that might have happened to you. The party was at the old Cap and Bells Club on Lower Fifth Avenue. And it wasn't a brawl. Jimmy Westlake was in the chair, I admit. But nothing could have been more quiet, more dignified. <laughs> oh, Mademoiselle from Armitage, Marley Boo. Oh, Mademoiselle from Armitage, Marley Boo. Oh, Mademoiselle from Armitage. Quiet, you fellas! Quiet! Pipe down, can't you? Wait a minute, the chairman wants to say something. Break gentlemen, down, gentlemen, this is a solemn occasion. Those dopes over there will kindly get away from the piano and sit down at the table. I have another toast to propose. Excuse me, Mr. Wesley. Excuse me, please, sir. Yes, Uncle Cato. What is it? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Wesley, but you ain't going to bust the glasses on this toast, is you? And why shouldn't we bust the glasses, Uncle Cato? Why shouldn't we bust the glasses? Oh, but Mr. Wesley, if you keep on busting the glasses, there ain't going to be no glasses left. Well, in that sad eventuality, Uncle Cato, we will simply start busting the plates. Isn't that fair enough, boys? Yeah. Oh, look, Jimmy, don't you think you'd better tone the gang down a little? Be quiet, Ron. You're only the group. Yeah, I know, Jimmy, but... Gentlemen, I regret to tell you this, but the protesting voice you just heard was that of our guest of honor, Ronald Denham. Now, we all know Ron, and we all like him. But I am sorry to say he is not himself. Where now is the terror of nightclubs, the chorus girl's friend? I say it to his face, he is sober. But we like him just the same. Friends, guests, and bachelors, I give you the groom. The groom! Oh, please, please, gentlemen, don't 
Don't bust the glasses. Hey, come on, Ron. Come on, say a few words. All right, Ron, get up. Come on. Now, look, boys, I thank you for all the good words, and I don't want to be a wet blanket on the party, but it's nearly midnight, and I've got to get home early. Don't you understand, boys? I'm a reformed character. Yeah, how's Fifi Latour? I haven't seen Fifi for over years. She doesn't mean anything to me anymore. He thinks he doth protest too much. Oh, now, look, I'm marrying the sweetest girl in the world. But Anita's a little, well, straight laced. (laughs) You know how it is. What's more, there's my Uncle Rufus. Uncle Rufus. We'll hang Uncle Rufus to a sour apple tree. Quiet! Quiet! Anita and Uncle Rufus. Uh, Anita and Uncle Rufus have apartments in the same building as I have. Now, what's more, they're on the same floor, and that's not all. Tom Evans, the fellow I share my hey, flat with. wait a with. minute. Where is Tom Evans tonight? What's the matter with him? Tom works for Uncle Rufus, and he doesn't drink. Oh, he works for hey, Uncle Rufus. Hey, fellas. And he never fellas. takes a drink. Oh, he works wait. for Uncle Rufus. Quiet, you baboons. Quiet. He's a broker, and he's never in the sink. Now, wait a minute. Will will you put yourselves in my place? My girl and my uncle and my best friend, Tom Evans, are all expecting me to come home from this party in an ash cart. And I'm going to fool them. Oh, Oh, and I have a heart, can't you? This Uncle Rufus must be a pretty tough egg, isn't he? Oh, he's all right, but after his first million dollars, it went to his head. (laughs) Has he got any human weaknesses? Yes, he keeps canaries. Oh, no, not the kind of canaries you're thinking. I mean the kind that go tweet-tweet in cages. (laughs) Oh, what's the use? What do you say, gentlemen? Shall we allow this pure in heart to wind his way home? He's got a drink to the bride, though. That's right, Ron. Can you, as a chivalrous gentleman, refuse to drink to the bride? You can't, and you know you can't. Uncle Cato. Yes, sir, Mr. Westlake. Get a beer mug from the sideboard there. Fill it with champagne. Oh, now, wait a minute, Jim. One more drink won't hurt you, Shirley. Just one little drink. Well, no, I suppose not. Fill it up, Uncle Cato. All right, I'll have one more drink, just in honor of the occasion. But that's all, do you understand? That's absolutely all. Yes, sir. 098 Park Avenue. Hey, 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 mister, mister. Hmm? Come on, wake up. Hmm? Uh, what's wrong? Well, you're home, mister. This is the apartment house. Oh, yeah. Yes, of yeah. course. All right. Thanks. Off we go. Easy now. Are you sure you're all right? Yeah. Yes, I... I'm all right. I... I have been to a bachelor party. Yeah, sure, I know. Well, take it easy now. I can't see straight. The whole street's going around. The funny part is, I only had a couple of drinks. They they must have put something in that last one. Well, it's none of my business, mister, but I wouldn't tell that to the missus if I was you. It's absolutely true. Oh, sure, sure. I know why. And I haven't got a missus. Not yet. For my word of honor, I'm a reformed character. I have nothing to do with any woman except... Ronald Denham. As I live and breathe, it is Ronald Denham. Fifi Latour. Oh, Cherie, how good it is to see you. I look everywhere for you. I cry my eyes out, but I don't find you. What are you doing here? I live here, Fifi. I moved. I... Oh, you tried to get away from me, yes? Yes. Uh, no, no, I, I mean... Well, here's your money, driver. Good night. Oh, good night, sir. You're friend of yours, lady. You better take care of him. I'd take care of him. Yes, you bet you. My poor Ron. I forgive you this time, because you've been on the rassle-dassle and you need someone to take care of you. You live in this building, yes? Yes, fifth floor, I... Oh, good. I take you to your apartment. No. No, no. You say no, eh? And why not? Because you mustn't go in there. Oh. Oh, there's an hour woman. Well, oh, yes? Well, uh, yes. The, the fact is, Fifi, I'm going to get married. Married? Oh, no, for heaven's sake, Fifi, don't make a scene in the middle of the street. Oh, you break my heart, eh? Right in the middle of Park Avenue, you take my heart and you break it, bang, bang. Fifi, please. Now I tell you what you do. You will take me to your apartment this very minute. No, definitely no. You will give me one cigarette and one brandy. You will tell me what this means. Oh, I warn you, by golly, I start screaming so they can hear me at City Hall. I can't do it, Fifi. All right, then I start screaming. No, wait a minute. Oh, of all the times in the world you had to pick this. Do I go along, Cherie? Yes or no? Well, if I do take you, Fifi, will you promise to be good? Cherie, 
I am always good. You won't kick up a row or start banging at doors. Oh, if Anita heard of this. Anita? And who is she? Oh, never mind. I'm too groggy to argue. Come on. I remember going into that building. Dim religious light, deep carpets, an automatic elevator that you work yourself. I remember stepping into that elevator because the floor creaked. I remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. I took Fifi with me and I took her into what the champagne told me was my own flat. Maybe you think that's funny, but it won't be funny much longer. Either the door of the flat was unlocked or my key fitted it. Anyway, I, I remember stumbling through the little hall inside, getting a light on and into the living room. I remember sitting back in an easy chair, thanking the Lord I was home. If I take my coat off, Cherie? Look, Fifi, couldn't you just go home? I want to talk to you, Cherie. And this is one very nice flat. I like it. Thanks a lot. You and Tom Evans, you have good taste in furniture. We didn't choose the furniture, Fifi. This girl of yours chooses it, I suppose? No, it comes with the flat. Oh, you mean? Well, these are furnished flats. They're all furnished exactly alike, except for the personal things you bring yourself. Like that picture on the wall behind me. What picture, Cherie? The painting of the clipper ship over there. <laughs> but, Cherie, <laughs> your eyes are funny and you cannot say straight. There's no picture on that wall. Wait a minute. What's wrong? Why you jump up? We, we don't own any bronze bookends. And the, the lampshades are different. And, Fifi, we're in the wrong flat. Oh, well, then that explains everything. Explains what? It explains about the canary birds. What canary birds? When we first come in here, I think I hear a lot of birds sing. And I think, ooh la la, this is a funny taste for Ron Denham and Tom Evans. But the... Uncle Rufus. Great Scott. Uncle Rufus. This uncle of yours, he keep canary birds? Yes, five of them. But this isn't his flat. I know his flat as well as I know my own. Where'd you hear the singing? Behind that door over there, where I point. That ought to be the door to the dining room. But... <laughs> what was that? Oh, it is a car backfire. Maybe yes. Maybe no, unless they keep cars in dining rooms. That was a gun. It came from the dining room. Yeah, I think so. Quick, let's get out of here. Oh, no, we don't. I've been pushed around tonight till I'm good and mad, and I'm just about crazy enough to find out what this is all about. You're not going to open that door. You just watch me. There's a light in that room anyway. Oh, you know. Look under the sill of the door. Not a very bright light, but... Ron, don't do it. I'll stand back now while I get the door open. Dining room. Not Uncle Rupert. And five canary birds. Five canaries in cages, all in a line. Where in Satan's name are we? Oh, sir, I don't know. Whose flat is this? Who except Uncle Rufus would keep five canaries? I tell you one thing, though. And then I go out of here. Well? There's somebody watching us. Where? Swing door to the kitchen is partly open. But don't look. How the devil can I see it if I don't look? There's somebody standing behind it. I see the light shine on his eye. Quiet, Fifi. Hello there. Hello there. The door move a little more. He's pushing it. Oh, excuse me, sir. We didn't mean to barge in here. We're not burglars or anything like that. We got into the wrong flat, that's all. I want to apologize if we... Straight out through the door, flat on his face. What's the matter with him? Why don't he move? I've got an idea, Fifi. It's because he's dead. He was a little fat man with eyeglasses and a spade-shaped beard. He looked foreign somehow, and there was a bullet hole over his heart. You ask me what happened then? I don't know. Fifi turned and ran. At least I think she did. I bent over the man to make sure he was dead, and then something hit me. As though it hadn't been enough of a nightmare already, I, I could hear that blackjack strike the back of my skull, and everything exploded. 
I couldn't get my breath, and I, I seemed to be swimming in dark water. The next voice I heard wasn't Fifi's at all. It, it was Anita's. And... Ron. Ron Denham. Oh. Oh, my head. Oh, Lord, my, my head. Well, I'm not at all surprised. What's, what's that, Anita? I can't hear you. I said I'm not at all surprised. Of all the disgraceful, dissolute objects I ever saw. Anita, where am I? Oh, darling, as though you didn't know. But, uh, but I don't know. My head feels like a, like a printing press in full blast. Well, you're out in the main hall, dear, on the fifth floor, sitting on the stairs beside the elevator shaft. That's true. But how did I get here? Oh, now, really, Ron. I, I must have been carried here. That's it. By your drunken friends at the club? Well, I don't doubt it in the least. No, Anita. No, you don't understand. I left that party early. I was cold sober. But the low hounds wanted to see me come home in bad shape. So they could... So they, they put something in my glass. Oh, naturally, Ron. Whiskey or champagne? Oh, no, Anita. I mean a drug of some kind. I was dizzy when I got here. Just as I was getting out of the taxi, I met... Well, go on, dear. Whom did you meet? Uh, nobody, Anita. Nobody at all. I came up here to what I thought was my own flat, but it, it wasn't my flat. It was somebody else's. There were a lot of canaries singing and a dead man with a bullet hole in his chest. And... <laughs> well, this sounds pretty crazy, doesn't it? Yes, dear, it certainly does. Yeah, but it's true. <laughs> oh, Ron, I suppose I've got to forgive you. I always do forgive you. Now run along like a good boy and sleep it off, hmm? Listen, Anita, there's a dead man in one of these flats. A dead man? In which flat? Well, that's just it. I don't know. You're not saying it's on this floor. Yes, I definitely remember pressing the button for the fifth floor. Suppose you listen to me, dear. Now, don't make faces and rumple your hair. Just listen. There are only two other apartments on this floor. One is your uncle. It wasn't but... his. I'll swear to that. Well, and the other is mine. You don't think I'm hiding a dead man? No, it wasn't your flat either. Well, then where is it, darling? A whole flat can't vanish and take the dead man along, can it? No. But I'll tell you something else, Anita. I've seen that man's face somewhere before. Well, whose face? The dead man's. Thick eyeglasses, square black beard, something foreign about it. I, I've seen him, or, or I've seen his picture, or... Oh, Ron, please. What's wrong? It's the elevator. Somebody's coming up. Oh, please don't let people see you. Your hat smashed in and your tie's untied and you, you look like nothing on earth. Well, look here, Anita. If it comes to that, what are you doing out in the hall in negligee and pajamas? Well, I wanted to make sure you got home safely. Ron, the elevator, it's Tom Evans and your Uncle Rufus. All right, I can take it. But your uncle can't. Now, don't say anything to him about this dead man. Promise me. Hold on, I've got it. Pierre Duroc. Who? Pierre Duroc. That's the dead man's name. He... The prospect of a European war is so remote as not to be worth serious consideration. Excuse me, sir, but isn't that a little strong? Now, don't argue with me, Evans. No, sir. You may tell my secretary to... Look here. What's this? Well, now, look, Uncle Rufus. Oh, I can't stand any more of this. I'm fed up. Well, I don't blame you, my dear. Has this nephew of mine been annoying you again? Oh, no, of course not, but please don't pay any attention to him. He's... He's drunk. For the last time, I am not drunk. I just want to ask Uncle Rufus, before I go completely nuts, whether he hasn't heard of Pierre Duroc. What's that, Ronald? What'd you say? Pierre Duroc, the French millionaire. Well, what about him? He's the man who always deals in cash on the line. Spot cash, even if it's a million. I saw his picture in the paper. He's in New York to put through a business deal with you, isn't he? Oh, indeed, Ronald. Well, you show a commendable interest in my affairs. That's what you want me to do, isn't it? Well, I believe Duroc does want to buy some property I own, but uh, he hasn't approached me and I haven't approached him. It's a bad business. Uh, why have you developed this sudden interest in Duroc? Because he's dead. Dead? Somebody shot him in a room full of canaries and then slugged me over the head. Do you believe me, Evans? If your uncle will excuse me, old man, I don't see any reason not to believe you. Where's the body? Well, that's the trouble. Ron claims he found it in a flat that doesn't exist. Listen. What's that? Some 
Like somebody running upstairs in the devil of a hurry. Well, maybe it's the dead man. Well, as a matter of fact, it's the night porter. He's the one who can tell us. Tell us what? Well, maybe I did get off at a different floor, but that flat's got to be somewhere in this building. Pearson! Oh, just a minute. Pearson! I'm very sorry, sir. I can't stop now. Please stand aside. I've got to go upstairs and get the manager. Why, Pearson? Is anything wrong? Well, Mr. Evans... Speak up, man. Is anything wrong? It's the police, sir. We found a dead man in the palm garden downstairs. Now do you believe me? You will oblige me, all of you, if you remain quiet and allow me to deal with this. Uh, <clears throat> oh, what does this man look like, Pearson? Uh, he's a foreign-looking gentleman, sir. Never saw him before. He doesn't live in the building. Well, then how did he get to the palm garden? Uh, well, sir, that's what we don't know. He certainly wasn't there when I looked in half an hour ago. But I went back to the palm garden just by chance, and there he was in a wicker chair with the singing birds in cages all around him. Birds again? Oh, be quiet, Ronald. He'd, uh, he'd been shot, sir, the... Police think he was brought down in the service elevator from somewhere upstairs. Why do they think that? Because they found a revolver in that elevator and a little paper band of the, the kind that goes around banknotes. If they could tell where the dead man came from... You can tell us where he came from. Huh? I, I can, sir. Yes, you've been in most of the flats in this building, haven't you? Uh, I've been inside all of them, sir. Why? Well, would you recognize any given flat if I described it? Oh, well, uh, yes, sir, certainly, but... Uh... Well, then, for the love of Mike, think... Who lives in a flat with five canary cages in the dining room? Ronald, are you out of your mind? In case you don't happen to remember, you're describing my place. No, it, it was like your place, but it wasn't at all the same. Oriental prints on the walls. In the living room, uh, bronze bookends and, and bronze lamps. Dragon patterns on the lampshades. There was a, a queer kind of clock on the mantelpiece, shaped like a figure of Father Time. And what's the matter with you, Pearson? Uh, nothing, sir. Uh... But you, you're sure you saw all that? Yes, of course I'm sure. Why not? Because I'm sorry, sir, but you couldn't have seen it. What do you mean I couldn't have seen it? I did see it. Who lives in the blasted place? Nobody. Well, you mean the flat's vacant? Uh, no, sir. I mean, the, there's no such flat in the whole building. <laughs> And that's the position I was in when the police took us down to that palm garden to see the body. I never did like the palm garden much. It's a big, dimly lighted hollow of a place. With bird cages beside the palms and an artificial goldfish pond in the middle. I liked it even less at three o'clock in the morning with a dead man looking at me from his chair. They sent us in one at a time. I was first to see the homicide squad officer. And there was Inspector Braddock, a big, sleepy-looking hulk with a hat like a pirate, sitting on a bench throwing pebbles at that pond. Back would go his arm, and a pebble would hit the water. Back would go his arm, and a pebble would hit the water. And that's all you got to tell me, Mr. Dunham? Yeah, that's all, Inspector. It happens to be true. Oh, I believe you. After all, son, we've got corroboration. Corroboration from whom? From your other girlfriend, Fifi Latour. But Fifi's not here. She ran out of here as soon as Duroc's body fell through that door. Yes, but she didn't run far. A cop wondered why she was running and brought her back. Where's Fifi now? In that room there, talking to your official girlfriend. Oh, that's fine. That's beautiful. The one thing I didn't tell Anita. Why don't you wake up? Wake up? How? This isn't post office any longer. It's murder. And one of that gang out there shot Pierre Duroc. Are you serious? Serious. Sure, I'm serious. This is as clever and slick and mean a trick as ever went on the blotter. Pierre Duroc was one of the goats. You were the other. This uncle of yours is a fairly important guy, isn't he? Wait a minute. Just exactly what are you saying about the old boy? I'm saying he gets lots of publicity. This hobby of his, keeping dicky birds, must be pretty well known. Yes, I suppose so. All right. So if Duroc came to visit your uncle tonight... You say, if Duroc came to visit my uncle. What you're forgetting, son, is that Duroc's an important man, too. He's a visiting foreigner, capital letters, and the department's got to keep an eye on him. The Rock did go to visit your uncle tonight, and he was carrying $20,000 in cash. What are you intimating? Murder. Inspector Braddock. Yes, Sergeant? That crowd out there is raising Kane, especially the old man and the French gal. Shall I let him in? Yeah, you can let him in now. An hour. No, more than an hour. Sitting in an ante room without even hearing why we're here. I tell you, Evans, this is intolerable. It's all right, sir. They probably know what they're doing. You think so, my friend? 
but I still don't know why I'm here. How very interesting, Miss Latour. Such extreme absent-mindedness. Well, perhaps Ron could tell you why you're here. Oh, listen, Anita, I can explain everything. Can you explain the disappearing apartment? Well, that's better. I'd like, if you don't mind, to have a little quiet here. Now, which one of you is Mr. Rufus Denham? I am Rufus Denham, sir. Rufus Denham of Denham and Company. Can there be any doubt whatever about that? No, but I thought I'd ask. I was just telling your nephew, Mr. Denham, that Pierre Duroc came here tonight to see you. To see me, Inspector? That's right. <laughs> I can only characterize that statement, sir, as a flat and downright lie. I've never met that man. I didn't say you met him. I said he came here to see you. Duroc wanted to buy some property from you, didn't he? Well, well I suppose he did. And Duroc always paid spot cash, didn't he? Mm, yes, I believe so. And just one more question. I imagine you've got a secretary... Yes, naturally, I've got a secretary, Miss Helen Gardner. What about her? Somebody posing as your secretary telephoned Duroc at the Metropolis Hotel and spoke to him in very good French. Well, Inspector, don't stop there. Go on. This person, pretending to represent Rufus Dunham, asked Duroc to come here with the money and said they could settle the deal immediately. Don't you see the trick now? Don't you see Duroc was lured into a dummy apartment? A dummy apartment? What does this man mean? I'll tell you. All the flats are furnished exactly alike except for personal things. Pictures, books, lampshades, ornaments. Is that correct? Yes, of course it is. The murderer didn't dare use Rufus Dunham's real flat. But the murderer could always decorate an imitation flat. So that Pierre de Roc would be deceived when he saw... Five canary birds. That's it, son. But what was the idea? A very neat swindle. Look at de Roc's body now. Oh, I can't look at it. Look at his thick glasses. Well, the man was half blind. This so-called secretary, disguised, would meet Duroc in an imitation flat. Duroc would hand over the money and get forged title deeds in return. When Duroc had gone, the flat could be put right again and no evidence left. But uh, something went wrong, That's huh? right. Something went wrong. Duroc suspected. And it had to be killed. Right again. Inspector Braddock, who is the murderer? Can't you guess? Cream, I think I know how it all happened. Do you, Miss Latour? Well, it's very smart of you. Uh, this poor Ronan of mine, he is at a bachelor party. They do not think that he will be home until daylight. Um, but he get reformed and come home early. He blunders straight into that flag in time to interrupt... In time to interrupt the murder, yes. Afterwards, when you were supposed to run away... But I did run away! Sure, Miss Latour, I'm admitting you did. Then why do you look at me as though I didn't? Afterwards, as I was saying, the murderer had to hit Ronald Denham over the head and drag him out in the hall. Turok's body was brought down here along with the canary cages that had been borrowed from here. And the dummy flat was set right again. Uh, just one moment, Inspector Raddock. I, I'm not disputing anything you say, but... Uh, well, sir, what's on your mind? The murderer. What about the murderer? Well, all this. Uh, wouldn't it have been much too heavy a job for a woman? Who said the murderer was a woman? Well, didn't you? I don't think I did. I said the murderer was somebody who planned to swindle. And you still don't see it, any of you, because you can't find the dummy flat. Well, no, and I can't find it myself. That's one question you've got to answer here and now. Where in Satan's name did I go? Whose flat was I in? Your own. What? My, my own? Naturally. If you'd been cold sober, you might have made a mistake. But your instinct brought you home to your own flat. And the only possible murderer is the man who shares that flat with you. The man who thought you'd be away until daylight. The man who knows enough about Dunham's business affairs to plan this swindle against Duroc. Look out, Inspector Braddock. Grab him, Sergeant. <laughs> Thomas Evans, I arrest you for the murder of Pierre Duroc. Good Lord, Evans. Well, that's about all there is to the story. Anita and I were married last week. She's a wonderful girl. I tried to talk her into our staying on in my old flat, but she said she just ha had to have an apartment which didn't have such a habit of disappearing. But we're very happy. We agree about everything, don't we, dear? Oh, practically everything, darling. But I still don't think it was cute of Fifi to send up three dozen canaries for a wedding present. <laughs> And 
so closes Five Canaries in the Room, starring Ona Munson, Lee Bowman, and Osa Masson. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday, when our suspense play will be Last Night by Cornell Woolrich, and will star more of your Hollywood favorites. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Ted Bliss, the director, Lud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, and John Dixon Carr, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now, the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California presents... Suspense! Tonight, Roma Wines bring you the suspenseful play called A Guy Gets Lonely, starring Dane Clark. Suspense is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you a remarkable tale of suspense. And with a drama called A Guy Gets Lonely... And with the performance of Mr. Dane Clark as Eddie Lewis, Roma Wines hope indeed to keep you in suspense. Have you ever been lonely, desperately lonely? Well, there's an emptiness in the pit of your stomach that no food can remove. There's a coldness about people's faces that make you shudder. And you do silly things when you're lonely. Maybe that explains what happened to me. Maybe. Anyhow, I was hanging around the shooting gallery in one of those Broadway penny arcades that night, one of those places where you can play a game of chess, get your fortune told, have ten shots at Hitler all 15 cents. And I was alone, as usual, thinking the dull, drab, dreary things a guy thinks about when he's alone. And suddenly an old man standing next to me said, Ah, uh, well, my aim is not what it used to be. Oh, uh, got a match, my boy? Match? <laughs> oh, sure, here. Oh, thank you. You uh, haven't by any chance got a cigarette to go with that match, have you, son? <laughs> of course, you'd take one. Oh, thanks again. You know, with cigarettes so scarce nowadays, the only way a gentleman gets a smoke is to buy him himself. Yep. Mm. Thank you, thank you. Ah, what's the matter, kid? You look like your ship came in, only your mother-in-law was aboard. Oh, nothing. Oh, oh, come on. Face up to old Horace. I'm Beatrice Barefax without the girdle. Well, I'm just fed up with this town, that's all. Oh, there's nothing wrong with this town, kid. It's like all other towns. Yeah, except the one you grew up in. Oh, uh, I suppose you're right. You know what you need is a... There's a little diversion. Huh? Oh, here, my man. Yes, uh, sir. Yes, load sir. these guns up again, will you? Yes, sir. Both guns, chum. You'll try it again, won't you, sir? All right, sir. Okay. You know, I think perhaps I've got just the right medicine for your homesickness, young fellow. Oh, what's that? A girl. A girl? Yes. Don't tell me you've never heard of them. Well, if you haven't, bless me. I don't want to be the one to tell you. <laughs> there we are. No, That's it. not that. Here you are, sir. That'll be two bucks. Two dollars? That's right, chum. There's a war on in case you haven't heard. Ammunition's kind of hard to get nowadays. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, it's a little dark in here, and my uh, eyes aren't what they used to be, so perhaps I'll simply forget. No, no, no. Here's, here's the money. Go on. Go ahead, Pop. Shoot. Uh, you uh, wouldn't care to make a small wager on this, would you, my boy? As I say, my no, eyes... No, 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 thanks. Uh, well, as I was saying, son, 
I have a splendid idea. Hmm? Now, tomorrow, being the Sabbath, my wife and I are bound for Minnewonka on a peaceful little fishing expedition. <laughs> if you'd care to accompany us, there is a faint chance, just a faint chance, mind you, that uh, I might round up a beautiful young lady who will make it a foursome. Well, wouldn't that be too much trouble? Oh, oh not at all, son. Meet me here tomorrow at nine. What do you say? Gee, that... Well, that's swell, except that... Except what? Oh, uh, do you mind if I shoot first? No, no, no go ahead. Except that I've, I've never been fishing before in my life. Well, don't worry about it. Hey! <laughs> hey, your eyes aren't too bad. Oh, with a fish, hey! the big thing is not so much your experience as your bait. <laughs> The idea of not being alone again on Sundays what excited me. I, I didn't give much thought to the girl and until I saw her. If you've ever seen a truly beautiful woman walking toward you, you'll know what I'm talking about. First, you see the tiny gray silhouette in the distance, and then the figure seems to spring to life. Each curve runs into place, and finally you see the smooth oval face and the, the long auburn hair dancing in the breeze. And before you know it, you all, you're, you're in a trance, that's all. That must have been what happened to me when I first saw Jolie, because I don't remember much of anything until I heard myself saying, Oh, hey, what's that? A worm, silly. You can't fish without a worm. Do I have to? Well, of course. As captain of this boat, I promise to bring in more fish than Horace. Wow. I order you to put that worm on the hook. No, it, it, it shakes. <laughs> Rather gracefully, don't you think? Kind of reminds me of a shimmy queen at a burlesque show. Oh... There. Oh. Now you did it. Easy, wasn't it? Oh. Now drop your line in the water. Okay. Well, where's the fish? Patience, lad, patience. The fish haven't had a chance to read your advertisement yet. Well, if they could only see you, Jorley, I doubt if they'd bother with my line at all. Oh, your line isn't bad, Eddie. This is so bad at all. I guess in the next few hours, I told her just about all I could remember about myself, about wanting to be an actor and leaving home and coming to this town and the disappointments and how I decided to go home while I still had some money left and how lonely I was, how terribly lonely I was. And before she left that night, she wouldn't let me take her home, I, I made a day for the next night. It's funny how quick you can get to feel that way about somebody when you're lonely. We met in the Asta lobby and after we talked for a while... Well... For a slow starter, you certainly pour it on in the backstage. No, 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 please don't laugh, Charlie. I'm, I'm pretty serious. <laughs> about what? About you. How about me? Charlie, look. Look, I was planning to go home today. I had the ticket in my pocket, and this morning I turned it in. Oh. Look, I still want to go home, Charlie, but I want you to go with me. You want what? I, I want you to marry me. Charlie? I heard. Well? You want an answer, no? Yes. It's no, Eddie. Oh. I'm sorry. Well, is there somebody else? No, it isn't is that, there... Eddie. It isn't anything you could possibly imagine. It isn't even that I don't love you, because maybe I do. Jolie! But you see, you... Eddie, I was going to ask you something tonight, too, and it doesn't stack up very well against what you asked me. Jolie, what? What? Oh, I know it's silly. We've only known each other for 48 hours, and it shouldn't matter, but... Oh, it doesn't matter anyway now. Jolie, you've got to tell me. It's just an old, old story, Eddie. Such an old story that you probably wouldn't even believe it. And that's the trouble. Look, I, I, I believe anything you told me. It's, it's about my mother out west and how I support her and how she needs an operation, and... I was going to ask you for a thousand dollars. Is that all? Well, that's enough. Oh, Jolie, why did you put me through such a cold sweat for a little thing like that? Well, it's, it's pretty complicated. Oh, Eddie. what's complicated about it? Look, Jolie. Look, here's a ring. It's all I've got right now, but I, I wish you'd wear it. Oh, it's beautiful. An old Samoan chief gave it to me when I was in Tahiti. Go ahead, look inside. Mm. To Eddie Lewis from Question Mark. Yeah, I had that engraved in it when I got back to the States. I never did know the old guy's name. Will you wear it? Eddie, I'll meet you here tomorrow for lunch. And if I'm wearing the ring, third finger left hand, you'll know that I do. All right. Jolie. Yes? 
Do you want the money now? No, Eddie, no. Not now. The next day, I was there waiting for her, way ahead of time again, but this time she was late. After a half hour, I began to get worried. And then I began to get scared. And after a full hour had gone by and she still hadn't shown up, I was half crazy. And then I felt a hand on my arm and a voice speaking over my shoulder. You were uh, waiting for somebody? Hmm? Huh? That's right. A lady? Yeah, what about it? Would your name be uh, Eddie Lewis? Yes. Say, what do you know about the fact that I'm... We found your name written in lipstick on the back of a bathroom door up on the 10th floor. After it, it said, ask the lobby, one o'clock. So we uh, sort of put two and two together. You see, I'm from headquarters, Eddie. What? I'm a detective. Detective? Listen, if you know anything about Jorley Andrews, I, I, I was supposed to meet her here about an hour ago, and she Would hasn't... Would she have been uh, wearing this ring by any chance? Well, that's right. That's my ring. Where is she? She's down at the city morgue, Eddie. She's dead. <laughs> For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you a star, Mr. Dane Clark, whom you have heard in the first act of A Guy Gets Lonely, a radio play by Don Paul Nathanson, which is Roma Wines' presentation tonight of Suspense. Between the acts of suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Gracious hostess, internationally known on entertaining, Elsa Maxwell's suggestions are always worthwhile. Spring is here, and nature is again bursting into life. Let's bring some of this beauty to the dinner table. A centerpiece of spring flowers will brighten your table, and there's no better way to awaken winter-weary appetites than by serving cool Roma Burgundy with the meal. This glorious wine from California goes well with almost any food. So simple... And yet, how charming. A few flowers to give your table the gay note of spring. A bottle of cool, delicious Roma Burgundy as the subtle accompaniment to a savory meal. You'll enjoy the tart piquancy, the fruity, robust taste of this distinguished Roma Burgundy. Like all Roma wines, unvaryingly good, always high in quality. The result of selected grapes, slowly brought to perfection in California's choicest vineyards gently pressed, then brought to fullest flavor by the ancient skill of Roma's famed wineries. Yet all this goodness is yours for only pennies a glass. Remember, more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wines. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Dane Clark as Eddie in A Guy Gets Lonely. A play well calculated to keep you in suspense. My mind was going round like a merry-go-round. Having an old moocher like Horace walk up out of a clear sky and introduce you to a girl like Jorley. Proposing to her after only 48 hours. And then having a cop come along and tell you she's dead. They took me down to headquarters, and I was there all day answering questions and trying to dope out what had happened myself. I even told them how she'd asked me for $1,000, but they didn't pay much attention to anything I said. It's a simple case of suicide, and that's that. But it couldn't be. Jolie wouldn't commit suicide. You recognized her, didn't you? Well, I... Well, I... what? People don't look quite the same after they've fallen ten stories on a concrete side. But you recognized her? Yes, yes, I recognize it. But why did she write my name on the inside of that door? How do I know what women think about before they jump out the window? I'm not Mr. Anthony. Well, look, maybe somebody followed her. Maybe somebody tried to force the door. There wasn't and... any lock on the door. Then it would have been that much easier. Maybe somebody... Look, Eddie, just what are you trying to make out of this? I don't know. All I know is it couldn't have been as simple as this. You wouldn't be uh, thinking about murder, would you? Maybe. Now, Eddie, this sort of thing happens all the time. Look. I'll draw you a picture. Friendless girl meets guy. They start going together. Then oh. she asks him for money. He doesn't give. The next day, Look, she... I told you. We were I'm doing the talking. She asks him for money, and he doesn't give, see? 
The next day, she writes his name on the handiest plain white surface, and boom. Now, how does that look to you? All right, all right. But what about Horace? Have you tried to trace him? Yeah, sure, sure. We tried to find Horace. Only we didn't. Mainly on account of he doesn't exist, if you ask me. I talked to him, I tell you. He introduced us. <laughs> you don't have to go that far to explain how a man meets a girl nowadays, Eddie. Look, he did introduce us. He was an old man, white hair, was in the shooting gallery. And he has a hobby of introducing guys to beautiful gals, and nobody knows where he lives. Oh. And the only time you ever met him was in the Penny Arcade that's so busy they wouldn't remember George Washington being in there. That and the time you were seen together by a couple of lake trout. Oh, cut it out, will you, son? All right, go on home, Eddie. I wouldn't leave town just yet, though, if I were you. All right. And, uh, Eddie. Yeah? I wouldn't push that murder theory too far, either. Why? Because you know who's the only possible suspect for murder? That's right. You. <laughs> First, I didn't know what to do or what to think. I didn't blame the cops. From where they sat, it just didn't make any sense any other way. And then all at once, I knew what I was going to do. First, I moved to another hotel, just in case. And then I started growing a full beard, and I dyed it black. And my hair, too. You see, I'm a natural blonde, so it turned out pretty good. Good enough to pass off for a night anyway. And I really am an actor. Maybe no Barry Moore, but enough to give a fair imitation of an accent. And I got some different clothes, and then I was ready. I began haunting that shooting gallery because I, I figured the old man had a system. But after about three weeks, I'd about given up hope. When one Saturday night, I walked into a little place off Times Square, and I saw him. My heart was jumping through hoops, but I just sort of moseyed around, tried to look as down in the mouth as I could, kept my face out of the light. I felt pretty safe with the beard, so I went over and I stood next to him. Huh. Well, my aim seems to be off tonight. Oh, pardon me. Do <laughs> you have a match? Uh, I reckon I do. Uh, sure, here you are. Oh, thank you. <sighs> my boy, <laughs> like to try your skill at the shooting gallery? Perhaps a little wager? Oh, no, thanks. I, I've i just about had enough shooting to last me a lifetime. i just come back from two years in the South oh. Pacific. So that's where you got the beard. Yeah, a bunch of us fellas grew them down there. I promised my kinfolk I'd let them see it before I shaved it off. I'm not so sure I would shave it off. <laughs> it's mightily becoming to thank you. Thank you, thank uh, you. Where are your folks? Uh, Texas. Got a mighty nice little ranch of my own down there. I sure do miss it. <laughs> kind of lonely, huh? Oh, you all can say that again, mister. Well, son, if you'd forgive an old man for sticking his nose in somebody's business where he's got no call to... Sex, no. What's on your mind? I think I know just the medicine for you. Why, well, what's that? A girl. That was it. That's what I've been waiting for. First, I thought of taking the old devil out in the alley and sweating it out of him right then and there. And then I thought, no. No, there'll be a girl, and I want to have a talk with that girl. In the meantime, the old man was going on about that fishing trip. Uh, if, you, uh, if you care to join us, my boy, I think I can promise you a very pleasant afternoon. Well, I, I reckon I couldn't do that. Uh, perhaps if you could make it tomorrow night. Well, now, that might be arranged. Uh, where would you like to have us meet you? Well, couldn't you just sort of give me the young lady's phone number, tell her I was uh, fixing the oh, call? I, I'm afraid, you see, this particular young lady doesn't have a phone. Oh, don't think I'm not downright grateful, mister, or that I wouldn't enjoy your company, but... Uh, uh, but you'd rather be alone. Shucks. Huh? No, don't get me wrong. I'm no wolf or nothing like that, but... Well, when a fella has his first date with a gal more than two years, maybe you can't understand what that means. But... I think maybe I get the general idea, son. I'll tell her to look for a handsome Texan with a beard. Can you be here tomorrow night at, say, 8 o'clock? Oh, I calculate I sure can. Well, then, my boy, you've got yourself a date. The next night I was there in plenty of time. I had plans for that girl, lots of plans. As I got around toward 8 o'clock, I kept looking toward the street entrance, but somehow I must have missed her because the next thing I knew... There was somebody standing beside me, and I heard a voice. Hello there. I'm Joyce Ireland. It seemed as though minutes went by before I was able to say a word. If it hadn't been dark where I was sitting, she couldn't have but helped to see that something was wrong. Because the girl was Jolly, My Jolly, who was supposed to be dead. 
the joy that I'd seen it myself at the slab at the city morgue. And somehow, I, somehow I managed to pull myself together and start talking. You're Johnny Farrell, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, that's right. I, it was sure mighty nice of you to come. Oh, that's all right. I wasn't doing anything. Is there anything in particular you'd like to do now? No, nothing in particular. Well, I thought maybe you'd like to go dancing or something like that, only I... Only what? Well, I discovered a terrible thing just before you got here, Miss... Ma'am. <sighs> you can call me Joyce. <laughs> you see, I, I left my wallet up in my hotel room. Oh? If you all wouldn't mind stopping by there with me for a minute while I pick it up, then we could... And I suppose while we're up there, I can look over your etchings. Oh, or... no, ma'am. I ain't that kind. Honest, I'm not. But if, if you don't want to go, it... Oh, what's the difference? Come on, let's go. You always keep it this dark in here? Well, there's a couple of bulbs burn out. I told them to have them fixed. Oh, but well, they... never mind. Where's that wallet? In the closet there, my other suit. Say, uh, Joyce. Yes? Would you mind if I stepped in here and sort of slicked up a little before he went out? No, no. Go right here. I went into the bathroom and got out my razor. My plans were still the same. I excused myself a minute before we came upstairs and I made the phone call that I'd planned to. But there was a couple of little extra flourishes to be added on now that I hadn't figured on before. First, I shaved off my beard. Then I went to work on the hair dye. I was rubbing alcohol. It came out pretty easy. And I was almost ready when I heard her voice in the next room. Johnny! Uh, uh, yes? I think maybe I'd better go home. You mean you... You reckon you don't want to go out with me? Oh, well, it isn't you, Johnny, but... Well, what is it? You'll think I'm crazy if I tell you. No, no, I won't. What is it? Well, you sort of remind me of someone. Who? Oh, just someone I used to know. Oh, but Joyce, I'm all ready to go now. Well... Only first I thought maybe we'd better have a little more light on the subject. I thought you said you didn't have any... Hello, Jorley. Hattie. That's right. Hattie, I, I thought, thought you... thought I'd never catch up with you. All right, Jorley, all right. Give. What? Come on, talk and talk fast. Who was that other girl, the one they thought was you, the one who's dead? Well, she was my sister. Sister? What happened to her? I, I don't know. What kind of a racket are you and the old man running anyway? Well, Horace is... He's my father, Eddie. He's, he's my stepfather oh, anyway. Oh, that's nice. That's very nice. It keeps it all in the family, huh? Oh, Eddie, you can think anything you want to. Nothing could be quite bad enough, but... Please believe me, I wasn't playing any games with you. No? No! That's why I sent Evelyn that day, my sister. I gave her your ring so you'd know she really came from me. I just couldn't face you myself. Face me with what? With what Horace and I had planned to do to you. The old shakedown, huh? I guess so. Evelyn was horrified anyway when she got wind of it. She was a funny girl. She belonged to one of those religious sects, and she said we'd have to atone for our sins and be punished. <laughs> and now... Uh, maybe you better start from the beginning. Well, that's about all. We were awfully hard up. And Mother really was sick. And... And I'd borrowed some money once from a man I'd met. I paid it back that time, but it gave Horace ideas. He wheedled and threatened and said our mother might die, and... Well, I'd had a couple of pretty raw deals pulled on me out here, and I just didn't care anymore, I guess. That is... Till I met you. Yeah, and so you sent your sister to me to confess all, and she jumped out of the window instead. Is that what you think happened? I, I don't know. Then why did you tell me what you knew then? Well, I wouldn't have brought Evelyn back to life. And Horace said we'd all go to prison, and... You see, Mother didn't know what was going on. It would have broken her heart. Yes, but you went right back at it again. Oh, Horace said if he'd had just a little money, he'd go away. He'd leave us alone and go back east. And I was supposed to be the next victim as Johnny Farrell with a ranch in Texas. No, Eddie, no. Not after I met you. No. 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 You weren't before, were you? Oh, Eddie, maybe if you knew a little more about what a girl is up against in this town, Where's you'd it? understand. Telegram. Telegram? Oh. Ah, yes. I had a hunch about you, my boy. Horace! Why, you... Uh -oh, uh oh don't try anything foolish. I'm quite expert with this little gun, as you may recall, my boy. 
I suggest we close the door and have a nice quiet talk just between ourselves. That's better. So in spite of all my admonitions, you still persist in this confessional mood, do you, my dear? Horace, what are you going to do? You young people may not see it quite my way, but I'm an old man and I don't fancy the notion of spending my remaining years behind bars. It's quite a penalty for extortion, you know. You're telling me. And so I'm afraid there's going to be a little accident up here. Something like the accident that happened to poor Evelyn. So you did kill her! Well, technically, yes, I did uh, assist her through that window after she insisted on making a scene. Why, you... Evelyn was always excitable, you know. Really not quite normal, I'm afraid. Oh, Horace, you're mad. Now, my dear, I want you to write a little note. See, there's paper and pen over there on the desk. And you will say, uh, <clears throat> Darling, forgive me, but it will be best this way for both of us. And sign your name. You must be mad to think I'd do such a thing. You wouldn't like to see me kill your lover here, would you? Oh, oh uh, yes, these old eyes can still tell love when they oh. see it. Charlie, look, don't do it, don't do it. Can't you see he's going to kill us both anyway? Horace, oh, will you promise, Of course then? I will. That's it, my dear. Write it down just as I told you. There's only one thing wrong with all this, Horace. You want to know what it is? Naturally. I've already called the police. They're waiting for me in the lobby right now. And if I'm not down there in about five minutes, they'll be up here. Oh, dear, this is embarrassing, isn't it? Isn't it? I think perhaps you'd better get on that telephone, my boy. Give directions for the officers to go away immediately. Say that you no longer have any need of them. Well, all right. Hello? Hello, desk. You know those two men who are waiting in the lobby for me? Well, tell them... Tell them to get up here as fast as they can. You! Horace, no! Jolly! Why, you won't... Jolly! Jolie, are you all right? I think so. It's only my shoulder. Oh, darling, you shouldn't have gotten I'd in I'd rather have had it been me than you. Look, I'll, I'll call a doctor. What's going on here? We heard a shot. Look, there's the man who's responsible for the suicide of Jolie Andrews. Oh, only it wasn't a suicide. He killed her. It wasn't Jolie Andrews. That's Jolie Andrews over here. What are you talking hello, about? Hello, hello, hello. I've hey. got to get a doctor. Wait a minute, will you? All right. Hello? Was... Look, I don't enough. you understand? Look, that isn't Joel Andrews that's dead. That's Joel Andrews over there. You're it's... not making sense, man. Look, fella, look. I met this guy at a hotel. Yeah. And then we went fishing, and then we put the worms on a hook, and yeah, yeah. And then she was in a slab, and she was she was dead. Only she's not dead. She's wonderful. We're going to get married. See, I love her. And and then Horace and I were in the shooting gallery. Then I met him, and I dyed my hair, and I made a fake Texas accent. See. And I met him one afternoon. And so closes A Guy Gets Lonely, in which Roma Wines have brought you Mr. Dane Clark as star of tonight's study in Suspense. Before our star returns to the microphone, let me say a word for Roma Wines, the sponsor of Suspense. Elsa Maxwell is known the world over for her great charm as a hostess. Now, here's a brief message from this noted authority. It is always a gracious act of hospitality to serve a glass of distinguished Roma wine. I suggest you try Roma California Toque, a wine of unusual versatility, enjoyable any time, before or after meals. I serve it frequently with dessert or coffee. It's perfect with fruit or nuts or with any light snack. Follow Miss Maxwell's good suggestion. Try Roma Toque. A velvety smooth, flame bright wine, moderately sweet, light, yet delightfully rich in flavor. And you'll find that all Roma wines are always delicious, always of unvarying goodness and fine quality. The next time you use vermouth, sweet or dry, use Roma vermouth. Zestful, herb flavored Roma vermouth is blended, mellowed, developed, and bottled in California with all the traditional wine-making skill of Roma wineries, yet surprisingly low-priced. Try Roma Vermouth soon, won't you? This is Dane Clark. That I enjoyed appearing on Suspense goes without saying all of us do. Next week's show sounds like it'll be really swell. It's a story written by one of the great contemporary masters of the art of suspense, Dashiell Hammett. And starring in it will be two of your favorite Hollywood people, John Payne and Stuart Irwin. I'll surely want to catch the one next Thursday, and I know you will, too. Suspense is produced, edited, and directed by William Spear. Dane Clark appeared through the courtesy of Warner Brothers and will soon be seen with Dennis Morgan in their production, God is My Co-Pilot. Next Thursday, same time, 
John Payne will be your star of Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is the man in black. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star tonight is Bela Lugosi, playing the part of Professor Antonio Basile, psychologist. The story is by J. Donald Wilson, who calls it The Doctor Prescribed Death. If you have been with us on these Tuesday nights, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. This series of tales is calculated to intrigue you, stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the doctor prescribed death and Bela Lugosi's performance. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense. Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but let him tell you about it. As a psychologist, I have worked out a theory. A theory I know to be sound. I contend that a person who has decided to kill himself can very easily be turned from this desire to the desire of taking the life of another. I can prove my theory. And if necessary, that is exactly what I will do. Yes, Professor Antonio Basile has a theory, but only a theory. And he's worried about what his publisher will say. So he visits the editor, whose name is Hellman. Hellman finishes the manuscript and tosses it on the desk. Professor Basile leans forward eagerly and... Well, Hellman, what do you think? Professor Basile, it's purely conjecture, simply a theory, and I wouldn't advise publishing it. I worked on that theory for a long time. I am positive of it. I know it'll work. Suppose it will. What good is it? What good have you accomplished if you can prove it'll work? <laughs> Are you laughing at me, Hellman? <laughs> it's so silly. An ordinary human being has suffered reverses. is sick of it all. He wants to leave it all behind. And you say he can be changed to want to kill someone else. I do. Self-destruction and the destruction of other life are closely related in the mind. The dividing line is very thin. It's ridiculous. And you won't publish it? Ranger would fire me. Why? He told me that in his opinion you should be in the asylum. Mr. Granger said that. Does he think I'm insane? <laughs> How do I know? <laughs> Herman, Mr. Granger didn't say that. It's you who thinks I'm crazy. You've never liked me. For some reason, you are trying to tear me down. Well, we'll see, Mr. Hellman. We'll see. Now, wait a minute. I'll show you whether my works are illogical. I'll show you whether I'm insane. Oh, calm down. <laughs> I'm going to make you eat those words. I know you don't like me. But I'm going to prove that my theory is sound. Good night. Wait a minute. Basil, wait. You wait, Hellman. You wait. Yes, wait, Hellman. 
Wait. Professor Basile, seething with resentment, rushes from the office and strides angrily down the street. Insane, huh? I'll prove my theory. I'll find the subject. I'll find someone who wants to take his own life. And so Basile goes home late for dinner. He finds a note from his wife, Myra, saying she's decided to attend the opera and will be home around 11.30. Then Professor Basile gets an inspiration. He goes to the bridge over the deep canyon, the bridge called Suicide. And strangely enough, he hasn't long to wait. As he stands against the railing in the fog, a figure appears a few feet beyond, stops, prepares to leap. Don't do it! Wait a minute! Listen. Huh? That's very silly. Let go of me. Oh, no. I couldn't do that. I need you. I don't need you. Don't you know this is uh, against the law? You're not an officer. You can't stop me. It's 500 feet to those tracks below. Hard steel rails. And don't believe what they all tell you about not being conscious of what happened. You'd know. People don't die instantly. Let loose. They lie in agony for minutes and sometimes for an hour. It's a horrible death, I know. How do you know? I'm a doctor. Doctor? Yes. I can tell you much simpler ways, much less painful ways and quicker. You're a nice young girl, an intelligent girl. You wouldn't want it to happen this way. Maybe after I talk to you a while, you wouldn't want to do this at all. No. No. But come on. Let's talk it over. Maybe a few minutes' talk will change the entire picture for you. What could you do to help me? If you'll come, I'll tell you. There's a motive back of your wanting to do this, and I'd like to know what it is. Nothing doing. Haven't you any relatives? Any loved ones you'd like to do something for? Yes. Then if you'll talk with me for a while, maybe I can find my way clear to help those people. You sound crazy to me. Oh, no. All right, I'll... Where? My apartment. Let's go. Well, here we are. Come in, please. Well, what do you want to know? Now, sit down first. Are you hungry? No, I'm not that broke. It isn't poverty. I knew that. Why did you come here? Why? Why, because you talked me into it. I <laughs> see. You're not afraid of me? Afraid? In my frame of mind. What could I lose? Suppose I told you that I really brought you here to kill you. Kill me? <laughs> you know, you're a very pretty girl, don't you? Yeah. That doesn't always mean so much. The right man, it might. That's what I thought. But I found out it didn't mean a thing. Ah. Then it was because of a man. I knew it. Really? How did you guess? I'm a student of psychology. I'm Professor Antonio Basile. I see. And you want to know what makes me tick. You want to know the reason behind my action tonight. That's right. I would like to know what happened to make you want to kill yourself. Suicide is a mental aberration. Yeah. I'd like to know what preceded the decision to destroy yourself. And what you thought about until the moment I stopped you on the bridge. What good will that do me? You said you weren't broke. But you also said you had some loved ones you'd like to do something for. I meant I wasn't broke to the point of being hungry. I have a few dollars. But you suggested help for someone in larger terms. Yes, I did. Who is the loved one? My mother. You are her only means of support? Yes. And you intend to kill yourself? Yes. That's being selfish, isn't it? Selfish? Yes. You are concentrating solely on self. You think so? What else? The first law of human nature is self-preservation, right? I suppose so. The second law is the preservation of family. Yeah. So you decide to deny the first law and destroy yourself. 
and as a consequence, deny the second, and leave your mother alone and in need. You indicate a form of insanity. What would be normal? To destroy the other person, the one who has done you wrong. Have you hurt him? No. Then the one who has done wrong should be the one to suffer. You have no legal recourse? Legal recourse? No, I haven't. I'm sorry, Stay. And you would kill yourself to let your poor mother suffer because of the wrong of another. Why shouldn't he be the one to suffer? I suppose you're right. Why shouldn't he? What happened after all? Why not tell me about it? Were you married? No. I never seemed to find time to get a wrong marriage. What's your name? Gladys. Gladys Tanner. How long had you known him? Almost four years. And you always thought he meant to marry you? Yes. Until three weeks ago. Yes? On July 1st, he had to leave town for a week on business. Said he was going to Kansas City. When he came back, he seemed to be too busy to see me. Then a week ago, I found a snapshot along with several others in his desk in his home. May I see it? Certainly. It's a picture of him and another woman. But the picture was not taken in Kansas City. It wasn't? No. It was taken on the beach at Atlantic City. And it's dated by the finisher, July 3rd. Since he returned, he's refused to see me. Yesterday, he finally said he didn't care to see me anymore. But I'd better forget him. But it isn't so easy as that, is it? No. I figured I'd done something. And blame myself. Do you... Uh, do you know this blonde woman in this uh, snapshot? No. Then it must be a woman uh, he has met uh, recently. You've known him for, for four years. I don't think you are to blame. He's the one in the wrong. And he should be made to suffer. How? You were going to kill yourself. Why should you? Kill him instead. He double-crossed you. He deserves it. Now, let me go a little deeper into the situation. Whenever a person has reached the conclusion to take his life... You are sure you have made up your mind, Miss Tanner? Positive. Now, if you're careful, you won't be caught. No. But whether you are or not, I'm giving you this check for a thousand dollars made out to cash to be sent to your mother only after the man is dead. Write his name on this pad. There you are. I will know what has happened by the newspapers. And I will be told payment until I learn that you have gone through with it. It'll happen tonight. Very well. You are sure... You are determined? Absolutely. Nothing could stop me. Very good. But just what would happen if I did get caught? You won't get caught if you follow my instructions. I know. Now, here is a small revolver. It'll fit easier in your purse. That's all you need. Be sure to wipe your fingerprints off and leave the gun near the body. Well, goodbye, Dr. Basile. Goodbye, Gladys, and good luck. Professor Basile watches Gladys as she crosses the street to the dimly lighted bus stop. Then he rushes to his car and drives away. A few minutes later, he comes to a stop at Hellman's house. Hellman, the editor who ridiculed his theory. A minute. Oh. Hello, Basile. Good evening, Herman. Thought I'd drop out to have a little chat with you. Well, why this time of night? It's kind of late, isn't it? Eleven. Didn't think that was late for you. No? Well, uh, come in. Thanks. Sit down. What's on your mind? 
I want to talk to you about my theory you ridicule so definitely. My theory about suicide. Oh. Well, I just don't believe it, that's all. And I said I'd prove it, didn't I? Yes, but what are you getting at? It's going to be proved. My theory is going to be proved tonight. Oh, that's fine. Go right ahead and prove it. I don't like you, Hellman. I'd never like you. And I know you don't like me. I can't help that, Basile. What are you staring at? Is there someone here with you? Certainly not. Why? That's a woman's purse on the Davenport. Hmm? Oh, my secretary dropped by earlier this evening with the manuscript. She must have forgotten it. She's not here now? Of course not. Then I'll continue. I found a subject. A girl who was ready to commit suicide because a man jilted her. In a few hours, I was successful in changing her thoughts from suicide to homicide, and she is going to kill the man tonight. What do you think of that? There may be a dozen murders tonight. Ah, but you'll know which one I mean. You'll know about this murder. What do you mean? Because I'm going to tell you who the victim is going to be. You know who the intended victim is? Why don't you stop it? <laughs> but then I wouldn't have proved my theory. If you put this girl up to it, you're as guilty as she is. <laughs> you're insane, Basile. Hopelessly insane. You think so, Emma? The whole idea is mad. Too utterly ridiculous for words. <laughs> no sane man would ever think of such a useless, senseless idea. And for heaven's sake, stop laughing. I'm thinking about the victim when he learns. Who is the victim? Martin Harriman. Me? Yes, you. <laughs> I don't believe you. You will this time. Who is this girl? I know no girl who'd want to kill me. This one does. Now. Oh, nonsense. However, I wouldn't put a past you to hire someone to do something like this. No, no. This girl is no fake. This girl is serious. Deadly serious. You probably hypnotized some poor woman, figuring she'd never remember what happened. Oh, Hellman, you underestimate me. Maybe I do underestimate your evil mind. But believe Put me... Put up your hands, Hellman. Get away from that desk. I'll just take care of that gun, Hellman. That's better. Well, since when did you start carrying a gun, Basile? I a gun? Don't be silly. This isn't a gun in my pocket. It's just my pipe. See? <laughs> well, what do you hear, Hammond? Uh, nothing. Oh, yes, you do. I heard it, too. The sound on the porch. I leave now. The back way. I put your gun in the kitchen. And I'll be very careful to remove all my fingerprints. You insane fool. Oh, fancy you. You, Hellman, you are going to help prove my theory. <laughs> Good night, Hellman. Busy devil. I'll have him locked up before he gets across town. Good evening, Mr. Hellman. Huh? How did you get in here? Through the patio door. What do you want? I wanted to talk to you. Very strangely. <laughs> You're just imagining things. And what are you doing here? I wanted to tell you something. Yeah? What? When you first indicated to me that you were through with me, I was terribly hurt. I thought all along that we were to be married. I couldn't understand. I tried and tried to think of something I'd done to cause our breakup. Then I happened to find this snapshot in your desk. Snapshot? Take a look at it. Kansas City. No, Atlantic City, New Jersey. You and a blonde. And the date is stamped on the back. A business trip. Ha! Huh. Well, what about it? I just wanted you to know that you weren't so slick. I wanted you to know that I knew about the blonde... But I knew you'd lied. Now that you've told me, what good does it do you? A lot of good. First, I thought you came here for money. How could you think such a thing? Well, I think you'd better go now. <laughs> I'm going. Goodbye, Morton. And good luck in your new venture. What venture? This one. Gladys. Gladys! 
wish me luck in mine. Gladys stands staring a moment at the body of Hellman, then wipes off the gun, drops it to the floor, takes the professor's check from her purse, steps to Hellman's desk and writes a note. Then she puts the note in an envelope with the check, addresses it, stamps it, turns out the lights, and steps out into the dark street. At the corner, she drops the envelope in the mailbox and disappears. Professor Basile heard the shots. His theory worked. Hellman will torment him no more. The perfect crime. So he can go home to his wife now and go to sleep. Myra. Myra. Huh? What? Oh, oh, Antonio. What are you doing asleep on the Davenport? Do you know what time it is? It must be after midnight. I've been waiting for you. How was opera? Oh, fair. Nothing to brag about. Who sang the lead? Bill Chiotti. He wasn't very good. Bill Chiotti? Mm-hmm. He's a poor old fellow. A fellow? I thought they were uh, doing Ida tonight. No, they switched because someone was ill. Oh, they just as soon have stayed home. Have a night, Cup Myra? No, thanks. I'm tired. I think I'll go to bed. I'll be long presently. Good night. Then the night passes and the morning comes. The professor rises cheerfully and prepares for breakfast. Then... i get it, Myra. Yes? Are you Professor Basile? Yes. May we come in? We'd like to talk with you. Of course. What is it you want? Is your wife in? Yes. We'd like to see her, too. If you are... Oh, I'm Lieutenant Davis. Right. Detective Davis. Well, what do you want? Will you call your wife? Why? Uh, suddenly. Myra! But what is this all about? What is it, Antonio? These men are from detective headquarters. They want to talk to us. Really? What about? May I ask where you were last night, Mrs. Basile? Certainly. I went to the opera. And what time did you get home? Oh, I imagine it was around 11 or shortly after. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last evening, Professor? Well, I was at the club and got home about 12.30. By the way, uh, do you know a Morton Hellman? Certainly. What about him? He's been murdered. Murdered? Good Lord. When? Around midnight last night. I found him this morning. How terrible. Why, I've known him for years. He was editor-in-chief of the company publishing my writings. I'm a psychologist, you know. Yes, I know. But, uh... What do you want to know from us? We weren't connected socially with Hellman. uh, Just in business. Did uh, you know him, Mrs. Basile? Yes, yes, I knew him very slightly. Do either of you know of anyone who'd have reason to kill him? Uh, Certainly not. Everyone thought highly of him. Did you ever hear of a girl named Gladys Tanner? Gladys Tanner? No. Did you know of a Gladys Tanner, Mrs. Basile? No. Is this your purse, Mrs. Basile? Why, of course it is. That's the one I gave you last Christmas, Myra. Oh, yes. I must have lost it downtown. Where did you find it, Lieutenant? At Hellman's home. Hellman's home? Well, how in the world... Good heavens, but We found it on the sofa. I can't imagine how it could get there. And this is the revolver that killed Hellman, found on the floor beside him. What? No fingerprints on it, however. What? What? May I see it? Why, Myra, this is your gun. I bought this for you two years ago. When I went on the lecture tour. Yes, I think it's mine, but it just doesn't make sense. Did you have the gun in your purse when you lost it last night? Well, I... Perhaps I did. I, I'm so confused now, I can't remember. I think... I don't think it is, it is terrible. Oh, I know. Oh, dear, I feel ill. Did you ever fire this gun? Yes, once last year up in the mountains. I, I wanted to see how it worked. Ever reload it? No, I've never reloaded it. I, I just didn't think about it. Maybe I did put it in my purse. Why, I don't know, and... And whoever found the purse may have used the gun to... Oh, I just can't seem to think. This gun misfired on the first two shots. The other three killed Hellman. This is the most amazing piece of coincidence I ever heard of. Why would my wife want to do such a thing? Why should she get to Hellman? She hardly knew him. Are you sure about that, Professor? Of course. Well, sorry to say that I don't believe her. What? This is ridiculous. This is going to be a shock to you, Professor, but... 
Here's a snapshot we found on Hellman's desk. Taken in Atlantic City last July. Good heavens. Why, this is you, my... You and Hellman. You were at your mother's in Florida in July. <laughs> Myra, look at me. What does this mean? I can't. I can't. And I can't believe such a thing. May I have the purse, the gun, and the photo? Thank you. I'm sorry, but I'll have to take her down to headquarters. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I wouldn't. I loved him. <laughs> Myra. You better pull yourself together. You'll have to go back. You'll want photos and fingerprints. Yes. You better get it ready, Myra. <laughs> Certainly looks bad for her. Great it does. Looks like an open and shut case. Oh, uh, will you come along too, Professor? Certainly. And so it all worked out beautifully. Not quite as the professor had planned. But then he changed his plan from the moment when Gladys Tanner showed him the snapshot taken in Atlantic City. And he realized that the girl's fiancé was Hellman and that the blonde was Myra, his wife. He had no intention of allowing Gladys Tanner to kill Hellman until he saw that snapshot. And when he recognized Myra's purse in Hellman's home... He decided to let Gladys kill him and the blame be placed on Myra. The perfect crime. But several hours later, after fingerprints and many questions, the professor is just about to be dismissed when Sergeant Rankin steps into the room and speaks quietly to Lieutenant Davis. What is it, Rankin? Well, I stayed at the Seals place, as you said. Well? A few minutes ago, a special delivery letter came for the professor. This will knock your eye out reading. All right. Well, this fits perfectly with the writing we were trying to make out on Helm's desk letter. Professor, here's a letter sent special delivery to you a few minutes ago, postmarked last night. Read it. Dear Professor Basil, your theory worked a certain degree. You convinced me I should kill him. Uh, I should kill him, uh, but when that gun you gave me uh, misfired twice, I, I almost quit. Go ahead, Professor. Read on. Then as I looked at him on the floor, the feeling of self-destruction came back. I'm going ahead with my plan. Here's your check. I won't need it. Besides, I lied to you. I lost my mother long ago. Better luck next time. That is Tana. And a half hour ago, they found her body beneath Suicide Bridge. Well, Professor, your perfect crime has failed. Failed? Yes, Failed, Wonderful but... setup on paper, but your theory backfired and you're up for murder. But I didn't kill him. But you planned it and you're as guilty as Gladys. She's paid her penalty. Now it's your turn. No. No. I won't. I won't be hanged. Never. Drink and drink. And now the doctor lies on the sidewalk, 17 stories below. His entire theory worked in reverse. So closes the doctor prescribed death starring Bela Lugosi. Tonight's story of suspense. It came to you from Columbia Square in Hollywood. This is the man in black who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next Tuesday when we present the noted actor, Mr. Sidney Greenstreet, in The Hangman Won't Wait. Spear, the producer, Ted Bliss, the director, Lad Gluskin, the musical director, Lucian Mahwick, the composer, 
and J. Donald Wilson, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Now let's see. Suspect, suspected, suspend. Ah, here we are. Suspense. The condition of mental uncertainty, usually accompanied by apprehension or anxiety. Fear of something which is about to occur as... Do not keep me any longer in... Suspense. For our story of suspense tonight, we invite you to enjoy... The Devil in the Summer House... By John Dixon Carr. Somewhere along the Hudson, perhaps not far from Terrytown, there is a modest house in its own grounds. Behind it, in the spacious garden, stands a summer house of evil memory. More than 25 years ago, a man shot himself, or at least died, in that summer house. They found Major Kenyon with a scorched bullet hole in his head and the weapon beside him. But we are in the present now. The latticed summer house has grown heavy with vines. And only the other evening, two men came into that garden at twilight over the shaggy grass as a storm was brewing along the Hudson. Two men, the lawyer from New York... Who's there? And Captain Burke of the Homicide Squad. Easy, my friend, easy. I was just trying to ask you the same thing. My name is Parker. I'm an attorney. You're not Captain Burke. Yeah, the very same and no other. I thought I recognized you, Mr. Parker. Must be something important to bring you so far from New York at this time of night. I was in Tarrytown anyway. I thought there'd be a housekeeper here. But I don't see any lights. You've got business here? Yes, in a way. Have you? I don't know. I'll tell you better after you tell me what brought you to a place that no one has lived in for ten years. Tell me, Captain. Did you ever get an anonymous letter from a dead man? Did you? No, I can't say I did. The letter's anonymous. How do you know the man's dead? Because they're all dead. Every last one of them. Dead and under the ground where they can't be hurt any longer. Look. There's the summer house where Jerry Kenyon used to work. There are the windows of the library and the dining room. Looking for it. Confound this lightning. Makes the windows blaze, don't it? Jerry Kenyon hadn't a care in the world, yet he shot himself. I'll show you the letter. Now, look, Mr. Parker, I couldn't read anything in this light, but if we can get inside the house Certainly we can get into the house. I was the family attorney. I've got the keys. Why should a dead person send me a letter? Working, eh? 
But you got a flashlight, I see. Came here prepared for anything, eh? This is the library. There were always candles on the mantel. Uh, yes, there they are. Have you a match, Captain? Oh, uh, yes, I'll light them. Uh, that's better. Same old heavy furniture. Same old thick carpet, same old globe map. Now, uh, Mr. Parker, this letter that you were talking about. Yeah. Read it. Hey, wait a minute. This thing is dated November 2nd, 1918. That's right, and be careful of that paper. You see how old it is? But it was mailed yesterday. From where? I don't remember. I didn't keep the envelope. Read it. Dear Joe. In case you didn't know it, I am Joe. Dear Joe, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died... But we know how he died. It was suicide. Are you sure it was? Whoever wrote this letter doesn't seem to think so. If you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. Press hard at the back of the drawer, yours very truly. That's not signed. That's right. Are you sure you don't know who wrote that letter? This is the first time I've been back in this room, Captain. It was almost a home to me once. There's the chair where Isabel sat on the afternoon it happened. Isabel was Jerry Kenyon's wife, beautiful woman. There's the door that the maid let me in by that afternoon. You know, Captain, it seems to me they're all here tonight. Who? Oh. We stand beneath the sounding rafter, and the walls around us are bare as they echo our peals of laughter. It seems that the dead are there. Yet we stand to our glasses steady. You know it? I was in my school, reader. How does the rest of it go? Yet we stand to our glasses steady and drink to our comrades' eyes. Here's a glass to the dead already. Hurrah for the next that dies. Excuse me, Captain. I don't know what's come over me talking that way. I was very fond of these people. Are you going to look in the desk drawer? This is a lot of nonsense. Then why are you here, Mr. Parker? Jerry Kenyon was always a happy man. At least that's what I always thought. Big, boisterous fellow. Yeah. He had a good position with Vitatone. You know, the phonograph company. Yeah, sure I know. But he'd just been made a major in the army. 1917. There was a war on then, too, if you remember. I remember. To make the world safe for democracy. Old days. Old heartaches. Old memories. I remember that blazing hot day in August. When all the windows were up. I remember this room. And Isabel, that was Jerry's wife, sitting in that chair, knitting. I remember... Yes, Kitty. What is it? There's a man to see you, Miss Kenyon. He says his name's Parker. Yes, I'm expecting him. Show him in, please. All right, ma'am. Shall I take your knitting in your knitting bag? Why should you take my knitting? I don't know, Miss Kenyon. I just wondered. You can come in now. Thank you. Hello, Joe. Hello, Isabel. You sent for me? Joe, I must apologize for Kitty. Servants are getting to be a problem nowadays. She looks pretty enough to get along. Oh, Kitty's got large ideas. She wants to go on the stage, if you please, and do imitations, like Miss Draper. She only knew how hard it was acting all your life. Isabel, you've been crying. I have not. At least... Is that why you sent for me? I've missed you. You haven't been here in over a week, Joe. I had an idea Jerry was getting a little tired of having me around this house. Oh, no, Joe. Why, Jerry... Yes, what about Jerry? I wish I knew, Joe. That's why I wanted you here. Where is he, by the way? I want to say goodbye to him before he leaves. He's probably out in the summer house where he works with all those papers. 
He's got a lot of work to catch up with. He's going overseas tomorrow. Yes, I know. He's out there. He's been out there all day. His last day here. And I've been alone. That sounded like a shot. <laughs> yes, it was a shot, Joe. The house dear. doesn't seem to worry you. <laughs> it's only Paul. Jerry's brother, Paul. Oh, thought you'd gotten him off your hands for good. Jerry asked him out. He got here two nights ago. That doesn't make it any easier for you, does it? No, I don't mind. Jerry's fixed him up with a pistol range in the cellar. Paul's a terribly bad shot. Not like the rest of us. You don't seem to like it, Joe. Uh, shall I have Kitty go down and tell him No, 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 it's terrible. As long as he keeps away. Poor Joe. But, uh, about Jerry. Who is it this time? Joe... Jerry's been home five days on leave from camp. Well, uh, never mind what camp. But he spent four evenings of those five with... with that Fisk woman. Diane Fisk? The redhead with all the money? Oh, she got money? Wow. She must have some attraction then. Please understand me, Joe. It's not that I'm jealous any longer. It's just that... No, no, that of course not. Jerry goes his way and I go mine. I... May not be without admirers myself, if it comes to that. You've no idea how true that is, Isabel. No, uh, I was thinking about Jerry. He may not always be lucky. He may meet some girl who's not as broad-minded as I am. And then when he gives her the go-by... <laughs> Paul must be getting really furious down in that cell. He's not hitting anything. He must be using a lot of ammunition. Now, your trouble, Joe, is that you're too much of a gentleman... And if you really want to see Jerry, uh, there he is now. Where? Uh, just standing in the door of the summer house. Uh, look out the window. In finally bright out there. Doesn't he look noble in his new uniform? Sam Brown belt and revolver and everything. Uh, look how he turns around and waves his cap at us. Like a real soldier. Real soldiers don't exactly wave their caps, do they? He does. Uh, Jerry! Jerry! Jerry, Joe Parker's here. Who? Joe Parker. He wants to see you. Well, give him a drink or something. I'll be up in a minute. Into the summer house again. Not a care in the world, Henry. Now, listen, Isabel, you've got to slow down. You'll be crying again in a minute. Come on over here and sit down. Uh, light hurts my eyes, that's all. Well, then we'll just pull these blinds. We'll still be able to see it. There, how's that? It's better, thanks. Now, can I get you anything? Oh, no. You heard the great white chief's orders. I'm to get you something. Uh, what do you have, Joe? Highball? Don't bother with that. Oh, it's no bother. Everything's out in the dining room here. The ice man didn't deliver today of all days, so I'm afraid I can't give you any ice. I uh, read in the paper yesterday that we're likely to have automatic ice boxes any day now. Uh, you know, uh, things that freeze ice by electricity or something. Uh, do you believe that, Joe? I doubt it. Listen, Isabel. Uh, here you are. It's not cold at all. It's the best I could do. Thanks, Emma. What I wanted to say was, couldn't you get that brother of yours to give up practicing now? Hasn't he done his good deed for the day? <laughs> yes, maybe he has. Uh, I'll ring for Kitty. You don't have to call me, Miss Kenyon. I'm here. Oh, yes, Kitty. What is it? It's only to tell you there's another visitor. This time it's a woman. Lady Kitty. Call her a lady, please. Well, maybe. She says her name's Diane Fisk. Diane Fisk, that's Jerry. Uh, Kitty, tell the lady I'm not in. Lady. <laughs> She's a fine lady. I don't want to intrude, my dear. I don't want to intrude. <clears throat> anyway, it's too late, Miss Kenyon. She's coming down the hall now. My dear Mrs. Kenyon. <laughs> How do you do, Diane? <laughs> this is a friend of ours, Miss Fisk, uh, Mr. Parker. How do you do? Now, I don't want to intrude, really. I don't. I wouldn't have intruded for worlds, especially on a day like this. Isn't it awful? But your husband simply insisted, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, he simply wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't. Uh, do you know what he's brought from his office as a surprise? No. A phonograph recording machine. He's going to let us use it. So that we can all hear ourselves talk twice. How nice. <laughs> Heaven's name, can't somebody stop that firing? Don't fly off the handle. Take it easy now. Kitty. Yes, ma'am. Would you please go down the cellar and tell Mr. Kenyon's brother he's driving us all crazy. Tell him to stop. Yes, ma'am. My, my dear Mrs. Kenyon, I do hope I haven't offended you in any way. I, 
I know I'm a silly little chatterbox. They say people who have red hair often are. <laughs> of course, at your age, you, you must find the heat very trying. Uh, don't you think we'd all better sit down? I I was very much interested in what Miss Fisk said about our phonograph recording machine. Mrs. Kenyon was just talking about a machine to make ice. <laughs> yes, yes. Isn't science wonderful? But I do think it was mean of Major Kenyon to invite me out here and then go and fall asleep in the summer house. Did you say fall asleep? Yes, of course. How did you know? Well, I came up the back way and I saw him in the summer house with his head forward on the table, taking a nice little snooze. That's very queer. Of course, you couldn't see much except in the bright light of the door, but I think I saw him there. I didn't disturb him, naturally. But I think I'd better disturb him. Oh, now, please don't trouble on my account. The fact is, my dear, I don't altogether trust myself in this room. A woman of my age has to conserve his strength, you know. So if you'll just excuse me... I'll... Well, of course, if you... Oh, dear, I just can't think what I'm always saying because I, I have the best intentions in the world, Mr. Barker. But... Parker. Uh... Oh, yes, Parker, but I do somehow manage to offend people being so dependent and everything. <laughs> Except the men, of course. I couldn't offend you, Mr. Barker, a Parker. <laughs> now, could I? <laughs> Madam, I'm not sure. Well, of course, the person I really came to see was Paul, Mr. Kenyon's brother. He's a little young, of course, but he's joining up next month, and I think we should all do our bit, don't you? <laughs> he has such a pleasant personality. I think he likes me. Why, if he walked in at that door this minute... Now, how am I ever going to get any place? Someone's always interrupting my revolver practice just when I'm getting to the point where I can... Oh. Why, Paul. Good Lord, are you here again? You're a very untidy object, Paul. Well, that's pretty untidy in the cellar. And dirty. I've got cockroaches on me, so keep away. Did you have a good day shooting? Swell. One of the best. Hit the target? On the only shot that mattered, I hit the target dead center. That sounded like Isabel. I think it was Isabel. Why have you got those blinds down? Get them up. What is it? What's wrong with you? What are you looking at through that window? Twenty-five years ago, Captain Burke, we found Jerry Kenyon lying across the table in the summer house. He'd shot himself through the head with his own revolver in the holster. It was lying on the floor beside him. Shut up, sir, Burke. I see. When Isabel found him, he'd been dead about half an hour. The doctors proved that, did they? Yes, that shot had been fired against his head. The front of his uniform cap was powder burned where the bullet entered. There's no doubt about that. None at all. We never noticed the real shot because... Because that young lad was shooting off guns like a maniac in the cellar. Precisely. Now they're all dead. By accident, illness, they're all gone. Isabel Kenyon died less than a year afterwards. I think she died just because she was so fond of Jerry. I suppose you've guessed my little secret. Oh, I think I can sort of read between the lines. You were in love with Isabel Kenyon, weren't you? Yes. Well, these things happen. I never let her see it, do you understand? Women know, pretty generally. So? They're gone. The youngest of them. And I'm left alone... With old tunes, old ghosts, wondering why the fellow ever killed himself. Why? Why? And this morning, out of a clear sky, I get a letter saying, if you want to know how Major Kenyon really died, look in the third drawer of the desk in the library. But I tell you, we know how he died. Well, aren't you going to do it? Naturally. I've got a key somewhere here that fits the drawer. Now, listen, Mr. Parker. In my father's country, in Ireland, they got a saying that when a man's going to commit suicide... I thought of doing that, too. Once. Then the devil comes in and takes him by the hand and talks to him. They say you can see the devil as plain as I see you just before you pull the trigger. Well, the devil must have been in the summer house that afternoon, then. Oh, no, he wasn't. 
What do you mean? Major Kenyon didn't kill himself. He was murdered. My dear Captain Burke, the police covered all that at the time. Everybody had an alibi. They did, did they? Well, think of what I've told you. Isabel and I were together all the time. Paul, her brother, was shooting off guns in the cellar. Yeah. Diane Fisk. Yeah, what about her? Her chauffeur who drove her there swore he saw her walk straight up to the place. She passed the summer house, but didn't stop there. Well, that checks. Even Kitty the maid could prove she'd never stirred out of the house until just a minute or so before Isabel went herself. Oh, and why did the maid have to leave the house at all? She was taking Jerry the black coffee he drank every afternoon. He'd already been dead half an hour then. And that, my dear Captain, disposes of everybody. Well, now listen, Mr. Parker. You're a good guy, and I'm not going to hold out on you any longer. You see, I say Major Kenyon was murdered because I know he was murdered. By an outsider? By one of the people in the house. That's impossible. Is it? Well, why don't you open that desk drawer and see? What time is it? Uh, it's a quarter to eight. Quarter to eight? And I haven't got much time. For what? Holy St. Patrick, will you open that drawer? If it's waited 25 years, my friend, it can wait a minute more. I've got the key somewhere in this bunch of keys. Everything the same. Paul never altered what he inherited. Same old desk, same old phonograph. Same old... I think this is the key. Yeah. It opens. There's nothing here except one or two old newspapers. Everything very dirty. The letter says to press hard at the back. Now, have you tried that? Doesn't seem to. Yes, my George, it does work. Well? There seems to be a movable back on a hinge. Well, what's inside? Uh, uh some sort of flat brown paper parcel sealed with wax. And about as dirty as it can get. Open it, man, open it. I'm going to. It's a phonograph record. There's a plain white label, something on it written in pencil. I don't see too well nowadays without my glasses. Uh, here, give it to me. I'll read it to Let's you. Go on. A record of how I killed Jerry Kenyon. Say, don't you get it, Mr. Parker? This is the real goods. The murderer is going to tell us his own story 25 years later. Be careful. Whatever you do, don't drop it. You seem to be interested enough now. I don't say I'm not interested. I say I can't believe it. You know, when you were talking about the dead coming back and that kind of thing, you sure started giving me goose pimples. But that's just what it is, a dead person. Now, there's the phonograph. Put that record on. Let's hear what the ghost says. Any of them could have made the record, of course. The apparatus was all here. Don't just stand there by the phonograph. Won't it work? Yes, it works. Is it wound up? Yes, it's wound up. Here goes. Now, look, Mr. Parker. Whose voice do you think it's going to be? I don't know. Now, I want to warn you. The voice you're going to hear from there... Please, be quiet. Listen. I've started it up. Well? Speak up. Who killed Jerry Kenyon? I killed him, Joe, dear. Isabel. I'm sorry about it, Joe. But I had to have you for an alibi. And you were so terribly easy to prove. It's only a phonograph record, man. Don't look at it as if it was alive. You said you and I were always together, Joe. But that wasn't quite true. I left you to go into the dining room and mix a highball, remember? Yes. And I was carrying my big knitting bag. Remember that, too? And there was something else in it besides knitting. I'm an awfully good revolver shot, Joe. I told you we were all good except Paul. And the back windows of the dining room faced the same way as the back windows of the library. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Jerry very was much. in the summer house. I made a sign to him from the window, and he came to the door there. In bright sunlight, 50 feet away. Sure, again, Isabel. Sure Joe. Again. Don't you know what August heat is in a wooden summer house? Didn't you, didn't anybody see that no man would be wearing a cap inside on a day like that? Jerry had taken his cap off before he went into the summer house. We saw him do it. 
He was bareheaded when he came to the door. So I lifted the revolver and shot him through the head. Then I dropped the gun back in my knitting bag and went back into the library with your drink. Isabel, don't talk back to the thing, man. You'll drive me screwy. There was in my knitting bag, too. I had to use it. It was a duplicate of Jerry's army camp with a powder-burned hole already fired through it in the place I wanted. Very clever of you, Isabel. So I've been the goat for 25 years. I waited for some time and then flipped out to find the body. I fitted a new cap over Jerry's head in place where it ought to go. I put the old cap in my knitting bag. I took his revolver out of the holster and kept it. The gun that I'd used, I dropped on the floor beside him. So I proved it was suicide. You see? You proved it to me. Joe. Joe, listen, I, I'm very sick. They tell me I'm going to die. You are dead. Joe, I'm afraid. I'm going out in the dark, and I I don't know what's there. Don't go away, Isabel. Come Joe. Out. Just for a minute. Okay, I've had just about enough of this. Joe, I want you to tell everybody about it. I want you to tell them how a poor, crazy woman couldn't stand that man any longer, and how... There. It's cut off, and it's going to stay cut off. Thank you. I've heard about enough, too. But you can't arrest her now, my friend. You can't arrest her now. After hearing that, I'm not going to arrest anybody. Tell me, Captain. Did you know what was on the record? No. That's why I had to hear it. I knew about it, but I wasn't sure what it had to say. But so help me, I never guessed how hard it would hit you. Man, don't you get it even yet? Yes, I get it. Oh, no, you don't. You don't see anything. That was how the fake suicide was managed, yes. That's just how it was all done, bar one or two little things. Only... Only what? Only it wasn't Isabel Kenyon who committed the murder. Did I hear you correctly? You did? This is another one of your little jokes, I imagine. Can't you let me alone? Have you some kind of personal spite against me? What did I ever do? You're going to hear the real truth now if I have to hold you down in that chair. I know Mrs. Kenyon didn't kill her husband because I've just come from talking to the real murderer up the river. But they're all dead. Oh, no, they're not. And I haven't got much time either. That clock's just going to strike eight. What's the time got to do with it? Good deal, if you'll follow me. Mrs. Kenyon died less than a year after her husband, didn't she? Yes. But it wasn't Mrs. Kenyon's voice you just heard in that record. What? I'm telling you. The real murderer hated her. Hated her like poison and wanted her blame for the crime. When Mrs. Kenyon died, the real murderer wrote a letter. Well? But she never mailed that letter. She made a lying record of Isabel Kenyon's voice as evidence. Now you figure it out for yourself. Who was pretty enough to take Major Kenyon's eye and strike back like fury when she got thrown over? Who wanted to go on the stage and do impersonations? Kitty, the maid. Ah, you're talking sense. She shot Jerry from the dining room window. When she couldn't borrow Mrs. Kenyon's knitting bag, she went out to the summer house with a gun and the fake cap wrapped a napkin on a coffee tray. She did go out, I remember. Actually, she got there before Mrs. Kenyon did. But the summer house was dark inside and Mrs. Kenyon never noticed her. The next day, Kitty wrote that letter, but she couldn't bring herself to send it. So she kept that letter till the day before yesterday. Then one of the boys at Sing Sing... Wait a minute. ...thinking he was doing her a kind action, put a stamp on it and mailed it. Did you say Sing Sing? Yes. They're electrocuting her tonight for the murder of an Italian down at Collier's Hook. I found out about the record, all right. But the one thing I wasn't sure of was that, that she had done the job alone... Now, frankly, the way you acted, I thought that you might have been in on it, too. Well, that's why I had to hear it through. And it was anything but a joke. And now, here it goes to blazes forever. Eight o'clock. Now, she's dead. So ends The Devil in the Summer House. 
tonight's story of... Suspense. The part of Mr. Parker was played by Martin Gable. Again next Tuesday at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Wartime. A story dedicated to the thrill of the nighttime. The hushed voice and the prowling step. Another adventure in suspense. William Spear, the producer, John Dietz, the director, and John Dixon Carr, the author, are collaborators on Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Roma Wines presents Suspense. Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Salud. Your health, senor. Roma Wines toast the world. The wine for your table is Roma Wine, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is the man in black, here for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California, to introduce this weekly half hour of Suspense. Tonight from Hollywood, Roma Wines bring you the remarkable actress whose performance in the Paramount picture For Whom the Bell Tolls won her an Academy Award, Katina Paxinou. And so with a woman in red and with the performance of Madame Paxinou, we again hope to keep you in Suspense. All of London, few houses were so fine, so correct, so austere, and yet gracious with age as number 30 Henrik Square. That was true of its reception room, true of its long, quiet hallway along which the young man led the girl. Aunt Rita, this is Miss Julia Ross. The woman rested her knitting in her lap and slowly turned around. She was a giant of a woman, a woman of 60 in a bright red dress. For several seconds, she stared fixedly across at Julia. Then, in an instant, a soft, gentle smile came on her face. Perfect. How perfect. I beg your pardon? Here. Come over here, child. Let me look at you. That's it. Over there, child. Sit there on the divan. And, and Carl, I think I shall have my milk now. And Miss Ross will have some with me. Will you? Won't you, Miss Ross? Oh, some milk? Oh, but I, I some never... Some warm milk and a biscuit. Of course you will. I always find it very sustaining. Uh, Carl, you heard the young lady. <laughs> and stop staring at her. <laughs> You've seen a pretty girl before. Was I staring? <laughs> Excuse me, Miss Ross. Hurry now like a nice boy. Is he your secretary? Let us say that he has been substituting... Until I find someone like you. You mean, you think I will do? <laughs> Don't you? <laughs> well, I... All I know is when I saw your advertisement in the paper, Miss Crable, I, I couldn't believe my eyes. Wanted secretary, Irish girl, blonde hair, age about 25. It was all so perfect. It sounded just... Well, it was like me. <laughs> and just like Sheila. That was my former secretary, Miss Ross. You, who passed away just recently. Oh. She had been with me many years. I'm so sorry, Miss Crable. I Cable. had the feeling that my loss might be lessened if I could really replace her. <laughs> An old lady's whim, of course. Uh, because no one is ever exactly like someone else. You, for example, I'm sure you have friends, acquaintances... Relatives, perhaps, uh, you see now and then. Uh, Sheila oh, didn't, but, but, but you see, I don't. What I mean is, my parents aren't living, and so far as friends or acquaintances are concerned, I I hadn't had much time lately, and... Well, my landlady, of course, I know her, but... Unbelievable, Miss Ross, because it's so perfect. You see, the last time you have four outside attractions, 
the more time you have for me. The milk and Rita and the biscuits. Uh, will this table do here? That will be fine, dear. And leave us alone. Oh, very well. My aunt is a very domineering woman, Miss Rose. <laughs> oh, but also a generous one, I think. Your milk, dear. And a biscuit? Oh, just the milk, thank you. Miss Crabo, there's something you must know. Uh, well, don't hesitate, child. Miss Crabo, I... I'm afraid I'm not quite what you think. I mean, I've never really done any secretarial work before. Oh. I've had some business training, a little, but not oh. actual experience. <laughs> I I mean it, Miss Crabo. I, I lied in what I wrote you. I, I wanted the position and I needed it so much. You silly girl. You mean you still want me? Certainly. Now finish your milk before it, it gets cold. Oh. <laughs> As a matter of fact, there will be very little secretarial work for you to do. I shall want uh, a sort of, uh, yes, a companion. Now, I shall want you to start immediately. You will, of course, live here in the house and... Live in the house? But of course, you are my companion. Oh, but I didn't understand that I... Yes. Well, then, I think perhaps I should make plans accordingly... I mean, I'd better leave now. I, oh. I shall want to go to my boarding house and cancel my lodging. Oh, there will be plenty of time for that, child. Carl and I generally take an afternoon stroll and would like you oh, to... But, but you see, there'll be other arrangements. People I must see and people? things... People? To... But you said you knew no people. Oh, yes. Well, um, Miss Crabo, I have no qualifications for this position. I... Oh. Why, uh... child? What's the matter? I don't know. Suddenly, I, I feel so drowsy. Well, then, I would just lie back on the divan. Oh, but there's no reason for it. I... Oh, but there is, child. You are weary from the strain, the uncertainty, the ceaseless search for work in a strange and friendless city. The milk. Oh. There was something and in it. so you relax. Your nerves, they go to sleep. Yes, sleep. Carl. Oh, Carl. Yes, Aunt Rita. Have you finished the note, oh, dear? Yes, only this moment. I... Well, don't just stand there. Let me see. Aunt Rita, please. She's so harmless. She... <laughs> and so perfect. And now read me the note. Oh. Uh, to Department K.L. Sudden mm. development. Leaving at once for Dublin, Ireland. We'll communicate in ten days. Ten days, Carl? We won't need so much time. Make that five. Just as you say, Aunt Rita. Then sign it Sheila Campbell and post it to British Intelligence. <laughs> Night for Suspense, Roma Wines bring you as star Madame Katina Paxinou, whom you have heard in the prologue to The Woman in Red by Anthony Gilbert. Tonight's adventure in Suspense. You remember the old saying, the grass is always greener in the other fellow's yard? Well, you might agree with the truth of that statement if you happen to overhear a conversation like this. Let's imagine we're seated in the smart and festive Club Montmartre in Havana, Cuba. An American has just complimented his Cuban friend on the fine quality of Havana tobacco. Graciously, the Cuban replies, But you of the United States need have no envy of us. Nature has made a great gift of perfection to your country, too. The magnificent wine which we are all so fond of. It is Roma wine, made in your own California. Friends, that little scene is typical of many countries where wine is truly enjoyed. For in other lands, Roma wines must be imported over long distances from our own California. A luxury to be enjoyed on special occasions. While lucky you can enjoy these superb Roma wines as a daily delight. With no import duty, no expensive shipping charges added to your cost for Roma wines. Whichever one of Roma wines many different types your own taste test names as favorite... You'll agree here is truly superb wine that could come only from truly choice wine districts. And you'll say, no wonder Roma wines are America's largest selling wines. I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A. Roma wines. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. 
And now it is with pleasure that we bring back to our sound stage our star, Katina Paxinu, in The Woman in Red, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. <laughs> Feeling better, Julia, after your little nap? No. No, I don't feel better. Well, the walk and a little something to eat will do wonders for you. There is a little tea shop up here. At I the don't corner. want anything to eat. Oh. And please don't hold on to my arm like Oh, that. now, child, is that a way to talk? You seem a bit shaky, that's all. Here we are. Carl, you wait with Julia. Oh. I'll just look in first to see that it's no too crowded. And now you have to hold my arm. Oh, no, wait, Miss Ross. I don't have to hold... Hey, no, don't, don't. Let me go. What are you doing, Miss Ross? Why do you run like that? Please, don't you understand? If I'm to move in with Miss Crabo, I've, I've got to get in touch with my landlady. But there'll be plenty of time. Plenty of time. What do you want with me? Why are you both... Oh, come. Oh, yes, Aunt Rita? Come along, you two. No. Oh, please, you're making yourself worried about nothing. My aunt, it is just that she's a peculiar... Hurry, woman. hurry, children. Uh, then remember that I am here. I have already ordered for oh, us. Oh, fine, Aunt Rita. Uh, our table, this is it? Yes, sir, you're in the corner. Uh. Miss Craver. Thank you, Mr. James. And Sheila will sit what? here to my left. Of course. Miss Sheila? Miss Sheila? What? This is your place here, Miss Sheila. Sheila? Why are you calling me Sheila? <laughs> what is it? Why are they laughing? Pay no attention, dear. Just sit down, please. This woman called me Sheila. You both did. My name is... I know. I know, dear. It is Julia. <laughs> Everything is all right. Sh shall I serve the tea now? If you will, please. Uh, now, Sheila, sit down, dear, like a nice girl. No. What, dear? I'm... I'm going to the restaurant. Sheila! It's all right, Miss Crabo. Don't bother. There's no other exit from that room. Oh, I'm so sorry to impose on you, Mr. James. I had no idea she would be so difficult. Oh, don't give it a thought. Once you explained uh, the situation, we were only too glad to help. Of course, uh, I'd never seen your secretary. I had no idea that... Uh... It's only a recent development. Uh, yes. Shall I pour the young lady's tea now? No, thank you. I can manage. Yes. You know, I was just saying to Mrs. Blandin the other day, I says... I wonder if Miss Crabo and her nephew are still in the neighborhood, I says. Why, they haven't been in my shop for ages, I says. And she says, no, they... Ah, they're... yes. You see, Mrs. James, uh, we don't dare leave her for long. Uh, for her own protection, that is. Huh? Protection? Uh, yes, we are a little worried about suicide. Oh, oh, yes. Aunt Rita, Sheila's coming. Well, just call me in case I can help. Thank you. Oh, here you are, dear. Carl, help Sheila into her chair. Oh, yes. Sheila... Thank you, Carl. Relax now, dear, and drink your tea. It's all ready for you. My tea in this cup? No, I won't drink it. You won't drink it? Sheila, what? You're pouring, pouring it into your saucer. <laughs> dear, everybody's staring at you, laughing at you. There's nothing for them to laugh at. I simply prefer to pour my own cup of tea. And that's exactly what I shall do. But, but I... Dear, you don't think I... Do you really believe that I, I... I put something in that first cup of tea? Yes. Yes, I do. You did it before, and there's no reason to think you wouldn't do it again. Sheila! Very well, then. Drink your tea. Only hurry. I don't think I can endure much more. Never mind. I shall hurry. I'm just as eager to leave as you. And I'm going straight to the police. Oh, now you're not starting that again. Are you insane? Do you think I'm helpless, that I can't get away from you? That I shall simply stand here and... Oh, it, it's happening. What, dear? What's oh, happening? You, you had it in the teapot. Oh, you're tired again, aren't you, child? Is there something oh. I can do, Miss Crabble? These attacks, Mrs. James, they, they leave her quite exhausted. Oh. If, you, if you, if you'd be good enough to open the door. Of course, Miss Crabble, of course. No. Uh, no. She, she must be taken straight to her room, Carl. Yes. Uh, please, if you just give her a hand. Sure. That's it. That's fine. You are really such a help to me, Carl. <laughs> Here we are, Sheila. Right here. 
Now, just go to bed, dear. Let me alone. Come along, then, Carl. Uh, she lays quite tired. Yes, Aunt Rita, I shall. You, you said you'd always be here. You've got to help me. What can I do? Here. I've had it in my pocket. A note. Are you coming, dear? Uh, right away, Aunt Rita. It's to my landlady. I wrote it in the restroom at the tea shop. Here, mail it to her. It's my only chance. But I, I can't keep this. Oh, Carl! Uh, uh, she's coming. <laughs> yes, Aunt Rita. You can do it. You've got to do it. Good night, Sheila. How very slow you are, Carl. Oh, was I so very long? <laughs> oh, you like her, I can see that. A letter, I imagine. She gave you a letter to post. A letter? Oh, oh no, I, I was just locking the door. Ah, yes, of course. <laughs> Perhaps I have letters on my mind, dear. After that episode with Sheila. <laughs> the first uh, Sheila Campbell, that is. Uh, dear, uh, hand me my knitting. Please. That's a nice boy. Mm. Do you know, I'm continually amazed at the stupidity of these English. Can you imagine that girl, that's, that supposedly trained agent, dropping that note? <laughs> and addressed, mind you, to the British intelligence. It was very alert of you, Carl, finding it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, if you excuse me, I'm rather tired. But... Uh, yes, uh, this espionage, it's not a restful service. Sometimes I wonder if Burling really appreciates the risk we have taken. Yes, the girl had to be disposed of. There was no doubt of it. That was her report on us. All the facts... Aunt that... Rita, we've gone over this a thousand times. I really, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. Yes. You were right in realizing what bad to be, uh, what had to be done. It was just that you acted too... Please, Aunt Rita, explain all that. Too hastily, all that. too thoughtfully, too violently. I couldn't help it, I tell you. She rushed into the telephone room out there. I ran after her, and that, that stupid catch lock pinned us in. She went to pieces, pounding on the door, screaming, tearing at me. I didn't know what I was doing. There was that bookend, the big one. I lost my head, that's all. It's all your fault. Why didn't you unlock the door? Now Where were you? It. I simply want you to remember that every incident counts. Because of you, we cannot produce Sheila Campbell's remains. And we certainly can't allow the police to tear up the cellar to find them. Because of you, we shall have to produce a substitute body. A substitute Sheila Campbell, who will satisfy the authorities completely. We have her, and I don't, it, I don't intend to lose her. The note, please. The note? The one that girl just gave you to mail. I don't know what you're talking about. All I know is you don't have to use this girl. You could get somebody else, somebody just as good. She's not right for it. She... Not right for it. A girl who denies her identity, who shrieks of drug drinks, persecution. She is ideal. The police will accept her as a suicide without giving it a second thought. Yes, yes, if they knew she was really insane, but she isn't, don't you see? She isn't. She isn't. <laughs> just ask those people at this tea shop and that foolish Mrs. James. She will tell you. <laughs> she will tell the whole neighborhood. Oh, Mrs. James, a few neighborhood gossips. They aren't enough. You have to have someone professional, an authority. Listen to me. Our note to British intelligence will divert them for just five days. Within that time, Julia Ross must commit suicide. And we will see that she does. No. No, I won't. I won't go through with it, I tell you. I see. <laughs> What a pity it would be if the police learned who was the last person seen with the first Sheila Campbell. You, you wouldn't. You wouldn't turn me over. This espionage call, it's a very demanding trade. A note, please. Huh. Thank you. Thank you, dear. I knew it was an oversight. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell me if Miss Crabo lives here? Miss Crabo? Why, yes, this is her home, but uh, uh, she's rather busy upstairs, however. Oh, uh, yes, Aunt Rita? Was that someone at the door? I thought... Oh. How do you do, Miss Crabo? My name is Turner, Dr. Turner. Dr. Turner? Yes, I happened to drop into the tea shop yesterday, uh, Mrs. James' shop, you know, 
And she told me about your situation. Yes? Well, I thought I might be of some service. My field, you see, is psychiatry. Yes. Yes, I see. Oh, how very thoughtful, Doctor. Uh, please, uh, won't you come right up? Well, thank you. Uh, Miss Campbell's room is up in this floor, Doctor. I thought you might as well see her at once. I know how busy you must be. Yes. Well, the case has been uh, quite difficult, Miss Crable. In many ways, yes, Dr. Turner. Naturally, I feel that uh, someday with professional guidance and with those things, I can give her patience, understanding. Mm -hmm. I can bring her out of the darkness. Until then, here we are. Sheila. Sheila, dear. That is Dr. Turner. Step right in, Doctor. He's coming to visit you, dear. How are you, Sheila? How do you feel? Uh, doctor, I... I rather think my presence will interfere. Mrs. James has undoubtedly explained. Uh, if you don't mind... Yes, yes. That might be best. Won't you talk to me? It's all right, Sheila. Believe me. I'm a doctor. You're no doctor. No, no, Sheila. Don't call me Sheila. You're here to help her. Help her keep me prisoner here in this house. Ah, uh -uh, stop help it. Help her drive me out of my mind. Help her. Yes, help her to murder me. Sheila, pull yourself together. She's told you, you everything. Do act like this. Told you how to act. You must have Why don't you leave me alone? Why don't oh, you go away? Oh, excuse me, Dr. Turner, uh, but I became a little bit uneasy. Yes, yes, I can understand. Well, Doctor? Uh, yes, it's persecution mania, clearly enough. She has all the symptoms. The deep melancholia... The stubborn, hysterical insistence that she's about to be done away with. Yes? I happen to be attached to the King James General Asylum. And I'm somewhat familiar with this type of case. There is one important thing, Miss Crabo. Over here, please. Yes, Doctor? The uh, matter of Miss Campbell's protection. Her protection? Yes, from herself. You undoubtedly are not aware of it. But uh, her type is often inclined toward uh, suicide. <gasps> How dreadful. In case those tendencies uh, should become apparent, naturally you'd let me know. Naturally, Doctor. She would then require professional care. Meanwhile, I'm sure your own treatment will be as effective as any. Patience and understanding. Torture me like this, will they? Murder me here in this house. Sheila! No, I won't let them. I'll kill myself first. Miss Campbell. I'll kill myself. That's what I'll do. The window. Stop her. Oh, Carl, oh, yes. Carl. Oh, yes, the window. Yes, she That's it, the window. I'll jump through the window. A young woman, control yourself. Let me go. You Don't let right. me Put jump. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. What's going on here? What? What happened? Well, this girl, she just tried to kill herself. I'm afraid this changes things, Miss Crabo. She must be put away. Put away? Yes, as soon as possible. I'll have the men come at once. You mean take her away from me? But you can't. I've looked at her myself. Uh, why can't I go on doing that? Because it's beyond you now, Miss Crable. No, 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 you... I'm sorry, but there's nothing else I can do. Would you be good enough to direct me to your telephone? Telephone? Yes, I wish to order a car. Some uh, men from the asylum. Of course. There is a small telephone room right, uh, right on down the hall. Uh, this way, please. I know how you must feel, Miss Crable. But you see, it's the same. The thing. telephone, Dr. Turner, is in this room, right here. Just sit down there at the desk. Oh, well, thank you. You're sure the young man can handle the girl? I mean... I will go back myself and take charge. Well, that will be safer, I'm sure. Excuse me. Hello? Turner speaking. It's Dr. Turner. I'd like you to send a car right away. And three men. The address? It's number 30... Uh, just a moment. Uh, Miss Crable. Miss Crable. Yes, Dr. Turner. I can't open the door. It's locked. Oh, sorry, Doctor. I'll have to get the keys from Carl. Keys to unlock this door? This very special look locked, Dr. Turner. You don't need any keys. Just open the door from your side. Miss Crable, Miss Crable. Where are you? Miss Crable. Aunt Rita, she won't stop crying. I just can't get her to stop. I will get her to stop. A clever one, aren't you, child? <laughs> Pretending to commit suicide so the doctor would take you away. The doctor? Where is he? A splendid idea you had, <laughs> leaping out that window. We'll see if we can help you this time. No, don't come near me. Carla, huh? we've only a very few seconds. Get her across the no. window. 
Don't make me do it, Andrita. Please, oh, you don't. You wretched, <laughs> sniveling coward. Do you want us both to hang? No. Help me get this girl to that go. window. You, you'll be sorry you made yeah. me, Andrita. <laughs> you will, you will! <laughs> I couldn't help it, Dr. Turner. I couldn't help it. I couldn't help it. I, I just just lost my head, that's all. But she made me do it. She made me do it. Don't you see? Don't you understand how it was? She made me do it. She drove me, Dr. Turner. All right, now settle down, settle down. And do stop calling me Dr. Turner. Stop calling you Dr. You? Well, no, I'm not a psychiatrist. But I'm going to see that you meet one. I happen to be from British Intelligence, Carl. I suppose I have you to thank for that letter. What letter? Yes, the one supposedly signed by Sheila Campbell, telling us she was off to Dublin, Ireland. Oh, yes. It would communicate with us in five days. Well, Aunt Rita, she made me do that, too. <laughs> ah, that was an inexcusable mistake, Carl. You see, Sheila would never have written Dublin, Ireland. No, an Irishman assumes that everybody knows where Dublin is. Uh... How about that, Miss Ross? Am I right? Well, I know where it is, all right. And I'm going back there as fast as I can. Oh, <laughs> now, Julia, London isn't as bad as all that, you know. Maybe not. I suppose it all depends upon the murderers you meet. Why, child, you wouldn't want to meet a nicer lad than Carl here. After all, it isn't everybody who'd pitch his aunt through a bedroom room window just to save your life. Yes, he's really a very nice boy. Sergeant. Better take him down to the cellar now and have him show you where he buried Sheila Campbell. Aunt Rita, she made me do it. Oh, she made you do she that too. A woman of character, Miss Crabo. I'm uh, sure you'll miss her very much. But that's the way it goes. This espionage, Carl, is a very uncertain trade. And so closes The Woman in Red, starring Katina Paxinu. Tonight's tale of Suspense. Spotted about the globe, wherever wine grapes grow, there are a few wineries whose products are made for world enjoyment. Among such wineries right here in California are those of Roma. And we who live in America have the pleasure of enjoying Roma wine at exceptionally low cost. For we buy it free of duty and free of excessive shipping costs. For instance, Roma California Sherry is the queen of appetizer wines. And not only that, but a wine so delicious it is suitable to serve at any time, cool or chilled. But no matter what your preference may be, you will find a Roma wine costing far less than you would expect to pay for such distinguished wine. In Roma, you have the old world art of winemaking, plus the extra care, constant tasting and testing, which modern knowledge adds to that ageless art. That's why Roma wines have a universal appeal, why they are America's largest selling wines. I'll spell out the name for you. R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Katina Paxinu. I hope you enjoyed our suspense play this evening and that you don't hate me too much. I'm not really as bad as that. Uh, next week, I, I know you will want to listen when Mr. Orson Welles will be your star. Suspense is produced and directed by William Spear. Don't forget, then, next Thursday for Orson Welles in Suspense. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Suspense. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Heading our starring Hollywood cast tonight is Mr. Laird Kriegar, who will be seen shortly in the 20th Century Fox production of one of the great suspense stories of all time, The Lodger. Tonight, Mr. Kriegar appears as a cynical gentleman who made an unusual bet with death. With Mr. Kriegar as a cast of the screen's most distinguished and characteristic players, Miss Helen Vinson, Mr. Walter Kingsford, Mr. George Coloris, Mr. Harold Huber, and Mr. Ian Wolfe, here to bring us the suspense play called The Last Letter of Dr. Bronson. And so with the performance of Laird Kriegar as he writes for us this last letter of Dr. Bronson, and with the performances of, in the order of their appearance, Walter Kingsford, Ian Wolfe, Harold Huber, Helen Vinson, and George Coloris, we again hope to keep you in. Suspense. My dear Dr. Mosher, forgive me if I dash this letter off rather hurriedly. There are but a very few minutes remaining for me. The few minutes between now and midnight. You have always protested my fascination with the subject of death. It irked you to hear me discuss the latest electrocution or hanging. I remember your sarcasm the day you found me staring down from the top of the Empire State Building, speculating on the thoughts of a man about to leap from that pinnacle. You alone, Moshe, know how this fascination led to my latest experiment. I should say, my last experiment. I promised you a complete account of it all. Here is that account. First of all, let me recall a conversation which we held here in my study a little over a year ago. There you go again, Bronson. Death and murder. Really, you're unhealthy. Please, you're... answer my question, Moshe. Why do men behave as they do? What keeps them from breaking loose? Why, why don't they kill one another as animals do? Why, because, uh, because they aren't animals. But my dear Moshe, being neither vegetable nor mineral, they must be animals. But what I mean That is, you sir... do not know the answer. I do. So? I have been studying the question for some time. And I've concluded that there are five basic checks which serve to restrain man from murdering his fellow man. Oh, really, Bronson? The uh, obvious corollary is that murder occurs only when some stronger drive overrides these five basic checks. Oh, you make it sound very simple. It is simple. And what are these five basic checks? Well, I'm not prepared to reveal the outcome of my study as yet. I must put my theory to the test. Uh, and that would seem to be a difficult undertaking. Difficult, yes but intriguing. Oh, well. I take it you're about to embark upon another of your experiments. Correct. Bronson, why must you keep on? These studies invariably bring you some physical, or what is more dangerous, some nervous disaster. And in turn, your handsome bill for putting me in shape to conduct the next. Sooner or later, you will experiment yourself into a position beyond my power to aid you. Oh, let it be later, then. Meanwhile, I shall continue to pursue my sole interest in life. And how do you propose to conduct this... Uh, this restraint from murder experiment? Well, a murder is composed of four elements. The murderer, the motive, the opportunity, and the victim. My first step will be to select five men, each of whom will be restrained from murder by the particular check that I'm testing on him. That's no easy task. By no means. It will require an extensive search. But having found my men, I must then supply each with a motive. Greed, revenge, jealousy. I see, and... Your next step must be to give each man an opportunity. Precisely. 
An opportunity which precludes all checks but the one being tested. Well, not knowing what your checks are, I can't help you there. Well, that'll be relatively simple. And finally, I'm a supply and intended victim. And you'll ask this victim to face five men, each standing to profit handsomely by murdering him? Correct. His only chance of survival being the correctness of your theory of checks in all five instances? Yes. And do you imagine you'll discover a man with such utter confidence in your reckoning? There is one such man. Who? Myself. Bronson, this is folly. No, Mosher. I never hesitate to risk high stakes on a sure thing, not even my life. Now, look here, Bronson. You're a doctor yourself. You told me to speak to you like a Dutch uncle. Now, as your physician, I, I haven't advise... consulted my physician. But you will take precautions, provide yourself for emergencies. I tell you, there's no danger. Oh, well, 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 well. Well, when will you begin your experiment? Well, I suppose in about... Well, why wait? Why don't we begin right now? Moshe, I invite you to kill me. What? There's a revolver right here in my desk, and I want you to take this revolver... Oh, you, 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 you're joking, Bronson. What, what possible motive could I have for murdering you? Motive? Uh, why, we're known to be associated rather closely in our work. You'll come naturally into my entire practice. I'll put that in writing. Why, it's, it's, it's preposterous. Why? Why won't you kill me then, Moshe? Why, there are, there are dozens of reasons. In the first place, I'd go to the electric chair for it. Thank you, Dr. And... Moshe. You've given me an admirable illustration of the first and most obvious of the five checks in my theory. Man refrains from murdering his fellow being because he himself will be killed by law. Remember, Moshe? Remember how it began? That was more than a year ago. Yes, I've spent more than a year in selecting my other four subjects. Because the checks I wanted them to prove were not so simple. In selecting my people, it was necessary that I cultivate the friendship of each. So that when the time should come to confront him with my proposition, I should be certain of how he would act. The first of my four potential murders was a clerk named Totten. Totten was badly in debt, his wife in the hospital about to undergo an expensive operation, and he was a deeply religious man. We went to church together on Sunday evenings at St. Luke's, right around the corner from my apartment. One Sunday evening after the service, I asked him to come to my apartment, and we talked as we walked along. You know, Dr. Brunson, I was talking about you to my wife the other day, before they took her to the hospital. I was saying what a great comfort it was to be with you these Sunday nights. Now, come, Mr. Totten, you embarrass me. No, I mean it. In the world today, too many people seem to feel that they no longer need their God. Yes, but their lives are void of the great thing you have in your faith. The church is a great comfort to me, and I do need something to cling to in times like these. Mr. Totten, uh, you could make rather good use of $5,000, couldn't you? It isn't like you to make fun of my poverty. No, I'm quite sincere. You know what even $100 would mean to me? And at present, more than ever. Yes, with your wife's misfortune. Oh, isn't this your apartment we're passing? Well, I want to go in the sideway. We shall be unobserved. Unobserved? Oh, you'll understand presently. Please, come into my study. Ah, here we are. And now if you'll take this chair opposite my desk. Ah, thank you. Mr. Totten... You said that even a hundred dollars would be a great help to you. Here in my desk, I have this package containing five thousand dollars. Well, what could I do for you that would be worth all that money? Let me explain. My doctor called on me yesterday and he told me... Well, to be quite frank with you, Mr. Totten, he said that I was slowly going mad. Oh, no, that couldn't be. I'm quite all right at present, but it's only a matter of time and I'd rather not have to face it. I believe you can understand that. But there must be something you can do knowing in advance. There is. And I want you to help me. I, I don't understand. Put on these gloves. Take them. But why? As soon as you have them on, I shall hand you this paper knife. Notice how very sharp it is. I grip it firmly, thus, and clearly impress my fingerprints on the handle. Finally, here on the desk, I am leaving this note explaining that I have committed suicide. Suicide? When the knife is in your hand, I want you to drive it into my heart. Then you may leave by the same way we came in. You'll be quite unnoticed, and with the $5,000 in your pocket. You can't mean this. But I do. You see, I don't have the nerve 
You... Well, I... can't quite make the final move myself. You would greatly oblige me. And with the $5,000, you will be able to give your wife the treatment she needs. What do you say? You can't die yet. You're not ready. Would you have me wait until I've gone you mad? You can't take the matter of life and death into your own hands. I am not asking you to pass judgment upon my actions. Whether I wish to live or die is my own concern, and my mind is resolved. Is that clear? I'm sorry for you. I'm merely asking you to do something for which I will pay you very well. You will, of course, be killing me. But if you could realize what life would be like for me, otherwise I'm you... very sorry, but I can't oblige you. If it's the law you fear... No, it's not that. You seem to have arranged that perfectly. Then what is it? I'm an honest Christian, and I thought you were, Dr. Bronson. If you don't understand why I can't do this monstrous thing, I suggest you look up the Sixth Commandment. Good night. So, Moshe, my second point was proved. Man refrains from killing because it is against his religious principles. The hands of the clock now read 15 minutes to midnight. One quarter of an hour in which to complete this report. My third proposition called for an entirely different sort of man. In fact, the very reverse of Totten. A man who believed neither in heaven nor hell. And also a man of little intelligence. It required careful search. For a number of nights, I frequented the rougher districts of the city. At first, I had no luck. Then one night, I came upon my man very unexpectedly. I was walking along one of the darker streets. There was no one in view. Oh! Oh, oh. He was slumped down beside an ash can. Oh. He'd been shot in the chest and left arm, severing an artery. Oh. He was bleeding profusely. I tore off his shirt and made a tunic for his arm. Oh, no. Oddly, no one came into the alley to investigate. Never mind me. Get away. Was this a gang shooting? What do you think? I think you're going to the hospital. No! I'll blab to the cops. Come on, I'll help you to your feet. I ain't going. You'll die, man, if you're not treated quickly. I ain't going, I tell you. No cops gonna... No cops... They ain't gonna... Gonna... Oh. His name was Matt Doyle. I visited Doyle in the hospital almost every day. Several months later, I decided to put him to the test. I found Doyle in one of his hangouts and brought him to my apartment. It sure is a fancy roost you got yourself, Doc. <laughs> I find it very pleasant. Have a cigarette? Mm, thanks. Doyle, how many men have you killed? That's all right, Doyle. I understand. Now, suppose we get down to business. Yeah. I've been wondering what you want me for. I want you to do something for me, and I'm going to give you $5,000 to do it. Will you do what I ask you? For five grand? <laughs> Spell it. I want you to put on these gloves so there won't be any fingerprints. Then I'm going to hand you this knife, and you're going to kill me with it. Huh? I've arranged everything so it will appear to be suicide. You nuts. Not yet, but I will be before very long. That's why I want to die. All you have to do is stab me and slip out with this 5,000. Is this on the level? Absolutely. This wad of dough is mine if I kill you? That's right. And nobody will know I've done it? No one. These gloves is kind of big for me. That's all right. They'll do. Yeah. You yeah, want me to put on the other one? It's safer. Yeah, I guess it is. Gee. What is it? I was just thinking. Five grand. Oh, the boss is going to pay me more next. I mean, I never got... I'll skip it. I want you to understand exactly what you're doing, Doyle. Without any justifiable cause, merely for the sake of money, you are going to murder me. You understand that? Yeah. You've been hired to do this before? Yeah. I suppose it don't hurt to talk about it now that you're going But you've never killed a friend, have you? Oh, yeah, I have. Anyway, they watched my pals till they got in the boss's way, but when the bosses say slip it to a mat, then they was just another job to me. But there's a little difference in this case, Doyle. I saved your life. Yeah. I don't know. What? I don't know. Nope, I can't do it. But I thought you said that yeah, you... Yeah, take these gloves. Afraid of the law? No. What's the matter, then? Is it because I'm your friend? That's no, more than that. I can't bump you off, even if you want it. It would be an act of true friendship. I ain't so sure. When a cat has fits, you put it out of its misery, don't you? That's what I want. Oblivion. 
peace. Sorry, Doc, I ain't the guy. It's like you said. You saved my life, so that's that. I'm sorry. I wish you could help me. Oh, me too, but not that. Now, if you got some other punk you want took <laughs> care of... There's no one. Thanks just the same. Oh, don't mention it. There was my third proposition. Man will not kill fellow man if a sufficient degree of gratitude has been invoked. Even a professional killer and one of the lowest examples of human life, such as Doyle, could not bring himself to murder his benefactor. My next subject was altogether different in temperament. With Judith Ainsley, I used a special technique. I first encountered Judith Ainsley when I operated on Barrett Sheffield, the actor. You will recall that Sheffield was brought to the hospital with a lung abscess. As I prepared to do the rib resection, I noticed that the nurse standing beside me was greatly agitated. Retract us, doctor. Thank you. Doctor, do you think this is advisable? What? Is this when the air is more pronounced? Listen. Listen. Miss Ainsley, another hemostat, please. But he's getting blue. Doctor, do you think you're really sure that he's cyanotic? Miss Ainsley. I'm sorry, Doctor, but if you... Doctor, Doctor. Quickly, quickly, caffeine. Quickly. Stethoscope. Here it is. Well, that's that. Yes. Miss Ainsley, what's the matter with you? You've been acting strangely all through this operation. You killed him. You killed him. You shouldn't have gone ahead. You know that. I warned you. I shall see to it, Miss Ainsley, that you are never assigned to one of my cases again. What's the matter with you, anyway? Have you never seen a pulmonary before? Or does it upset you to see a handsome actor like Barrett Sheffield die? Yes, it did. Oh? Yes. We were going to be married next week. <laughs> If I ever saw hate, cold, undying hate, it was in that girl's eyes as she turned and left the operating room that day. I had made the most implacable enemy of my life. As I come to my third check, dear Mosher, it suddenly occurred to me that Judith Ainsley was the perfect subject. One day at the hospital, I inquired about Miss Ainsley and learned that she had done four years of medical and was now interning at Cedars of Lebanon in hope of picking up a resident fellowship. I went down to the hospital and sat in the doctor's lounge, waiting for her. Presently, she came in with another intern. I stood up. She turned and looked at me. I saw again in her eyes that inexorable hate. She had never forgiven me for what she felt was my negligence in the death of the man she loved. I walked toward her. Excuse me, please. I see you remember me, Miss Ainsley. Yes, will you excuse me, uh, Miss please? Miss Ainsley, you may not believe this, but I've come here especially to talk to you today. To talk to me, Dr. Bronson? Yes. Come along with me, please. In this treatment room, please. We can talk privately. Dr. Bronson, I don't think there could be anything you and I can say to each other. Well, now, Miss Ainsley, that all depends. That all depends. Sit down, won't you? Um... Uh, Miss Ainsley, Dr. I... Ainsley, if you please. Oh, yes, of course. Doctor, I have a little proposition to make to you. First of all, there are two facts I'd like to be sure of. A, you are unable to set up your own practice because you don't have the money to get started. Is that right? I don't see what business that is of yours, but it happens to be true. Fine. Fact B, you still hate me and feel a strong desire to be revenged for the wrong which you consider I have done you. Yes, I'm afraid that's true, Dr. Bronson. Good. Good? Yes. You see, I want to pay someone to murder me. And I think you'd enjoy it more than anyone, and you need the money, too. Dr. Bronson, I'm very busy. There's a patient in 302. Will you... Wait a moment, Dr. Ainsley. I'm perfectly serious. Absolutely serious. You want to die? Yes. You see, I'm going mad. I can't face it. I wish to end my life immediately. You're smiling. Good, you're interested then. You going mental, Dr. Paresis? Yes, hopeless. I've been to five or six men about it. Are you far gone? Hallucinations? Delusions of grandeur? 
Yes, advanced stages. Agony. Yes, it must be quite a temptation to get it over with. I wonder what I would do if it happened to me. I want you to understand, Doctor, that I'm not asking you to perform a crude murder. This would uh, look like a simple error, unavoidable. There would not be the slightest aspect of homicidal intent. Really? That's most interesting, Doctor. Go on. Uh, my heart. I've had considerable damage. Coronary occlusion. Had to spend some six weeks on my back. Just got up last week. Naturally, I was given digitalis. Oh, I see, Doctor. You've been heavily digitalized, and if someone were to give you an injection of calcium gluconate, you would have an immediate heart block, dead within a few minutes. Exactly. <sighs> I must compliment you, Dr. Ainsley. You've learned a great deal. What a pity you can't have your own practice. And that, of course, reminds me... Ah, another inducement? Of course. I plan to pay you the sum of $5,000 for your professional services in this matter. And I think, unless times have changed greatly since I've been in practice myself, you ought to be able to set up handsomely with that. My own practice. You'd better be careful, Doctor. You may tempt me a little bit too far. I thought you'd find it an attractive proposition. It will be only an error. I will say that I'm feeling badly again, a recurrence of my pericardial pains. I'll go back to bed and ask that you be assigned to my case. The rest is simple. No one would ever expect you to know that I had been digitalized. Still, if I were on my toes, I would naturally go over your case history before giving medication of any kind. Well, yes, I suppose that's true. Professional people might think you had been a little lax. Might not have the highest regard for a new doctor who launched her career with such an unprofessional incident. Just a slight stain on your reputation for just a short while. You're very clever, Doctor. You knew that would do it, didn't you? I want to thank you. You've done me a great service. You mean you'll do it? You've reminded me that nothing, no money, revenge, nothing, can be worth the slightest suspicion in a doctor's career. I've worked too hard. I've waited too long for my practice. When I get it, it won't be soiled by any single act of carelessness. They'll never say that I lost any patient because of an error in judgment. You see, I once knew a doctor who did. <laughs> There, Moshe, is my fourth check. Man, or in this case, woman, refrains from killing because of the fear of loss of reputation. Now I come to the testing of my fifth subject. A man who would not murder because he couldn't bear the sight of blood, much less the responsibility for shedding it. Ladern was my man, and I found him shortly after my search began. On that day, I saw him turn a ghastly white as a fast-moving car almost ran over a small dog which had run into the street. It wasn't a particularly frightening sight, but Ladern clutched at his throat and fell in a dead faint. I, of course, made it my business to become acquainted with him. I hadn't seen him for more than four months until tonight. He's changed, I noticed, as he took his place at my desk. He's thinner. His dark eyes seem blacker than ever. Ladern, I want you to do me a favor. It's a little peculiar, but I'm perfectly sincere about it. Well? Circumstances require that my life be ended, but I can't quite reach the point to kill myself. I've arranged everything necessary to give the appearance of a suicide. Here is the farewell note which I've written. I see. And here is the knife with which, apparently, I shall have killed myself. Notice I am carefully putting my fingerprints on it. Yes. Here are the gloves for you to wear. And here is $5,000 for you if you will drive this knife into my heart. What do you say? You've arranged everything? Everything. No one knows I'm here? No one. And uh, you want me to kill you? I... Yes. Of course, it will be a bit messy. When a person is stabbed, his blood usually splurts out. But if you keep to one side, I don't think much will get on you. Why do you want to die? My doctor says that I'm going insane, and that I haven't got much longer. <laughs> That's strange. <laughs> About going mad? About him saying that you're going mad. Oh, yes. It was a shock. No, I don't mean that. What do you mean? That's the same thing they told me. Oh, that's strange. 
They what? They told me over a year ago that I was going mad. <laughs> I only laughed at them. Over a year? Well, uh, do you... Uh, have you noticed any change? Not much, at least no change for the worse. Oh, that's good. In fact, I, I'm really much better. I've been having fewer and fewer of those sick spells. You remember how I was the day that dog was almost run over? You've gotten over those sick spells? I haven't had one in three months. Then there isn't any check. Check? Well, what check? Uh, nothing. Oh. Uh, well, this is going to be a pretty messy business. We might as well get it over with. Nice gloves you've got here. Nice and smooth on my hand. Then you're going through with it? Yes, can't let you down. Oh, never mind the knife. I've got my gun right here. Look, 38. Beauty, isn't it? Oh, yes. Uh, then, if you'll give me back the knife... No, I... no, no, I'll keep it for you. <laughs> yeah, I've used this gun a lot in the past three months. I've bumped off about 50 dogs. You've done what? It's very interesting. I, I do it after midnight. It's fun watching the dogs. You have to know just where to hit them. <laughs> and it kills them instantly. But the noise in here, aren't you afraid that somebody will... Oh, yeah. Silence, I look. I don't like to wake people up when I kill their mutts. But they'll find the bullet. They'll trace to your gun. They're sure to get you. In a suicide, the weapon stays right beside the body where it falls. Suicide? Who says this is suicide? It's murder. I'm going to murder you. That's what you asked me to do. Look here, Lejeune. This has gone far enough. I, I was only joking. I don't want you to kill me. Five thousand, eh? All here. Listen to me, I was only joking. You ready? Lejeune! Shall I shoot now? No, wait! You want it through the heart or brain? Not yet. Can't you wait? Just a little while. Wait, what for? Uh, well, I've been conducting a little experiment. I'd like to write an account of it before I go. Well, what, what sort of an experiment? I don't think you'd understand. Oh, okay. I'll wait. Till midnight. <laughs> then I've got to go. There's a German police dog I've been wanting to get. A big, ugly brute. <laughs> It'll be fun. Yes. I'll wait. Thank you. The clock says ten minutes past eleven. Yes. You've got fifty minutes. I'll wait by the window. And so, Moshe, my experiment has ended. As you predicted, I have finally placed myself in a position beyond your power to aid. <laughs> Strange, isn't it? That the one thing I didn't count on was the choosing of a subject who would not respond to my checks. Who in fact had no checks at all. For insanity knows no restraint. Bronson, midnight. Oh yes, Ladone, I'm hurrying. He is still at the window. And he is sure to shoot me. There is nothing I can do to say or stop him. I know that. I'm beginning to understand exactly what is going on in his twisted mind. I wonder why. Now I shall sign my name for the last time and lay down my pen. Then I shall look up and say, all right, the day. All right, Ladern. closes the last letter of Dr. Bronson, tonight's tale of suspense. In our Hollywood cast tonight, Laird Kriegar played Dr. Bronson. Walter Kingsford played Dr. Mosier. Ian Wolfe was Mr. Totten. Harold Huber played Doyle. Helen Vinson was Nurse Ainsley. And George Coloris played Ladern. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week when Robert Young will star in an adaptation of a story by James Thurber called A Friend to Alexander. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear, who with Robert Louis Cheon, guest director, Richard Paulette Craik, author, Bud Gluskin and Lucian Marowick, conductor and composer, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>